With organizations beginning to shift their infrastructure to the cloud, hybrid server administration is becoming increasingly relevant. IT pros with both on-premise and cloud-based server admin skills are highly sought after. If you're looking to become one of these hybrid server admins, this is the course for you. I've been a Microsoft certified trainer for many years and the first course I taught was Windows NT Server. 30 years, hundreds of classes and thousands of students later, I'm still in the server space, teaching the current crop of certification titles to a new generation of IT pros. Over the next nine hours, I'll be your guide to the AZ800 Administering Windows Server Hybrid Core Infrastructure course. This course is a full study resource that covers every objective on the AZ800 Administering Windows Server Hybrid Core Infrastructure exam. The skills measured by the exam include deploy and manage Active Directory domain services in on-premise and cloud environments. Manage Windows servers and workloads in a hybrid environment. Manage virtual machines and containers. Implement and manage an on-premise and hybrid networking infrastructure. Manage storage and file services. This course includes around nine hours of video training and demonstrations covering the exam ODs. Selected readings to provide in-depth explanations. Quizzes for each lesson so you can test your knowledge throughout the course. A practice test to determine your preparedness for the exam. I've used my many years of experience to put together a comprehensive AZ800 Administering Windows Server Hybrid Core Infrastructure course that by the end will more than prepare you for the exam and help you on your path to becoming a more skilled hybrid server administrator in Azure. This course consists of eight lessons, each broken down into sub-lessons between five to 15 minutes duration, although some lessons are a little longer. The lessons have been grouped together in such a way as to easily map to the exam OD. Lesson one, manage on-premises identity, covers the content for the following exam ODs. Deploy and manage ADDS domain controllers. Configure and manage multi-site, multi-domain and multi-forest environments. Create and manage ADDS security principles. Lesson two, implement and manage hybrid identities, relates directly to the content in the exam OD, implement and manage hybrid identities. Lesson three covers the content for the exam OD, manage Windows Server by using domain-based group policies. Lessons one through three together provide coverage of the exam OD, deploy and manage ADDS in on-premises and cloud environments, and together account for around 30% of the exam content. Lesson four, manage servers, consists of two sub-lessons and covers the content for the following exam ODs. Manage Windows Servers in a hybrid environment, and manage Windows Servers and workloads by using Azure services. This lesson covers all the content required for managed Windows servers and workloads in a hybrid environment, and that accounts for around 15% of the exam. Lesson five, manage virtual machines and containers, consists of four sub-lessons that cover the exam OD, manage virtual machines and containers. This represents around 15% of the exam. Lesson six, implement name resolution, covers the content for the following, implement on-premise and hybrid name resolution. Lesson seven, manage network infrastructure, relates directly to the following exam content, manage IP addressing in an on-premise and hybrid scenario, and implement on-premise and hybrid network connectivity. The two lessons combined cover the exam OD, implement and manage an on-premise and hybrid networking infrastructure, and represent around 20% of the exam. The final lesson, lesson eight, manage storage and file services, maps to the exam OD of the same name and covers the content that represents around 20% of the exam. By the end of the course, you should have learned enough to take the AZ800 Administering Windows Server Hybrid Core Infrastructure exam. I do hope you get as much out of attending the course as I did writing and recording it. So let's get started. This is lesson one, managing on-premise identity. In this lesson, you'll learn about ADDS fundamentals, deploying domain controllers, RODCs, DNS serve records, deploying domain controllers to Azure, configuring and managing multi-site, multi-domain and multi-forest environments, and managing security principles. The hands-on sessions demonstrate how to use ADDS management tools, deploy a new domain controller, review DNS serve records, transfer FUSMO roles, manage trusts, manage ADDS replication, manage OUs, users and groups, join a Windows Server computer to ADDS, and enable Azure AD sign-in on an Azure Infrastructure as a Service VM that's running Windows Server. It's important to understand the Active Directory fundamentals. 
Active Directory is made up of collections of forests, trees and domains. These are linked together by trusts. It's very important to understand how these components interact. Let's start with some definitions. A forest is a collection of ADDS domains that share a common schema and are bound by automatically created two-way trust relationships. A domain is a logical administrative unit that contains users, groups, computers and other objects. A tree is a collection of ADDS domains that share a common root domain and have a contiguous namespace. So in this instance, for example, contoso.com is the parent domain, sales.contoso.com is the child, the contiguous namespace element being contoso.com. Both domains share this. A schema is the collection of object types and their properties, which are also known as attributes, that defines what sorts of objects you can create, store and manage within your Active Directory forest. So for example, that might be user accounts with properties such as full name, distinguished name, group memberships, passwords, date last signed in and so on. Within Active Directory, there are a number of containers of slightly different types. For example, organizational units or OUs are a container within a domain that typically contains users, groups and computers and potentially other organizational units. You use OUs to delegate and or configure objects that reside within the OUs. An example of an OU is the domain controllers container. This is built in, but nevertheless it is an OU and contains all of your domain controller objects. In addition to OUs, there are a number of containers. These include computers, built-in and managed service accounts. They're similar to OUs in the sense that they can contain objects, but there are some significant differences. For example, you can't create sub-containers within a built-in container and you cannot delegate permissions on a container in the same way that you can with an OU. A site is a logical representation of a physical location within your organization. So for example, if you have an office, say in London, you typically create a site object for London and you would associate that site with a number of subnets. And in this way, computers can determine their location based on their IP in relation to configured subnets, which are linked to site objects. A subnet then is a logical representation of a physical subnet on your network. Active Directory is made up of a number of partitions. The first of these, the schema, contains the Active Directory forest schema. This partition rarely changes, and in fact will only change if you need to modify the behaviour of the schema to include additional object types or additional properties for a given object type. The configuration partition contains the configuration data for the forest. Again, this rarely changes, but changes might occur when, for example, you add a new domain. The domain partition contains the actual objects, such as your users and computers and groups, that exist within your forest. A writable copy of this partition is stored on all domain controllers. The domain partition in a given domain often changes. So for example, every time you create a new object or change the properties of an object, the domain partition is updated. Trust relationships define security relationships between forests, domains within a forest, domains in separate forests, and between domains and Kerberos realms. Trust can be one way, either incoming or outgoing, or two-way, in which case both incoming and outgoing. They can also be either transitive or non-transitive. A transitive trust being one in which domain A trusts domain B and domain B trusts domain C, therefore A also trusts C. It's important to understand the role of domain controllers within your forest. Perhaps the most important role is to host the Active Directory database. This is a file, ntds.dit, that lives on the file system of all domain controllers. The domain controller also provides authentication and authorization services so that users or computers can identify themselves and then potentially gain access to resources based on that identification. Domain controllers are typically co-installed with a DNS server role so that they can provide name resolution services for your domain. Domain controllers also provide location services through the use of sites and subnets. Finally, domain controllers are used to distribute group policy settings and preferences to client computers. Active Directory has been designed to be multi-master. 
What that means is that you can make a change to any object on any instance of that object within the domain. So for example, if I want to change a user's properties by adding them to a group, I can connect to a domain controller, any domain controller, I can make that change. The advantage of that is that you don't have a single point of failure. So if a domain controller is offline, you're still able to update records and maintain Active Directory. But there are a few exceptions to this multi-master behavior, and these are handled by single operations masters. Within a forest environment, there are a number of these masters. The first of these is the schema master. When you want to make changes to the schema, the schema master must be online. Now it's not necessary for you to particularly know which domain controller holds the schema master role at a given moment. When you open up the appropriate tool to manage the schema, then a connection is automatically established. But if the schema master is offline, you can't make changes to the schema. Now that's not necessarily a problem on a day-to-day -day basis because typically the schema doesn't change very often. The schema, if you remember, is that collection of definitions about the types of objects and their properties that you can have. So if you wanted, for example, to change the properties of a user object, then that would be indicative of a change to the schema. Typically, for example, if you install enterprise applications like Exchange Server, then schema changes are necessary. The domain naming master is also a role that's not very frequently used, but is held by typically the same server or same domain controller rather as the schema master. The domain naming master, as the name suggests, is responsible for domain naming, more specifically when you add or remove domains from your forest. Now that's not something you do on a day-to-day -day basis either, and therefore the absence of the domain naming master is unlikely to go notice straight away. Within the domain, there are three operations masters. The first of these is probably the most critical, the PDC emulator. Now the name is interesting, PDC stands for Primary Domain Controller, and this is evocative of the earlier directory service that Microsoft provided prior to Windows 2000, when Active Directory first came along. In those days, there was only one writable domain controller known as the PDC, and there were a number of backup domain controllers that provided only authentication and authorization services. In the absence of a PDC, you weren't able to make changes to the directory service at all. Now, for the most part, as we now know, Active Directory is multi-master, but there are certain specific tasks within a domain that need to be handled on a particular domain controller. For example, the expedition of uh, password changes is usually handled by the PDC emulator so that when a user makes a password change, that's replicated quite quickly. Time services, the PDC emulator acts as a time source for the rest of the computers in the, in the domain. You can only usually have a, a single time source, otherwise you'll end up with services configured for different times and that can lead to problems and inconsistencies. The role of the PDC emulator is critical and its absence is noticed almost immediately. Group policy also is typically focused on the PDC emulator and we'll discuss that when we talk about group policy later in this course. In addition to the PDC emulator there is a, a server or a domain controller that holds the role of infrastructure master. Now the infrastructure master maintains consistency between multi-domain group memberships, by which I mean if you have a group in domain A that contains members from domain B, which is perfectly possible and perfectly permitted, then you need to maintain the integrity of that group membership and it's the infrastructure master that handles that role. Now that role is not particularly important of course if you've only got a single domain in your forest because there are no groups that contain members from other domains because there are no other domains. So that role may or may not be important based on your particular requirements. The RID master is responsible for maintaining the integrity of the Active Directory database in regard to the creation of objects. Whenever you create an object, it must have a unique security ID or SID. Now, if you only had a, a single domain controller, then that domain controller can be responsible for generating these SIDs in a manner which ensures that they're each unique. But because you've got multiple domain controllers, any one of which you could target for the creation of an object, there must exist a means to ensure that no two domain controllers create the same SID for two different objects. And so the use of the RID master helps ensure that by distributing blocks of SIDs to each domain controller as and when necessary. The global catalog contains a subset of attributes for all objects in the forest. Now this is pretty important because it helps accelerate the process of handling uh, queries about objects that are resident in another domain. So for example, if you are sending an email message 
and your Exchange server lives in domain A and you're referencing a group that is hosted in domain B, the Exchange server needs to know who belongs to that group. And so they will perform a query of a domain controller in the remote domain. And that will obviously have a, a speed issue if that domain is physically remote. So by using a global catalog, we can provide a localized copy of all objects in the forest, but only of specific attributes. This can help that forest-wide search be as efficient as it can. You can define a domain controller as a global catalog server when you promote the domain controller. In fact, that's the default behavior. And subsequently, by using the Active Directory Sites and Services tool after you've promoted a domain controller, if you decided during creation to not mark it as a global catalog server. In a single domain forest, to optimize performance, ensure that all of your domain controllers are also global catalog servers. If you've got multiple domains, deploy at least one global catalog server at each physical site that has more than 100 users. Universal Group Membership ca Caching performs a similar function to Global Catalog, so consider using that for small sites where there are fewer than 100 users to mitigate the need for Global Catalog replication. You can manage Active Directory by using a number of different tools. The Active Directory Administrative Center provides a graphical user interface, but is largely based on Windows PowerShell commandlets. Active Directory Domains and Trusts is the appropriate tool for managing domains and trusts. Active Directory Users and Computers is for day-to-day -day management of user objects, group objects and computer objects. Active Directory Sites and Services enables you to manage sites and subnets and the relationship between them and to manage the replication of Active Directory between your sites. Adsy Edit is a more advanced tool for fine-tuned adjustments to specific properties of objects or specific object types. Windows PowerShell provides a command line interface that enables you to perform all of the management tasks that you can achieve using any of the graphical tools. In this demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can use the Active Directory management tools. So this is the Server Manager console, which is the likely landing page when you connect to a server interactively. You can use this console to review specific services or to add roles and features or to manage servers, whether those are local or whether they are added in a server group. You've also got access to the tools menu, which provides links for the Active Directory Administrative Center, for domains and trusts, for sites and services, for users and computers, and a range of other tools, all of which we'll cover in due course throughout this course. Let's start by selecting the Active Directory Administrative Center. And from here in the navigation pane, I can select my domain and then I can select an object like the ITOU. And then you can access objects such as users and groups that are contained within that organizational unit. So to perform management of an object, I can select it and then I can look at its properties by selecting the properties option from the context menu. And from here, I can update the properties of this user object in a, in a range of different ways. This is something that we'll look at as a specific demonstration later. Likewise, from the Active Directory Administrative Center, I can modify groups and their properties and computer objects and their properties. In addition, it's possible for me to use a feature known as dynamic access control, which determines a level of access to resources like files and folders based on conditions. So, for example, a user belonging to a certain group is a condition, but also something like um, a user having a home address in a particular city. So a combination of those factors might be used to make a determination about access. And that's a feature of dynamic access control. And that also is configurable here. At the bottom of the Active Directory Administrative Center window is the Windows PowerShell history. If you expand that out, when you create objects or you manage objects, it will show you the commandlets and the syntax for those commandlets that was used to perform the task. So for example, if you add a new user account, it will show you the corresponding PowerShell history for that task. That's a very useful way of getting up to speed on using PowerShell to perform typical day-to-day -day tasks. There's even a feature to copy the syntax from the PowerShell history, and then for you to utilize that in a script. Active Directory Users and Computers gives a much more simplistic view and is a bit more limited in its functionality. Because it's simple, it's relatively quick to load and relatively easy to work with. So again, you can see a navigation pane on the, dis on the display on the left-hand side that shows the 
connected domain and then the containers within that domain, both built-in containers and organizational units. If you select, as I have here, a particular OU, you can see the corresponding objects within that OU on the details or in the details pane on the right-hand side. So a collection of user objects and, and, and group objects. If we select a user, for example, then we can perform management of that user object. I suppose it's a personal preference as to whether you use the Active Directory Administrative Center with its additional capabilities or the Active Directory Users and Computers interface, which is a, a bit more limited, but a lot more simple to use. In addition to these graphical interfaces, you can also use Windows PowerShell. If I right click Start and choose Windows PowerShell Admin, and then issue a command such as get ad user and then filter using a wildcard, it should return a list of user objects. If I want to format that list differently, I can pipe the output to a table using um, FT, and there we can have a list of the user objects within the Active Directory domain. I can go on from there to modify uh, user object properties by using the set AD user command. Likewise, I can also perform management of any other object or any other service from PowerShell. So working with the Active Directory Administrative Center and learning about the PowerShell commandlets that are used to perform management when you perform a particular task using the graphical interface and then using that knowledge to apply here in the command line and using Windows PowerShell, that's a great learning experience and a great way to get up to speed with what you can do with PowerShell. It's maybe worth having a, a quick review of ADSI edits. If I switch back to Server Manager and select the Tools menu and then select ADSI edit. Initially, there's not very much to see here. So if I right click the ADSI edit node, I need to connect to a, a particular object. Now, ADSI edit uses the lightweight directory access protocol to connect to objects and to provide management to those objects, which is an industry standard for directory service, on-prem directory services to which Active Directory conforms. So you can see here that the LDAP path is going to connect to the domain via the local domain controller. If I want, I can specify a connection to another known context. For example, I can connect to the schema um, or the configuration partitions if I needed to make changes there. So one way in which you can edit the schema is to use ANSI edit. However, I'm just going to select the default here, which should connect me to the domain. The default naming context here, uh, which connects via my domain controller to the domain called contoso.com, allows me to gain access to all of the objects stored within the domain. Although the interface is relatively intuitive, it's not, I think, as friendly as using Active Directory users and computers. So this is not the typical way in which you would modify the properties of objects within the domain context. However, if I select the OUIT, you can see the objects over on the right-hand side of the details pane for each of the individual users and groups that we reviewed before. In the demonstration, you learned how to use the ADDS management tools. When you deploy a domain controller, you can choose to create a new forest. Alternatively, you can add a new domain to an existing forest, either as a new tree or as a child domain. You can also add a domain controller to an existing domain, typically to perform load balancing or to provide for a high level of availability of the authentication and authorization services provided by a domain controller. To create a new forest, start by installing the Active Directory domain services role. You can do this either by using Server Manager or by using Windows PowerShell. After you've installed the role, you then run the Active Directory domain services configuration wizard and you use the wizard to promote the machine as a domain controller. In this instance, select the option on the Deployment Configuration tab to add a new forest, and then define the root name of the forest. You'll want to add a new domain controller in a number of different circumstances. There are two basic scenarios for this. The first is to add a new domain controller in an existing domain. Typically, that will be for load balancing and for higher availability of authentication and authorization services. In addition, you might want to add a new domain controller in a new domain. If you select this option, then you'll need to define the relationship between that domain and any other existing domains. For example, you might add it as a child domain in an existing tree or as a new tree. You'll want to deploy read-only domain controllers in a number of circumstances. Typically, you'll deploy them to branch offices where physical security might be a problem. So for example, your domain controller 
is in a standard office rather than in a controlled environment like a data center. You'll configure the RODC replication policy to determine which user account passwords are synchronized to the RODC. The idea behind this is that if the physical domain controller were compromised, uh, stolen for example, then a malicious person might be able to gain access to stored passwords on that machine, possibly by removing the hard disk. There are a couple of protections that you can apply. For example, if you enable BitLocker Drive encryption on the system drive, then that will help guard against that eventuality. But even so, the replication policy means that you only replicate those passwords that are likely to be used at the branch office. And then in the circumstance where a domain controller is compromised, then you can change the passwords for those compromised accounts only, rather than worrying about the fact that all of your user accounts need to be reset or have their passwords reset. Whenever you create a new domain controller, additional DNS serve records are created for that domain controller. These records determine which services are running on the domain controller. For instance, in this screenshot, you can see a GC, a Kerberos, and an LDAP record. Those are fairly typical. So this domain controller in the contoso.com domain has records stored in the contoso.com zone in DNS. So when a client computer wants to authenticate, it can query DNS specifically for the contoso.com zone or domain and locate records that are pertinent to that particular client computer for authentication and authorization. If you've configured sites in your organization, as indicated here, a site called London, then a computer based on its IP can determine the nearest domain controller based on its IP and the relationship between that IP and a subnet object and the subnet and that site. You can select a specific record to determine which host is offering the service. In this instance, the Kerberos record has been selected and the host offering the service is contosodc.contoso.com. The priority weight and port number provide additional details, determining which particular domain controller might be selected if there are several providing the same service and on what TCP port the service is available, in this case TCP port 88. In the demonstration, you'll learn how to deploy a new domain controller and how to review the DNS serve records created by that domain controller. So this is the uh, domain controller for Contoso.com. Let's take a look at the DNS records first of all. So if we expand out Contoso.com and expand forward lookup zones and select Contoso.com, you can see a list of the various uh, hosts. And if we take a look underneath the TCP node here, you can see the services being provided by domain controllers listed. Global Catalog, Kerberos, KPassword, and LDAP. So if we take a look at the Kerberos record, for example, we have contosodc.contos.com providing that capability over TCP port 88. As we add additional domain controllers, you'd expect to see additional records, and we'll review these additional records when we've performed a number of promotions. So I've switched to another server and I'm going to use server manager to add the ADDS role on this computer and then promote the machine as a domain controller. So it's important to note, you can see in the top right hand corner of the add roles and features wizard that the server I'm connected to is contoso-svr1.contoso.com. It's usually easier if you're going to promote a computer to be a domain controller if the computer is a member of the domain in which you want to promote it. If it's not, if it's in a work group, that's fine, but you'll need to provide credentials that have sufficient privilege to perform the promotion. It's usually easier then if the computer is already a member of the domain because you can sign in using a domain admin account on that particular computer. So click through the wizard and select from the list of roles the Active Directory Domain Services role. I'm prompted to add the additional components, and in this case, the Active Directory module for Windows PowerShell and other management tools, which usually you'd want to do. Click through Next, pass the features, and then really there's not much else to do here other than install the components. Once the installation is complete, we'll return to Server Manager and perform the promotion, which is done as a separate and additional task. So that's completed now, select close. And if you notice up here, there's a notification which is prompting us to promote the server to a domain controller. I'll select that option. And then on the deployment configuration tab in the Active Directory Domain Services configuration wizard, 
under the select the deployment operation heading, we've got options for add a domain controller to an existing domain, which is the default, add a new domain to an existing forest, and add a new forest. Depending on what you choose will determine what happens next. So if I were to choose add a new domain to an existing forest, I then need to define the relationship between the existing domain, in this case contoso.com, and the new domain that I want to add to that forest. I can add it either as a child or as a separate tree. If it's a child, it will, it will share the parent's domain name, but have an additional prefix. So for example, I might add the domain sales, and it, but then define the name as sales.contoso.com because it's part of the same tree. In this case, it's a child. If I choose tree domain, then I can give it a completely different name. The forest root will be contosa.com and the forest will be known as contosa.com, but I might choose to create a new tree called adatum.com, if I can type it correctly. In this instance, actually, I'm just going to add a new domain controller to an existing domain. On the Domain Controller Options page, you can now select whether or not you want to additionally install the Domain Name System or DNS Server role, which is a good idea and strongly recommended. You can also select the computer to be a global catalogue. Again, that's recommended in a single domain environment. We discussed this in the last lesson. You can choose to make the machine a read-only domain controller by selecting that read-only domain controller RODC checkbox. The other significant thing to specify here is the site name. Member computers such as servers and workstations determine their site uh, membership based on their IP and the setup that's been configured by an administrator in terms of a subnet object and its relationship to a site object. Here I've only got the default first site name configured so I haven't gone as far as configuring any sites. That probably suggests I'm operating in a single site environment. However it's not a bad idea to change the default first site name to something more meaningful. I can do that subsequently, and obviously that would then update all of the domain controllers um, accordingly. So if, if there are multiple sites, I would select the appropriate site here, because domain controllers are manually defined as being in a particular site, rather than making that determination automatically based on IP. The other thing that's useful to remember is the password that's used for directory services restore mode. That's used in certain troubleshooting scenarios. It doesn't necessarily need to be the same, and perhaps it shouldn't be the same, as the password with which you sign in using an administrative account, but it should certainly be a password with which any domain administrators are familiar. I can then configure any DNS options, none are available at the present time. And now I can choose to install the Active Directory, or replicate Active Directory, from a specified domain controller or from any domain controller. That probably only has meaning if you have multiple domain controllers and perhaps the physical location of this new domain controller, it would be more appropriate to use a specific additional domain controller from which to obtain an initial seeding of Active Directory objects rather than from perhaps a remote domain controller. In my instance, it makes no difference because I've only got one other domain controller and it's in the same site as me. If I am in a disconnected state, if my domain controller is not necessarily connected via a high-speed network or a reliable network, then I can also choose the option to install from media, which requires that a domain controller has had an, its instance of Active Directory written out to external media, and I have access to that external media. In this instance, I'm just going to click through. Now I'm going to specify where the Active Directory database, log files, and sysvol are located on the local file system. I'm going to accept the defaults here. I can review my settings and note the option to export the settings that I've configured here as a script, which I can then use to promote other domain controllers with similar or um, fairly identical settings. Obviously, I can update the script to make certain changes if I want. I'm not going to copy that script. I'm just going to click through. A prerequisite check is performed to make sure that the computer is capable of performing the role. And then I can complete the installation. So all seems to be okay. There's a couple of warnings here, none of which are significant. So I'm going to select the option for install. And then the process is initiated and completed. So at this point, I can select the option to close and leave the promotion process to complete. The 
target domain controller now needs to be restarted. That's an automatic process. And we'll check back when that process is completed. OK, so the computer has restarted. I can now sign in to the computer using a domain account. Now, there's nothing particular to see here. So we're going to switch over to Server Manager. And we're going to have a look at the updated server records. So if I select Tools and DNS, and you'll remember we chose to install DNS on this domain controller as part of the promotion process. And if I expand Contoso SVR1 and expand Forward Lookup Zones, there's a, an instance of the Contoso.com zone, and that's been replicated through Active Directory automatically without us having to configure anything. That's pretty standard. If I expand out the list of sites and choose the default first site name and then select the underscore TCP node, you can see now that there are two global catalog servers, two Kerberos servers, and two LDAP servers. If I select Kerberos, for example, here, I'm selecting Contos SVR1, Contos.com. That server is providing authentication services over TCP port 88. If I felt so inclined, I could reconfigure the weighting and priority values to make a determination about which of the domain controllers should be used by preference. But I'm going to leave that as it is for now. In the demonstration, you saw how to deploy a new domain controller, in this case as an additional domain controller in an existing domain, and how to review the DNS serve records that were created as a result of that promotion process. Now, when you want to deploy domain controllers on server core, it's a slightly more challenging process. And this is largely because there's no graphical user interface. So to deploy server core as a domain controller, for which it's ideally suited, in fact, remotely connect to the server using the server manager console, run the add roles and features wizard to remotely install the Active Directory binaries on that server, and then run the Active Directory domain services configuration wizard to promote the computer to a domain controller using the process that we just reviewed. You can also use Windows PowerShell. Run the install the Windows features command and specify AD domain services and option you choose to install the management tools. Then you'll need to perform the promotion. In this case, you run the install AD DS domain controller commandlet, specify the domain name, specify that you want to install DNS, and then use the credential prompt so that you can enter the necessary uh, credentials that has the capability to perform the promotion. Typically, that's going to be a, a member of the domain admins group. Now, in a hybrid environment, that's to say where you have both on-premise and uh, cloud-based resources, it's possible you might want to deploy a domain controller to Azure. So there are a number of scenarios where that might be appropriate. First of all, you might create a standalone forest in Azure by creating a new forest when you promote effectively the first domain controller in that forest. You can then create the appropriate trust relationships between your on-premise forest and the Azure forest represented by the individual domain controller that you've added in Azure. You might choose to create a domain in an existing forest, possibly as a child domain of your on-premises domain. Alternatively, you might choose to implement a new site in an existing on-premise domain. So, for example, in Contosa.com, you might choose to create a site for your on-premise environment, London, um, and another perhaps New York. And then for Azure, you might create a domain controller that's in um, an Azure region, say, for example, down in Australia. And you might choose to create a site called Brisbane, depending on what it was you wanted to achieve. You'll need to configure the appropriate site-to-site -site VPN or express route connections to support these particular scenarios. And that's something we'll look at later in the course. In the last lesson, we learned a bit about the multi-master nature of Active Directory, uh, but that there were also some flexible single master operation roles configured within the forest and within each domain that needed to handle some specific activities that can't be managed on a multi-master basis. Now, it's important when you're creating new domain controllers that you're aware of which particular domain controllers hold which particular roles. So for example, the schema master is usually assigned along with the domain naming master to the first domain controller in the forest. You can transfer that role, of course. You can use the get ad forest command using PowerShell to make a determination about which particular domain controller holds the schema master and domain naming master roles. For the Domain-based roles, PDC Emulator, Infrastructure Master, 
and Ridmaster. Similarly, you can use Windows PowerShell, in this case the get ad domain commandlet, to make the determination about which domain controller holds which role. If you want to transfer the roles, you can do that by using Windows PowerShell or indeed by using the appropriate graphical tool. But where a domain controller has failed, you might need to seize the role. To seize the role, you can use the following PowerShell command move ad directory server operation master role and then the identity of the server and then use the operation master role, in this case RID master, to force the move of the uh, role to the new target server. In the demonstration, I'll show you how you can make a determination of which domain controller holds which master roles and how you can transfer an operations master role. So to make a determination about FISMO role holding, select Windows PowerShell. And then in this instance, I'm going to use the get ad forest commandlet, specify the uh, domain name as contosa.com, and I'm using format list and selecting the output for schema master and domain naming master. So as you can see, it returns the information for schema master as being held by contosadc.contosa.com and also the domain naming master as the same domain controller. That's unsurprising since that was the first domain controller promoted in the forest. Similarly, I can use the get ad domain commandlet, again specifying contosa.com and output the result as a list for the PDC emulator, infrastructure master and RID master roles. And you can see for each of those again, and again, also unsurprisingly, it's the contosodc.contosa.com domain controller. Again, the first in the domain in this case. So if I want to check that information through the graphical uh, interface, I can also do that. If I select Server Manager and go to Active Directory Users and Computers, for example, and right click Active Directory Users and Computers node at the top and choose All Tasks, I can have a look at Operations Masters. And you can see here that the RID master, PDC, and infrastructure masters are displayed. These are the domain-based, and that's why I'm using the domain-based Active Directory Users and Computers tool. If I want to transfer a role, I need to do this from another domain controller. So I'm sitting in front of Contoso svr1.contoso.com. The remote domain controller is Contoso dc.contoso.com, the current role holder. And I can transfer the operations master role using this tool by, just by selecting the change option here. When I'm sure I want to do that, I can select yes. That now transfers the role and you can see the operations master role is now held by Contoso svr1.contoso.com. And if I return to PowerShell and run the preceding command, I should get a slightly different output now. So you can see the RID master role has been transferred. You can also use the PowerShell window to perform the same activity by transferring roles by using the move ad directory server operations master role commandlet. So let's give that a try. In this instance, I'm moving the role to Contoso SVR1 again. And I'm going to force that by saying yes. And if I now check to see if the role has been moved by using the get ad domain commandlet. I can see that the infrastructure master and RID master roles have now both been moved to Contoso SVR1. In the demonstration, you learned how to determine which servers held which operation master roles and how to transfer an operations master role. Most organizations can implement a single Active Directory forest. Typically, that may only consist of a single domain, but there are some circumstances where you might want to use multiple forests. This might be to accommodate mergers and acquisitions, to separate operating divisions within a particular organization, and to provide total administrative separation. Remember that a forest has an enterprise admins group, which has, or members of which have, complete administrative control over objects that form part of that forest. By using multiple forests, you create a separation. If you have multiple forests, you're quite likely to want to create forest trusts between them. Forest trusts are transitive and allow any domain in the trusting forest to be accessible to any security principle in the trusted forest. Now, maybe it's worth discussing trusted and trusting for a moment. 
If you consider a scenario where I decide to lend somebody my car, for example, the car is an object and I'm lending that car to a security principal, a specified individual. In that scenario, I am trusting and the person to whom I'm lending my car is trusted. So whenever you're thinking about the relationship between domains, or in this case forests, and trying to work out who is trusting and who is trusted, think of that everyday example. Forest trusts can be bi-directional or unidirectional, or in other words, one way or two way. You can configure them with one of two authentication scopes. Forest wide authentication provides an, a situation where users from the trusted forest are automatically authenticated for all resources in the local forest. With selective authentication, Windows Server doesn't automatically authenticate users from the trusted forest, enabling you to be very specific about which of those users you want to authenticate. It's worth noting that you can configure a trust relationship between a forest hosted in Azure and one that's hosted in your on-premises network. There are other types of trust that you'll encounter. The first of these is an external trust. An external trust is a non-transitive one-way relationship between an Active Directory domain and a Windows NT4 or NTLM domain. These are created manually and used to access resources in what's known as a down-level domain. Shortcut trusts. These are transitive one-way or two-way links between your Active Directory Kerberos domain and another Active Directory Kerberos domain or indeed an NTLM domain. These are created manually and they're used to shorten the authentication path. So for example, if users in sales.contosa.com require access to resources in sales.adatum.com or vice versa, then you can create a shortcut trust between those. That negates the need for the authentication to pass from sales.contosa.com through contosa.com through adatum.com down to sales.adatum.com. Finally, you can establish realm trusts. A realm trust is either transitive or non-transitive, depending on how you set it up. And it's either one way or two way, again, dependent upon preferences. It's established between two Kerberos authentication authorities, one of which is Active Directory, the other of which is running on something like a Unix operating system. In the demonstration, you'll see how to manage trust between forests. Before you're able to set up a forest trust between two Active Directory environments, it's important that each of the domain controllers in the respective environments are able to resolve via DNS the necessary information to be able to establish a connection with the remote end. So essentially that means that it must be possible to determine what the domain controller IPs are in the remote domain in order to establish the forest trust and indeed to maintain that trust. There are a number of ways you can achieve this using DNS. For example, you can set up conditional forwarding. What I've done is I've created a stub zone, which is possibly the most logical thing to do here. StubZone is created when you work with a partner organization on a frequent basis and it provides the most efficient way of providing for name resolution between disparate zones. So in tools here if I select the DNS console and expand out my local name server which is also a domain controller and take a look under the forward lookup zones node you can see that there are two zones listed adatum.com and contosa.com. So contosa.com is the local zone for the local contosa.com domain and contains all of the records, including serve records, that are necessary for local resolution and to determine the location of domain controllers. Adatum.com doesn't contain those records. This is the remote domain. By adding it as a stub zone, it, it creates a minimal set of records, a start of authority, a host record for a name server and a name server record. That allows me to contact the designated name server to retrieve the necessary information when I need to create the trust and maintain the trust. The reciprocal end would also need to be created, which is to say that the ADATUM administrator will need to create a contoso.com stub zone. Once you've done that, you'd obviously need to test name resolution to make sure all was well before being able to proceed along to create the necessary trusts. So back in Server Manager, the next thing to do is to create the trust. I'm going to use the Active Directory Domains and Trusts tool. This is the local domain, contos.com. I'm going to right click that and choose Properties. And then select the Trusts tab. And then I can create a new trust. So the new trust wizard starts and it's going to offer me the options to create 
a Windows domain in this forest or in another forest to, to create a link to an NT4 domain, to create a link to a Kerberos realm or to another forest. So I'm going to specify the forest name, which also is the domain name in this instance. And I can now set that up as an external trust if I want to, or as I want in this instance to set it up as a forest trust. I can specify it as two-way, or one-way incoming, or one-way outgoing. I'm going to choose two-way. Then I can create the trust for the following, for this domain only, which creates the relationship in the local domain, or for both this domain and the specified domain. To be able to do that, I would also need to have domain name joining capabilities, trust capabilities in the remote forest. Now, as it happens, I do, so that should be feasible. And the username I'm going to need to use in the remote domain is the same details as I use locally. Now, that's obviously quite unusual, but in a demonstration environment, that's entirely feasible. I can choose forest-wide authentication or selective authentication, as we discussed a moment ago. I'm going to choose forest-wide. And at the remote end, likewise, I can choose forest-wide or selective. Again, I'm going to choose forest-wide. I can get a summary here of what I've selected. And then select Next. Next. And then I can just confirm the outgoing trust at both ends. And then select Finish. And click OK to complete the process. If I now go to properties of Contos.com and choose trusts, I can see the forest um, trust relationship set up with adatum.com as being of type forest and being transitive. In the demonstration, you learned how to manage trust between forests. Sites enable you to manage the physical side of your network. That's to say that you can create a collection of IP subnets establish a relationship between those and sites, and then establish connectivity between the sites. That enables you to represent your physical network logically within Active Directory. There are a number of reasons to create sites. These are for managing replication. By default, the way in which replication is handled within a site is with the expectation that there is a high speed connection, a high bandwidth connection, low latency connection between all domain controllers. Now, so long as that's true, there may not necessarily be a reason to need to create sites. But where it's not true, particularly over slower wide area network links, which have a higher latency or a lower bandwidth available, then by creating sites, you can configure a schedule of replication updates between those sites. You have more manual control over the replication process. Group policy application can be configured through three types of container sites, organization units and domains. Now, depending on your specific configuration, it may or may not be a good idea to use a site container to determine the application of specific group policies. But it's certainly possible, and that may be something that you want to do. And therefore, by creating multiple sites, you have that capability. And then perhaps the most useful thing is service location. And I say the most useful because generally speaking, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you use sites for group policy application. And replication management by using sites is because we expect that wide area network links are lower bandwidth and, and, and maybe with a higher latency. And I don't think these days that's necessarily true. We can have very high speed links, very low latency links between our various geographic locations. And so the imposition of a design requirement to manage around that, to mitigate that issue, maybe doesn't exist so much as it, as it perhaps did 20 years ago when Active Directory first came on the scene. But service location is fairly critical. We need to be able to determine which is the nearest domain controller to us. We don't want to authenticate using a domain controller in London when we're, say, in New York and we have a more adjacent domain controller to use because, albeit, the link between London and New York may be fast, it's probably not going to be as fast as the one between my computer and the domain controller next door. Perhaps the first part of the puzzle when setting up sites is to create your subnets. Subnets enable computers to determine in which site they're located. A small sidebar here. Remember that domain controllers are placed within a site if you've decided to create sites. So they are configured into a particular location based on a determination that you make during the installation or, or some point thereafter when you decide to perhaps move a computer to a different site. But 
typically member servers and workstations determined based on the subnet that they have an association with and that's based on their IP. So in the graphic you can see here that the subnet with the prefix of 172.16.0.0 slash 16, that's using the um, CIDR or VLSM notation, something we'll talk about later, is in the London site or is associated with the London site. Generally speaking, of course, you might have multiple subnets linked to a single site and typically not the other way around because a subnet possibly contains, I don't know, 50 or 60 hosts, perhaps, maybe not even as many as that. And a, and a given building might contain many dozens of different subnets, all part of the same um, network. So that creates a many to one relationship. It enables computers to locate adjacent services that they, they know their own IP, they know the subnet of which that IP or to which that IP belongs, and from that they can make a determination about what site they belong to, and then based on an Active Directory query they can determine where the nearest uh, domain controller is, or they can make a determination about um, uh, printers that are in the next room along based on uh, um, a configuration information that the printer administrator has defined within Active Directory. In the demonstration, I'm going to show you how to create Active Directory sites and subnets and then review the associated DNS serve records. To create uh, sites and subnets, you can do this, you can do it through PowerShell, but I'm going to use it through Active or do complete the task through Active Directory sites and services. So if I expand out the list of sites, you can see a couple of subfolders, intersite transports, which we'll talk about shortly, subnets, and then a list of sites. Now, the initially, the first site, um, which is always created when you create your first domain controller in the forest, is called default first site name, as you can see here. You can change the name of that if you want to, and I'm going to start by doing that. Um, so I'm going to change that to London. Now that will take a little bit of a while for that to percolate through the organization. As it happens, I've only got a couple of domain controllers, so that change shouldn't take terribly long. But if you had an extended network encompassing many locations, it might take a bit of a time for that to percolate through. So having allowed for that, then you can go on to create additional sites. If you create a new site, you must associate it with a default with a link, a, a site link. The, the default link is called default IP site link, as you can see here. Now you can change those site links, you can create your own, and you can specify a particular transport for them. But initially, and probably mostly thereafter, you could probably rely on the built-in default IP site link object. So I'm going to create a new site called New York. and select OK. And now I've got two sites, one called New York and one called London, both of which are linked together using a replication topology, which is automatically generated. There's nothing really for me to do with that unless I particularly want to. To handle different computers, I now need to create subnet objects. So I'm going to create a new subnet and I'm going to use the CIDR notation, which means specifying the number of bits in the subnet mask rather than a mask. And then I can associate that with one site. So I'm going to associate that with London. And then perhaps I'll want to create several additional subnets for London. That's quite usual. Um, but I might also want to create new subnets for the office location in New York. So using the same notation and select New York and then select OK. So having created the necessary subnet objects and site objects in Active Directory Sites and Services, we can take a look at the effect of that by selecting DNS, which is of course the service that's used to locate services. So expand out forward lookup zones and expand out contoso.com and there are a list of sites. And if we select London, for example, and expand out the TCP node, we can see that there are two domain controllers, contosodc.contoso.com and contososvr1.contoso.com, both of which are part of the London uh, site. The default first site name still appears there as a legacy. That will disappear in due course after replication has occurred between the various domain controllers. In the demonstration, you learned how to create Active Directory sites and how to review the corresponding DNS serve records. It's important you understand how Active Directory replication works. Intrasite replication is the process of replicating between domain controllers that are part of the same geographic location. The expectation is that they are connected 
maybe in different subnets, but certainly in the same high speed network with low latency connections between one another. This is largely automatic and you generally don't need to exert any control over the process, although if you want, you can. Intersite replication is the replication between different sites. Again, generally these days, we probably have fairly high speed connections between our geographic locations and those connections are generally pretty low latency. So in those circumstances, you don't again need to perform any kind of special configuration based on the fact that you're replicating between geographic locations. But if you want to, you can. And it's more likely with intersite replication that you'll want to exert manual control than you will with intra or in within a site replication. The knowledge consistency checker is responsible for determining a replication topology, be that within or without a particular collection of sites. You can force the knowledge consistency checker to update on a manual basis just to see if something's recently changed. You can then run the knowledge consistency checker to realize there's been a change, or you can just leave it to run in the background as and when it's required. Site links are created automatically between different sites to manage replication between those sites. But you can reconfigure that if you want to by configuring a schedule or particular timings when a replication is permitted. So out of office hours, for example, otherwise every three hours. And you can use that as a way of controlling the bandwidth that's used over your site link between your different sites. Once again, with today's high speed, low latency networks, that's maybe not such a consideration as it once was. Site link bridges, that's an Active Directory object that represents a set of site links. All of whose sites can communicate using a particular transport. There are two transports, IP, which is the default, and SMTP. Site link bridges enable your domain controllers, if they're not directly connected to one another, to replicate with each other. So typically a site link bridge corresponds to a router or maybe a set of routers on an IP network. For most situations, you probably aren't going to need to worry about site link bridges. Site links automatically created are usually sufficient. As you might remember, Active Directory consists of a number of partitions. There's the configuration partition and the schema partition. Neither of these change very frequently. In fact, hardly at all once you've set up your Active Directory environment. All domain controllers maintain a read-only copy of both the schema and configuration partitions. One domain controller, the one which holds the schema master and the domain naming master roles, will handle changes to the schema and configuration partitions. That's generally the same domain controller, but as you know, it, it needn't be. That's not going to consume a lot of bandwidth on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of replication. But when you're adding an additional service like Exchange Server or something to your environment, that could generate a lot of changes to the schema. And there may be a bit of schema replication as a consequence. The domain partition is where most day-to-day -day activity takes place, adding users, modifying group memberships, moving computers around or changing their properties, all of which generates changes to the domain partition, all of which needs to be replicated amongst all the domain controllers in a specific domain. You can create application partitions to support a particular directory aware application, and you can then control to which domain controllers that application partition replicates. You can manage replication with the sites and services snap-in. Using this snap-in, you can configure sites and subnets, you can check the replication topology, and you can replicate to and from selected domain controllers. In addition, you can enable the global catalog setting for a server or domain controller rather that you chose not to initially during the creation of that domain controller. Finally, you can configure the replication schedule. You can also use the repadmin command line tool to manage replication. The following table details some of the options that you might want to use. So for example, repadmin slash repl summary will display information about the current replication status, whereas repadmin slash show repl displays specific inbound replication traffic. In the demonstration, I'll review intersite replication and review replication options. So on my domain controller, I'm going to open up the sites and services tool and I've created a, a number of sites, London and New York, and I have moved my domain controllers into those sites. At the top here, under Intersite Transports, we've got the two options, IP and SMTP, which can be used to send messages, replication messages between sites. SMTP, the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, is not widely used now. It was typically used some years back when you had intermittent or non-persistent connections between sites. 
as a way of using a messaging system to route replication traffic. IP is the default transport, and by default, we've got a default IP site link to which all of our sites are automatically linked. If I look at the properties of that, I can change the cost and the interval and the schedule. The defaults are every three hours, and the schedule at the moment is replication is available 24-7. Now I can change that and normally I wouldn't need to these days with high speed, low latency links, but where I do have intermittent connectivity or unreliable or slow connectivity, I might want to change that so that the schedule is that replication only occurs out of office hours or less frequently than every three hours. Or conversely, I might want to make replication more up to date by changing that value, reducing the replicate every value. If I take a look at a particular domain controller and expand out its properties, we can see on the right hand side an automatically generated connection to the other domain controller and there is a reciprocal connector under Contoso SVR1 here. Let's select that and there's an automatically generated connection back to Contoso DC. So the, the, the topology generator has created these connections and again there's no real reason why you'd need to change those unless you had a particularly complex routing environment. So I'm going to right click one of these and I can choose to replicate now, which is a way of forcing replication between the domain controllers if there are changes that need to be propagated more quickly. I can also have a look at the properties of the NTDS settings object and I can check the replication topology by selecting check replication topology off the context menu. That forces the knowledge consistency checker to, if necessary, rebuild the automatically generated links between the various domain controllers. In the demonstration, we reviewed intersite replication and replication options. There are a number of different types of object that you'll need to be able to manage in Active Directory. The first of these is probably user accounts, or to give them their correct name, domain users. You have um, a fairly small number of properties you can configure with local user accounts, but domain user accounts give you a lot more scope for managing the properties. There are many properties or attributes of Active Directory domain user accounts. You can manage your users by using the Active Directory Users and Computers tool, by using Windows PowerShell with the Active Directory module, or by using Active Directory Administrative Center, all of which we'll cover in the demonstration shortly. Active Directory groups are quite interesting. There are a number of different group scopes and group types. Scopes include domain local, global, and universal. A domain local group is exactly what it says. The scope or the range of the abilities is limited to the local domain. So a member of a group, which is a domain local group, can only have permissions or rights and privileges on resources which are held within the domain where that group exists. A global group, by contrast, can potentially have permissions and capabilities, rights and privileges, in other words, on resources anywhere in the forest, including in the domain where this group resides. Likewise, a universal group also has that forest-wide capability or forest-wide permission potential. Now, there are some differences between global and universal groups, and we'll talk about those in a moment. There are two types of group. The Security group is the default type that you'll normally use on a day-to-day -day basis. Security groups or, or groups of the type security are able to be granted permissions and rights to perform management tasks or to access resources. Whereas distribution groups only exist for the purposes of working with an email system for distribution. In other words, a distribution list. So if you create a group of type distribution, you can't assign it permissions and nor will it ever appear in an access control list for say a file or a folder on which you're granting permissions. Whereas a security group can be added to an access control list thereby granting permissions and capabilities for users through group membership. The additional consideration for security groups is that although they're primarily for security, they can also be used for distribution purposes. So if you're unsure which type of group to create, use security. Uh, if you change your mind later, you can change a security group to a distribution group, but any permissions that have been assigned to the security group whilst it was a security group would be lost. You can also change a distribution group to a security group. There's no considerations really there. You'll then be able to start to add permissions to that retyped group. Domain local groups can contain members from anywhere in the forest, but as I said earlier, they only have localized permissions and abilities. 
you tend to create local groups and give them names that are descriptive of what it is that they can do or what it is that they can access. So for example, there are some built-in local groups, administrators, users, guests, server operators. So they're all fairly descriptive of, of what level of access they have or what type of permissions they enjoy. Global groups can contain members only from the domain where they reside, but they can be assigned permissions and abilities anywhere in the forest. Global groups tend to be named after the users that belong to them. So, for example, sales, marketing, research. So descriptive, in other words, of the department to which those users also belong. Universal groups can contain members from anywhere in the forest and can be assigned permissions and abilities anywhere in the forest. So if you like, that's a sort of superset of domain, local and global groups. So the ability to contain members from anywhere, but also to have permissions and, and, and abilities anywhere in the forest. Now, when I first moved to supporting Active Directory, I found it a bit confusing that there would be these different scopes, particularly when you start to consider things like group nesting. The purpose of group nesting is to enable you to group groups within other groups. So in a single domain network, you could theoretically use only one scope of group. If you think about it, since um, domain local groups can only contain or only have access to resources in this domain, but can contain members from anywhere, if you've only got a single domain, then that anywhere doesn't really mean very much because in essence, a local group can contain members from this domain and can have access to resources in this domain. And if that's your only domain, then there's really no difference between that and a global group or indeed a universal group in all of those situations. The membership is restricted because you only have one domain and the scope is restricted because you only have one domain. So in those scenarios, you can choose universal groups, local groups, global groups. It really probably doesn't make a lot of difference. However, in multi-domain networks, you can benefit from nesting groups. So, for example, you might choose to add your user accounts, that's the A in this abbreviation, to global groups, which are descriptive of the users that belong to them. So probably named after departments. So adding a user account to the sales global group, for example. And then you would add the sales global group to a domain local group, perhaps called sales reports, which has permissions on the sales reports folder. So AGDLP is the strategy. If you've got multiple domains, then I mean a great number of domains, then it can be beneficial sometimes to group global groups in universal groups and then group those in domain local groups. Remember that the domain local groups are limited to having permissions and rights on resources in the domain where they exist and therefore those are the types of group that you assign permissions to. And then it's a question of whether you need three tiers of group or two tiers of group as to whether you go down the AGDLP strategy or AGU DLP. In the demonstration, I'm going to show you how to create organizational units as a way of structuring your users and groups, how to create and manage users, and how to create and manage groups. So the tool that you choose to use to manage your users, groups, and organizational unit units is entirely dependent on your personal preference. Probably the Active Directory Administrative Center is a good place to start. You can select that from the Tools menu in Server Manager. And by using this tool, you can create pretty much any type of object. There are also some capabilities provided here, such as dynamic access control and managing the AD recycle bin, which we'll talk about later, that are not accessible through some of the other tools. Performing fairly simplistic tasks, you can navigate to find a particular organizational unit, and then you can review the objects within that organizational unit. You can then go on to create a new organizational unit beneath the domain or beneath a particular OU, depending on what you want to do. So we want to call this IT computers. And if you want, you can specify some managed capabilities in here, specify who manages it, whatever you want to do, and then otherwise click OK. So I've now created a child OU, IT computers, beneath the IT OU within the Contoso domain. I can then go on to create objects within that if I want to, such as um, computers. We'll talk about adding computers to domains shortly. If I want to add an, a user account to an OU, again using the administrative center, I can select new and then choose user and then specify the properties. I'll, I'll enter my own name here. 
It's important that you specify a unique user principal name. That's the UPN abbreviation there. That's a name that looks a little bit like an email address. You have to choose a suffix, in this case, contoso.com, and then specify the prefix, which might be a variation on the user's name that yields up a unique identity. When you do that, it also generates what's called a down-level sign-in name. In this case, that's the domain name in its uh, NetBIOS format, uh, Contoso, so it loses the suffix and then uses the same UPN prefix to create Contoso slash Warren AJ. And that's possibly the form of user ID that your users might typically use when signing into their domain join computers. It's a good idea to specify a password. And then you might want to go on to define other properties such as organizational details, job role, department, company. You might also take the opportunity to add the user to a group and to define password settings. So authentication policy, if there is one, and the authentication policy silo. You may also want to go on to define profile settings so that you can define a roaming profile and a logon script for the user. Although these days that's normally handled using group policy and folder redirection settings within a group policy. And when you're ready on the account page, you can select any other final details and then click OK to create the user account. When you create a group, you start off by specifying whether it's going to be security or distribution and whether it's going to be domain local, global or universal. As I said, generally you use domain local groups to assign permissions and then global groups to consolidate users into a collective that in turn belong to the appropriate local group. In a single domain environment, remember it's not necessary for you to use multiple tiers of group, but that may well still be a good strategy in case you add additional domains along the way and then you can adhere to an existing standard rather than change the way that you've done things. Um, so I'm going to create a group called, um, I don't know, IT managers. I don't know if that exists already. Let's see how we go. And uh, then I'm going to select uh, click OK here. I, I can add members here or define it as a member of another group if I want to. So here we can see that I'm, I can choose the option here to add a user account. If I, if I type Warren, which is part of a name, and then select check names, it will select the user for me. And then when I'm happy, I can select OK, and that will create uh, the group. Later, depending on what I've done, I can change the properties of that group. So I can change it to a distribution. So it tells me if, you, if you're doing this, that's fine, but you'll lose any access because a uh, distribution group can't have permissions. And you can also change the scope, but that's a little bit more complicated because the rules around who can belong to a global, universal, domain, local group and what permissions you can have and where can make that somewhat of a convoluted operation. So um, we're not going to cover that right now, but, but it is possible in certain circumstances. It's unlikely to be a thing on the test, so we won't worry about it too much. So I'm going to click OK there, having made no other changes. So in addition to using the Active Directory Administrative Center, I can also use Active Directory Users and Computers. And there's my IT OU and there's my IT Computers OU that I just created. And uh, yeah, I can create objects in here. This is a slightly more simplistic interface and it's not as configurable. So uh, again, I'm going to add, um, oh, I don't know, just a standard account. Sales Manager is not a very good username, <laughs> but for, for our purposes, that would be fine. Like that and then select next, enter a password, and then I can select these options for user cannot change password or password never expires, or that user must change at logon. Some of these are mutually exclusive, and then select next. And as you can see, that's pretty much it. I'm not prompted to do anything more in the wizard, so that's fine, but it necessarily means that I'd have to come back in and specify additional properties, which I can fairly easily do, but it's not a convenience. I think Active Directory Administrative Center gives you more capabilities at the outset. I'm just going to delete that user account because it's a fairly meaningless name. And the other way in which you can manage uh, objects, user or group objects, is to use PowerShell. So if I do a get ad user filter star and then output as a table, for example, that will retrieve all of my user accounts and display them in a table. I can be specific about the things that I want to know if I want to know anything. So I can say, I don't know, name and then object class, for example. And I can obviously do more than just retrieve. I can also uh, create new Active Directory user objects. So new AD user, or I can change the properties of a user object and or likewise a group. And if you're unsure about working with, with PowerShell, that's fine. You can use the Active Directory Administrative Center. So let's go back to it. 
And when you perform a management task, like adding a user or group account, down the bottom you've got Windows PowerShell History, and that will show you a summary of the task that you just performed. So let's, um, let's modify a user, change its properties, and let's give them a middle name, and maybe put them into the IT department and the company Contoso, and then select OK to that. And you can see down the bottom here, the commands that were actually used to perform that task in PowerShell are set AD user, and that tells you the properties that I changed, and then rename AD object, and the properties that I changed. Likewise, were I to create an object, be it a, a user account or a group account or an organizational unit, whatever it is, that would also be detailed down here. And then there's nothing stopping me from copying that information into a text file and then working on it and taking the general, uh, sorry, the specific details and, and generalizing those. It's even possible, of course, to, as you can do with any PowerShell type command, is read in content from a, a text file. So if you wanted, you could use a CSV file as the basis for creating these sorts of objects using the, either the Active Directory Administrative Center, but also by using PowerShell. In the demonstration, you learned how to manage organizational units how to manage users, and how to manage groups. Service accounts are configured to work with services and interact with the operating system. By default, there are a number of different types of service account. The local system, the local service, and the network service. A group managed service account is a service account that's managed by the domain. If you want to use group managed service accounts, and the primary benefit of using them is that the password changes can be managed. So sidebar here, if you specify a particular user account to use as, a, as an account related to a service, as shown in the graphic here, so a particular service might need an association with a specific user account. If the user account is a regular user account, then when you change the password, as you have to based on a password policy, then it doesn't update the password definition or the storage of the password on the logon tab for the account which is related to a specific service on a specific computer, which re results in a failure for that service to start because it's got the old password stored on the logon tab or defined on the logon tab. So unless you remember that you've changed the password for a service account and then you go to every instance of that service account in use and modify the password, on the logon tab of a particular service, then you might experience some problems. And that's the point of a group managed service account. To create one, you have to create a, a key distribution services root key, which you can do using PowerShell, running the add KDS root key commandlet. Then you need to create the appropriate user accounts, in this case, new AD service account commandlet, and then specify the name of the service account. And then finally, you need to install the account on a specific server. And for that, use the install AD service account and then specify its identity. Uh, and then that will be uh, active on that particular computer. The Active Directory Recycle Bin is a very useful feature which you can enable through the Active Directory Administrative Center. Once you've enabled it, it can't be disabled. So it's a one-time operation. The reason you'd want to do this is because if you delete an object, whether it's a, a user or a group or um, an organizational unit or other objects, you can recover them by just going to the recycle bin and recovering them, like you can recover a file from the recycle bin on your desktop. It's the same sort of process. An authoritative restore is a way of, of recovering an object that's been deleted for whatever reason, and you've changed your mind about that deletion. So it might be that another administrator makes a mistake and deletes the wrong object. Now, if you've got the AD recycle bin, enabled, then that's fine. You can just recover the object from the AD recycle bin. But if you haven't, then you're going to need to perform an authoritative restore. Also, if the object you want to restore was deleted before you enabled the recycle bin, then and you've enabled it now, then that's not providing a recovery for you. I suppose the final instance or the final situation in which you might need to perform an authoritative restore is that you've got an object which is, has been deleted for longer than the tombstone lifetime of the Active Directory database. Now, in any of those circumstances, you'll need to perform an authoritative restore, which means that when you restore the Active Directory database, you mark it as being the latest version. 
None of this really particularly matters if you've only got one domain controller. If you perform a restore of the Active Directory, then that's the version that you'll go on to use. But if you've got multiple Active Directory domain controllers, if you delete an object, that deletion is replicated to all the other domain controllers. If you recover the object, then it has an older timestamp, amongst other characteristics, than the fact that it's been deleted. And therefore, the other remaining domain controller that knows of the deletion will re-delete the object. Uh, it will, in other words, it replicates the fact the object's been deleted. The only way to bypass that is to perform an authoritative restore, which marks that object as being well, has a very high instance number, so that it can overwrite the instance to, or the instruction to delete the object. Before you can sign in at any computer using a domain account, that computer must be joined to the Active Directory domain where you want to sign in. Alternatively, if you want to sign in to an Azure AD domain services domain, which is a managed service in Azure, something we'll talk about later, or you want to sign in to Azure AD, which is a, a cloud identity solution provided by Microsoft, and again, we'll talk about that later, then your computer will need to be joined to one of those environments. By so joining, you are then able to use the domain identities on the local machine. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to join a Windows Server computer to an on-prem ADDS environment, and also how to enable Azure AD sign-in on Azure Infrastructure as a Service VM that's running Windows Server. So let's start off by verifying which computers we have already in our domain environment. I'm just gonna select Get AD Computer and then filter for all computers. And I'm going to format the output as a table and I'm just going to ask for the computer name. So you can see I've got um, five computers, Contoso DC, Serve 1, Serve 2, Serve 3 and Contoso CL1. So we'll come back and run that command again in a moment. In the meantime, I'm going to switch to my member server and I'm going to add it to the domain. So before I can join a domain, I'm going to need to make sure I've got connectivity to the domain. So I need to verify my IP configuration. So that's looking pretty encouraging. I should be able to therefore resolve names. I'm using DNS server 172.16.0.10, which is um, on my local network. And I could do this through settings, going to system and then choosing about. And then I can um, select the option to choose advanced system settings. And then on the computer name tab, I can select change, enter or select domain and then enter the domain name and then select OK. I'm going to need to have permissions to, to add the computer to uh, the domain and actually standard users can do that but I'll also need administrative permissions on, on this server. So generally I'm going to probably want to have signed in as a local admin on this computer and I'll need at least standard user permissions in the domain although most organizations tend to be a bit more restrictive about which user accounts can add service to a domain. I'm going to choose the administrator account because I know that's sufficient, it's more than I need and select uh, OK. Close that out of the way. It tells me welcome to the contos.com domain and I now need to restart my computer for that to be effective. So I can now choose other user and enter Contoso slash whatever user I want to sign in with, bearing in mind this is a server, and signing in for the first time so it'll create my desktop. And that will have made some modifications to the local security accounts database, which I'm just going to review. So I'll wait for server manager to start, if it does. Okay, I'm going to go to Windows Admin Tools here. Oh, there's server manager. It's because it's booting, it's a bit slow. So we'll just wait for server manager. And so uh, what I want to do is I want to review the local account database. So I'm going to, actually I'll do that through computer management if I open up computer management here and select local users and computers and look at groups. And if I select the local administrators group, that's on this computer, you can see that it's been modified to contain the Contoso domain admins group. So group nesting is automatically configured so that anybody that's an administrator or a member of domain admins in the Contoso domain is also an administrator of this local computer. So that's the sorts of changes that are made. 
Now, if I've switched as I have here to my um, domain controller, go back to the PowerShell window I had earlier on and run the same command, we should see that there's an additional server now that's been added. And if if we wanted to review that in Active Directory users and computers, we could also do so. It will be listed under the computers folder, but that's a built-in folder by default, uh, although I can now move it to whichever is the appropriate OU. So let's have a look at how you can enable Azure AD sign-in on a Windows Server virtual machine running in Azure. I'm just going to minimize this local virtual machine and I switch to um, Microsoft Edge and I've got a connection to a demonstration tenant. So I'm going to create a virtual machine here in Azure. I'm using the graphical console, but you can do this in a number of different ways and we'll review that later on in the course. So as with everything in Azure, you normally want to choose a resource group to place your objects in. I'm going to use my Contoso resource group in my Contoso demo subscription. I'm going to call the virtual machine Contoso VM6. I'm going to store it in the UK South region. For my purposes, I'm not going to specify any infrastructure redundancy or anything. I'm going to choose an image. In this case, I'm going to choose Windows Server 2022 Data Center Gen 2. I need to size the VM, and again, we will be talking about this later. And I'm also going to create a user account for signing in here. Optionally, I might want to allow selected ports to be opened on this virtual machine for management purposes, and again, that's something we'll discuss later. If I wanted to go into configuring disks and so forth, I could do so, again, for another time. On the networking uh, page, I might want to specify a particular virtual network and subnet the device was connected to, and again, something we'll look at later. But for our purposes, on the management page, I can specify whether or not I'm going to allow uh, um, someone to sign in using an Azure AD account. So I just check the box on the management tab, log on with Azure AD, and then continue to com create the, um, the virtual machine. So I'll review and create that. And then select create to create the virtual machine. So in the demonstration, you learned how to join a Windows Server computer to ADDS and how to enable Azure AD sign-in on an Azure virtual machine running Windows Server. This is lesson two, implement and manage hybrid identities. In this lesson, you'll learn about implementing Azure AD Connect, creating and managing ADDS users and groups, implementing group managed service accounts, joining Windows Service to ADDS, to Azure AD Domain Services and to Azure AD, managing account policies in ADDS and Azure AD. The hands-on sessions include sync on-premise ADDS with Azure AD, create a password settings object, configure Azure AD self-service password reset, and create a conditional access policy in Azure AD. Part of your role as a Windows Server administrator in a hybrid environment is to choose and manage an appropriate directory service. In an on-premise environment, you're most likely to be using Active Directory Domain Services or ADDS. We discussed that in an earlier lesson. To support cloud services like Microsoft 365 and Azure, Dynamics, Salesforce and potentially third-party apps, you'll likely use Azure Active Directory or Azure AD. If you want the benefits of the platform as a service solution, you can implement Azure AD Domain Services. This closely resembles ADDS, but it runs in Azure as a platform as a service solution. ADDS is hierarchical and granular. By hierarchical, I mean that you can create a collection of domains in a parent-child relationship or in separate trees within the same forest. You can even create multiple forests and link them together with trust relationships. In terms of granular, you have the ability to be very specific about, for example, the permissions that you can assign on objects down to the attribute level. There are many different types of objects with dozens, perhaps hundreds or even thousands of attributes that can be configured. All of this is defined within the schema, which is configurable to your particular requirements. It provides a great deal of configurable security based on group membership. So if you create a, a group and assign it privileges, any members of that group will gain access to those resources based on those permissions, on those privileges that you've assigned. Administration is handled by group policy. 
Group policy provides a, a centralized means for you to configure settings for both users and computers. These settings are stored in group policy objects which are linked to containers such as organizational units and domains. This ensures that any object which is in a given domain or part of a particular OU is configured with those particular settings. Authentication is handled by the Kerberos protocol in ADDS. This is a widely implemented protocol, particularly in Unix environments, and when Active Directory was added to Windows Server back in 2000, it was the predominant standard for, for non-Microsoft environments. So it made a lot of sense to implement this particular protocol. It's less useful to support cloud apps. Azure AD. Azure AD is flat and less fine-grained. So in other words, you have less control over objects in, in the same way that you do in ADDS. It's flat. In, in other words, there's no hierarchy. You just have a collection of user, device, and group objects within a flat environment. That's not necessarily a disadvantage, but it lacks the structure of ADDS. Security is based on role-based access control. In some ways, conceptually, this might appear similar to groups. In an Active Directory environment, you'll typically add a user to the administrator's group to give that user administrative capability, since the administrator's built-in group has been granted a large number of permissions and rights. However, in Azure AD, you use role-based access control, so you can define roles within your environment that determine the privilege that you have on a particular scope of resources. So that might be to do with managing servers, or it might be to do with managing user objects, or, or whatever it might be. And then you can assign a group to that particular role, and then add users to that particular group. And through that relationship through that established relationship you can determine a level of management capability over a range of, of resources. Administration is managed with profiles and group assignments. Azure AD relies on the security assertion markup language and open authorization. These are two internet based standards for authentication and authorization systems. However, Azure AD does not support group policies or Kerberos so you can't use it to provide for authentication for your on-premise workloads or on-premise users. You can synchronize Azure AD with your on-prem ADDS environment by using a feature called Azure AD Connect. You install this feature on a member server in your on-prem environment and you configure the necessary settings to enable synchronization between the on-prem and the cloud. That synchronization can be configured in a number of different ways. It can be one way, it can be both ways, it can support device synchronization to enable hybrid devices. There are a range of options. By using Azure AD and synchronizing with Azure AD Connect, you can enable single sign-on. This provides access to cloud-based applications such as Microsoft 365. So your on-prem users can sign in with a single account and depending on the synchronization settings that you've configured, that will give them access to on-prem resources but also to applications and resources in the cloud. You can enable federation between your different organizations or different elements of your organization. Azure AD is primarily an identity management solution and supports features such as multi-factor authentication. Azure AD comes in a number of different editions. If you take out a, a fairly basic Microsoft 365 subscription, you'll be provided with Azure AD Tenant to provide for authentication and authorization within that particular workload. But you can extend that, or you can choose to, at the outset, take out a premium edition of Azure AD. Premium features include multi-factor authentication, Microsoft Identity Manager, self-service password reset with writeback, Azure AD Connect Health, and for the P2 edition, identity protection, and privileged identity management. The third option is Azure AD Domain Services. Now this is a, a curious option. It provides a directory service which is very similar to ADDS in an on-prem environment, but it runs wholly in the cloud, specifically in Azure as a platform as a service offering. So it has a, a charge attached to it, so you, you subscribe to this particular service. But it gives you the capability of being able to continue to support your directory aware applications, but using a cloud service without the need to maintain servers or domain controllers. So it's a managed service that mirrors ADDS behavior, but runs in the cloud. It provides support for group policy objects, unlike Azure AD. It supports LDAP and Kerberos, again, like your on-prem environment, but not like Azure AD. 
It supports your directory-aware applications. It provides support for adding computers to the domain. Typically, those might be infrastructure as a service virtual machines running Windows Server that you add to your Azure AD domain services domain, much as you might add a server to your on-prem domain. It doesn't require virtual machines to be deployed as domain controllers. That's a slightly older approach where you'd implement a virtual machine, install Windows on it, add the ADDS role and promote it as a domain controller. And although you can still do that to integrate Azure with your on-prem environment, so effectively to extend your Active Directory forest into the cloud, that's an IaaS approach. This is a platform as a service approach. You can also synchronize Azure AD domain services with Azure AD Connect to your Azure AD environment. I'm going to take a quick look at ADDS and compare it with Azure AD and Azure AD domain services. So let's start with a quick review of some of the objects in Active Directory domain services. This is a domain controller and just a quick review of creating a user. So under the sales department, for example, to create a new user object, I click select new user to find a name. I'll use my own name here, maybe type it correctly. And then enter a password. And then if I modify the properties of a user object, you can see that there are a range of different properties, address, accounting information, which is to do with the sign-in uh, user principal name and the earlier Windows 2000 compatible sign-in name, which users often use. Profiling information for signing in with um, a roaming profile and, and using a logon script and connecting to a home directory. And then there's addressing and telephone information and organizational details in terms of defining who my manager might be, for example, change this one here, choose Terry and then click OK. So these are the sorts of relationships that you can define when you create a group and we'll call this one, what uh, location are we in here? Oh yes, sales, so we'll call this one sales support. You can choose local um, or domain local, global, universal, security, distribution, which we discussed in the last lesson. OK to that, and then we can add members. And we'll maybe add Terry. And click OK to that. You get the idea. And then when I want to delegate control over the sales organizational unit, that's one of the benefits of ADDS. It's quite granular. I can choose delegate control, and I can grant groups or users, but best practices our groups. So sales support, which contains a member of Terry, select OK, and then next here, and maybe grant Terry indirectly through the group membership, the ability to reset user passwords, for example. So very granular control that I can configure. So now let's contrast that with Azure AD. So I've signed into my Azure Active Directory admin center for my trial Azure AD account, which you can see here is an Azure AD Premium P2 account with the name Contoso Demo. So I'm going to select Azure Active Directory here and I'm going to take a look at a user account very briefly. If I want to add a new user, I can select Create a New User and then I can specify details. So John, John Smith, first name John. Smith, similar sort of process, but different user interface. The suffix here is the name of the tenant. Now I'm not using a custom domain, so I'm using the default name, which is a configurable first part followed by dot on Microsoft.com. Now usually you'd want to change that to match your organizational suffix. So in this case that would be contoso.com, but whatever your organization details were to make it easier for your users to sign in. I can use a specific password for the user account, if I can type it that is. And, and then I can add the user to groups. I can also add the user to roles. We'll talk more about that later. There are a couple of other things I need to do. I need to specify usage location for the user so that I can add a license for the user to do whatever, maybe to use Microsoft 365 or to have some sort of capability in Azure. And then I can optionally specify some job information and so on. So the, the broad approach of, of creating user account is pretty similar, but there are different properties that, that we'll want to define. Okay. So there's some other fictional users I've set up. 
So let's have a look at uh, groups now. When I create a group, I can choose between security and Microsoft 365. Security allows you to assign privilege and permission to members. Microsoft 365, in addition to that, allows you to associate the members of the group with a team for collaboration with Microsoft Teams, for instance. So that you'll use Microsoft 365 when you're working with the Microsoft 365 environment. Otherwise, it will tend to be security. I can choose a membership type of being assigned, so I add the members explicitly, or I can choose a query to yield up a user group based on a dynamic user query, or a dynamic device group based on a, a query that yields up a certain type of device. Very useful when you're doing mobile device management, for example. So a couple of slight differences there. I, I shan't create any groups right now. The other significant issue um, that deals with uh, user security is that of roles, role-based access control. So here we can define roles which have particular capabilities. There are many built-in roles, but you can define custom roles if you want to. And then you can define who has that particular role. Now, it's not quite the same as adding a user to a group called administrators or server operators, but I suppose conceptually it's similar. But rather than creating a group that has permissions and assigning a user to that group, we use one of these built-in roles or where that's not appropriate, we, we create a custom role. Let's contrast all of this to Azure AD Domain Service. So I switch to the Azure portal here. If I want to add a Azure AD Domain Services domain, I search for that. And now I can select it. And then when I'm ready, I can create an Azure AD Domain Services domain. As with most things Azure related, you place them into a resource group. That's not always true, but it's almost always true. You select a subscription here. You then specify the domain name that you want to use. And then you specify the region where that will, will reside. That's essentially it. And then you select review and create. It will need to create a number of networking components. You can see those listed here. So it's going to create a virtual network that will host this service and a subnet in which it will place this service and a network security group that will protect the associated subnet and a, a connected service. It'll take a, a moment to uh, run through the uh, verification. It will create some administrative groups and it will also create some default group policy objects and some containers within the uh, Active Directory environment itself within the domain contosa.com. So you've got some built-in containers and some built-in group policy objects which you can either use or you can decide to create your own. I'm not going to select create here. I've, I've given you an overview of how that would be created. But once it's created, you can add a server to it in the same way as you would add a server ordinarily to an on-prem domain. And thereafter, you can um, configure and manage that domain by using the management tools that you would normally use to manage an on-prem environment. So to all intents and purposes, it behaves very much like an Active Directory domain service environment in your on-prem network. But the key thing here is that there are no domain controllers. It's not an infrastructure as a service deployment. It's a platform as a service. It's managed. So in the demonstration, we compared Active Directory with Azure AD and Azure AD domain services. We've already mentioned Azure AD Connect. It provides a synchronization solution between your on-prem environment and the Azure AD environment in the cloud. So that supports Exchange hybrid deployments, Exchange mail public folders, Azure AD apps and attribute filtering, password synchronization, which is perhaps one of its more important aspects, password write back, which means that a user can change their password in the cloud and that will write back to the on-prem environment. That's quite important because otherwise you'll end up with a, an inconsistency between the two passwords for a, for a synchronized account. Group write back, so if you change group memberships, Device right back, so if you change the properties of devices, which are uh, as you AD joined, and directory extension attribute synchronization. Before you install Azure AD Connect, there are a couple of requirements you should be aware of. First of all, you need Windows Server with desktop experience. This must be a member server, but it I mean, it can be a domain controller, but I'd recommend you use the member server. It must be installed with .NET for Framework 4.5.1 and Microsoft PowerShell 3. And from a security standpoint, You'll need a global administrator in Azure AD to configure Azure AD Connect. You'll need enterprise admins permissions in the on-prem Active Directory Forest for using the Express installation option. And you'll need administrators group member permissions on the computer where you're going to install Azure AD Connect. The connectivity requirements for Azure AD Connect aren't terribly onerous, but let's run through them. 
So you need connectivity to Microsoft Azure service using TCP port 443. You also need a writable domain controller in each domain of the forest that you want to synchronize on the following ports. DNS over TCP UDP port 53. Kerberos over TCP UDP port 88. RPCs or remote procedure calls over TCP port 135. LDAP over TCP UDP port 389 and secure sockets or SSL over TCP port 443. You'll also need to remember to enable SMB server message block on, on TCP 445. Once you've got those prerequisites sorted out, you can then go on to configure as your AD connect. I'm going to show you a short demonstration on this in a minute, but essentially you define the forest to which you're connected at one end and the Azure AD instance at the other end, and then you specify which particular objects you want to synchronize by selecting them. So typically that might be organizational units and other containers, or it might be absolutely everything depending on what you wanted to achieve. There are some optional features that you can enable during the synchronization. Which ones are available depend on the specific details of your configuration, but in this screenshot, for example, you can see both password hash synchronization and password writeback are enabled. For device options, you can run through the wizard a second time and configure that you want to enable hybrid Azure AD join. That's particularly useful if you're doing mobile device management and you've got a lot of domain join devices in your on-prem network that you want to potentially co-manage using Intune. In that circumstance, you can join the specified devices both to your on-prem network and also to Azure AD. Once you've got the service up and running, you'll need to monitor it and you can use the Azure AD Connect Sync tool to check out the status of synchronization. And there's also elements within the Azure AD portal that allow you to check the reciprocal end. So for example, here, as you can see, you can check on Azure AD Connect Health, that's a premium feature, but you can verify what's going on and you can look at sync errors and, and check on the status of sync services and so on. During the configuration of Azure AD Connect, you can also choose the sign-on method for your users. You can select between password hash synchronization, pass-through authentication. You can choose federation with ADFS or federation with ping federate, or you can choose not to configure it and come back later. You can also select the option for enabling single sign-on. It's possible to configure Azure AD domain services so that an account that you create in an on-prem domain will synchronize through Azure AD Connect to Azure AD. You can then configure the appropriate hash synchronization so that that account in turn can be used to sign in to an Azure AD domain services joined virtual machine running Windows Server. In the demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can sync your on-prem ADDS with Azure AD. Okay, so here I am on my domain controller. Um, as I said, it's best to install Azure AD Connect on a member server, but this is a test environment, so I've got a limited number of VMs. It's perfectly functional, but maybe not optimal. So I'm going to load the Azure AD Connect tool here. Now this has already been configured, so I'm just going to roll through some of the settings with you. I select configure here. I can view or export the current configuration. I can customize the synchronization options. I can configure device options and various other things. Let's run through customizing synchronization options. I need to specify the password for my global admin account. And that's in the Azure end of things, or rather the Azure AD end of things. Then I'll specify the directory type at this end on the on-prem end as being Active Directory and specify the forest. I've already done this, but typically you'd add the directory. And then here I can choose which particular containers I want to synchronize. I can choose to synchronize all domains and OUs, or I can be specific about it. So uh, I can enable the synchronization of the Azure AD computers um, organizational unit. I can choose to synchronize development, whatever I want. I can include the built-in containers as well, if that's appropriate to my particular scenario. So I'm just going to expand out sales uh, computers. I can see here I've got a, a sub-OU here, which contains, I'm guessing, computers for the sales department. And once I'm happy with the selections, I can click Next. And then I can choose the way in which I'm going to manage my passwords. So I'm going to do password right back here. That will then go off and make some configuration changes. I actually haven't changed anything, so I'm not expecting it to do very much. And then I can click configure and it will then start the synchronization process once it's made the necessary changes. At this point, I'm just going to deselect that and step back. 
Device options I can also select from here. And I can configure hybrid as your AD join. Once again, I need to authenticate by entering the credentials for my uh, cloud account. And then I can configure or select configure hybrid as your AD join and then specify the operating systems that are being used and complete the process. And that will enable me to synchronize any computer accounts which are already in a synchronized OU so that they will be automatically Azure AD joined. So I'm going to quit out from this now. I can use the synchronization utility here just to check on the status of the synchronization service. And you can see that there's been some activity recently. And next I'm going to switch to the Azure AD console and look at the reciprocal end. So I've opened up Microsoft Edge and navigated to the Azure AD portal. This again is my trial tenant. If I select Azure Active Directory and then scroll down the navigation pane here, I could, should be able to select, uh, there we are, Azure AD Connect. And we can see that it's last synchronized less than an hour ago, so things are looking pretty good there. If I suspected or there were indeed indi indications of any problems, I could scroll down and select Health and Analytics and look at Azure AD Connect Health and review the information about synchronization errors. For example, there are none. Everything's working as it should do. And whilst we're here, let's take a look at what a user, a synchronized user, looks like. So if I select Users, I can see whether or not something is synchronized because it's indicated as such being on-prem sync, sync enabled. So for example, Sergio here is a synchronized user. Adline Snyder also a synchronized user, whereas Alex Wilbur is a, is a native cloud account. So any modifications I make to Alex won't be written back to the directory service in, in on-prem because he's not synchronized. Whereas any changes I make to Adline Snyder at either end will be synchronized. Let's have a quick look at devices whilst we're here. And again, if I select that from the navigation pane and look at all devices, I should see a hybrid joined device. And there we are, Contoso CL1 is indicated as being hybrid as your AD joined. I can see that it's running Windows 10 because it has a version number of 10.0.1 something. So that's a Windows 10 device. It also tells me, of course, that it's it's called um, it's called Windows. So we've got the operating system type of Windows. I can scroll over and find out other information, but at the moment this device is not co-managed. It's simply Azure AD joined and that's been synchronized by Azure AD Connect. In the demonstration, you learned how to sync on-premises ADDS with Azure AD. In Active Directory, or rather more accurately, in an on-prem ADDS environment, you can configure an account policy. The account policy consists of a password policy, which deals with things like password history, password age, minimum password length, password complexity requirements, and so on. It also deals with the account lockout policy, so how long an account is locked out after a number of bad password attempts, and whether or not that's an automatic reset, or whether an administrator must intervene to reset the locked account. Finally, it also includes the Kerberos policy, this is not something you'd normally want to configure, but essentially it deals with ticket granting tickets and session tickets. These are the things that are generated when a user or computer signs into a domain. The ticket granting ticket has a certain lifetime. That's known as a service ticket here. It's 600 minutes. That will therefore need to be renewed if the computer stays online beyond 600 minutes. There's generally no real reason to want to change any of the Kerberos policy settings, but the password policy and account lockout policy certainly do bear closer inspection. You can create a password settings object, which you can then use to apply specific password policies and lockout policies to either individuals or to groups. This is a very useful feature because the group policy configured account policies cannot be defined at lower level organizational units. They are only defined on the domain through the use of the domain security policy. So if you want to have different complexity rules for administrator users or for the sales department, the only way to do that is to create a password settings object. And you can do that either using Windows PowerShell or more easily perhaps by using the Active Directory Administrative Center, which you can see displayed on this slide. So in this instance, I've got a name, IT admins and a precedence of one. Precedence becomes important where you have multiple password settings objects that apply to a specific user, either directly or through a group membership. 
it makes a determination about which particular policy should be used. The lower numerical value wins. You can then go on to specify password complexity and history and minimum um, password length and so forth, as you can in the domain security policy that we just reviewed. Uh, in addition, you can define account lockout status and, and, and whether or not the account is locked out and is unlocked automatically, or whether, again, an administrator is required to unlock. All of those se same settings. There's nothing to do with Kerberos in here, but the other two elements, the password policy and the account lockout policy, are, are both defined. You then go on to add a particular user, or, or better yet, a group, to assign this collection of settings to. So in this circumstance, then, members of the domain admins group will have potentially different password settings and account lockout settings than everybody else within the domain because they're all being configured using the default security policy for the domain. You can determine password settings by opening up the Active Directory Administrative Center, selecting a particular user and then view the resultant password settings and you can then determine where those are coming from. Are they coming from the default policy or are they coming from a password settings object? In Azure AD, you also have an ability to configure password protection settings. So you can select that by navigating through to your domain, selecting security, then selecting authentication methods. On the password protection tab, you can configure the custom smart lockout settings for lockout threshold, lockout duration. You can configure custom banned passwords. I mean, it's often the case that users will tend to choose simple to remember passwords. So you can define a custom list. If you don't choose a custom list, then Azure will automatically try to block well-known passwords. So obviously typing something like password would generate a message that says to the user, you're not able to do that. That's a very commonly used password. But if you have a particular list that you'd prefer to use, then you can configure that. You can also configure password protection for Windows Server Active Directory, and then you can specify that you're going to enable password protection on Windows Server Active Directory, and you can enable that either in audit or enforced mode. One of the very useful things that you can configure in Azure AD is self-service password reset. So with this capability, you can define which users can use this feature, either it's none or everybody, or you can select specific groups of which users must be a member. And if a user has the capability, they can then go on to reconfigure or change their password. When they change their password, they must use a number of authentication methods. On this screenshot here, you can see that they must use two authentication methods to identify themselves. So because it's a sensitive activity that we're performing, a, a password reset, we need to be sure that the user who's performing that is in fact the user is identified by that account and not some malicious person. So by using these additional methods for identifying themselves, what you might refer to as, I suppose, multi-factor authentication, we can be sure that we're dealing with the right user. And now you can use um, things like mobile app notifications, mobile app codes, email, mobile phone notification. You can even ask some s security questions. You know, what was the name of your first dog? That sort of thing. Um, and by using those methods, you can then determine that we are genuinely dealing with the appropriate user. At the time of uh, creation of this course, this is just about to be merged with the registration experiences for multi-factor authentication, which are very similar. When you have turned on the self-service password reset feature, it's a good idea to go back to the Azure AD Connect tool and to configure password write back. That means that when a user changes their password in Azure AD, the password will be written back to the corresponding account in your on-prem Active Directory environment. Multi-factor authentication is pretty ubiquitous now. The notion that you can just identify with a username and a password, although that's possible in some circumstances, it's not desirable in most circumstances. We need to be sure that the user that we're, or computer that we're signing in, is who they claim to be. When a user signs in then, by using multi-factor authentication, they'll have to use one of several factors, something that they know, something that they have, and something that they are. So you might combine some sign-in experience with a biometric. That would be something like Windows Hello on a Windows 10 or a Windows 11 computer. That would allow us to identify that the user is who they claim to be, possibly in conjunction with some other aspect, like ownership of a particular device or some kind of notification code on a mobile device. This screenshot shows us the service settings for multi-factor authentication in Azure AD. And once again, at the top of the screenshot, you can see that these settings will be combined with those for the self-service password reset set up for your users. So you can choose to send a text message to users' phones or to send a notification through a mobile app or request a, valid, a verification code from a mobile app. 
And you can also choose at the very bottom of the screen there to allow users to remember their multi-factor authentication on devices that they trust from between one day to 365 days or not at all. Now that's quite a useful feature because although multi-factor authentication is desirable from a security standpoint, if every single time a user connected to some sort of application they needed to use a text or receive a text message and enter a code, that would very soon get annoying. So by allowing perhaps even only for a day for the system to remember, then on trusted devices only of course, then that would mitigate that irritation from the user's perspective. I always think of security as being a, um, a balance between usability and security. A very usable system might not have many security checks. A very secure system might not be very usable and maybe as an organization you need to pick where on that line you need to, to, to configure things. So this is a useful feature. Conditional access is a feature of Azure AD. It enables you to support the following scenarios. You can support apps that require multi-factor authentication by stipulating that multi-factor authentication is a requirement for being able to connect to a particular app. You can enable multi-factor authentication for untrusted networks. You can allow Office 365 access only from trusted devices. Policies are enforced after authentication has been completed. When you set up a conditional access policy, you need to start by defining the conditions. These are rules that devices must adhere to. The conditions might include things like a sign-in risk. So if a user signs in and we identify it as being a risky sign-in, for example. So if a user signs in in London at 9.05 and then signs in in New York at 9.10, that's a risky sign-in because you can't be in two places within five minutes if they're separated by a couple of thousand miles. If a user signs in in Australia, then that might be a risky sign-in, especially if you have no office in Australia and no one's ever signed in before from Australia. So those are, or could be identified as, as high sign-in risks, in which case they may not necessarily be problematic, but there's something that you ought to be aware of and therefore you might stipulate a particular set of access controls based on meeting that condition. A user might sign in from a particular computer, it might be running Windows or it might be running Mac OS or it might be running Windows 10 or Windows 11 or a specific version of Windows 11. Locations where a user signs in from might be more or less risky. A particular app that a client is using, for example, they might open up um, a connection to Teams using a web browser as opposed to using the Teams desktop client and that might be something you wanted to control. And whether or not the device state meets certain characteristics. Once you've done that, you can then define controls. This is the actions that are taken when the condition is met. So it could be that you allow or, or grant access um, or block access depending on the condition. So if a user is using a web browser to access Teams, you block access. Or maybe if a user is using a web browser to access Teams, you permit access but or grant access rather only if certain conditions are met. For example, they use multi-factor authentication or they're connecting from a device that's marked as compliant or both of those things. You can configure the following types of conditional access policy. Users and groups, cloud app based, device platform based. In the demonstration, we're gonna review ADDS account policies, create a password settings object and determine the result in password settings, and then review Azure AD password protection settings, self-service password reset settings, and multi-factor authentication settings. We'll also create a conditional access policy. So if I open it up, group policy management and edit the default main policy and if I expand if I get there in a minute policies administrative templates window settings rather security settings and here you can see the node account policies and I can configure the password policy settings that we discussed the account lockout settings and the curb ROS policy and that will apply to every object and every user account in the domain. There's no way to override those settings once they've been configured at this level because of the way that Active Directory works. However, you can use the Active Directory Administrative Center to create password settings objects. So if we expand out the local domain and then expand out the system container and then select password settings container, we can then create a new password settings object. We we'll want to give it a name and a precedence where 
The precedence is used to determine which particular password settings object will apply if several apply based on a, um, various group memberships of which a particular user is a member. And because perhaps we want to be more rigorous with our security settings for IT admins, then we might want to make the password length greater, the number of passwords being remembered more, specifying we need to change the passwords more frequently, and then perhaps enabling a lockout policy. And then applying those settings to a particular group. And then selecting OK. And so any members of the domain admins group will have the more rigorous password settings object settings applied to their account. To determine the effect of this, if we do a global search for a user that belongs to that group. We can then have a look at the resultant password settings. And you can see which settings are applying here. If I want to review similar settings in Azure AD, I navigate to the Azure Active Directory Admin Center and then select Azure Active Directory. And then in the navigation pane, scroll down and select security. And then from security, you can configure things like conditional access, identity protection. You can review reporting information and so on. For our purposes, we want to go and have a look at authentication methods and select password protection. And here we can specify lockout settings and um, enforcing a custom list of banned passwords and, and related settings. To configure self-service password reset, go back to Azure Active Directory and choose users and then select password reset. And here you can enable whether or not a user is is permitted to perform self-service password reset through group membership. In this case, I've selected all, so all users are able to perform that task. And then under the authentication methods tab, I can choose what methods are required for them to identify themselves when they perform that reset. So one or two methods, and then I can select what those methods are, including security questions, for example, and the number of security questions that are required. For multi-factor authentication, navigate to users and then select the option per user multi-factor authentication. A new tab opens. And then for an individual user, you can select them. And then you can choose that you want to enable or enforce the multi-factor authentication settings. If you want, you can do a bulk update if multiple users need to be configured. Before you do that, though, it's a good idea to select the service settings tab and then to configure the settings that control how users are able to verify their, their identity, including a, a telephone call to a, to a phone, a text message to a phone, notifications through a mobile app, which is my preferred way of doing it, verification code from mobile app or hardware token, and then the setting I mentioned when I was discussing it earlier, which is allowing users to remember multi-factor authentication on devices they trust. It's not a bad idea to set that to a period of time, maybe a day, which enables the users to not constantly be prompted, but enables you to be fairly sure that they have to go through the multi-factor authentication process on a daily basis. And as I said, once you've configured those service settings, you can go on to enable the features for specific users. Let's just finish up by taking a look at a conditional access policy. Again, you can access that by selecting Azure Active Directory, scrolling down and selecting security, and then you can choose conditional access. From here, you can create a policy to control access to specified apps or to perform specific tasks. Let's do a quick run through. Give it a name. Demo policy in this case. Then you can choose the users or workload identities. So I can choose all users or I can select specific users and groups. If I select that option, I can then go on to say, I'm only interested in controlling access from guests or external users, which is quite a useful capability, or anybody who holds a particular role, for example, global admin. Um, or I can be specific and select users and groups. So if I select Alex, for example, here, and then I can go on to define what it is that, in this case, Alex needs to do. So if Alex tries to access any cloud app, notice that it warns you that that includes the Azure portal, so you might lock yourself out if you're not careful. There's no danger of that here because I'm only applying the policy to Alex. But if it was applied to everybody or, or a role holder like global admin, then if I wasn't cautious from this point forward, that might be a problem. 
or I can select a specific app. So for example, I might want to focus on Teams. And then I can look at conditions. There are a number of conditions, user risk level, sign in risk level, device platforms, locations, and so on. But for instance, let's choose a client app and configure that setting. And when a user attempts to use a browser, for example, to connect to Teams, then that will be the condition that we're looking for. If they connect using a mobile app or desktop client, that's not been selected here, so that's not a condition that's being met. So the policy won't apply. Then under access controls, we can configure what will happen. Either they'll be granted access, or they'll be blocked access, or granted access, but only if they use multi-factor authentication and or their device is marked as compliant or, or some other characteristic. So I'm gonna go with block access in this instance. And then I can create that turned on and select create. And my policy is then in place. It may not immediately be effective. It depends on, first of all, when Alex tries to use a web browser to access Teams. But in any case, it takes a moment to provision. So I've switched to a web browser and signed in as Alex. And now I'm going to access Teams by selecting it here. I'm obviously accessing Teams through a web browser. And we'll see if that's successful. And no, it was not. And that's because I've uh, fallen foul of my conditional access policy. In the demonstration, we reviewed account policies in Active Directory. We created and tested a password settings object. And we reviewed various security settings in Azure AD before creating a conditional access policy. This is lesson three, Manage Windows Server using domain-based group policies. In this lesson, you'll learn about implementing group policy in ADDS, implementing group policy preferences in ADDS, and implementing group policy in Azure AD domain services. The hands-on sessions demonstrate how to create and edit GPOs, configure common GPO settings, verify GPO settings apply, create link and filter GPOs, configure group policy preferences, and troubleshoot group policies. Group policy provides a mechanism for you to centrally configure settings for your users and for their computers. Group policy uses rules that enable you to manage those um, computer objects and other objects stored in Active Directory. And group policy applies configuration settings that your organization wants to enforce. Group policy objects or GPOs are collections of these settings. GPOs are linked to container objects, sites, domains, and OUs. And through that link, the settings are applied to computer objects and user objects within each of those containers. Settings are pushed to targeted groups of user accounts or computers. Specifically, the group policy client service that runs on each client computer makes a determination about which particular group policy objects apply to it in a given circumstance. And then client side extensions on the computer process those group policy settings. Standard users cannot modify a managed setting. Now, Group policies can apply to the local computer, to sites, to domains, and to organizational units, and where necessary to child OUs, where OUs are nested within other OUs. Typically, the most specific setting will apply. Let's deal with local group policy application. Rather a misnomer, but there is such a thing as a local group policy. Local group policies are designed to allow you to use the same management interface and the same collection of configurable settings for a computer which is standalone. Uh, that's to say it's not joined to an Active Directory domain. However, if you have configured local group policies and that computer is domain joined, then the local policy settings are overridden by those that are applied based on belonging to a domain. So rather unusually, those are the least specific or the least relevant settings, although they are the most specific in the sense that they are configured on an individual computer object. So the local policies apply first. If the computer is a member of an Active Directory domain, it may be configured into a site, and at the very least, it will be in the default first site name site. If your administrator has taken the time to configure subnets and to associate those with site objects, and a computer boots up with a particular IP, it will know in which site it resides. And if there are linked group policy objects that pertain to that site, those will be applied. Next, the computer examines its domain membership. So whichever domain it belongs to, it will apply any of the group policies linked to that domain. 
And then finally, if the computer is stored in an organizational unit or the user account that, that we're signing in with is, is configured into an organizational unit, then the organizational unit or OU settings will apply if any group policies are linked to that OU. As I said, the most specific setting wins, but let's just talk about that for a moment. Group policies contain many thousands of settings. For a conflict to occur, there needs to be a group policy linked to perhaps a domain uh, which has a specific setting, perhaps Windows Update settings, and the same setting is configured differently on the organizational unit of which a user account or computer account is a member. As a consequence of that, in this situation, the organizational unit setting for Windows Update would overwrite the domain setting for Windows Update because the most specific setting wins. That's not to say that it overwrites the entire group policy, merely that it overwrites that specific setting within a particular group policy object. And that's an important consideration. Typical group policy settings include things like folder redirection. So you can redirect your users' folders, by which I mean libraries, documents, pictures, videos, that sort of thing, to a UNC name, a shared folder, in other words, on a file server. That's an extremely common use for user configuration. To deploy software. Now, that can be configured both at the computer level or the user level, depending on what you're trying to do. It's a bit limited, actually. Deploying software by using group policy is, is somewhat constrained compared with other methods that are available, such as using Configuration Manager or, for cloud-based use, using Intune as a way of distributing software. You can use group policy to apply and run a script. Those scripts can be configured to run during startup or shutdown for computers or log on and log off during a user sign in. You can deploy security templates, which means you can be ensure or you can ensure that your security settings are consistent across your enterprise by using security templates to apply security settings to a group policy, which is linked to a domain or to an organizational unit, thereby ensuring that all devices have the same security settings. And you can use something called preferences. Preferences are slightly different than policies. Preferences are, very much as the name suggests, their initial settings. They are preferences. I prefer that you use this particular setting rather than I require that you use a particular setting. Now, I personally don't like using preferences because I prefer to have a standardized and enforced environment. But they can be useful for things like drive mappings and for registry changes and for distributing files and folders and so on. But it's important to remember that these settings can't be enforced, but they can be configured through the Group Policy Management Editor. Now, as mentioned in a previous lesson, you can implement a managed service, Azure Active Directory Domain Services or Azure AD Domain Services. And if you choose to implement that in Azure, you are creating a very similar environment to an on-premise ADDS environment. The significant difference is whereas on-prem uses domain controllers to manage and distribute group policy settings and to manage the authentication and authorization process and to manage replication of those, of those entities, in Azure AD Domain Services, you have a managed service which does not have domain controllers. It's, it's, it's treated as a single entity. Nevertheless, it's perfectly possible for you to configure computers that are Azure AD Domain Service joined by using group policy. So Azure AD Domain Services includes two built-in group policy objects, AADDC users and AADDC computers. The following group policy objects are linked to the following containers. AADDC users GPO and AADDC computers GPO. Now you can use those group policy objects and understand that any users that you create and place in the AADDC users folder or OU or correspondingly any computers that you place in the AADDC computers OU will be configured by using those default group policy objects. However, you can create your own if you need to. So either use the built-in group policy objects and containers or create your own. If you choose to implement Azure AD domain services and use group policies, you'll need to know how to manage that environment. So to manage group policies, you must install the group policy management tools on a management computer. Now, typically that will be a Windows Server computer, which is running as a virtual machine in Azure. So what you'd call an IaaS, Infrastructure as a Service. And then you would configure that device to be domain joined specifically to your Azure AD domain services domain. And then you would install the appropriate management tools on that computer.
once you've got the management tools in place, you can then create um, any customer you use that you want in the usual way that you would for your on-prem network and create and or import group policy objects and link to those custom OUs. So in, in a sense then, managing Azure AD domain services is not really conceptually any different than managing your on-prem group policy objects and related um, organizational units. To implement group policy in Azure ADDS, you'll need to sign in with sufficient privilege. If you sign in as a member of the Azure ADDC administrators group, you'll have the required permissions to perform the group policy management tasks. As I mentioned, you can manage the built-in group policies by installing the necessary tools on a computer that's a member of, of the Azure ADDS domain. So bear in mind that this is a infrastructure as a service virtual machine running Windows Server in Azure. So you're going to want to connect to that remotely. That's important that that remote access is secure. So possibly you might want to in, uh, implement an Azure Bastion so that you can connect through that using HTTPS and then it will then connect using RDP to the target server, which then will connect to your Active Directory domain service environment. While Azure ADDS doesn't allow you to create group policies and link them at the domain level, you can create custom group policy objects and can link them to a custom OU that you can create separately in Azure ADDS. In the demonstration, you'll learn how to use the various group policy management tools and how to edit a group policy object. So here in Server Manager on my domain controller, I'm going to select Tools and then choose Group Policy Management. And then we're looking at the default setup here. We've got two policies, the default domain policy or group policy object, which is linked to the domain. And under the domain controllers OU, we've got the default domain controllers policy, which is somewhat more restrictive, linked to the domain controllers OU. Any computers which are in the domain controllers OU, and obviously that's going to be domain controllers, will have more sec restrictive security settings applied. Now you can use the built-in group policy objects to configure settings, but it's just it's generally best to take a, an approach of, of creating a specific group policy object to address a specific configuration need. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to create an individual group policy for every single individual setting, that would be excessive, but you might create a group policy called security settings. You might create another group policy co called sales department settings, or you might have a group policy that says, says something like folder redirection, depending on what it is you're trying to do. We'll talk more about that throughout the rest of this lesson. So to create a group policy, the best practice is probably to go down to the group policy objects node and to create a new group policy I'm being very inarticulate here and just saying sales GPO doesn't really tell me what it's going to do. And naming is always important. So for now, we're just going to choose sales GPO. And then when I'm ready to configure it, I will right click it and choose edit. That opens up the group policy management editor, which displays a hierarchy, starting with the computer configuration and the user configuration. If you know that the policy only applies computer related settings, you can turn off the user related settings and that may have a slight performance advantage when processing group policies. Although since group policies normally only update on the basis of that there's been a change, once you've initially processed a group policy, there shouldn't be a lot of difference really. But anyway, if you want to make a change to that, you can select properties on the sales GPO object in this case at the top of the tree, and then you can disable whichever element you don't want to configure. Okay, so I'm just going to cancel out of that. After that, you can choose to configure your policies and your preferences. Remember, preferences provide us with initial settings that users can override, whereas policies provide us with mandated settings that local users can't override. And in fact, actually, it generally changes the behavior of the user interface on that target computer so that the setting is inaccessible. So um, up here, I can select a particular setting. Let's choose something like, I don't know, um, open up administrative templates under the computer node and go to Windows Update, and maybe I want to configure automatic update behavior, select that value and then turn it on. And it's worth noting that when a setting is not configured, it's not processed, which means that the setting stays as it was on the local computer originally, unless another group policy changes the setting. If I disable the setting, it will turn it off. If I enable it, it will turn it on, and then I can specify particular values and, and um, other settings within that enabled setting. For this to be overridden or changed, there needs to be another instance of configure automatic updates in another policy that also applies to the target computer or target user, depending. 
And in that circumstance, then group policy will determine a winner and we'll work out how it does that later. But generally, the most specific setting applies. Having configured that setting, you can see that it's enabled. So once you've finished configuring, when you close down the group policy management editor, and only when you close it down, the settings are then applied. Now, there's nothing to apply at the moment because I've not linked it. That's the next step. I must link this to a container object. So the next thing would be to go to sales in this case, right click and say link an existing group policy. Note that you can create a group policy and link it here if you want to. But it's best practice, as I said earlier, and as I showed you to create the group policies, configure them and then link them. So I'm going to link an existing group policy object. I select it from the list of group policy objects and click OK. That will now apply the settings to any user and computer objects that reside within the sales OU. And it's worth noting that you can't see what those are in the group policy management console. You need to go to Active Directory Users and Computers or the administrative center and open up sales and see that there are some um, user objects. There are, however, no computer objects here. That may or may not be a thing that we need to be concerned about, but certainly any of these users will apply the necessary settings based on the fact that they are stored within that particular OU. In the demonstration, you learned how to use the group policy management tools and how to edit a group policy object. So in the previous lesson, we explored the group policy management tools. These include the Group Policy Management Console with which you can create group policies and link them and configure things like WMI filters, starter GPOs, and define the relationship of linked group policy objects to containers and control security filtering and manage delegation. You can also use tools like Group Policy Modeling and Group Policy Results to determine the effect of your various group policies on the objects to which you've linked them. The Group Policy Management Editor is a way that you can use to modify the contents of your group policy object. Both the policies and preferences can be edited using the Group Policy Management Editor. Important to remember that the moment that you close the editor, the changes become live and will replicate around the organization through your domain controller sysfol folder and through Active Directory. You can also use Windows PowerShell commandlets to create and manage and configure and secure your group policies. For the exam, you need to have at least a passing familiarity with some of these commandlets. So this table here displays some of the more common commandlets. Get GPO, Backup GPO, Import GPO, New GPO, Copy GPO, Rename GPO, Restore GPO and Remove GPO. If you can remember the basics of these commandlets, you should be in reasonably good shape for the exam. I'm going to go through a demonstration now where we'll look at how to create a group policy, group policy object. We'll configure some common settings using the group policy object, and then we'll apply and review those GPO settings. So my domain controller here, let's navigate to group policy management. Oh, it may already be open. There it is. And as I mentioned in the last lesson, it's a good idea to create your group policies in the group policy objects node and then link them but you can also create and link them at the same time. So I'm going to create a group policy and link it to the domain object. I'm going to call this Contoso Security Settings. Always a good idea to be descriptive. If you have starter GPOs, you can select one from here. A starter GPO contains some initial settings for commonly configured things. And then you can use that as the basis for configuring the initial settings of your new group policy. Thereafter, you can make any changes that you want. Once you've created and linked the group policy, you need to edit it. And you can do that by right clicking the group policy and selecting edit. So the common things that are typically configured under the policies node anyway, include things like software distribution. And you can distribute software or applications by using computers or by using users. If you configure a computer setting, then the application will be available on that computer irrespective of who sits at it. Whereas if you configure it at the user level, then wherever the user goes, the application will be made available or potentially available depending on how you choose to set things up. To configure software installation, you need to create a new package and the package must be an, a Windows installer and it needs to be on a network shared folder so that it's accessible from the client computers. So I've got a XML notepad here, which is an MSI file. In other words, it's a Windows installer package. So I'm going to select that. 
and then I can choose whether I want to assign it or publish it. And you can see that published is greyed out here, and that's a hint. You can't publish software to computer objects, but you can publish software to user objects, and I'll show you that right now. If I complete the process down here on the user node, click new package, it remembers the location, select XML notepad, and you can see that I can choose to publish or assign it. What's the difference? Well, an assigned application is automatically available, uh, so it's, it's installed automatically on a computer or for a user, wherever that user is, if you choose that option. A published application, on the other hand, is one which is available for a user to choose to install, and typically they would use control panel programs to select a network program, and any pro programs that you've published or apps that you've published will be listed in possibly categories in that area. So let me just complete this process. I'm going to choose published. It'll think about that for a moment. And it's completed the process. Now I'll look at the properties here. And on the deployment page, it's possible for me to, in the case of a published app, to auto install the application by using file extension activation, which means if a user double clicks on a, a file with a, I don't know, an extension, it will open up a, the appropriate or install the appropriate application potentially Excel, I suppose. I could also choose to hide the package from the Add Remove Programs control panel section, although for a published application that would not make a lot of sense. It may be that the application is an upgrade for an existing deployment, in which case I can select what that previously deployed software package is. If categories have been defined, I can select a particular category for the application to appear in. And, and there are a number of other properties, but that's probably enough for now. So I've, I've linked the group policy to the top of the st structure to the domain, and I would expect that any user affected by this policy, which is all users, should receive the option to deploy this application from control panel. Now, of course, I've called this the Contoso security setting, so it's not a very good example of a security setting, but it's a good example of, of one of the things you might choose to do with um, group policy. Under the Windows settings node, there are some security specific settings in addition to startup and shutdown scripts, and under the user node, there are also log on and log off scripts. If you want to run a script, it needs to be a PowerShell script or a Visual Basic script, typically, and it's relatively easy to set up. You specify whether it will run at log on or log off, and then you add a particular script and browse for its location. The system automatically detects where on the file system it needs to be placed, so I don't need to figure that out for myself. And then I can now create a new file, and I'm going to call this one log on, and press enter here. Now I need to change the file extension. So let me just enable the view of file extensions. And I should be able to change the name of this. There we go. Make it a VBS. And then I'm going to open that up in an editor. And it's been a bit of a while since I've done this. And since I spelt that, oh dear, oh dear, I'm not doing terribly well here. Contoso, there we go. And so that's um, going to display a simple message box. I save that away, close it down, and complete the wizard here. And that's now added a log on, log off script that will run at the domain level. So every time someone signs in. In terms of some specific uh, security settings, if I expand out security settings under the computer configuration node, I can configure local policies such as auditing user rights assignments, and security options, including things like user account control settings. I can configure the behavior of the event log by configuring maximum sizes and other settings that pertain to the event log. I can configure restricted groups, which allows me to define which users or groups belong to another group or to define membership of a, or to define the groups of which a particular group is a member. So I can do either the members must belong to this group or this group must belong to these other groups. That allows me to manage them effectively the membership of all my groups. System services, I can configure the startup state of any particular system service. So the application identity service, for example, I can change the properties of that so that it automatically starts up on any workstations that are affected by this group policy. And there are lots of other things in here that I can configure, but a very common one to want to be aware of is Windows Defender Firewall with advanced security. So I'm going to create a new inbound rule. I'm not going to talk about the detail of what this rule does. I'm just going to whiz through and create a custom rule, which is for allowing for the propagation of ICMP4 packets. And I'm going to allow the connection, and I'm going to call this one ICMP and finish that. So I would expect that rule to be created on computers which are affected by this policy. 
So there are lots of security settings that we can configure. In addition to that, we can configure a vast array of settings under administrative templates. And this is where you find most of the settings that you'll work with in group policy terms. So for instance, any sort of Windows component can be configured here. If I want to control the behavior of BitLocker drive encryption, I can do that here. If I want to enable and configure certain security settings, I can do that down here under Windows Defender, smart screen there. And I've also got some other settings under Microsoft Defender Exploit Guard, Antivirus, and so on. Once I've configured all the necessary settings, as soon as I close the Group Policy Management Editor, they will become live. And computers that are online will start to obtain those updated settings. That's a, an automatic process. It's a refreshed process. So typically an online computer refreshes every 90 to 120 minutes. It will only pull down changes. It doesn't refresh things that aren't changed. But since I've introduced a, a, a new group policy, you would expect that the group policy client service will expect that to be processed by the appropriate client side extensions. So once we've done that, we can then go and see the effect of that on a workstation. I will sign in as administrator temporarily. There's my script, as you can see, that's running. So click OK to that. I can now take a look at control panel and see if I've got that program listed. It may take a while for it shows up, but let's take a look. So under programs of features, I can choose install a program from the network. There we go. We've got XML notepad showing there. So that's ready to go. And if I take a look at services, I think we configured the application identity service to run automatically. It hasn't picked that change up yet, but it may do so when I do a refresh of the group policy. We'll talk about the process of forcing a refresh later. Finally, we set a group policy setting to configure a firewall rule. Let's see if that's in place. So open up network and internet and scroll down. We should be able to find Ethernet. Oh, no, well, this is Windows 11, isn't it? So let's go back one level. Advanced network settings. Windows Firewall, it takes us through Windows Security and then we can go to Advanced Settings. And if we have a look at Inbound Rules and have a look for ICMP, it hasn't created it yet, so we need to refresh. Let's just quickly check that, see if it's picked it up. No, okay, we're gonna force a group policy update, opening up Windows Terminal. And on the PowerShell tab, I'm gonna do a GP update slash force. And at this point, you know, we, we could go on to use other command line tools to verify the application of settings or to see where settings are coming from, but hopefully that's not necessary. So we'll close that down and come back and have a look at inbound rules. There we go. That's our ICMP rule that's been distributed by group policy. And I'm just going to check back on that services to see if it picked up that change to the application identity service. Yep, there we go. It's now automatic and it's now running. So those group policy settings are all enforced. So in the demonstration, we created a group policy object, we configured some common settings, and we applied and then reviewed those settings on a target computer. As we learned earlier, by default, group policies apply to container objects in a hierarchy. So they apply to sites, then to domains, and then to OUs and child OUs. And generally, the most specific setting wins. But you can change that default behavior if you want to by filtering the application of group policies. One way in which you can do that is to block inheritance. Now, block inheritance is configured on an organizational unit. It prevents the application of policies from higher up, in this case, from a parent OU or from the domain. So on the graphic here, we're blocking inheritance on the marketing OU, which will prevent the application of the default domain policy, which is configured on a parent object, in this case, the domain. So just to reiterate for the exam, block inheritance is configured on a per container basis. Whereas enforced, you can configure enforced on a specific group policy. So that's configured on a per policy basis. When you enforce a policy, it means irrespective of the settings that apply further down, and remember, the more specific setting usually wins. In this circumstance, the enforced setting wins. So in our scenario, perhaps 
this is the default domain policy, but if I configured a, a, a policy down level connected maybe or linked to the marketing OU that had the same settings configured in the policy, ordinarily the marketing OU would take precedence because it's a more specific setting. By using enforced, I can ensure the policy that I've configured at the domain level will take precedent, precedence and override any settings that are configured further down. You want to use both block inheritance and enforcement fairly sparingly because it indicates that you've got an OU structure that doesn't necessarily fit your particular needs. If you find yourself consistently relying on block inheritance and enforce to get where you need to be, then you need to rethink your OU structure. Security filtering. By default, for a policy to apply to a user or computer, the user object or the computer object needs to be a member of a group that has the apply policy permission. They'll also need to be able to read the policy, but it's the apply policy permission that's critical here. By default, any group policy you create automatically has authenticated users, which is pretty much everybody, as defined with apply policy permissions. So that displays on the scope tab of the selected policy in the security filtering section, as you can see on the graphic here. Now, if I want to use security filter, I can change that group membership, either by adding or removing people from the group, although that's not possible with this implied group, but I could replace this group with a group that had specific membership. And the purpose then of security filtering is to target a subset of users within an OU or an o within a domain that ordinarily would have the policy applied, but you want to block the policy or a group of users or computers for the application of a policy for which it only applies to that subset of users or, or computers and not to everybody in the container or everything in the container. WMI filtering generally is used to target computers, but not always. But a WMI filter, a Windows Management Instrumentation filter, is used to target specific subsets of objects to whom the policy will apply. So, for example, you can create a WMI filter that specifies that the operating system must be Windows 11. And if that's the case, then the policy applies. If it's not the case, then the policy does not apply. So security filtering and WMI filtering, you can use to target specific subsets of users within a container, either to apply the policy or to block the policy. Link order is very important when you've got multiple policies linked to the same container. In this instance, we've got a, an OU called Research, which has two group policies linked, Research Security and Research Settings. In this situation, currently, research security takes precedence. So if the same settings are configured in both policies, and that may not necessarily be the case, but if it is the case, suppose you've got two conflicting firewall rules, for example, then the setting which takes precedence, which wins, is anything configured in research security because it has the lowest numerical link order. Now, that's often a little bit confusing. Why would the lowest number win? Well, if you think about it, gold is number one, silver is number two, bronze is number three when you're talking about winning medals. And Microsoft always take the approach that the lowest numerical number in a precedence situation wins, whether that be printing or, as in this case, link order for a group policy. So it's a good thing to remember for the test. So if you want to change the behavior so that the research settings that take precedence, then you just move it up the list to give it a lower link order number and therefore give it a higher precedence. Now, a lot of the settings that are stored in group policies are stored in the administrative templates node. Now, the administrative templates node deals with registry changes in essence. So when you make a configuration change to the administrative template, you're actually updating a registry value and a registry key. The information that makes that happen is stored in a collection of uh, text files or XML files. These XML files create the interface, the management interface that you see in the group policy editor in the administrative templates node and also determine which settings are configured in the registry as a result of changes that you make in the user interface. If you introduce a new piece of software, for example like a new version of Office, Office 2021 or whatever, then you might want to import the administrative templates into or onto your domain controllers. If you import them then you can update what you see in the user interface and the reflected changes that can be made in the registry. So there may be some new features in, in a new version of Office, obviously there will be, uh, but you can't configure those until you've got the appropriate administrative templates which you can download from the Microsoft Download website. Just search for whatever it is you're looking for and you'll find a link. You can add or remove templates on an individual GPO or if you've got multiple domain controllers it's a good idea to create what's called a central store. All that is is a folder called policy definitions which lives in the c slash windows sysvol 
sysvol, that's no typo, that's correct. So that's c slash windows sysvol sysvol. And then whatever your domain name is, contosa.com slash policies slash policy definitions. So if you create the policy definitions folder, then you'll need to copy any of your administrative templates into that folder, thereby creating a central store. The advantage of a central store is that it's replicated throughout your domain controllers because it's part of sysvol which means you only need to update your administrative templates in a single location rather than on each individual domain controller. In the demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can manage the links for GPOs, how you can filter GPOs, how to block inheritance and enable enforcement, and then review whichever is the winning GPO. So I'm going to use a tool called the Group Policy Modeling Tool. It performs a sort of a what-if scenario for determining which group policies are going to be effective on a particular user and computer. So I'm going to run this group policy modeling wizard and I'm going to specify that the local domain controller processes the policies or provides the policies and then I'm going to choose a user account from sales. Let me just find a user from sales. So Abby will do, that's great. And I'm also going to create a computer in sales as well. I don't have one at the moment, so let's create a new one very quickly. Okay, so sales and Abbey, sales one and Abbey. In my wizard, I'm going to specify Abbey as a user. So I'm imagining that I'm signing in as Abbey and I'm going to sign in on a computer called sales one, which also is in the sales OU. And I'm not going to go through the detail of this for now. I'll talk about it when we talk about troubleshooting later, but there are some ancillary options I could choose to configure. I don't need to do any of that for now. And then I'm going to complete the process. And what it will generate for me is a report that shows me, just close that there, which particular setting is coming from where. Now let's review what we think ought to be happening. If I sign in as a member of, or as a, as a user which is stored in sales, on a computer that's in sales, then I would expect that the policies that will apply will be the Contoso security settings policy, because that's linked to the domain which processes, the default domain policy, and then the sales GPO policy, because all three of those are effective on that particular object because of the way that inheritance works. Now I've configured a couple of settings to conflict with one another. So the same setting is configured at different levels to see what the effect of this will be. So if we scroll down this report here, some of this is fairly generic stuff. You can see that it's picking up the account policy, password policy from the default domain policy, and it tells you what the setting is that's being configured. But I know there are some things that I've changed under administrative templates a bit further down. So let's see what I've got. There's the ICMP rule that we picked up from Contoso security settings up at the top level. That's not conflicting with anything, but nevertheless, that's a, a rule that you can see that would be effective on the sales one computer. Then I've configured Windows update settings and it tells me that the settings been enabled and that the configure automatic update setting has been set to number three, option three, and that's been provided from the sales GPO. So that gives you an idea about that. I'm picking up settings from the default domain policy, the Contoso security settings policy, and the sales GPO policy. Now we can change the behavior a little bit here. For, let's see what happens if we block inheritance on sales and then run the same model again. So I'm going to just go through this. I'll choose the same domain controller, although in fact, actually, I only have one, but I'll choose the same user. Something you've gone into caps lock for some reason. Um, I'll choose the same computer. And remember, this is a simulation, but it's an accurate one. Uh, I don't need to do anything else here. I'm just going to roll through it as if, and it will then process as if. I uh, don't need to worry about that. So now, if I scroll down, I can see that I'm picking up some of the same settings from the top up here. I can expand everything here. But if I, I look at the policies, for secure system services. The system service setting that's being uh, used to manage system services is sales GPO. Also, the configure automatic update setting is sales GPO. Okay, so that's the one that's being used there. And I don't have any of the domain policies. As you can see, there's no default domain policy or Contoso security settings policy. So there's the, none of those are being processed because I've blocked inheritance. Okay, now I'm gonna change the block inheritance, remove the block, and I'm now going to make 
Contoso security settings the uh, more significant of the two policies linked to Contoso.com. If I select Contoso.com and looked at Link Group Policy Objects tab on the right, you can see that at the moment the default domain policy will take precedence. So I'm going to change that so that the Contoso security settings take precedence. And then I could go and have a look at what the effect of that would be. I don't have time to go through all of this. So what I would expect to see is any policy settings that were previously being provided by default domain policy would now be provided by Contoso security settings. Those would be the ones that would take precedence. But tell you what I am going to do is I'm going to enforce the setting here. And then I'm going to run and see what that does on settings that have been configured at sales. So run the wizard again. It's a great tool this because it does allow you to get a feel for what should be happening. Because remember that group policy never actually comes up with errors. There are never any conflicts. It always resolves them by coming up with a winning GPO. But it's really interesting to know how it does that because that's part of the troubleshooting process. So I'm choosing the same user and computer as before and going with the same settings. And that will now generate a report for us. And uh, just close that. And now we can see that um, there's an enforced Contosis security settings is enforced. And then let's have a look at any of the settings that might be affected. So the account policy settings still being picked up by default domain. And that's because nothing in Contosis security defines those settings. So there's no conflict. Remember, that's the point. It doesn't overwrite the entire policy. It only overwrites those settings that are conflicting with one another. So here we've got a setting. I'm trying to find one. Here we go. So we've got global settings for the Windows firewall with advanced security. Contoso security settings um, is the winning GPO in that circumstance. And that's generating that ICMP inbound rule. And then, interestingly, we've got configure automatic updates. Now, we know that previously the sales GPO was providing that setting, but because we've configured enforcement, then it's the Contoso security settings setting that applies. The final part of the puzzle is to review how you can configure security settings to configure or enable security filtering. Suppose, for example, that I didn't want the policy to apply to Abby, but everybody else in the sales OU would be affected. Obviously, one way I could achieve that by moving Abby from the sales OU, but perhaps she's a member of the sales team, and therefore needs to be in the sales OU. Nevertheless, if you find yourself doing lots of things like exceptions with um, security filtering, WMI filtering and, and enforcement so on, it probably suggests you haven't designed your OU structure very well. But anyway, what we typically do is pop over to Active Directory Users and Computers and in sales, maybe we would make a new group. So it's a good idea to use groups called um, policy does not apply, which is perhaps not a particularly brilliant name, but is very descriptive. And I'm going to then add as a member, Abby. Having done that, I'll go back to my group policy. There it is. And I'm going to select the policy here. And on the scope page, I'm going to review that currently it will apply to everybody because it says so here, authenticated users of which Abby is a member. It's an implied group. So I'm going to go to the delegation page and I'm going to add an entry for, I've forgotten what I called the group now. Yes, policy does not apply. That's good. And I'm going to grant that group uh, read permissions. Policy does not apply, but I need to change that by selecting advanced. And if we review authenticated users, we see that they have read permissions, but they also have apply group policy permissions. So the policy will apply to everybody. But if I choose the policy does not apply group and I grant deny apply group policy permissions, then anybody that's a member of that group will not be able to apply the policy. They'll be able to see it and read it and see that they don't have permissions, but won't be able to apply it. So that's a way of, of preventing the application of the policy to a specific group of people, but it generally applies to everybody. The flip side of that is that you can create a, a policy that only applies to an individual. So for example, if we create a new policy here and call it Abby's policy, which is a really bad practice here to create a policy that only applies to an individual user, but for demonstration purposes. So this is going to apply to Abby, but as you can see on the scope page, it actually applies to everybody. So we're going to choose delegation and we're going to modify the properties. It's tempting just to remove authenticated users, but that won't work properly. The authenticated user entry needs to still be there, but it needs to have read permissions. So we choose advanced and we change the permissions so that read permissions remains, but we deselect apply group policy. Now you might be thinking, well, why not say deny like we did before? 
well, we can't do that because Abby needs to have the policy apply and Abby will also be a member of authenticated users and will pick up the deny permission. So deny will override any allow permission she has. If I click OK here and then click on the scope page, you can see that now the policy doesn't apply to anybody because nobody has the apply policy permission. So I'm going to go back to delegation and then add Abby, remembering that actually, of course, you should use a group even if it only contains one user. Click OK and then on the advanced page, I can select Abby and then grant Abby the apply group policy permission. Click OK to that. And if I go back to scope, you can see that the policy only applies to Abby, which seems a little bit of a convoluted way of doing that, but you know that's how it's done. In terms of a WMI filter, you create your filter here, add it with a particular name, provide the syntax for it, and then once you've created it, you can go back to a policy and you can select it from a drop down list. So in the demonstration, you learned how to create and link group policies, how to filter group policies, how to block inheritance, enable enforcement, and then finally to review the winning group policy. Preferences provide initial values for computer and user configurable options. They provide similar capabilities to startup and login scripts, such as creating drive mappings and variables. They can be locally reconfigured, unlike group policy policy settings. The following are the available preferences. Applications, drive mappings, environment variables, file updates, folders, INI files, registry settings, shortcuts, data sources, devices, folder options, internet settings, local users and groups, network options, network shares, power options, printer settings, regional options, scheduled tasks, and start menu settings. You can configure preferences using the Group Policy Management Editor. Under both Computer Configuration and User Configuration, in addition to the Policies node, you also have the Preferences node. Beneath this, you can configure the appropriate settings for Windows settings and Control Panel settings. One of the interesting things about preferences is that you can target the setting within the setting. Now, in the last lesson, we discussed how you could target a group policy setting, group policy object, by determining security filtering, WMI filtering, enforcement, you could block inheritance, ways in which you could change the default behavior. Now, all of that still applies because a preference is configured as part of a group policy object. But within a group policy preference, for an individual preference, you can use item level targeting to determine whether or not a particular preference applies to a given situation. For example, you can use the targeting editor to specify, in this instance, the operating system is Windows 10 Enterprise Edition, and the computer is a member of the security group Contoso Domain Users, and the total RAM is greater than or equal to 4096 megabytes. The settings or the targeting is determined by adherence to all three of these particular statements in this particular example. The following are the available targeting options. The computer has a battery, a specific name, a specific CPU speed, a certain amount of disk space, particular environment variables are set on that computer, the MAC address within a specific range, there's a PCMCIA card present, there's a specified amount of memory, there's a specific registry entry, and there's a particular remote desktop setting. In addition, the computer is within a particular IP address range, a member of a domain, running a specific operating system, is a member of a specific OU, is a portable computer, or is in a specific Active Directory site. You can also target based on the computer using a specific language setting, using a specific type of network connection, using a specific processing mode, meeting the requirements of an LDAP query, or meeting the requirements of a WMI query. Finally, you can target based on the fact that a specific time range is present, the user has a specific name, a certain file is present on the computer, that you can apply by or after a specific date, or a user or computer is a member of a specific security group. In the demonstration, you're gonna learn how to configure and target preferences. So on my domain controller, I'm going to select Group Policy Management. I've created a policy called Abby's Policy, which I've uh, linked only to Abby, which you did earlier. There's also a Sales Group Policy, which has security filtering set to authenticated users. Let's take a look at Abby's Policy. 
and I'm going to configure the settings of this policy by editing it. That opens up the Group Policy Management Editor. Preferences exist for both computer settings and also for user settings. So under preferences for computer settings, we can see that there is the ability to create environment variables, to create files and folders, to create any files, to modify the registry by defining a new registry item and then configuring that item, to create a network shared folder and to create and place a shortcut on maybe the desktop or, or some other location. Under control panel settings, we can also configure things like data sources, devices, folder options, local users and groups, power options, printers, services, etc. Similarly, under user configuration, we have the ability to define applications, to map network drives, once again to create environment variables, create files and folders, any files and registry settings, and again create shortcuts. I'm going to create a shortcut under the user configuration. And I'm going to change this to create. I'm going to define it as, let's call it sales app. It's a file system object. I'm going to specify that that will live on the desktop. So it'll create a shortcut on the desktop. And the path that I want it to execute or provide a shortcut to is C slash Windows Notepad. Now I realize that's not any kind of sales app, but for demonstration purposes. So that should create a sales app shortcut pointing to notepad and place it on the desktop. Also going to create a drive mapping. And I'm going to say create and I'm going to specify that as I can search for a, a particular a path here on the network, but I can just enter that Contoso DC slash apps. I'm going to reconnect and I'm going to label this as well, first use, I'm going to call this one drive, let's say H, and label this as apps. And I can select apply there. Before I do that, I'm going to go on to common, and I can then choose item level targeting, and then choose one of the targeting options. So for example, I can specify that the computer name must be Contoso CL1. So I've got an item level targeting configured to create a drive mapping to Contoso DC apps. Okay, when I close the editor, those will become effective, although it'll be a while before they apply in general. This policy is being security filtered to only apply to Abby Parsons in the first place, so it won't apply to anybody else. So now let's try and see what happens if we flick over to Contoso CL1 and sign in as Abby. So on my Windows 11 computer, select other user and sign in as Abby. Okay, so signed in, start menus displayed, and we can see here we've got a couple of scripts, one for Contoso and one that's associated a group policy, which is just for Abby. And we can see that there's a sales app shortcut on the desktop, so that's been picked up. So we'll just check in File Explorer for the presence of the drive mapping under this PC. As you can see drive H here is called Apps. And that's available. If I select that, it'll take me to the apps map network drive. So that's all looking pretty good. So everything worked as expected. So that's preferences. In the demonstration, you learned how to configure and target preferences. Group policy is extremely reliable. If you set it up with appropriate planning, there's no real reason to suppose you'll ever get any particular problems. Once everything's been set up, unless you make any changes, there's no reason to suppose anything should subsequently go wrong. But occasionally, if something's been changed or something hasn't been planned properly or other infrastructure elements are updated, group memberships changed, for example, file permissions are changed, then that can have an effect on the way that group policies apply. Common reasons for problems with group policy is security filtering. Remember, security filtering is used to change the default behavior whereby authenticated users, members, are automatically able to apply a policy if it's linked to a container in which that user or that computer resides. 
So we looked at that in an earlier lesson. We were able to, to block the application of a policy through security filtering or ensure that only a certain subset of individuals were able to apply the policy where otherwise everybody or everything would apply the policy in a given container. Now, if you're using groups as you should be and you change your group memberships, then that can have a consequent effect on the way that group policies apply. So it's always worth checking security filtering and make sure that users belong to the appropriate groups where you've used security filtering. WMI filtering similarly is used to control the default behavior of the application of group policies. And typically this is used for computer properties, but not necessarily only that. When you create a WMI filter that looks for, say, Windows 10 computers with a 64-bit edition of Windows 10 Enterprise, for example, and having 8 gig of memory, then if your computers don't meet those characteristics, then the policies won't apply. That may be unexpected. You may have anticipated that all your computers have that minimum requirement. Suppose, for example, you upgrade your computers to Windows 11, then they would no longer be running Windows 10. That would be a factor for you to consider. So WMI filter is always worth reviewing if you suspect that there's a, a, a change in the way that your computers are configured or you introduced additional new computers to your environment. Incorrect linking. We saw how when you create a group policy, you link it. You can unlink a policy so it doesn't apply to any container. Likewise, you can also change the link order to change the default precedence. Remember, the group policy with the lowest numerical link order has the highest precedence. Your OU configuration. When you start to move OUs around or you create sub-OUs or um, you otherwise remove users from an OU or move computers to an OU, all of those things can have a consequent effect on the way that your policies then apply. So although none of your group policies have changed and none of the settings within them have changed, the effect has changed because you've got infrastructure changes underpinning all of that. Inheritance. The default model is that all settings are inherited from the site to the domain to the OU to the child OU. Remembering always that by default, the most specific setting will win if there's a conflict in settings. But we learned earlier how you can change that behavior with security filtering, um, inheritance, enforced block inheritance and link order. Now, on the client end of things, you can use GP update to force an update on a computer. Remember that the client, the group policy client service that runs on all computers checks in to see if there are any additional group policies or if any group policies have changed every 90 to 120 minutes or when the computer starts up. When that's taking place, then any changes should prove to be effective fairly immediately, although it's always worth remembering that some changes require a computer to be restarted after the policy has applied. So we have to wait for it to apply and then we have to restart for it to apply. The same is also true for user related settings. Sometimes it requires a user to sign out and sign back in. So if a policy is not immediately effective, it's always worth at least considering forcing an update of the policy and then if necessary, signing out and signing back in or restarting the computer. You can force an update by using GP update slash force. When you want to determine which particular policies should be applying in a given situation from the client end, you can use GP result. If you use it with a slash R switch, it will tell you which group policies should be applying, both for the computer and, both for the, and, and also for the user. It will also identify when a group policy has been filtered out and it will specify the reason, maybe because the policy doesn't contain any settings or maybe because of security related settings or WMI related settings. Whatever the reason why a policy is not applying, it should be ind indicated with GP result. So it's a great uh, tool to start with. Once you've determined which particular policies should or should not be applying, you can use the resultant set of policies tool again from the command line by running RSOP. That will prevent or present you with a, a dialogue that looks very similar to the tool that we use to configure the policy. That's to say the group policy management editor. As you can see in the graphic here, it's showing us the password policy node under account policies under the computer configuration. So this is a report based on a computer called CL1 for a user called administrator, as indicated by the name of the report. And it's showing what particular setting is being configured in a particular area and what source GPO that came from. So that's a really good way of, of being able to figure on the client end of things what's happening. On the server, if you have access to the server console, the group policy management console, you can use the group policy modeling wizard. And I've shown you that in an earlier lesson. It's a great simulation, but it is important to remember it is a simulation. 
it, it supposes based on the information you provide within the context of the model wizard, what you want to test. So what, what particular user, which particular computer, and whether you want to modify group memberships, whether you want to enable features like loopback processing and so on. And it will then execute that as if it was sitting at that computer signed in as that specified user. Now, it's not actually doing that, so it's not executing those group policies using the client-side extensions, but it's doing a best effort. And it's a reasonably reliable way of modelling what should happen or should or ought to be happening in a given circumstance. The group policy results tool, however, allows you to get a much more accurate interpretation. It will connect to the configured computer as the signed-in user or the designated user. It will sign in as that user and it will process the client-side extensions on the target computer. So for that to happen, the computer needs to be online and the user must have signed in at that computer at least once. In addition, you'll need to be able to connect over the network using remote management to be able to initiate the test. That's a very reliable way of testing things. In the demonstration, I'll show you how you can use some of these tools on the client end of things and also on the server end of things to determine which policies are in force. So here I am on my Windows 11 computer signed in as Abby. Suppose I want to determine which particular policies are in force on my computer. I'm going to open up Windows Terminal and on the PowerShell tab, I'm going to run GP result slash R. That will show me which particular policies are in force. Now, I'm signed in as a user here, so it will actually only show me the user settings in this instance. But you can see even from this that the applied group policy objects are Abby's policy and Contoso security settings. It's filtered out the local group policy because there are no policy settings configured as part of it. Now, if I want to determine which particular settings apply based on it being a, a computer, then I'm going to need to have a high level of privilege. So I'm going to open up Windows Terminal Admin and I'm going to use the credentials for my admin account on the computer. And now I can run GP result slash R again. And this time it will tell me not only about the user settings, but about the computer settings. So you can see here that the applied group policy objects include sales GPO, Contoso security settings and default domain policy. So combine that with the user settings that we saw earlier, then we've got a, a range of settings that are, are going to be, or a range of group policies that are going to enforce certain settings. So I can also use the RSOP tool, the command line here. That will generate a report by running the resultant set of policy against the client computer. And it will display in an interface that looks very similar to the group policy management editor. So I can see, for example, under Windows settings, there's a security setting. And I seem to remember we've got system services configured. So the application identity service is disabled through the sales GPO, for example. So this gives us another way of looking at the same information. You can also run GP result. If you can type it, that is using the slash H output switch and specify that you want to put the output out to a HTML file. And then if you use Explorer and go to the folder where you currently are, I'm under the users administrator folder. Uh, I should be able to do that, surprising. Oh yes, of course I'm signed in as Abby. I have a file here. Open up that file, it will display a report that looks pretty similar to the output you get on the group policy wizard, group policy modeling wizard. So scroll through here and you can see which particular settings are applying and where they're coming from. So we'll see here Contosa security settings, um, default domain policy and sales GPO are the ones that are applied. And then it will go on and identify where particular settings are coming from. So there's a range of different options that you have on, on the client computer to troubleshoot the application of policies. So over on the server, I can switch to group policy management and I'm going to use the group policy results tool now. This works in a similar way to group policy modeling, but rather than configure which user and which computer and other additional settings, you, you point it to a computer and then select a user which is logged in at that computer. And then it actually processes the client side extensions through the group policy client 
at the remote end. So I'm going to choose a specific computer I know to be online, and this is the computer where Abby has signed in. So the computer needs to be online, and it also needs to have um, Windows Remote Management enabled through the firewall. It will establish a connection to the target computer. And then you can select which user you want to test, Abby in this case, and then it will now generate the report by executing the client-side extensions for the selected group policy objects as determined by the group policy client service at that computer. Okay, so here's the report. I can have a look at the detailed information here if I want to. And scroll down and I can make a determination about which setting is coming from which policy. Remember the term winning GPO just means the one that has the highest precedence given the way that inheritance works and security filtering and block inheritance and enforced and link order and WMI filtering. All of that together combines to result in a winning GPO. You can scroll down and take a look at the settings. For example, some of this Windows Firewall stuff is coming from Contoso Security. There's an ICMP rule that we set up earlier. We've got configure automatic updates is, is from the sales GPO and so on. So this is verbatim what's happening on the client computer so it's an accurate report whereas modeling which we looked at earlier is a, a best guess. It doesn't actually process on the remote client but it, but it goes through the process as if. In the demonstration you learned how to troubleshoot the application of group policies from the client and also how to test the application of group policies from the server. This is lesson four, Manage Servers. In this lesson, you'll learn about Server Manager, Windows PowerShell Remoting, Windows Admin Center, Azure Arc, Azure VM Extensions, Update Management, and Azure Monitor. The hands-on sessions include using Windows PowerShell, using Azure Cloud Shell, using Windows Admin Center, enrolling a server in Azure Arc, installing extensions using Azure Arc, and installing Azure Monitor. There are a number of tools with which you can manage your servers. Server Manager is perhaps the most obvious. Not only can you use it to manage the local server, but you can also create server groups, enabling you to remotely manage those servers. You can also use Windows PowerShell. PowerShell commands are made up of verbs and nouns. The verb is the action, such as get, set, add, new, remove, and so on. The noun is the resource, service, local user, AD user, MSOL user, and so on. So for example, you want to retrieve a list of services, you can run get service. If you want to filter that a little bit, we can pipe the output of that command to another command, where object, and then we can specify that we're only interested in objects with a status that is equal To running. So you can see those services are all running. We can now output that to a list to have a slightly different format of output. We can retrieve information about the network configuration. Similar to running IP config at the command line. Get an IP address and then format as a table. So a large number of IP addresses on this machine. That's largely because it's my demo machine with, with many IPs linked to many virtual network adapters. So if I switch to a domain controller here, I can also run PowerShell on the domain controller. So for example, if I want to retrieve information about my users, I can do a simple get AD user and then retrieve a, a complete list of all my user accounts. I can format that as a table. And I can even make modifications to my users. I can see, for example, here that I've got some users in marketing. So if I wanted to change the properties of some of those users, let's take a look at them in Active Directory, Users and Computers, under Marketing. If I look at any of these users, let's pick Rachel here, we see that there's no description. And then if I run this command, 
I can retrieve a list of users that have OU equals marketing, DC equals Contoso, DC equals com as part of their name. And then using the set AD user command, I can modify their descriptions in a single step. And if I go back to the Azure Active Directory tool and select Rachel again, you can see that now I've added the description of member of the marketing department. In fact, let's take a look at another user also has been modified. So the thing about PowerShell is it's quite extensible. You can target the operation that you want to perform to many objects. You can script or group your commands together in a sequence that's a bit like a script, or indeed you can use a script to perform whatever task that you repeatedly need to perform or that would require a great deal of manual effort were you to use a, a graphical user interface. So you can review the commands that are around there, get service where object status equals running, get service where name begins with win, but doesn't include a, a service called winroom. We can retrieve the IP configuration. We can review the IP addresses on a computer. We can retrieve a list of services and then convert the output to an HTML file for review. And then you can manipulate things like Active Directory objects or indeed Microsoft 365 objects or again, Azure objects. So a, a range of things. Once you've got used to working with the basic construction of a commandlet, you can use it for pretty much anything. The PowerShell integrated scripting environment allows you to get up to speed with using PowerShell commandlets. For example, if you use the command line down here and type in a partial command, you'll get prompted for selecting from a list of possible commandlets that you might be attempting to use. Over on the right hand side in the commands tab, you can also have a look at the details for a specific commandlet after you've searched for it. And that can help you then to build up the commandlet that you want and then to insert that into a script or to run it. If you have a script that you've created, it will live in the script area, the script pane at the top of the, the dialog, and you can then run all of or part of the script. PowerShell Remoting enables you to take advantage of the Windows Remote Management capability to connect to a remote server or remote workstation. Once you've learned the basics of using PowerShell commandlets and creating and running scripts, you can then use PowerShell Remoting to run those against remote server targets. A server already is enabled for Windows Remote Management, but you'll need to enable the Windows Remote Management capability on your client computers, Windows 10, Windows 11, and so on. Once you've enabled PowerShell Remoting, you can use features such as one-to-one, -one, many-to-one, and one-to-many. In other words, it's possible to run a script on a remote machine that then targets additional remote computers so that you can execute the same command or script across a series of computers. Or you can collect information from a series of computers and bring that information back to a single point. To enable PowerShell Remoting, you'll need to run winroom quick config at the command prompt. That's a command prompt command. Or alternatively, use the PowerShell command that enable PS remoting dash force. These commands enable the Windows remote management feature and define or create a, a firewall exception and start the Windows remote management listening service. Once you've done that, the computer is then able to be remotely managed. Once you've enabled remote management, you can then use the invoke command commandlet. By using the computer name parameter, you can specify one or several computer names to target whatever you want to execute within the script block parameter. So in this case, get event log and targeting the system log. If we run this command as written here, it will retrieve the contents of the system event log from the Contoso DC remote computer. You can also create a remote session by using the new PS session command. In this instance, we're using a variable $s and we're passing to that variable the result of the new PS session commandlet targeting, in this case, a single computer, Contoso DC. Although, again, it could be several computers separated by a comma, or indeed you could accept input from a comma separated value file, for example. Once you've done that, you'll have opened up a remote management session to, in this case, a single computer. And then to access that, you can run the enter PS session commandlet and specify the variable, in this case, $s. Now that might seem slightly convoluted for a single computer, and it, and it probably is. But if you're regularly managing connections to multiple computers, then using a variable is a convenient way of doing that. So sort of a shorthand of addressing that issue. Otherwise, you can just use the NTPS session commandlet and then specify computer names directly. Let's review what that might look like. So here we're running the invoke command command that we looked at earlier, and we get a result back from the 
remote computer and it indicates that in the output. And this one we're creating a new session, a new PS session to a computer called LonDC1 and we're using the $S variable to store that information. And if you run $S by itself it will output the open connection. So we've got a connection called WinRoom5 to LonDC1. Computer type is remote machine, state is opened. So that means we've got a valid connection. And then when we run the enter PS session command look, with the $S variable, it opens up a connection to LonDC1 in this instance. And again, at the beginning of the PowerShell command line, you can see the prefix of the target computer, LonDC1. So the getNet IP configuration command that's being run is in fact running on LonDC1, the output arrives at this workstation. Now if you're operating in an Active Directory domain environment then all you really need to do to manage a remote server from a, a workstation which is a, a member of the same forest is to enable Windows Remote Management. Now again on the server that's automatically done so pretty much all you'll need to do is establish a connection to it from your Windows 10, Windows 11 workstation which whichever computer you're using for management purposes. But if you're performing management of Azure resources, for example, which are not part of your Active Directory environment or the workstation from which you're performing remote management is not in the same Active Directory forest as the servers you're targeting, then you'll need to manage something called trusted hosts. Trusted hosts enables you to, to get around the issue of not being able to authenticate. So in a domain environment, you're managing a remote connection through the authentication of the Kerberos protocol. Because your computer is part of the same Active Directory forest, then you're able to use Kerberos for that authentication. So in a non-domain environment, whether you're not in the domain where you're the computer that you're managing from or, or whether this target server is not in the domain, then you'll need to use the set item commandlet to add a trusted host. Now you're adding the trusted host to the management workstation. You're not managing or adding a, a trusted host to the target server. So on your management workstation you run the set item command with the, the syntax indicated on the screen here wsman colon localhost slash client slash trusted hosts dash value and then the names of the computer that you want to add to your trusted list. So that will be the name of the remote server or servers. In this instance I'm using the wildcard of asterisk and that will allow me to trust or add to my trusted list any host that I want to remotely manage. So this applies to using Windows PowerShell Remoting and also Windows Admin Center, both of which use these trusted hosts where Kerberos authentication is not possible. Whilst we're talking about Kerberos, it's worth mentioning Kerberos Delegation. You use Kerberos Delegation when you're using a second hop to remote to a target host. So in other words, you're signing into one host which then remotes to another and performs a task potentially requiring access to a third host. So your management workstation, remote server and then onwards to, a, to an additional remote server. So that's a second hop. Unless the intermediate host, that's your target server, can forward your credentials to the third host, your administration task may well fail. So Kerberos delegation enables that host to interact with a Kerberos domain controller to obtain a service ticket, what's also known as a ticket granting ticket or TGT, which is derived from your user account's permissions that can be used to access resources on the network. Kerberos constrained delegation enables you to limit which of a computer's services can interact with the KDC to obtain the appropriate ticket on a user's behalf. Use the delegation tab of a computer's account properties in Active Directory users and computers to configure constrained delegation on that computer. You'll need to specify the following, the service type, the user or computer account that can use delegated credentials, and the port and the service principal name of the service that can perform the action. For example, you must allow users with accounts in the contoso.com domain to use a Windows Admin Center computer to manage a server named app1.adatum.com in the adatum.com domain. So currently, Windows Admin Center Gateway is deployed on a host wac.contosa.com. There's a two-way forest trust between the adatum.com and contosa.com single domain forests. So you configure constrained delegation by running set ad computer identity get ad computer wac.contosa.com principles allowed to delegate to account get ad computer app1.adatum.com. Windows Admin Center is the new ubiquitous management interface. You can use it to manage the local workstation, a local server, a remote server, Azure resources. 
you can run Windows Admin Center from a Windows 10 11 workstation. You can run it from within an infrastructure as a service VM running Windows Server up in Azure. There are a range of options that you have. It's the go-to management tool. So it's worth spending a moment taking a look at how to uh, configure and set up Windows Admin Center so that you can use it in those various scenarios. The first thing you need to do is enable Windows Admin Center access. So to manage a remote computer using Windows Admin Center, you must be able to authenticate with that computer. So you'll need a, a user name and a, and a password. You'll need to add the remote computer to your trusted hosts list if the target computer is not in the same Active Directory forest as the computer from which you are managing the remote server. We talked about that a moment ago for PowerShell remoting. It's the same. You use the same commandlet to add um, a host, a remote host to your trusted host lists. And you'll need to open TCP port 5985 and 5986 through any firewalls between the management workstation and the target server or servers. And if the target server is um, an Azure Infrastructure as a Service VM running Windows, you'll also need to configure the network security group to which that VM is connected to facilitate 5985, 5986 inbound. In addition to Windows Admin Server, as a remote management tool, on a Windows 10, Windows 11 workstation, you can also enable the remote server admin tools. RSAT is now not a downloadable component as it was in earlier days. It's now an optional feature which you can enable through the settings app. My one thought about this is that each of these uses remote procedure calls and name pipes, which are slightly older forms of, of network communication, widely used on an on-prem network, but not widely used outside of that environment. And so relying on these requires extensive configuration, potentially, of remote management interfaces. So you'll need to do some work on the target service to enable the remote management ports to facilitate remote management. In my mind, using Windows Admin Center is probably a better approach. And where that's not available or isn't going to address your particular need, for example, to perform repetitive tasks, then PowerShell remoting is probably a better solution. So remote server admin tools, although perfectly functional may not necessarily be the best solution for remote management. In the demonstration, you're going to learn how to use Windows PowerShell, how to use Azure Cloud Shell, how to enable and use Windows Admin Center access. Okay, so the first thing I'd need to do if I wanted to remotely manage my server is to enable the appropriate Windows Remote Management um, listening service and firewall exceptions. I can run WinRoom quick config from the command prompt or indeed PowerShell and it will start the necessary services for me. As you can see, WinRoom service is already running and the exceptions are already enabled. Uh, alternatively, I can do an enable PS remoting, if I can type it, force. And similarly, it's not going to do anything because it's already turned on. If for some reason that doesn't work, it's possible you might have a public network interface on your computer, in which case uh, that will fail. So you'll need to change the status of that public interface to private or otherwise disconnect from that network. Once that's done, then I can remote to this server. So let's switch over to the Windows 11 computer now. So my Windows 11 computer, I'm going to open up Windows Terminal, which provides access to Windows PowerShell. And I'm going to run a command to connect to Contoso DC and execute the commandlet in the script block at the end of the line here. That will open up a remote connection to Contoso DC and execute and then return the output to me. So you can see here the IP configuration from Contoso DC. So that's one way in which I can run a remote command, whatever it might be. But I can also create a connection to the remote machine using a variable. I'm going to call a the variable dollar s. I'm going to create a new PS session and I'm going to specify one computer name here but I can specify potentially several separated by commas or I can even input from a file if I want to. If I just check that that's worked you can see that I've got an open connection and then I can enter that PS session. Oops, that did not work because I spelt it wrong. <laughs> Let's try that a bit better. That's better. 
not enough S's. And you can see at the prefix now, I've got Contoso DC. So that indicates that I am executing the command at the remote end. And let's just run a simple command line tool, hostname. And you can see that returns the hostname Contoso DC. So I'm connected to the remote computer. Anything that I now run here will be running on the remote computer, the output being returned to me. So I've got a, a, a very easy way of being able to use the same commandlets and scripts that I've run on my local host remotely. So switching to my host computer, which has a direct internet connection, I'm going to open up Windows Terminal. It's running Windows 11, so Windows Terminal is the default command line interface, but it provides access to multiple tabs, one of which is PowerShell, but another of which is Azure Cloud Shell. Now, the first time you open up Azure Cloud Shell and connect, you'll need to authenticate with your Azure tenant, but I've already done that, so I'm just going to select the tenant from a list. Now you'll need a storage account in Azure to facilitate a Cloud Shell interface. The first time you run it, you'll be prompted to create that storage account. It's created automatically for you once you, you know, follow the prompts. So here I've got a, a PowerShell command line, which is connected to my Azure space, and I can use that to manage resources within my Azure subscription. So get AZVM should re retrieve a list of, of virtual machines, for example. And if I want to, I can go on to uh, create VMs and, and manage the properties of those VMs. So let's do a quick sample of that now. So I'm going to paste in some syntax here to create a new Azure virtual machine. Specify an admin account and a password. We'll go on and create that virtual machine. Okay, so that's now complete. We can now see that there are um, three virtual machines, so we've created a new one. And in fact, we can go on to perform management of that VM as well. So here I'm going to run a remote command on that VM to install some components, in this case, the web server feature. So let's paste that in. Oh, I think I've got some <laughs> syntactic problems there. Let's try that again. Just quit out of that and try that again. That's better. And now that will install the necessary Windows feature and management components on the remote on the remote virtual machine running up in Zip from the PowerShell command, or rather from Cloud Shell using PowerShell. Now we can see that was successful now. And uh, now we're going to take a look at using Windows Admin Center to remotely manage objects. Okay, so switch to Microsoft Edge and take a look in the Azure portal. We can see that there are three VMs, VM7, which we just created, and you can see that that's running, has a public IP address. Now, if I want to connect to it for management purposes, I can connect to it by using RDP if I want to. That's not very secure because it opens up a well-known port on a public IP. I could configure Azure Bastion, which would enable me to connect using the Azure portal to the or to connect to the Azure portal. And then from there, the Bastion will connect on my behalf via RDP to a private IP um, for that particular host, which is far more secure. But I could also use Windows Admin Center. Now to configure Windows Admin Center, first of all, I'm going to need to enable port TCP port 5985 and 5986 on the network security group that protects this VM. So if I go back to the VM and I look at the networking here, Okay, there are a number of pre-configured settings. So I'm going to configure a new inbound rule. I'm going to specify it as being custom. Port ranges 5985, 5986, which is used for remote management. It's TCP. Everything else looks okay there. I'm going to call it Windows Admin Center and then add that. Now you can see then that there's some additional um, existing ports, port 80 and 3389. 3389 is the RDP port that's used or enabled by default, and you can turn that off, which would be a pretty good idea. And also, if you remember, I added the web service to this VM using Cloud Shell, so that's why that port's open. Again, that's not a great port to have open. It'd probably be better to install a certificate and use 443, but that's a discussion for another time. So now I think I've got everything ready for connecting to this VM. 
so let's give that a go. I've got Windows Admin Center installed on the local computer. I'm signed into Azure, which you do through the settings menu. I now need to add a host. In this case, it's an Azure VM. And then I can select my subscription and choose the resource group. Uh, it's Contos Resource Group 2, which contains the VM that I just added. And I can select the public IP and add that. So the next step is to connect to the machine for management purposes. Select Manage As, choose the account that I set up. I created the VM and connect. And finally, I should be able to establish a connection to the remote computer. And I can see some basic information here on the overview page. And then I can go on to have a look at the Azure Hybrid Center, which makes accessible a number of features that you might want to, to configure in an Azure environment, some of which we're going to talk about in the next lesson. For example, Azure Arc can be set up from here. You can enable and configure Azure Backup, Azure File Sync, Site Recovery, Azure Network Adapter, and a range of other features, all of which make it easier for you to integrate Azure resources into your on-prem network and vice versa. And then there's some generic sort of server management stuff, remembering that this is, although it's a, a virtual machine and it's running in Azure, it's still a Windows Server computer. And one of the nice things you can do here is open up PowerShell. And that actually enables you to connect to the remote machine using PowerShell without having to do all that remote stuff that we looked at earlier. So it creates a remote PowerShell session for me, and then I'm good to go here. I can run all of the PowerShell commandlets that we looked at earlier, and of course, many others. In the demonstration, you learned how to use Windows PowerShell, how to use Azure Cloud Shell, how to enable Windows Admin Center access, and how to use Windows Admin Center. So in the last lesson, we looked at managing resources, be those on-prem or in the cloud, by using on-prem tools like Cloud Shell in Windows Terminal or by using Windows Admin Center from a, a Windows 11 computer and connecting to the appropriate resource. So now we're going to take a look at using some of the tools that are available in Azure to manage your uh, on-prem resources. The first of those is Azure Arc. This enables you to manage your Windows Server instances both in hybrid and multi-cloud environments. So after you've enrolled your Windows Server instance into Azure Arc, the server is assigned an Azure Resource ID. And this enables you to include that enrolled server instance in an Azure resource group and then to perform management functionality on it. For example, you can assign Azure policy guest configuration to the device. You can manage the security settings on the device. You can perform configuration management of the device. You can monitor the device. You can manage updates on the device. And the requirements for this are to deploy and configure the Azure Connected Machine Agent on each server instance. You can do that by using a script. You can also choose to install a Log Analytics Agent so that you can perform monitoring tasks such as operating system and workload monitoring, managing automation runbooks, update management, and managing services. To connect your Windows Server instances, use one of the following methods. Generate and download an onboarding script through the Azure portal. Use Windows Admin Center to connect a Windows Server instance to Azure Arc. Use the PowerShell commandlet to connect a Windows Server instance to Azure Arc, specifically connect AZ Connected Machine. You can use PowerShell desired state configuration. DSC enables you to align a computer's current configuration with a particular state, a desired state, a, a, a standard configuration, if you like, that you want to apply. That may include the fact that the computer is onboarded to Arc. So to use the Azure portal, select Azure Arc and then add servers with Azure Arc and then use the wizard to identify the subscription, resource group and server details in terms of region and operating system. Then you can generate and download and run the script. So you'll download that script, you'll switch to your on-prem machine, sign in and then run the script on that machine which will uh, install the agent and then prompt you to sign into your subscription and then onboard the server. Once you've onboarded it, you can review the list of servers, the available servers, under the Azure Arc node in the portal. You can connect to a specific server, and then you can perform a variety of management tasks 
using facilities like policies, update management, inventory, change tracking and security. In demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can enrol a server in Azure Arc. So I'm connected to my Azure subscription and I'm going to select search for and select Azure Arc. And then I can scroll down here and choose servers. I can select add a server. And then if I've got multiple servers, I can generate a script for that scenario. Or in this instance, I'm going to add a single server. So I'll generate a script with that in mind. Click through the wizard. I'm going to select the resource group that I want to place my onboarded server into. So I'll choose Contoso resource group. Specify the region and the operating system and how I'm going to connect to that machine. In this instance, it's through a public endpoint. Okay, any tags I want to add, I can do so here. Now I've got the page here with the script. I can now copy that or otherwise download it. It's prompting me there to, from a security point of view. So it's downloaded the onboarding script and now I would need to copy that script onto my on-prem server and then run the script to associate the server with my Azure resource group and then to make it manageable. So I'm going to perform that task right now. So if I switch to my virtual machine, this is local, Contoso SVR4, so it's running on my host computer here. I now need to download the script. I've done that already, but I'm going to paste it into the downloads folder on this virtual machine. And then when I'm ready, I'm going to run that with PowerShell. And I'm going to choose to confirm that I want to run the script. So it's now installing the Azure Connected Machine Agent, downloading the requirements for that, installing the agent package. In due course, it's going to prompt me to sign in to my subscription and then to perform a security check. So here we go. So I'm going to navigate to a, a web page. So open up Microsoft Edge. Specify the device logon page here. And then I need to enter the code that was generated here. and then go on to sign in. Now I'm going to stop at this point because I want to show you the process of using Windows Admin Center. So I'm just going to cancel out of this. So we switch to my host and uh, here I am on the host and I've got Windows Admin Center open. I've added the server. So I'm going to connect to that. Choose the Azure Hybrid Center. It'll take a moment to think about that. So here we've got the setup Azure Arc option. So we're going to select that. Select the Azure subscription. Choose the resource group. We're using existing resource group. Put it in Contosa resource group. The region's already defined. So uh, I'm going to say set up. And then we'll revisit this in a moment to verify that that's been completed. Okay, so if I select notifications here, I can see set up for Azure Arc for servers. Looks like it was successful. And I can now go to Azure Hybrid Center. And then there are other options that I can configure here, but everything is configured. If I switch to the portal and take a look under Azure Arc for servers, there we go. I can see that Contosa Serve 4 is now connected. If I now select that, I'm able to configure and manage the device through the Azure portal and I can perform things like update management, configure policies, implement and manage change tracking and so on. So fully integrated into the Azure space, although it's an on-prem virtual machine. It's comparatively easy to set up using Windows Admin Center. It just required that we click the button set up as opposed to downloading a script, running a script, and then signing in and, and completing the process that way. So Windows Admin Center is obviously the preferred way to do this because it's much easier and less error prone. So in the demo, you learned how to enroll a server in Azure Arc by using an onboarding script, 
launched from the portal or copied down from the portal or by using Windows Admin Center. Azure VM extensions provide additional capabilities within your virtual machine. So you can use a Azure Arc enabled VM extensions to configure the following functionality on your Windows Server hybrid instances. So you can enable and manage the log analytics agent. You can enable and manage VM insights, download and run scripts using the custom script extension or update and refresh certificates stored in Azure Key Vault. So you can install the following extensions. Custom script extension for Windows, Log Analytics Agent for Azure Arc, Azure Monitor Agent, Azure Monitor for VMs Insights, Azure Key Vault Certificate Sync, Azure Automation Hybrid Runbook Worker, and Microsoft Anti-Malware Extension. In the demonstration, you'll learn how to install extensions using Azure Arc. So step one is to switch to Azure Arc and to select the connected server. And then under the settings heading, select extensions and then choose add. And then I can select whichever extension or extensions I want to install. So for example, if I want to add the log analytics agent, I can select that, select next. Now to add the agent, I need to connect it to a log analytics workspace. I've already created a workspace on this tab here. And to make sure I'm connecting the agent to the correct or the VM extension that's installing the agent to the correct workspace. I need the workspace ID and the primary key. I'm going to copy those from here and enter them in, in here. And copy the primary key there and enter it there. It's worth noting that if I did this manually, I'd have to download the agent and connect to the VM and install the agent and run through a wizard that would then prompt me for this information. This is considerably easier and quicker. Once I've got that all ready, I can select create. And that will then install that extension for me. So in the demonstration, you learned how to install an extension using Azure Arc. So let's have a look at Azure Policy Guest Configuration. Azure Policy Guest Configuration uses PowerShell Desired State Configuration version 3. And this enables you to audit and, if necessary, configure Windows Server Operating System settings. So you can deploy Azure Policy Guest Configuration to Windows Server Infrastructure as a Server instances, Azure Arc enabled Windows Server instances, and you can deploy on a per instance basis or apply it to a large number of hosts using Azure Policy. It enables you to specify what properties a Windows server should have. So for example, which services or server roles must be installed. It checks for changed or new guest assignments every five minutes. After a new assignment is detected, settings relating to that configuration are checked every 15 minutes. Azure Update Management enables you to automate the deployment of updates to computers that are running Windows or Linux. It enables you to manage the deployment of updates to those servers using Windows Admin Center. It enables you to view update compliance across Windows Server instances that you're managing with the service and enable you to determine which instances aren't up to date. Azure Update Management is integrated with Azure Monitor Logs, so that enables you to record update assessments and update deployment results as log data. You can configure on-premise Windows Servers to use Azure Update Management using Windows Admin Center. A Windows Server instance to use Update Management through Windows Admin Center. And you can also configure a Windows Server instance by enrolling the instance using Azure Arc or PowerShell. When configuring a scheduled update, you must provide the following information. The name of the update deployment, the operating system, groups of machines to update, update classifications, include exclude updates, scheduled settings, maintenance window, and reboot options. You can integrate Windows Server with Long Analytics Azure Monitor collects, analyzes, and responds to telemetry from workloads in your hybrid environment. And you can use Azure Monitor to perform the following tasks. By using application insights, you can detect and diagnose problems with your workloads and workload dependencies. Using VM insights and container insights, you can correlate infrastructure problems. With Log Analytics, you can review monitoring data. Azure Monitor metrics, you can ingest data from monitored resources. And you can also perform automated operation tasks and create visualizations from derived and collected data. Azure Monitor collects the following data. Application monitoring data, 
guest operating system monitoring data, Azure resource monitoring data, Azure subscription monitoring data, Azure tenant monitoring data. To prepare an Azure subscription for Azure Monitor, you must deploy at least one Log Analytics workspace. To install Azure Monitor, in Windows Admin Center, use the following procedure. Click Azure Hybrid Services and then select Discover Azure Services. On the list of those resources in the Azure Monitor section, select Setup. If an appropriate resource group and Log Analytics workspace already exists within your subscription, then Azure Monitor Setup detects these, otherwise you can create them. After you've configured the connection, you can review analytics information in the appropriate Log Analytics workspace in the Azure portal. This procedure assumes that you've connected the Windows Admin Center instance to an Azure subscription. That's easily done. You use the Settings menu in Windows Admin Center and you provide the credentials to sign into your subscription. This is lesson five, manage virtual machines and containers. And in this lesson, we'll cover creating and managing Windows Server VMs, Hyper-V network settings, nested virtualization, virtual hard disks, checkpoints, creating and managing containers, and deploying virtual machines in Azure. The hands-on sessions include creating and managing a virtual machine, managing checkpoints, creating an Azure virtual network, configuring a network security group, creating Azure VMs, enabling Windows Admin Center in the Azure portal, and implementing Azure Bastion. Before we get into some detail about how Hyper-V handles virtual machines in the Windows operating system, it's worth just considering what is a virtual machine. A virtual machine runs on top of a hypervisor. Now, Windows Server will use Hyper-V to provide that capability. Effectively, the hypervisor sits between the guest operating systems running in virtual machines and the physical hardware on which those guests run. And between there also we have the host operating system itself, in this case, Windows Server. The VM runs a guest operating system that might differ from the host operating system. In other words, they don't necessarily need to be the same. This gives you the capability of running different operating systems on the same computer. So you might create a Linux VM or one perhaps running Mac OS or some variant of Unix uh, sitting all on top of Windows Server. You can run multiple virtual machines on the same host. That's an advantage because it allows you to utilize more effectively the hardware resource within your physical host computer. It's a fact that when we're specifying the hardware configuration for server workloads, we tend to over specify around about 40% of the available capacity in terms of memory and processor is used when we run physical workloads on a physical host. But by virtualizing, we're able to more efficiently use the available capacity. The VMs are isolated from the host and from one another. This isolation actually has some significant benefits from a security standpoint, never mind from the capability of being able to run multiple guest operating systems. And some of these features, these isolation features, are leveraged in some of the security features that you get in client operating systems such as Windows 10 and Windows 11. If you connect your virtual machines to virtual networks, you can enable connectivity between your virtual machines. When you create virtual machines, the first thing you're asked is to define the virtual machine type. There are two options, Generation 1 or Gen 1. These are an older standard. They are implemented on an emulation of a BIOS that you might find on an earlier computer. They attempt to replicate the hardware of the host and they support legacy network adapters and other legacy devices. So we're probably, if we're using Gen 1 virtual machines, we're probably looking to, to create an instance of a, of a computer that's maybe five or 10 years old in terms of it, its underlying hardware capabilities, the features that it has, the way in which it's configured, the way it starts up. Generally speaking, there's no particular reason why you'd want to use Gen 1 machines. Gen 2 machines or Generation 2 machines enable you to start from a SCSI virtual hard disk. You can also start from a SCSI virtual DVD. Gen 2 machines support UFI firmware on the virtual machine and that's really quite important because UFI is the more modern standard and through the use of things like UFI you can implement some advanced startup features, security features. 
So secure boot, for example, emulation of a trusted platform module. These capabilities allow for us to apply the same security features in the startup environment for our virtual machines as we do for our physical computers. They also implement PXE or preboot execution from a standard network adapter. Now that's useful for when you want to connect across the network from a, a virtual machine that currently does not have an operating system installed. That might then enable you to deploy some sort of operating system to the virtual machine across the network. When you choose the virtual machine type, you can't change this type later. So it's a, a once only decision for that particular VM. If you need to change, you'll have to recreate the VM all over again. Generally, you'll always choose Gen 2 VM types over Gen 1. The exception might be where you're trying to run a 32-bit operating system, in which case the only option you have is to use Gen 1. So when you create your virtual machine or virtual machines, you'll need to choose a virtual hard disk format. The hard disk is used in the same way as a hard disk is used in a physical computer. So that's to say that it stores the operating system and data and so on. The virtual hard disks come in two formats, VHD and VHDX. VHD is the older standard and supports fairly limited disk sizes, comparatively speaking, whereas VHDX can be up to 64 terabytes in size. It also supports a larger block size for both dynamic and differential disks, which we'll look at in a moment. In addition, it supports a 4K logical sector size on virtual disks. That can be important if you're working with a lot of small files. It maintains internal logs that can help reduce corruption and provides a capability to support trimming to reclaim unused space. So generally, you'll always choose VHDX. In addition to the format, you'll also need to choose a virtual hard disk type. There are three to choose from. Fixed size, dynamically expanding, and differencing. So a fixed size, I suppose, might be an optimized choice, you know, getting the, the best performance. If you know that you want to, to find a disk of a certain capacity and knowing that you will not need to grow that disk. If you grow a virtual disk, you're growing a file in, in essence. And it may be that that file, which has to be stored on a physical disk on the physical host, may end up being expanded into areas that are not contiguous on the disk and that may have an impact on performance. It's worth bearing in mind that, that the impact of that is not perhaps as significant as it used to be. After all, if you're using high performance SSDs, then non-contiguous areas of space is not a particularly relevant concept anymore. So you choosing a fixed disk size maybe doesn't give you the performance benefits that once it, it may have done. So dynamically expanding is probably the default and logical choice. Here you'll set up a maximum size of the disk, but only the used space is allocated. So a comparatively small amount of space is allocated on the physical disk. And then that disk or that file rather, um, the virtual hard disk file will grow on the physical disk as your needs dictate. That's much more efficient of disk space. If you think about it, if you're allocating a couple of terabytes of space in a virtual hard disk, initially you're not going to use most of that. You'll maybe use, uh, I don't know, a couple of hundred gigabytes of space to support the operating system and applications and so forth for your virtual machine. And the rest will be allocated to the virtual hard disk on the physical hard disk. So that's very inefficient. So by using dynamically expanding, you can just use additional space as it's needed. And that's probably the choice in most situations you'll make. A differencing disk is used for particular scenarios. So with a differencing disk, you create a parent-child relationship between one disk and another disk. So for example, if you needed to build a number of Windows servers on the same Windows Server version and edition, so I don't know, data center with um, desktop experience and using Windows Server 2022, and you knew you needed to build three servers, what you could do is to build the initial server up to a certain point in time through the installation process. Perhaps, for example, to the, the initial setup, and then at that point you maybe capture the hard disk at that state, and then mark it as read-only. Then you can create a new operating system or a new virtual machine pointing to the operating system that you've partially installed on the existing disk. And you do that by creating a differencing disk that established a, a parent-child relationship between the new VM that you're building and the disk that you created earlier. So the disk you created earlier no longer changes, but the difference is being recorded as you go on and complete the installation for the first of your several virtual machines based off that initial disk. 
are recorded into the differencing disk. That can be much more efficient of disk space if you have a large number of VMs that are based on that initial configuration. It's something that we use quite a lot in training. So often we'll build a couple of servers and, and half a dozen workstations for a classroom environment. And it's quite common for those workstations to all be built off the same base tier drive. And in fact, you can actually create multiple tiers of differencing disks. So you can have a base and you can have a middle and then you can have a, a top tier, which is the, the ultimate differencing disk. And so in that way, you can accommodate a large number of variations and configurations with a fairly small amount of disk space. So for specific use cases, differencing this might be the choice to make. So you'll almost certainly want to connect your virtual machine to a network. And so for that, you'll need to create a Hyper-V network. Typically, you'll need to start by creating a network adapter and you'll want to then connect that to a virtual network itself. So you've got a couple of things to do. You've got to configure the virtual network and the network adapter. When you choose to set up your Hyper-V network, there are a number of performance features that you can enable. Um, the first of these is bandwidth management, and you can enable that here, as you can see on the network adapter, by selecting the Enable Bandwidth Management checkbox. So bandwidth management enables you to specify a minimum and maximum throughput in terms of network traffic for a particular virtual network adapter. So the minimum is the allocation amount that Hyper-V reserves for that particular network adapter. And the maximum bandwidth allocation specify an upper limit for utilization. By default, no minimums or maximums are specified if you enable bandwidth management, but you can go on to select the appropriate values to manage the throughput on, on your network adapter. Single root IO virtualization or SRIOV is a, a feature that enables you to increase the network throughput by bypassing a virtual switch and sending network traffic straight to the virtual machine. Now for that to work, the physical network adapter in your host needs to be able to map directly to the VM. And so as such, the SRIOV requires the VM's operating system to include a specific driver for the physical network adapter. You can only use this feature if the physical network adapter and the network adapter drivers used with the virtualization host, your Hyper-V host in this case, support this capability. The third of these features, performance features, is dynamic virtual machine queue. This is a, an add-on technology you can use to optimize your network performance. When you connect a VM through a virtual switch to a network adapter that supports this feature and the feature is enabled on the virtual network adapter's properties, the physical network adapter can use DMA or direct memory address to forward traffic directly to the VM. This improves the throughput on the network connection. The next thing you'll need to configure is a virtual switch. Now in Hyper-V there are three possible connection options for a virtual switch. External, internal and private. So with an external switch, you connect the virtual switch to a network adapter in the host. That means that virtual machines connected to that switch can communicate through that network adapter to whatever the host is connected to. So for example, it might be possible for the virtual machines to obtain an IP configuration from a DHCP server, which is on the physical network to which that physical adapter is connected. And that might be appropriate. Maybe also they can gain access to uh, an internet connection through an appropriately configured uh, network address translation device or similar. But the important thing to note is that you are fully on the physical network and, and therefore any other host computers also connected to that external network can communicate or potentially communicate with the virtual machines connected to a virtual switch on an external network. An internal network allows for the connected virtual machines to communicate with one another and also to communicate with the host as if it was on the same virtual network. External communications to other hosts or to other resources on the physical network is, is not possible, so it's isolated to the host and to uh, connected VMs on the same virtual switch. A private network virtual switch is one which is or enables control of communication such that any connected virtual machines can only communicate with one another. They can neither communicate with the external world nor can they communicate with the host that's supporting those particular virtual machines. So depending on what you're trying to do, you'll connect or you'll create a virtual switch of type external, internal or private, and then you'll select that switch when you're creating your um, virtual machine so that you have the required level of connectivity. Once you've set up your virtual machine, you can connect to it using VM Enhanced Session Mode if you want. 
This behaves much like a remote desktop protocol session or RDP session to a physical server, and it enables you to perform, whilst you're connected to your VM, cut, copy and paste actions, audio redirections so that sounds generated by the virtual machine are redirected to the host computer where you can hear them, and volume and device mapping. It's a really convenient way of working with virtual machines because to all intents and purposes it's acting as a, an RDP connected physical host. However, this is only available for VMs running on Windows Server 2012 R2 or Windows 8.1 and newer. Now that's not much of a restriction these days. Those are quite old versions of the Windows Server and Windows Client platform. The other thing to remember is that the user account that you use to connect to the VM or to sign in at the VM if you're using RDP session mode must belong to that computer's remote desktop users group. Now the administrator account typically will, but virtually all other accounts will not. So it's something you'll need to remember to, to configure. Nested virtualization is a useful feature. It enables you to configure a virtual machine to support virtualization. In other words, you can run a virtual machine on a virtual machine. Now there are plenty of applications in in my environment where that's useful. If I'm teaching a course and I've got virtual machines that are running in a, in a data center somewhere that students are connecting to, the ability for them to create additional virtual machines on that remote virtual machine is, is fairly useful for training purposes. But there may be other scenarios where this might be a benefit. To enable the feature, you must first stop the virtual machine. Then on the host which is running that virtual machine, you'll need to execute the following PowerShell command. Set VM processor, then specify the VM name by using the VM name switch. And then finally use expose virtualization extensions true. That will then turn on nested virtualization. When you restart your virtual machine, you'll be able to install the appropriate hypervisor. In this case, typically Hyper-V and its management tools. You'll then be able to create virtual machines just in the same way that you do on a physical host computer. Hyper-V supports the following integration services, which add functionality to your hosted VMs. Operating system shutdown, so that you can automatically shut your virtual machine down. Time synchronization. Data exchange. Heartbeat. Backup via the volume shadow copy service. And guest services. Operating system shutdown enables you to shut down the VM from the virtualization host rather than from within the virtual machine's operating system. So that's very convenient. You can just right click a VM in Hyper-V list of VMs and shut it down from there. Time synchronization synchronizes the virtualization's host's clock with the VM's clock. That helps ensure the VM clock doesn't drift away from when the VM is started, stopped or reverted to a previous checkpoint. Data exchange enables the virtualization host to read and modify certain specific VM registry values. Heartbeat allows the virtualization host to verify that the VM operating system is still functioning properly and responding to requests. Backup via the volume checkpoint service. For VMs that support volume shadow copy, this synchronizes with the virtualization host, allowing backup to the VM even while the VM's still running. And guest services allows you to copy files from the virtualization host to the VM using the copy VM file Windows PowerShell commandlet. Checkpoints provide one of the most useful features about virtual machines. With a checkpoint, you can capture a point in time. So the entire configuration of the virtual machine is captured in the state that it's in. So the computer might be running or not running, but whatever, that state is retained. You can capture as many checkpoints as you've got space to store. And then when you want to work with a particular point in time, you can apply that checkpoint. So in this instance, I'm the screenshot displays the 2022 underscore Contoso DC virtual machine, which is currently off and that there are one, two, three, four, five different checkpoints over a period of months that have been captured. The one that's currently being used is one that's been named security principles added, but any of those could be initiated by simply selecting it. And the computer, the virtual computer in this case, would revert to that point in time. Before you can work with any checkpoints, you'll need to turn that capability on. So for a given virtual machine, under the management heading, select in settings, select the checkpoints tab and then enable checkpoints. Thereafter you can specify that you want to use production checkpoints as part of a backup strategy for the guest operating system or standard checkpoints so create application consistent checkpoints. You can also even use automatic checkpoints. In the demonstration I'm going to show you how to create a network switch, how to create a virtual hard disk, how to create a virtual machine and how to manage checkpoints. Okay so here I am in Hyper-V. I'm now going to go through the process of configuring a virtual switch and then I'm going to create a virtual hard disk and then I'm going to create a virtual machine 
and manage the checkpoints of that virtual machine. So we we'll start by going to Virtual Switch Manager. And from here, I can create a new virtual switch based on either external, internal, or private. Remembering that external connects to a physical network adapter, allowing connectivity to anything which is also connected to that adapter. Internal restricts communication between the physical host that I'm running my virtual machines on and any virtual machines connected to that virtual switch. But the virtual machines cannot communicate with uh, other hosts or indeed anything uh, elsewhere on, on the network to which the host is connected. And then private restricts communications between the virtual machines on that particular virtual switch on this particular physical computer. So I'm going to choose a private switch here. I'm going to give it the name of private three and then select OK. Now, when I create a virtual machine, I can automatically create a virtual hard disk as part of the configuration process, but it's usually best practice to at least consider creating them beforehand so that you're making a choice in an unhurried manner. So I'm going to create a new hard disk. And remember, you can choose between VHD, VHDX, or for certain applications, VHD sets. I'm going to choose VHDX. And I can choose fixed size, dynamically expanding or differencing. If I choose differencing, I'm going to need to specify the parent drive. And if I choose fixed size, then of course it will allocate the entirety of the volume size as a single VHDX on the hard disk. If I choose dynamically expanding, it will create a comparatively small disk initially and then grow that as needed. So I now need to give the virtual hard disk a name. So we're going to call this one demo disk. It's going to save the disk into this default location, but I can store that somewhere else if I've got a requirement to do so. I now need to specify the maximum size of the virtual hard disk. Remember, it doesn't start off at that size. It will just grow to that size. I'll leave it at the default value of 127 gig here. I can also copy the contents of a specified physical disk. I'm going to select next here to create an empty VHDX. The next step is to create a virtual machine. So I'm going to give it a meaningful name, demo VM. I can specify where I want to store the virtual machine if I want to store it somewhere other than the default location. If I want to change the default location, I can do that on the properties of the Hyper-V host. So I'm going to select next here. I specify the Gen 1 or Gen 2 setting. If you're not sure, always go for Gen 2. It provides you with more capabilities that are probably far more relevant for modern computers than Gen 1. But if you've got a specific use for a Gen 1 VM, then you'll select that. Specify the amount of memory you want to allocate to the VM. What's nice here is that you can use dynamic memory for the virtual machine so that although it initially starts with um, 4 gig of memory in this instance, it will not use all of that unless it's necessary. You can change the amount of memory that you allocate, but not when the VM is running. Then you can choose the virtual switch to which you want to connect it. I created one earlier called Private 3, so we'll select that now. Next, I'm going to select the hard disk. It will create one based on the name of the virtual machine automatically for me and store it in the default location. But if I want, I can choose an existing hard disk and browse to locate it. So that's the disk that I created a little while back. Select that one. And I can choose if I want to, to attach a hard disk later and then configure other aspects of the VM and then attach the disk when I'm, when I'm ready. So I'm going to continue past this point. And now I'll just review the settings. Everything looks OK. I now will choose Finish. Now the VMs are sorted alphabetically. So I need to scroll down to find my demo VM. This is this one here. And I'm going to choose the settings for the VM. And I'm going to go down to Checkpoints first of all. I can see that Enable Checkpoints is turned on by default. I'm going to turn off using Automatic Checkpoints and then select Apply. And if there's any other changes I want to make, for example, to the processor configuration, which I wasn't um, asked about during the wizard, I can do that now. So for example, I might want to add an additional virtual processor. I might want to review my settings regarding memory. If I want to turn on some of the security features, Secure Boot is turned on by default, but I may also want to enable a trusted platform module. And then other security settings are also available. Now, when I boot the virtual machine for the first time, it doesn't at the moment contain any operating system. And so I'm going to need to build that. So as we can see here, it's going to boot off the hard drive, which is empty. It will also boot from the network adapter. And that may be a way in which I'm able to build the operating system by connecting across the network to a deployment server. 
Or alternatively, I can attach a virtual DVD to the SCSI controller here and then insert into that an operating system. So I can select an operating system image, an ISO file, and use that as the basis for building my operating system. So for now, I'm just going to leave that as it is. If I want to add any additional hard disks, I can do that by going to the SCSI controller and choosing to add a hard drive. Down under integration services, all these integration services, except for guest services, is currently enabled. If I need the guest services integration service, I can enable that, but otherwise I'm fine. So if I click OK to that, I haven't done anything with this virtual machine yet, but I might want to create a checkpoint, which is a capture of this point in time. And obviously at the moment, there is no operating system installed. So I'll maybe rename that checkpoint and I'll call it initial setup, no OS. And then if I want to go beyond that point, I can start the machine configure it and capture another checkpoint if I want to. And then if I want to go back to this point in time, I can apply that checkpoint. So let's have a look at applying checkpoints to virtual machines. This computer here, let me go to the right one. This computer here has a number of checkpoints that I can work with. So if I want to apply a particular checkpoint, I can select it, right click it and choose apply. If I want to tidy up my checkpoints, get rid of them essentially, I can do that and I can start by getting rid of all of the checkpoints and it will then merge, if I choose delete checkpoint subtree, it will merge all of the settings from this checkpoint back into the original. So effectively starting with a clean slate. However, it will be the point in time, in this case, security principles added, that will be the state of the machine. If I want to go back to the original, I can do that by applying it and then I can then delete the other checkpoints if I want to. Checkpoints consume space on the disk, of course, the physical disk but not as much as five or six iterations of the same virtual machine in its entirety. So it's more efficient, but occasionally you might want to tidy them up by deleting the checkpoint subtree or deleting a specific checkpoint. In the demonstration, you learned how to create a network switch, how to create a virtual hard disk, how to create a virtual machine and how to manage checkpoints. It's important to understand what containers are before we take a look at how we can use them. So containers are based on images. A container image is a template from which you can create a container. There are two types of container images, a base image and then a specific image. A container base image is the image of the operating system upon which you base all of your other images. A container image stores changes made to running container base operating system image or other container image. A container instance is when you run a container, a copy of the container image you're starting is created and it will run on your host. If you make changes to the container instance, those won't be written back to the original container image. Think of a container instance as being a temporary version of a container. The sandbox is an environment that you can make modifications to an existing container and that would be before you want to commit the changes to create a new container image. If you don't commit the changes to the new image, those changes are lost. A new container image has the container image from which you created it as its dependency. The container host is a computer that runs your containers. The container host could be a physical server, a virtual server, or even some sort of cloud-based platform as a service provider. Container registries are the central stores for container images. Microsoft have such a, a container registry. You can download various images from the registries. Containers like virtual machines are examples of compute workloads. But there are some differences between containers and virtual machines. It's important that you understand what those differences are. For example, isolation. Containers provide a fairly minimal or lightweight level of isolation from the container and the host upon which the container is running. Also, there's a limited amount of isolation between one container and another container. With virtual machines, the boundary is a lot stronger. There's a good level of isolation, complete in fact, from the host operating system and a given virtual machine and any other virtual machines. The operating system. Now containers run just the user mode portion of an operating system. So that's the bit that interfaces with the user, but also with applications. This means that containers use fewer resources. Whereas 
a virtual machine runs a complete operating system, including both user mode and kernel mode, which requires additional resources, memory, processor, and storage. Deployment. When you're dealing with containers, you might want to deploy an individual container using Docker from the command line, or you may want to deploy multiple containers using some sort of orchestrator like Azure Kubernetes. With virtual machines, you're quite likely to use something like Hyper-V Manager or Windows Admin Center to deploy individual virtual machines, or possibly something like Windows PowerShell or System Center Endpoint Configuration Manager if you're dealing with multiple virtual machines. Persistent storage. Containers use Azure disks for local storage for a single node, or possibly Azure files, which can be made available as SMB shares, for storage shared by multiple nodes or servers. When you're dealing with VMs, of course, you're using virtual hard disks for local storage for a single VM, or possibly an SMB file share for storage for which, or to which several servers have access. In terms of fault tolerance, if a cluster node fails, any containers running on it can be recreated by the orchestrator, on another cluster node. With virtual machines, of course, you can fail over to another server in a cluster with the VM's operating system restarting on that other server. This is a graphic that represents the architecture of virtual machines. So at the top of the architecture, you have applications running and communicating with binaries and libraries, and then communicating with the guest operating system. You can run multiple virtual machines on a single host, of course, and that's represented here. App 1 is running on a particular virtual machine, while App 2 is running on another virtual machine. Although, of course, you can combine apps in a single VM if that's what you want to do. It could be the case that App 1 is running on one guest operating system and App 2 on a completely different operating system. Neither VM needs to be running the same operating system as being used on the host. The host, of course, in this instance, is going to be Windows Server. So we're talking about a hypervisor implemented using Hyper-V. The host operating system, therefore, is Windows Server. But both guests might be completely different operating systems, or indeed they might be the same. If we compare that with containers, you've got a couple of applications running, communicating with binaries and libraries, and you'll notice that the container environment doesn't contain a guest operating system. It communicates with the host operating system. This means that the containers, or the apps that are running within the containers, must be able to communicate with the host operating system. That restricts you in some respects because it means that you can't run different containers based on different operating systems on the same host. They'll all share the same host operating system. But the advantage of that is that you don't need to run multiple guest operating systems with the overhead that that has relating to hardware resources. So containers offer a much more targeted, more efficient use of compute resources compared with VMs. But there are some significant differences in the architectures that might push you in a particular direction if you're choosing to host an app. When you're managing Windows Server container images, consider the following. You can retrieve the following Microsoft published container images. Windows Server Core, Nano Server, Windows, Windows Server. These are all available from the Microsoft Container Registry. If you ever need to update your images, you can't perform in a production environment a direct update. Instead, you create a fresh container from the original container image. You then update the fresh container you save the updated container as a new container image. You remove the container in production and you deploy a new container to production based on the updated image. When you're managing container images, you'll use Docker. To save a Docker image, use the Docker save command. To load a Docker image from a saved image, use the Docker load command. To remove an image by using the Docker RMI command, run Docker RMI and then the name of the image. A container instance is a separate copy of a container image that has its own existence. Create a new container instance by using the docker run command. Windows containers support the following network modes. Network address translation, transparent, overlay, L2 bridge, L2 tunnel. With NAT, each container is assigned an IP address from a private range, typically 172.16.0.0.12. When you use NAT, you can configure port forwarding from your container host to the container endpoint. With transparent, each container endpoint connects to the physical network. The containers can be assigned an IP address statically, either that or through DHCP. Use overlay mode when you've configured the Docker engine to run in swarm mode. Overlay allows, enables your container endpoints to be connected across multiple container hosts. 
With L2 Bridge Mode, container endpoints are on the same IP subnet as used by the host. However, you must assign IP addresses statically. All containers on the host contain the same or have the same MAC address. If you deploy containers in Azure, you might want to use L2 Tunnel Mode. Let's review how to create Windows Server container images. Create a new container image by configuring a running container instance in a desired way, so however you want to set that up. Then capturing that instance as a new image by using the docker commit command. Then removing the container using the docker rm command. When you're planning on managing virtual machines in Azure, before you start down the road of creating virtual machines, it's a good idea to consider at least creating the virtual networks to which those machines will be connected. Now, although when you create a virtual machine, it will automatically create the necessary networking infrastructure, that's not a best practice. It's a good idea to configure your networking in the same way, virtually, in the same way as you would in a physical network. You define the networking, you configure the physical infrastructure, and then you start attaching physical hosts to that infrastructure. So when you're looking at Azure Virtual Networks, you need to be aware of what they are. They constitute a logical boundary, which is defined by a private IP address space of, of your choice. You can divide that IP address space up into one or more subnets, just in the same way as you do on, on a regular on-prem network. It's important for the exam that you're fairly conversant with IP4 addressing and subnetting, otherwise you might find this aspect particularly challenging. By placing a virtual machine on the same virtual network as any other virtual machine, you provide those two virtual machines with a direct IP connectivity path so they can both communicate with one another. So that effectively they exist in the same private IP address space. You can also connect different virtual networks together and you can connect your virtual networks in Azure to your on-premise networks, which effectively makes Azure an extension of your own data center. After you've created your virtual networks, you'll start creating your virtual machines. Each virtual machine will require a network interface. This provides a connection between the VM and the virtual network. A VM requires at least one network interface connected to a virtual network. Multiple network interfaces allow a VM to connect to different subnets in the same virtual network and send and receive traffic over the most appropriate network interface. A really great feature about networking in Azure is you can use network security groups. A network security group is designed to filter inbound and outbound network traffic. They are associated with security rules that are used to allow or deny that filtered traffic. So this enables you to control that network traffic by allowing or denying specific traffic types. So for instance, you can allow or deny specific services, or you can choose specific TCP or UDP port numbers that you want to allow inbound or outbound. You can assign an NSG to a network interface to filter network traffic on just that network interface, or to a subnet to filter traffic on all connected network interfaces on the subnet or both network interfaces and subnets, and then each network security group is evaluated independently. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to create an Azure virtual network, how to configure a network security group, and then how to create virtual machines. So to create a virtual network from the Azure portal, search for and select virtual networks, and then select create virtual network. Choose the subscription and resource group in which you want to create the virtual network and then give it a name. I then click onto IP addresses and here you can review the IP4 address space. By default you're allocated a block of 65,536 addresses in the 10.0.0.0 slash 16 network. That's probably sufficient for most needs and it's probably a pretty good starting point. You can use any private address space that you want to here um, but the 10 net addresses is, is a pretty good place to start. You'll notice that a subnet called default has already been created and it's been assigned the 10.0.0.0 slash 24 subnet. So if you want to create additional subnets and this is a good time to do it, click add subnet and then define the subnet name. So I'm going to call this one subnet 1 Consistency in naming is really important, otherwise when you're looking at a network topology it has very little meaning to you. If you've got useful names that are representative of the IP addresses or devices that are related to that subnet, then that's helpful. So here I'm going to use 10.0.1.0 slash 24 and then I'm going to add that and then if I need any more subnets I can go ahead and create them. Otherwise I can click on to security. If I've got a bastion host 
I can select enable and configure the settings. If I've got a firewall, I can enable those as well. On tags, I can configure any tags for my to tie into my resource configuration in Azure. I don't have any right now. So I'm going to select review and create. A basic check is made against the settings. And if all is well, you can select create. So it takes a moment to set up. There we go. So I can go to the resource now and review the settings. From the settings, I can review the address space if I want to and add and remove subnets as needed under the subnet page. And then if I want to configure a bastion, I can select that option. Or if I want to configure integration with Microsoft Defender for cloud, if I want to configure DNS servers, or indeed if I've got other VNets to which I want to create a peering, I can select the peerings tab and I can configure the necessary settings. That's something we'll look at later on. So that's the fundamentals. And once you've created your subnet and your virtual network, the other thing you need to consider is the network security group. So if we go back to the home page here, I can do a search for network security group and then create a network security group. Again, choosing the subscription and the resource and then going to give it a name, Contoso NSG. Always use meaningful names if you possibly can. And then I'm going to review and create that. All that I'm doing here through the portal, of course, I can also do through the Cloud Shell using Bash or PowerShell. Select Create. I'll take a moment to do that. And we're done. I can select Go to Resource now, and I can review the settings for the Network Security Group. You can see initially that it has created some default rules, inbound and outbound security rules. Those can't be removed, but they can be superseded by rules with a higher priority. So if you create any additional rules, they'll have a lower numerical value for the priority, which means they have a higher priority. That's always the case with Microsoft, the lower numeric value wins. So if I set up an, any additional rules, say for example, when I configure a virtual machine, I might want to allow for RDP access to that virtual machine, in which case I'll need to create a rule that allows for inbound TCP 3389. And I want to assign that a, a priority with a lower numerical value than 65,000. Now, before this can do anything, we need to associate it either with a network interface or with a subnet. And so we'll take a look at that process when we come to create a virtual machine. So there are a number of different ways in which you can create a virtual machine. If you're in the portal, then selecting virtual machines and then selecting create and then choosing as your virtual machine from the drop-down list is as good a way as any to start the process. But Clearly, if you're creating a large number of virtual machines or you're creating them on a sort of repetitive basis, you'll possibly want to use some kind of script or command line interface to accelerate this process. But we'll run through it once using the portal. So again, I choose a subscription and the resource group in which I want to create the virtual machine. And I give the virtual machine a name. Um, let's call it Conto. So well, I'll call it VM1. I select the region. I can configure availability options. So I can make it part of a, an availability set or a virtual machine scale set or an availability zone. In my case, I'm going to keep it simple and just choose no infrastructure redundancy required. I can configure security types, standard and trusted launch virtual machines, which we'll discuss later. And then importantly, I need to choose the image. So here I'm going to choose Windows Server uh, 22 Data Center Gen 2. Then importantly, I need to choose the size of the virtual machine. This is the number of virtual processes, the amount of memory, and those are customized in groupings that allow you to choose a size that suits a particular characteristic. So if you've got a, a memory intensive application that you want to run, you might choose a size that's appropriate to that. So if we select see all sizes here, for example, you can see some of the general purpose sizes. And then if you look at the bottom here, you've got a, a range of D series, B series, E, F, L, and series type sizes and you can select one that's appropriate to your particular needs so high throughput low latency directly mapped to local nvme storage that's the l series you might choose one of those if that's a requirement each one of these has a cost attached and that is identified to you when you select the size that you want so it'll tell you as you can see here what the cost is going to be so I'm just going to choose um, a lower cost for demonstration purposes. It's worth noting if you want to use Windows Admin Center to connect to the to the machine, it needs to be of a, of a minimum spec, and that's a couple of vCPUs that are required. 
OK, I'm going to specify an administrator account. Again, consistency is really important here, so try to use an account that you can remember and then set a, an initial password. And then when you want to configure the machine, you need to be aware that you need to be able to connect to the machine. Now you can connect to the machine using PowerShell by using Windows Admin Center through a bastion, but also typically, and maybe initially, you might connect to it through RDP. So by default, through the portal here, it allows our RDP to be open on the firewall. So we're going to accept that. And then on the disks page, you can configure disk options and encryption settings and so forth for those disks. Something we'll look at later, we talk a bit more about storage. And then selecting networking, you can see that it picks up the VNet that I've already created. I want to put it into subnet 1, so I'm going to choose that. And it's going to create a public IP for the computer, which I may or may not need. Initially, perhaps I do to connect using RDP from my home office, but thereafter I might want to, to reconfigure. On the management page, I can go on if I want to and enable uh, the ability to sign in using Azure AD accounts. I select that checkbox there. For now, though, I think that's everything I need to configure. So select Review and Create. And then when it's happy and I'm happy, I select Create. So it'll take a moment to start that, to, to create that and to start it, and then for us to be able to come back and, and configure its settings. So we'll leave that running. In the meantime, let's take a look at doing the same thing using Windows Admin Center. So in Windows Admin Center, so long as I'm signed into Azure and you do that through the settings pane, I can select Add and scroll down and choose next to Azure VMs, Create New. That should connect to my subscription using the account details I specified in settings. And then I can choose the subscription and resource group I want to use, and I can create a VM by entering the details. This will be VM2. I'm going to select the UK region. I've got a policy actually set up that only allows me to create resources in the UK South. Then I choose the operating system image. OK, so in this case, those are the options that I have. This is in preview. I'm just going to choose 2019 data center. That will be fine. Again, a, a username and a password. I'm going to use the same one that I usually use for my demo machines. That should be fine. Pretty sure it is, but I'll tell you, <laughs> we'll go again just to make sure. OK, next I can go on to size and choose the size that I want to use. So find a some sort of general purpose one. Went a bit too far there. This is obviously going to take a bit of a while. Um, that will do. Oh, no, actually we'll go for that one. Again, I don't want to incur too much in the way of cost for demonstration purposes. Then I can choose the disk configuration, just as we did in the portal. If I want, I can join an Active Directory domain, so I can provide the credentials to do that. I don't want to, so I'm going to deselect that option and then go to Networking. And then I can choose the network interface card name, that's automatically generated. I can choose the virtual network, which I've already selected, and then I can put it into a subnet. I've created subnet 1, I'm going to put it into subnet 1. Once I'm happy with all the settings, I can review and create, and then select create. And again, whilst that's taking place, we can take a look at adding a virtual machine from the command line. So uh, here our other um, virtual machine add is completed. So if I go back to home and select virtual machines, we should be able to see our various virtual machines. I'll select refresh here. Yep, there's the one that we just added from the Windows Admin Center. So that's looking good. The other way in which you can add virtual machines is by using Cloud Shell, either using Bash or, or PowerShell, whichever you prefer. So we'll have a look at that right now. So I can access the Cloud Shell from up here in the portal. First time you run this, you'll need to create a storage account to support it, but that's a, a guided process. And then from here, I can run my PowerShell or if I prefer Bash command. It's also worth noting that if you've got Windows 11 machine, you can open up Windows Terminal. And from Windows Terminal, you can select a new tab to connect to Azure Cloud Shell. And once you've, uh, the first time you're on this, you need to authenticate with the tenant, but which is fairly intuitive. Once you've done that, you can just select the tenant. And then that will open up a Cloud Shell connection. In this case, 
PowerShell, but again, you can run bash to switch to bash if that's what you'd prefer to do. So uh, you don't need to be directly connected to the portal. You can access it from here. So let's take a look at running some commands. Let's move that out of the way for a second. So if I just paste in the command, so what I'm hoping to do here, if I've got this right, is in the Contoso resource group, okay, a new VM called Contoso VM4 in UK South, connected to Contoso VNet, and create a subnet called Contoso subnet, and a security group called Contoso network security group, and use Contoso-VM4-IP. It's a few things I think I need to change there, but let's do that right now. Just run this first of all. It's prompting me for my admin user and the password for same. It'll use the standard size here because I didn't specify. And it'll go off and create the VM according to the settings. I might need to reconfigure some of those network settings, but you get the idea of it. So this is useful if you've got a large number of VMs that you want to create. You can script it fairly easily to do what you need to do. And as I said, you can also use Bash if that's the syntax that you prefer to use, but I tend to use PowerShell. We'll leave that. So in the demonstration, you learned how to create an Azure virtual network, how to configure a network security group, although we'll look at more of that in a moment, and how to create virtual machines. So once you've created your virtual machines, you'll need to know how to manage them. If they're in Azure, of course, that means they're automatically remote from wherever you are. So everything has to be done remotely. So there are a number of tools that you can use to perform this management. Cloud Shell, which you just looked at as a means for creating objects, but likewise, you can use that as a management tool. So anything you've learned about PowerShell in terms of its syntax and structure can be applied. Although the command looks are slightly different because they relate to Azure resources as opposed to local resources. Remote PowerShell, we discussed that in an earlier lesson. Windows Admin Center in the Azure portal. So once you've got a virtual machine set up, you can configure Windows Admin Center to manage that machine. So you can use that consistent user interface. You can set up Azure Bastion to provide secure remote connectivity. And you can also enable just-in-time VM access. And where you choose to use that, it will enable the ports that you need to configure the machine when you request access to the machine. Once you're done, after a period of time, I can't remember what the default is, but it's you know less than an hour, it'll, it'll close those ports. So it only opens the ports for use and then closes them back down afterwards, making um, for a much more secure environment. The Azure Serial Console is useful if you want to troubleshoot a VM that's not starting properly. So it's a bit like connecting via some sort of serial connection through the back to the back of a host and debugging it. So it's a, it's a feature that you can select from the, within the context of a VM, you can select the Azure Serial Console, and if it's enabled and configured appropriately, you can use that to interact with the VM if, if you're doing that sort of early launch uh, troubleshooting. In the demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can enable Windows Admin Center in the Azure portal. So in the last demonstration, we were just looking at creating virtual machines. I think, uh, as you can see here, we finished up by creating a VM using PowerShell and the Cloud Shell. Let's close that down now and just refresh the view of virtual machines that we have. So we've got three and they're running. So uh, let's, let's pick this first one here, VM1. And there are a number of ways that we can connect to this remotely for management purposes. One way is to open up a connection using RDP. Now for that to work, the necessary ports need to be open and obviously it needs to be accessible over a public IP address. You can see it has a public IP address over on the right hand side that's been allocated automatically. It's important to note that unless you say otherwise, that public IP address may vary if you shut down and deallocate the VM and then start it up again. So let's take a look at configuring the network settings for this VM. Take a look at networking here and you can see that it's connected to a particular subnet. And you can see also that there is a network security group to which it's attached via network interface. And that has a rule on it, Priority 300, for RDP to allow inbound from any location over TCP. So that is how we can connect using remote desktop. We want to have a look at Windows Admin Center. Now, to connect to this computer from my local machine using Windows Admin Center is comparatively straightforward. I select Windows Admin Center here and then add the server from here. Oh, need to be not signed in, let's just sign in right now. Okay, that's better. Choose the resource group, choose the virtual machine, 
and then choose the IP address and then select add. Now this is not going to work because at the moment I don't have the necessary remote management ports open on the network security group. So I'd need to go here to do that. I need to add an inbound port rule and I'm going to specify that it is port ranges 5985 and 5986 TCP and I'm going to allow, I need to give it a name so call that Windows Admin Center and then select add. And that will take a moment to create the rule and then you'll see it appear here on, on this network security group. Now at the moment this is connected to a network interface. Any other VMs with their network interfaces connected to this network security group would also adhere to those rules. So it's a convenient way of setting things up quite quickly. Now this is allowing for external access of Windows Admin Center, which is not quite what I wanted to show you, but I wanted also to cover this. There's something else I need to do as well. I also need to enable the Windows Remote Management Listening Service on that virtual machine. Now that's not something that's been done by default, so I need to go back to the overview page here and at least temporarily, I'm going to need to connect using RDP, download the RDP file and open the file, connect to the VM. I'm going to need to choose uh, a different account and hopefully I can remember my password, otherwise this is where it would start to unravel a little bit and then click OK to that and I now get my connection. The first thing you'll remember about remote management is that the network interfaces need to be assigned as not being public. Otherwise, that you can't enable the Windows Remote Management Listening Service from an internal perspective anyway. So I'm expected to be prompted about that in a moment. So that's my Windows Server up in Azure that I'm connected to remotely via IDP. I will say yes to that network prompt. And then the other thing I need to do is to open up Windows Remote Management. I can do that with WinRim quick config and just say yes. It's not the firewall that I'm needing to change. I need to enable the capability to, you know, to start the service. So I'm done with that now. Nothing else I need to do here. So I can drop this remote RDP session. And now I can connect using Windows Admin Center with a bit of luck. Go back to Windows Admin Center here and add my server, add my VM choose the resource group, choose Contos of VM1, choose the public IP, add it, and then select it for manage as, and choose the admin account for that machine. I'm assuming it's got the correct password, but I'm not positive about it, so I'm gonna enter it again, and select continue, and then I should be able to connect to that remote machine using Windows Admin Center. So we're all done with that. But the other thing I wanted to show you, perhaps the first thing really, was to enable this feature here, Windows Admin Center. So this is enabling Windows Admin Center on the machine that I want to manage. So effectively, it's setting up Windows Admin Center on Contoso VM1 rather than connecting to Contoso VM1 from Windows Admin Center. So I'm going to attempt to do this now by selecting open the necessary port. The port here is 6516. That's the port that's used to connect to Windows Admin Center. So you can see on my local computer, on the local host, it uses that same port. And if I need to open any other ports, I can select those for outbound connectivity, choose install, and it will enable the outbound traffic on the NSG, the connected NSG for me automatically. And with a bit of luck, it will open the necessary inbound port and install the service. So I'm going to leave that to run and we'll review it later. Okay, so that's now complete and you can see that I can now connect using Windows Admin Center, sign in using the account details for the VM. And there you go, I've got a Windows Admin Center connection from within the Azure portal to my virtual machine and so everything looks pretty much the same as it does when I look at it from an external Windows Admin Center instance. So in the demo you saw how to enable Windows Admin Center via the Azure portal so that you can connect using a consistent interface to your virtual machine. You also saw how to connect 
from Windows Admin Center on a local machine to a remote Azure virtual machine. That required configuring various settings on the virtual machine itself and also on the network security group that protects that virtual machine via its network interface. Azure Bastion is a very useful feature. You saw earlier on how I connected initially, at least using RDP. RDP is not an ideal way of connecting to a public IP host uh, VM hosted in Azure because it's a well-known port. It, it exposes that virtual machine to a risk. So by using Azure Bastion, you can mitigate that risk. It provides RDP or secure shell connectivity depending whether you're using Windows or Linux to your Azure workloads. So the Bastion sits as a, an intermediary host and you connect to the Bastion using HTTPS and it connects using RDP or SSH to the, the appropriate host computer. The key features are that you use RDP and SSH through the Azure portal. Your remote session is protected using TLS, which is typically configurable through uh, all of the traversing firewalls. No public IP is required on your Azure VM, so you can disable that capability once you've set up Bastion. And there's no need to manage any network security groups because those ports are already configured and already accessible. So this provides a good deal of security, including against port scanning. And it also means you only have to provide hardening in one place rather than having to configure not only your target servers, but also your jump servers. So the requirements for this are that you configure an Azure Bastion one per virtual network. It must be installed in its own subnet called Azure Bastion subnet. Now that's the kind of thing that you'd expect to see come up on the test. The address space for the subnet must have at least a slash 26 prefix. So as long as you set a subnet up with at least slash 26, you're good to go. So in the demonstration, I'll show you how to connect to a virtual machine with RDP, how to implement Azure Bastion, how to reconfigure the VM's network settings to accommodate the changes arising from Azure Bastion, and then how to use Azure Bastion to connect to the VM. So here's my list of virtual machines and uh, Contos of VM1 is my target here. We can see that it's got a public IP and I've used that to connect using RDP, but just let's refresh our memories. Select connect, choose RDP, download the RDP file, open it, choose connect, choose to sign in using the appropriate admin account. And we're in business. And you'll remember that the key issue with this is that we're connecting over a public IP using a well-known port. So that's something we probably want to avoid. So I'm going to close that connection down now and I'm going to look to configure Azure Bastion. Search for it correctly would be helpful. And I can choose um, Bastions and then I can create a Bastion. Choose it to put it in a resource group. Give it a name, Bastion 1. Choose the region. I must always choose UK South. I have a policy set up in Azure to restrict that. And then I'm going to connect it to a virtual network. Oh, I should probably make sure I, I know which one I need to use here. Let me just check if I go back to my virtual networks, open up the dashboard in the new tab, and just check the virtual network that's connected to that VM because I can't remember. Uh, virtual machines and Contoso VM1 and uh, networking so so on Contoso VNet 1 so that's fine so we'll place it into Contoso VNet 1 and we now need to create a new subnet so I can switch to manage subnet configuration so I'll do that actually from this other tab if we go to the virtual network which I can do from here there we go and choose VNet1 and I need to create my subnet as your bastion spell it right subnet um, that's fine I've got at least 26 so that's great and select save I'll take a moment to do that there it is that's great now go back to create the bastion I think I should be able to select it's not picked it up yet, rather annoyingly. Okay, so let's go tags here and then go back and see if it picks it up. That's my mistake. Still not seeing it. That's rather annoying. I'll choose another VNet and then choose 
VNet1. There we go. It's seen it now. I'm going to create a new public IP. We do need a public IP to connect to Bastion. So I'm going to let it choose that. There's nothing really else for me to configure here. So I'm going to just choose review and create and then create it. And that'll take a moment or two. And once that's done, we'll be able to go on and reconfigure the network settings for the VM. So I'll, I'll let that continue. And in the meantime, let's go to the virtual machines list and select Contoso VM1 and take a look at the network settings here. Now it's tempting to remove the entry here for RDP in the network security group, but you don't want to do that because we are going to use RDP to connect to this virtual machine. We're just going to connect to it from the bastion. So what we want to do is to just turn off the public IP address for this particular VM. So if we take a look at the IP here, we can disassociate it and say yes. It'll take a moment to do that. So that's now done. If I go back to Contoso VM1 and refresh the networking settings. Cool. So you can see here we now no longer have a public IP, only have a private IP. So let's uh, give that a try. If I select the overview tab and select connect and choose Bastion, I can now enter the username and password and then select connect. Opens up a new browser tab and then connects to the virtual machine. Now I'm connecting using HTTPS through TCP port 443 to the Azure portal from my office computer here. And then the Azure portal via the Bastion is facilitating the onbound connection from the Bastion in its own subnet to the virtual machine in its own subnet using RDP over 3389 on the private IP address. So my virtual machine does not have a public IP address any longer. And that may or may not be necessary for something else. But for this particular requirement, for this particular remote connection, it's not needed. In the demonstration, you saw how to connect to a virtual machine using IDP, how to implement Azure Bastion, how to reconfigure the network settings, and how to use Azure Bastion to connect your VM. This is lesson six, implement name resolution. And in this lesson, you'll learn to install the DNS role, to configure forwarding and recursion, create and manage DNS zones, and integrate Windows Server DNS with Azure DNS. The hands-on sessions demonstrate how to install the DNS role, to configure DNS forwarding and conditional forwarding, configure delegation, create and manage zones, manage zone transfers, implement advanced DNS settings, such as DNSSEC and DNS policies, and implement DNS in Azure. Name resolution is a vital service, without which it would become difficult for users to locate any server they wanted to connect to. Imagine if every time you wanted to connect to a website, you had to remember its IP address. So name resolution resolves names into IP addresses for a user convenience apart from anything else. But in addition to that, it frees an administrator from having to maintain the same IP address for the same service. So the name for a particular service may remain the same, but the underlying IP configuration can change because of the dynamic nature of name resolution these days. In Windows Server, computers typically have two names depending on the configuration. The first is the host name. This is up to 255 characters and it consists of a prefix, the computer's name, and a suffix, the domain name of which a computer is a member. This is typically generated when you add a computer to an Active Directory domain. The NetBIOS name is derived from this host name, or rather more accurately, it's derived from the prefix of the host name. It's truncated to 16 characters, the 16th of which is a special identifying character which identifies a particular service. Now, NetBIOS is an older session management protocol, so it's not something you'll necessarily come into contact with. But the NetBIOS session management protocol is still part of Windows. And in fact, you can review the NetBIOS name and services that are running on a computer from the command prompt or elsewhere in the user interface. In this short demonstration, I'm just going to show you how you can review the configured names for a Windows Server computer. So to review the names configured on a local server, you can start by going to Network and Internet Settings 
and selecting Ethernet and then choosing Network and Sharing Center. And from here, select Change Adapter Settings and then review the properties of the network adapter. Open up the TCPIP version 4 protocol and then select Advanced and select the Wins tab. Now from here you can verify whether or not NetBIOS is enabled. The default is that it will be. It's not necessary for most scenarios, so you could choose to turn it off. You can turn it off individually on the Wins tab, or you can use group policy settings to configure the desired setting across a number of, of computers. To determine what the actual names are, again, you can do that through settings. Select Home and select System, and then select About. And you can see here the device name, Contoso Dash. SVR2 and the full device name contoso-svr2.contoso.com. Where does contoso.com come from? That comes from the domain name of which this computer is a member. So we add to the host name contoso-svr2, which will also be the NetBIOS name so long as that name is no more than 15 characters. Remember, the 16th character is used to identify a service. That's added to the domain of which I'm a, the computer is a member. So that gives us contoso-svr2.contoso.com. We can also do this from the command prompt. Open up a PowerShell window. Although these are command prompt commands, they, they can run successfully in um, PowerShell. So if I run host name, that will tell me the prefix. And if I want to find out more about NetBIOS, I can use nbt stat and then minus n to show me the local NetBIOS names that are being used on this particular computer. So as you can see, they are Contoso-SVR2 and then a little unique additional character in hex. So 20 and 00, for example, indicate respectively the server and workstation services on this computer. These are probably not that relevant anymore, but you should at least be aware of them. If I want to change the properties of a computer's name, the most obvious way to do that is to join a different domain and that will give them the computer a new suffix. But also if I just want to change the computer name, I can do that through settings as well. If I open up settings and again select system and about. And from this page here, I can choose rename this PC and give it a new name. That will then change the prefix of the computer name to whatever it is that I want it now to be. If I'm using dynamic DNS, something we'll talk about later, then that will update the DNS records in the DNS zone where this computer's records currently reside without an administrator having to do anything. If the name that I now change here does not exceed 15 characters, then the name entered here will also become the NetBIOS name for this computer in addition to the prefix for the FQDN. In the demonstration, I showed you how you can review the configured names for a server. It's pretty important to understand how names are resolved. There are a number of methods that Windows computers can use depending on configuration. So I'm going to list them all and then I'll talk a bit about the order that's likely to be tried. So first of all, a computer can use a broadcast. A broadcast is not a particularly efficient way of resolving a name. Essentially what a computer does when it wants to know what the IP address is for, for a name is, is, is it, it broadcasts onto the local network and says, you know, which computer or whichever computer has this name, what is your IP? And that's not efficient because apart from anything else, a broadcast can't transit routers. So that limits that success, the success of this technology to the local subnet. Broadcasts were used quite widely in the early days of networking when most protocols used on local area networks were not routable and therefore there were no routers. So that would have been a successful way of, of achieving the objective. Broadcast name resolution also requires the ability of a client to register its name using a broadcast and to release its name using a broadcast. These are the typical activities of certain types of NetBIOS devices. Again, therefore, that shouldn't be something that you need to concern yourself too, too much with now in a modern network based on, on a routable protocol like IP. The link layer multicast name resolution protocol or LLMNR, I think that was introduced with Windows Vista and it was a, a way of working around the problem of the convenience of a broadcast because one of the things about a broadcast is you don't need to set up a name server anywhere. But we talked about some of the disadvantages. But with the LLMNR, you can use a multicast communication method so that it's a more efficient and targeted. And this was quite often used as a way of discovering resources on the local subnet, such as printers. 
So if you've got a, a fairly basic workgroup based Windows Vista and newer computing environment in an office somewhere, so you don't have a server environment, then this might be the protocol that's default. It's not something you set up, it just defaults to this as a method for discovering resources. So again, for our purposes, it's not something we really need to worry too much about, but we should at least be aware of what it is. A local lookup file like LM host is designed to support or to improve on the support of NetBIOS name resolution. So instead of broadcasting, clients were able to look up a NetBIOS name in a local text file called LM hosts, which lives in the C slash Windows slash System32 slash drivers slash ETC folder. Again, it's NetBIOS, so it's not something you need to get too concerned with. There is, however, a, a hosts file, which we're going to talk about in a moment. The host file, again, a text file with a somewhat different syntax, but broadly the same in the sense that it contains a list of host names and IP addresses. That lives in the same folder. So slash Windows slash System32 slash driver slash ETC. And that can be used by a DNS client or a, um, an IP4 based client to look up host names. But over the years, it's become increasingly obvious that we need to manage name resolution in a central location. One of Microsoft's earliest attempts at doing this was using the Windows Internet Name Service, or WINS. This is designed primarily to support NetBIOS names. So again, it's not something that you'd need to worry overly about. It's installed, if you still want to use it, as a Windows Server feature rather than as a server role. DNS, however, and the whole basis of this entire lesson, is the primary means that you would typically use to resolve names. Windows Server has a, an excellent DNS service that has a, a number of advanced features and capabilities. So it can integrate with Active Directory, it can support dynamic updates to zones, and so on, all of which we'll talk about during this lesson. So typically, a client will, or a server will resolve a name in the following way. First of all, if you enter a name into a, a web browser or another application wants to resolve a name on, on a host, the question asked is, is this the local host? Presumably that will normally be no, it's not. The next thing that will happen on an IP configured device is that we check the contents of the hosts file. We just talked about where that is and what it is. The problem with having anything of significance in the host file is it needs to be maintained. So somebody has to maintain that host file on a particular computer and distribute updates to that host file to all of the computers in the network, which is impractical. Back in the mid 80s, when the IP protocol was being developed, it might have been sensible to configure a host file and distribute that amongst the then fairly small number of users of the internet. But these days, that's just impractical. So generally speaking, there won't be anything in the host file for us to reference. However, it's useful to remember because it can be used for troubleshooting purposes. At the same time, we'll see if there are any elements or any recently cached elements stored in the DNS resolver cache. So anytime you successfully resolve a name, however you do that, that's stored in the DNS resolver cache. That saves you, or as a computer, it saves the computer from having to go through the process of resolving a name all over again if it's only just recently resolved that name. Now the cache doesn't live forever and the records in the cache live for as long as the DNS server that resolved them say that they should live. And we'll talk more about that during this lesson. So then finally, if you're not able to resolve the name by it being the local computer or by their it having been recently resolved, then you'll switch to querying a DNS server. Most uh, clients are configured with one, sometimes two DNS server IP addresses so that they can petition either one of them to um, come up with a result for the petition query from whichever app is asking to resolve the name. As I just mentioned, there are two name resolution services available in Windows. The first of these is DNS and that's installed as a Windows Server role. That's what we need to focus on in this lesson. And the Windows Internet Name Service, or WINS, is installed as a feature. That really doesn't have a significant role to play any longer. It still exists, but it's something that you should merely be aware of. I wouldn't waste too much time on it for exam prep. To deploy DNS, fairly straightforward, sign in as a member of the local administrators group on the server where you want to install DNS. You must assign a static IP configuration to that server, and that's I think fairly obvious because if it has a dynamic IP configuration, then the IP address could be different one day to the next day, in which case clients can't connect to that DNS server because they have no way of knowing what the current IP is. So a static configuration is usually, well, must be assigned to all of your DNS servers. Then you can either use Server Manager or Windows PowerShell to deploy the role. 
In the demonstration, I'll show you how to install DNS by using Server Manager. So uh, one way in which you can install the DNS server role is in addition to making the computer a domain controller. If you install the ADDS role and then promote the machine as a domain controller, it will also install the DNS server role. In other words, all Active Directory domain controllers ought to be um, DNS servers. And that makes sense because in a Windows Server environment, you almost certainly want to integrate your DNS zones into Active Directory for reasons which we'll discuss later on in this lesson. This computer, however, is a server. It's part of the domain. Um, and I've signed in using a domain admins account. So I'm going to choose, uh, in server, I'm going to choose add roles and features. And then select next in the wizard and then click through a few times. And on the roles page, I'm going to select the DNS server role. And I'm also going to choose to install the administration tools at the same time. If I select next, if I scroll down, you will actually also see the Win server feature, which we mentioned earlier. So I don't need that. It's, it's unnecessary, except in, I suppose, some very specific circumstances where you have applications that still require NetBIOS. If that's the case, actually, there is a way around that with DNS, and we'll talk about that also later on. So um, it's unlikely you'll ever need that. So we select Next on the Features page, and basically click through the rest of the wizard, and then finally select Install, and the role will then install. OK, that's finished, so select Close, and we can check or verify the presence of the role by going to tools and selecting DNS. And you can see the server here. And there's empty folders for forward lookup zones, reverse lookup zones, trust points, and conditional forwards. And that's because we've not configured anything yet. So that was successful. So in the demonstration, you learned how to install DNS by using Server Manager. DNS forwarding enables you to determine what happens to a DNS query if the partitioned DNS server, by which we mean the DNS server that was asked to resolve a name, can't resolve the query. By using forwarding, you can configure generalized forwarding so that a DNS server forwards all requests to another DNS server unless it can resolve the query using the locally stored zone information. So typically, you might use generalized forwarding by configuring the IP of uh, one or several forwarders, which might sit in the perimeter network. So all of your internal DNS servers might be configured to use those internet facing DNS servers for all queries that aren't internal, for example. But you can also configure conditional forwarding. So if the DNS query contains a particular domain name, so contoso.com, for example, then it's forwarded to a specific DNS server. That might be useful where you're working with a partner organization or perhaps within another part of your own organization where maybe there's a, a different Active Directory environment and possibly different DNS zone information. So perhaps adatum.com and contosa.com are, are parts of the same overarching organization, but different operating divisions and they work well, frequently together. And so it makes sense to shortcut the DNS process so that when someone queries a name from contosa.com over in adatum.com, then the DNS servers in Contoso can forward straight away to the adatum.com name servers. If that's not configured, then you'd have to go through your generalized forwarding servers in the perimeter and then up through the hierarchy of the internet, uh, which is something called root hints, and we'll discuss that in a moment. To enable DNS forwarding, Open up the server properties. This is probably worth remembering for the exam because the way in which you configure DNS forwarding and conditional forwarding is quite different. So for forwarding, generalized forwarding, right click the DNS server and select its properties. And then on the forwarders tab, you can configure however many forwarders you want to configure. And it's presumed, I suppose, that these will be in the perimeter network, but that may not necessarily be the case. It will depend on your particular configuration. Note there's a, there's a checkbox, use root hints if no forwarders are available, and you can then edit to select what those root hint servers are. Root hints is the way in which you can go up and down the internet hierarchy. So if you're at contosa.com and you want to resolve a name for, I don't know, microsoft.com, if you don't have information about forwarders for that particular zone, then your name server will petition a response from the root server. And if it doesn't have the answer that's being looked for, then it will provide information about the name servers in the .com uh, domain or zone and so on up and down the hierarchy like that, something we'll look at shortly. Once you've configured all of the forwarders, click OK. 
Conditional forwarding is done on a special folder in the DNS server, conditional forwarders. You open up the, or select the conditional forwarders folder underneath the server name in your DNS console, and then you add for a particular domain name, in this case Microsoft.com, the particular IP address. Now, the graphic shows the use of a private IP address, which is somewhat unlikely, but uh, obviously I don't want to provide information about the particular DNS servers here, even if even if I knew what they were. So um, that's just an example of an IP address, but obviously would not likely be used in this scenario. The number of seconds before forward queries timeout would determine how long you wait for a response from the petition server before you then try to choose an alternative method for resolving the name, if such a method exists. Let's talk a bit about root hints. Now, before I go any further, I just want to draw attention to something that you'll hear me say during during this lesson. Strictly speaking, when we're dealing with DNS, we're, we're almost certainly dealing with DNS zones. But sometimes I'll use the term domain. And it's true to say that, of course, the purpose of DNS is to in the, on the internet side of things is to manage the collections of domains that exist, such as contoso.com and real ones like microsoft.com, and to provide some means for resolving names within that hierarchy. Essentially, though, the domains map to DNS zones. So that's a, a bit like a database, but I'll come on to that at some lesson later on during this, during this section of the course. But I sometimes use the terms interchangeably, and I probably shouldn't. Uh, so apologies for that in advance, but you'll just have to bear with me. Quite often, a domain maps exactly to a zone on a one-to-one -one basis, but that's not always the case. So I'll try to be as precise as I can. So what this diagram is going to show us is the way in which names are typically resolved. So over on the DNS client, there'll be an application running like the Microsoft Edge browser, and a user might enter the uh, computer name www.microsoft.com and press enter, and they'll want to resolve that, or rather the Microsoft Edge browser will want to resolve that into an IP so a, a connection can be established. We refer to the DNS client, or rather the application on the client, as a DNS resolver. So the first thing that the client does is establish a connection over TCP or UDP port 53 to its petition DNS server. If it doesn't get a response from the first I, um, DNS server that it's been configured to use, it will switch to another one. But let's assume that it's been successful in connecting to that first DNS server. The configured DNS server will check in its local cache to see if it's recently resolved the name. It will also check to see if it's authoritative for the record being asked for. So if you were asking for www.contoso.com and you were part of the contoso.com organization, it's quite possible the DNS server could give you the answer for that particular query. But we're going to assume that that's not the case here because we're looking at root hints. So it's been unsuccessful in, in being able to provide the answer. So it now queries another DNS server. Now, it's important to understand that DNS clients use the type of query that says essentially, give me the answer, but don't refer me to another server. Whereas when a DNS server petitions another name server, it says, give me the answer. And if you don't know, refer me to another DNS server that might have a better idea. So in this instance, the root server, which is known by full stop or period, doesn't have the answer. So it responds with that and says, I don't know what the IP address is of the server that your client's looking for, but uh, I do know of the several DNS servers that are responsible for the .com zone. And so the petition DNS server in our zone queries the DNS servers in the .com zone. Do you know what the IP address is for whatever server it is that the client's looking for? And it's unlikely that it will. And so it will come back and say, no, but I do have information pertaining to the Microsoft.com zone. In this instance, here is the IP of several DNS servers that are responsible for managing that zone. So our server now petitions each of those in turn until it gets a response. And with a bit of luck, it will eventually find the petitioned record. In this case, www.microsoft.com comes back with whatever is the IP. So in this case, obviously not WXYZ, but whatever it is. Now, the DNS server in our environment, in our zone, caches that for the period specified by the DNS servers in the Microsoft.com zone. So it, it is the entity which is authoritative for the record, which decides the time to live or cache um, duration. So our database locally cached database is updated with the record that's been resolved and the record is passed back to the client and the client then can establish a session over HTTPS to the, the appropriate server. So that's an end-to-end -end overview of root hints. 
So if we're not using forwarders, then we'll rely on this architecture. And it's important to note that this only works because each level in the hierarchy understands that there are parent zones and it knows what the name server IPs are for those parent zones. And each parent understands about the child zones and has the IPs for DNS servers in each of those child zones. And through that process, which is known as delegation, we can create this hierarchy um, and use this referral process to resolve names. If you need to update the root hint servers, you can do that on the server properties page on the root hints tab. There's no real reason why you need to do that, but you can. If you've done it on a particular server already, then you can use the copy from server button to expedite the process of configuring another server. Typically, it's only going to be your edge DNS servers, those ones sitting in the primitive network that you might want to configure with root hints because typically your internal servers will deal with internal name resolution and where necessary forward to the edge servers. You can use Windows PowerShell if you want to, to also modify root hints by using the add DNS server root hint remove DNS server root hint and set DNS server root hint commandlets. If you want to just retrieve the information, you can do or use the get DNS server root hint commandlet. And if you've also got root hints configured on another server, you can use the import DNS server root hints commandlet to import them onto any, to the server to which you're currently connected. In the demonstration, I'll show you how you can configure DNS forwarding and how you can also configure conditional forwarding. So I switched to my domain controller only because I've already got some zones configured here, whereas on my other server we have yet to configure any zones. So if I expand out forward and look up zones, you can see that there's a contosa.com zone. And if I expand that out, you can see the various records. We'll talk more about that later. To configure forwarding, it's a property, if you remember, of the server rather than of a zone. So we're going to right click Contoso DC, which is my DNS server, the local server in this instance, and choose properties. And then on the forwarders tab, I can select edit and then I can enter the IP address of a particular DNS server, which is in my edge or perimeter network. So it's, it's going to be an internet facing DNS server. And so generally, just to reiterate, you'll have two, three, four DNS servers that sit in your perimeter network and that are there solely to resolve names for internet facing or internet connected domain names. Internal DNS servers will deal with the internal requests typically. But there are different arrangements that you can make and we'll talk about those somewhat later. But in this scenario then you're going to enter the IP address of those edge DNS servers. The IP address will resolve using a reverse lookup into a server FQDN and then once it's validated and you'll see a little checkbox that says that it is, a little green check, then you're good to go. You can specify the number of seconds before forward queries time out, in which case some other method will be used to resolve the query. So I won't enter anything here because I don't have an edge network and I don't have any DNS servers in it, but that's where you'd configure them. Conditional forwarding is configured under the or within the conditional forwarders folder. So right click that and choose new conditional forwarder. And then here you specify the domain name. And this is typically going to be a partner network or some other DNS domain with which you frequently work maybe in a different part of your organization. And then you'll specify the IP address of several master servers. Now, all a master server is, is an authoritative server in that DNS zone. Again, I'm using domain and zone. I'm using domain because it says domain in dialog box here, but it, when we're talking about record resolution, we're dealing with DNS zone. So a zone will hold the records for that domain. So we'll need to know the IP address of whichever server is authoritative for that domain. Uh, we'll want to provide several, probably, and when we've done that, then we should see a validation check box and then we can click OK. Again, I'm not in a position to enter information here that has any meaning, but this is where you'd configure it. Later on in the course, we'll discuss, we'll discuss zones and we'll talk about something called a stub zone. A stub zone is a way of doing something very similar to conditional forwarding, but it works in a more efficient way. So think of conditional forwarding perhaps as a something that you might use if you if you don't want to or cannot set up stub zones but we'll see what stub zones do uh, later on in this lesson. In the demonstration, you learned how to configure DNS forwarding and how to configure conditional forwarding. DNS recursion takes place when queries are executed in a DNS namespace. So when a petition DNS server queries other DNS servers to resolve a DNS query on behalf of a requesting client, that's recursion. 
The petition DNS server returns an answer to the DNS client rather than referring the client to another DNS server. By default, all DNS servers perform recursive queries. By contrast, I suppose it's worth knowing that clients use iterative queries. You can, if you want, disable recursion. If you choose to do this, you'll do it on the server property page and select the advanced tab and then select or deselect disable recursion as you want. Bear in mind, if you disable recursion, it also disables forwarders. You can configure recursion scopes. So these enable you to control when recursion occurs instead of simply turning it off. That's a much better solution because without recursion, you can't use forwarders. and There's no means for a, a server to resolve a name that it doesn't already know. So you can enable recursion scopes by using DNS policy, something we'll look at later on in this lesson. Use the following Windows PowerShell commandlets to configure recursion scopes. Set DNS server recursion scope. Add DNS server recursion scope. Add DNS server query resolution policy. So for example, to allow recursion for clients in Microsoft.com, but to deny recursion for internet-based clients, run the following commands. Set DNS server recursion scope name for the root is enable recursion false. So you're denying it for um, the internet. Add DNS server recursion scope name internal Microsoft clients, enable recursion true. And finally, add DNS server query resolution policy, name recursion control policy, action allow, apply on recursion, recursion scope, internal Microsoft clients, and then specify the server interface IP as being equal to 10.0.0.254 in, in this example. So the end result of that is that clients that are on the internal network will be able to use recursion, but any server request or any DNS request received by the server from the internet, recursion is disabled. That's probably no bad thing because after all, your internal DNS server shouldn't be handling recursion of queries for internet-based clients, typically. So just to summarize then, in this example, client requests received on the DNS server interface with the IP address of 10.0.0.254 are determined as belonging to internal Microsoft clients and for them, recursion is enabled. For client requests received on other server interfaces, recursion is turned off. Delegation is a critical component of the DNS infrastructure. It's the entire basis of how we can determine what the IP address is of a server for which we have no authority. So if I sit at a computer in adatum.com and I want to know the IP address of www.marketing.microsoft.com, for instance, my name server won't know the answer to that, so it will petition the root server. The root server probably won't know either. There's no reason why it should. So it will refer the name server in adatum.com to ask the question of the .com name servers, which in turn won't know and will refer the adatum.com name server to the microsoft.com name servers. And that's where it then gets a little bit more interesting because we're dealing with an organization, in this case, microsoft.com, and any domains and subdomains that exist within there might be delegated or not, depending on the characteristics of the infrastructure. So let's have a look at a specific example. So DNS delegation is when a DNS server delegates authority over a portion of its namespace to one or more other DNS servers. So for example, the Microsoft.com and marketing.microsoft.com zones, or domains rather, could be hosted in the same zone, Microsoft.com, with marketing.microsoft.com just being a subdomain record. That would be typical if there weren't a huge number of hosts and servers in marketing.microsoft.com. It may even just be for the convenience of having a URL, www.marketing.microsoft.com. There may be nothing more to it than, than a single record. But where you have a large number of records and a large number of client devices, perhaps it's worth doing something slightly different. So instead of using a subdomain, you might decide to set up a delegation. But in this example here, the authoritative DNS servers for both Microsoft.com and marketing.microsoft.com are the same. There is no need for the DNS servers in Microsoft.com to refer recursive queries from, in our example, a name server over in a datum to look for another DNS server. In other words, Microsoft.com can answer any questions that pertain to Microsoft.com, but also to marketing.microsoft.com. 
But alternatively, you could create a separate zone for, in this, say, in this uh, case, Microsoft.com and a very busy subdomain called sales.microsoft.com. Each would have its own collection of DNS servers and therefore each is treated as a separate zone. Because one domain, sales.microsoft.com, is a child of another, in this case, Microsoft.com, there must exist a method to enable the authoritative name servers for the subdomain to be located from the parent, and vice versa. This is delegation, and it's essentially creating a pointer to the authoritative name servers for a subdomain. This graphic hopefully explains this. On the left-hand side of the graphic, we have a single zone called Microsoft.com. The zone always takes on the name of the parent. There is a subdomain record in the Microsoft.com zone called marketing.microsoft.com, which may be related or, or linked to server records such as www.marketing.microsoft.com. But the key point is those records are stored within the same zone. So if a query arrives at the Microsoft.com server for anything in the marketing.microsoft.com domain, the DNS servers in Microsoft.com are capable of responding. They have the records. They are authoritative. Whereas if a query arrives for a server in sales.microsoft.com, Microsoft.com does not have those records. It's not authoritative, but it knows how to find them and it will refer the petitioning server to the DNS server addresses for the subdomain. And that's what delegation is. So when to use delegation? If your DNS zones are getting big, delegation enables you to split up your DNS zone into smaller but manageable pieces across your organization. If there are changes in your organization, like mergers and acquisitions, that might mean that you suddenly have additional subdomains to manage. If you have a distributed management structure and you maybe want different departments or locations to be responsible for managing their own DNS namespace. So in the demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can configure delegation. So if I take a look in DNS forward lookup zones on my domain name server and expand out contosa.com, we can see that there's a record here, a folder here called sales. That's actually a, a, a subdomain. And two servers are configured to be part of that domain. So currently, if somebody wants to find the server contoso-serve2.sales.contoso.com, then they can find that information in the contoso.com zone. So currently, this is a subdomain within the contoso.com domain, but it's part of the same zone. So we have a, a one-to-many relationship right now, one zone to two domains. So contoso.com is authoritative for contoso.com and also for sales.contoso.com. To create a delegation, we need to install the name server role on servers that are within sales.contoso.com. And I've already done that on Serve2. That already has a name server role. But I need to configure the zone over on Contoso Serve2. So I'm going to switch to that server right now. So here I am over at uh, Contoso Serve2. I'm just going to verify the computer name. Open up PowerShell here and just run an IP config slash all, which is a command line tool, but it runs fine in PowerShell. And you can see here that it has a primary DNS suffix of sales.contoso.com. And so that's the, the zone or sorry, the DNS domain in which it resides. But we don't actually have a zone for that right now. So we're going to install that zone here. I've already got the DNS server role installed. I installed it earlier. And now I'm going to create a forward lookup zone. A primary zone. We'll talk more about zones later on for sales.contoso.com. I'll create it as a, a zone file because this is not a domain controller. I'll talk about dynamic updates later on, but for now, well, I'll, I'll choose secure and non-secure for now and then select finish. So we can see that it's got a host record, serve2, there for itself, and it's got a start of authority and a name server record. So that's all looking pretty good. So now we've got a name server which is set up for that particular subdomain. The next thing to do would be to configure serve3 to use this computer as its name server and also to set up the delegation. So let's do the delegation first. So I'm going to switch back to the domain controller, which hosts the parent domain. 
So here we are. I'm now going to right click the parent domain and choose new delegation. Sales.contos.com and the IP address or the server name, which is going to be Contoso spr2.sales.contoso.com and select OK and then finish. It's now created a delegation for me and you can see that it's got a pointer to a name server. And that's it. That's all that's needed. I mean, typically I'd want to set up more than one server because obviously if only one name server was available and it was offline, then we wouldn't be able to resolve any names. So you typically set up two for every delegation. In the demonstration, you learned how to configure delegation. In the last sub-lesson, we looked at zones from the point of view of delegation and we compared zones with domains. But just just go through that briefly again. In this graphic, uh, you can see that in a single zone called Microsoft.com, there are two domains, Microsoft.com and a subdomain called marketing.microsoft.com. However, for whatever reason, probably for wanting to have separate management or because there are a large number of devices, sales.microsoft.com, another subdomain, is treated as its own zone with its own collection of authoritative name servers. So when we're dealing with zones, we're dealing with part of the namespace that contains domain records and other records. There are a number of different types of zone. Primary zones which is a type of a zone that you can update by editing it. A secondary zone, which is a read-only copy of a zone stored on a server for the purpose, or a DNS server, for the purposes of providing name resolution services, but it's not editable. A stub zone, which is very similar to the way that conditional forwarding works in terms of what it does. It, it enables you to resolve the records for a partner organization or for a, an element of your own organization which has a different domain name. Uh, and so you're maybe frequently performing queries for this other domain. So in adatum.com and contosa.com, you've got some sort of business relationship or other type of relationship. And when you're performing queries, you don't want to have to use root hints going all the way up and down the tree in DNS. So instead, you create a conditional forwarder to point to the other zone in the, in the other domain. And that's fine, but conditional forwarding points to a specific DNS server. A stub zone works in a similar way, but slightly different. It contains a name server, start of authority, and host records. And it can be maintained to some extent by the partner organization. The, th the problem with conditional forwarding is if the name server changes at the remote domain, you have to know that and you have to update your conditional forwarding records. That's not true with stub zones. So if you're working with a, a partner organization or any organization where you know that those changes are possible, then you get a much better integration by using stub zones. Within DNS and the DNS console, there are a number of containers. Forward lookup zones, which contains exactly what it sounds like it contains. That's to say the zones like contosa.com, microsoft.com and so forth. Reverse lookup zones, which is a collection of zones based on IP addresses. And we use reverse lookup zones to resolve an IP address into a name, whereas we use forward lookup zones to resolve a name into an IP address. Trust points, which are used in certain security contexts, and conditional forwarders, which we looked at in an earlier sublesson. So to reiterate, forward lookups where you have a computer name, www.contosa.com, and you resolve that into an IP address 172.16.0.1. A reverse lookup takes the 172.16.0.1 IP and resolves it into the host name. You typically use reverse lookups in security situations, possibly, for example, to verify the integrity of a name server by determining its name from its IP address on a client when you do a name resolution check, or possibly when you're doing mail transfer to make sure that the SMTP host that is sending messages to a SMTP relay is has the correct IP for its configured name. So reverse lookups are often used in those circumstances. When you configure a zone, you can choose to store it either in a text file, which is known as a zone file, and the zone file name matches the name of the domain, in this case sales.contosa.com.dns. 
Alternatively, you can store your zones in Active Directory, and that's only possible for DNS servers that are also domain controllers. It's strongly recommended in an on-prem Active Directory environment that for every domain controller that you deploy, you also deploy to that domain controller the DNS server role. That will enable you to AD integrate all of your zones, and we'll talk about why that's a good thing in a moment. When you choose to Active Directory integrate your zones, you can choose to replicate the zone through Active Directory, which is a great benefit because it's more secure and you don't have to think about it. It's automatic. But you can configure it so that it will replicate to all DNS servers running on domain controllers in this forest, to all DNS servers running on domain controllers in this domain, to all domain controllers in this domain for Windows 2000 compatibility, and to all domain controllers specified in the scope of this directory partition. And that will default to, to all DNS servers running on domain controllers in this domain. And that's probably the setting you'll want for most circumstances. The advantages of AD integrated zones are that you get multi-master updates. So in other words, you can update any instance of the zone on whichever domain controller it's stored. Now that's not the case with standard DNS zones which are stored in text files. There is a single master. You update that master and then it uses zone transfers to update the, the secondary copies, the read-only copies. So multi-master is a much more convenient thing because it means when a, a computer boots up and it communicates with a domain controller for authentication purposes, it can also configure or communicate with the DNS element of that domain controller and update, if necessary, changes to its IP address that might have resulted um, as a consequence of obtaining a different IP during startup with DHCP. Whereas, otherwise, you'd have to do that manually using standard zones. Replication is automatically handled for you. You don't have to configure anything. It will automatically take place. It supports the feature Secure Dynamic Update. So again, when a client boots up and it maybe has a different IP address, we want to make sure that the client or server that's got the new IP address is the original client that had the old IP address. And we can use signing to assure ourselves of that. Active Directory is able to track that kind of information so that it can be certain that the client, I don't know, client1.contos.com that had an IP address of 172.16.01 yesterday and now has 172.16.02 today because of DHCP is still the same client and not some interloper or malicious device. Improved security because Active Directory replication is encrypted and authenticated. Now when you come to set up your DNS zone, depending on the options that you've selected, will determine on what dynamic update options you have. So for Active Directory integrated zones, you can enable only secure dynamic updates, which is the recommended setting. If you have non-AD integrated zones, then you can choose to either not allow dynamic updates, which means you must manually update any records that change. So any computer that has a different IP from what it used to have, you will have to update the record manually in the zone. Or you can choose to use both secure and non-secure dynamic updates. That does provide a vulnerability because it's possible that an update might be from a malicious person and without that kind of security check, you can't know for sure that the update is valid and yet you'll accept it. So it's important to always choose allow only secure dynamic updates. And that's another good reason why you must always AD integrate your zones. So those are the options. Do not allow. Allow both, both non-secure and secure, or allow only secure, which is what you should go for. The global name zone is a special zone that you can set up to address a particular need. If you're still using NetBIOS, it's possible you might be using the Windows Internet Name Service. We discussed it earlier on in this lesson. So the Wins feature can be installed to accommodate the fact that you have NetBIOS names on your network and you need to be able to resolve those. So the Global Names Zone allows you to continue to support NetBIOS name resolution, but without needing to use Wins. So to create the Global Names Zone, which will hold all of your NetBIOS names, use the following procedure. So in Windows PowerShell, run the set DNS server global name zone command and specify always query server dollar true as the parameter. Then run add DNS server primary zone and then specify the name of the zone as global names and then set the replication scope to be forest. In DNS manager, locate the global names zone 
and then create the required records. Now, unfortunately, that is a manual process. So you'll need a list of all of the NetBIOS names that you want to add to the zone and you can go through and, and add them. It, it shouldn't be too difficult because you can do that through PowerShell and there's no reason why you can't extract the list of names from your Win server and um, f clean them up a little bit and then use that as the basis for importing the records into, into the zone. But however you do it, you need to create the zone's alias records. So if you've chosen to not use Active Directory Integrated Zones, then you're going to need to set up your zone transfers for all of your DNS servers. In this instance, only one of your servers will be editable and all the other servers, the secondary servers or the secondary instances of a zone, it's not really the server that's secondary, it's the zone that's secondary. So the secondary zones will need to obtain a zone transfer to update their records. That happens on a periodic basis once you've configured zone transfers. So the zone transfer occurs between a secondary zone and its configured master. Now the master may be another read-only copy or it may be the primary zone, depending on how you decide to set things up. So the term primary and master don't mean the same thing. The term master in this case means the zone from which I obtain the records, which may also be another secondary zone. So you can go from the original primary to a secondary. So in that instance, the first tier secondary's master is the primary. And then you can have another secondary which obtains its zone from the first secondary. So its master is a secondary. So master servers can support a primary or secondary zone. You can configure zone transfers on the zone transfers tab for the particular zone. And you can choose the option allow zone transfers and then you can specify to any server or to only the following servers and list them by IP address and, S and server FQDN or to servers listed on the name servers tab, which is probably the best way of doing it. And then you'd have to select the name service tab to configure the details. Here you can also configure the notification settings. So you need to notify secondary servers that there are zone changes and that they will then need to connect in and retrieve those changes. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to create a primary zone, then how to create a secondary zone, how to create a stub zone and how to configure and test zone transfers. OK, so to create any zones, as good a place as any to start is in the DNS console. So expand out forward lookup zones. I've got one called Contoso here. Let's create another zone and give it the name. It's a primary zone this time. I'm going to call it. Well, we can choose if we want to active directory integrate. I'm going to choose not to in this instance. Then we're going to call it, let's think, tailspintoys.com. It'll be stored in a, a text file, which is a zone file. You can see that it's going to be under the system root system32 DNS folder. Do I or do I not allow dynamic updates? I don't have secure dynamic updates available because it's not an Active Directory integrated zone. Uh, or rather, I don't have only secure dynamic updates available. So I can choose if I want to have non-secure and secure or just not allow dynamic updates. I'll choose not to allow. I've now created the zone. I've got my name server here as the authoritative name server and I've got the start of authority record. I might now want to create a new uh, host record. Call it web server and give it the IP address, which does not exist of, uh, I don't know, 172.16.2.100. And then I'm gonna want to create maybe an alias record for that. Um, www and the fqdn is I'll just browse that and select uh, actually I will choose to enter it web server dot tailspin toys if I can type it which I can't make sure I've got the right name there yep uh, so web server dot tailspin toys dot com so now I've got a C name record so if I performed a, a query of that, I should get some sort of result. So now I want to set up a secondary zone. So I'm going to switch over to a, another computer. So this is uh, another computer. Choose DNS. I've installed the DNS server role on Contoso Serve 1, but I've, do, I've not done anything else. So again, I'm going to create a forward lookup zone. And this time I'm going to choose that it's a secondary zone. Tail spin toys.com that's better and I need to now specify the master 
So that's uh, 172.16.0.10, I think. And then select Next, and then say Finish. So I've configured the secondary zone and specified its master, but now I need to configure zone transfers. Otherwise, I'm not going to get any information down here that's useful. I can't transfer the initial contents of the zone until I've permitted zone transfer. So again, we need to switch over to the other server. So here we are on that other server. And now I need to configure the properties of this zone. And on the zone transfer page, I, I can choose to allow zone transfers. Well, I've got that. And then it says only to servers listed on the name service tab or to any server or only the following servers. I'm going to choose only the following servers here and then choose edit and then specify the IP addresses of the name servers that I want to transfer to for the DNS zone tailspintoys.com. So actually I don't know the IP address of the of serve one. Let's see what it is. Uh, yeah, so it's 11. Okay. So let's transfer that over here. 172.16.0.11. Not able to do that for some reason, but anyway, I'm pretty sure that's right. So we say OK to that. And then on the notify page, I also want to notify the following servers. Again, I can specify them manually, which I'm going to by IP. It will take a moment to do that. But again, I could list them on the name service tab if that was a better way. It's, it's resolved now, now properly to Contoso serve one. OK, and the next thing to do is to just verify that I can perform a zone transfer. So over here on the server that hosts the secondary copy of that zone, nothing showing here. I'll just do a quick refresh and then I'm going to transfer from master and again do a refresh. And there we have it. The records have now uh, percolated across here. But remember, I can't change these. These are read only. So there's nothing I can do with any of these records. As you can see, everything's grayed out. But nevertheless, this computer can serve as a a DNS server so it can provide resolution services it just can't be updated. Okay so back on my domain controller here I'm now going to create a stub zone. So again in forward lookup zones right click and choose new zone and choose stub zone and it's adatum.com I now need to enter the IP of the master DNS server that's the server over in the other organization. Now I just need to verify the address. I believe it to be 172.16.1.10. And that's fine. Select next and then finish. That now has created the stub zone. If we take a look in the stub zone, you can see that it contains a record for a datum DC, which is a host record. And it's also got a datum DC as the name server. And it's got a datum DC as the start of authority. Those are the three records you get in a stub zone. If I needed to, and I should do this, I need to configure the reciprocal end. So I'm going to switch over to the Adatum domain controller and configure a corresponding record for the reverse end of this stub zone. So here we are on the other computer. If I just run host name, we can see that it's adatum.com, uh, adatum DC rather, and we can see if we do an ipconfig slash all, we can verify it's a datum DC and a datum.com, and we can see its IP address is 172.16.1.10, and that its gateway is 172.16.01. So that's all looking as it should do. If I go to the DNS console, I'd need to create, I've got the zone obviously for a datum here, but I'd need to create the corresponding record for contoso.com in the other direction. So I need to create a new zone, stub zone. And the zone is called contoso.com. Uh, 172.16.0.10 is the IP of the other server. So that's fine. Finish. And if we look at contoso, it, it may take a moment to do that. Let's do a transfer from master refresh. There we go. We've got the records. So now we should be in a position to do name resolution checks between the two environments. So I'll give that a try. So if I open up a command prompt or PowerShell prompt and I check by doing a ping contoso dc.contoso.com, it resolves out for me. I mean, the ping is neither here nor there, but it does the name resolution. So it's doing that um, through that stub zone. We can actually test that by using NSLOOKUP. 
And if we do that to the same host, so Contoso DC contoso.com and output that to a file and then if we do a review of the file we can see that it's performing this is the question oh actually I know what's happened here it's because um, I malformed that this is a useful learning aid actually if you don't put the training full stop when you're using NSLOOKUP it assumes you mean in a datum.com and then it will go on to assume that you mean in .com. So it will do the query contoso dc contoso .com, com and so on. So let's just do that again, this time properly putting in the training full stop, which you should always use when you're troubleshooting. And now if we look at the file, you can see the query now is not with the rather peculiar local suffix attached. And then it's going on to perform that query. Um, and then it's eventually going to get a response and it's getting it from the primary server contoso dc contoso.com um, and it's providing us with the relevant information so all of that the the, the process is is successful so our stub zones have have been um, configured correctly in the demonstration i showed you how to create a primary zone and a secondary zone and how to create the stub zone i also showed you how you can configure zone transfers between primaries and secondaries Resource records are what makes the DNS world go round. In other words, it's what it's all about. You need to create the appropriate resource records so that applications and users can resolve those records into the appropriate server names and, when necessary, the server names into IP addresses. There are a range of resource records. So, for example, host records, sometimes referred to as A or uh, AAA records for IP4 and IP6 hosts, respectively. Pointer records or PTR records, which provide reverse lookups or inverse lookups. Start of authority records, which identify information that pertains to a particular zone who's responsible for it and the host that's primarily contactable. Name server or NS records, so that we can determine which name server or servers are authoritative for a particular DNS zone. Service location or SRV records, these are used by Active Directory to identify Active Directory related services. So you've got Global Catalog, um, LDAP, and Kerberos, for example. Alias or canonical name or CNAME records, which provide a, an alias name for an existing host. So, for example, if your web server.contoso.com server wants to be known as www, you'd create an alias or CNAME record for www that pointed to the web server 1.contoso.com server. Mail Exchanger or MX records, which you can use to identify which host is responsible for routing mail to a particular organization. In other words, which is the SMTP host that you should contact. Mail Exchanger records have a preference value. The lower the preference value, the more likely you are to use that particular MX record. Zones can become populated with out of date records. So zone scavenging provides a mechanism for you to remove stale records. So you use the aging settings to control this behavior. The new, no refresh interval is the period of time that a record is not eligible to be refreshed. The default is seven days. The refresh interval is the time the record is eligible to be refreshed by the client. Again, the default is seven days. In the demonstration, you'll learn how to add resource records and review zone property records, including those for start of authority and name servers. So I'll connect it to my domain controller, which is also my DNS server. So let's open up the DNS console. And to create DNS records, fairly straightforward, you locate the zone in which you want to create those records. Right click, and then you choose the type of record you want. New host, new alias, new mail exchanger, new domain, new delegation. Or alternatively, you can choose other new records and then you can select from a list here, which will include the ones we just discussed and other types of record. It's also worth noting that if you start to add host records, it's a good idea to have created your reverse lookup zone first. So I'm going to do that now. So the reverse lookup zone is based on the IP address of the uh, subnet. So we'll start by creating a new zone and it's going to be a primary store it in Active Directory. It's an IP4 reverse lookup zone and we put in the network ID 
172.16.0 and it will create the reverse lookup zone of 0.16.172.inaddr.arpa. Let it do um, secure updates because it's part of Active Directory. So that's something that's a, a good idea to, to create. And then from here, I might want to create a pointer record. Since I've done this retrospectively, I need to update the reverse lookup zone with the records for the existing host. So here's a host here. I want to say properties here and say update PTR. And then the same for this host as well. Update PTR. And update PTR. So it should be in fairly good shape. Let's see if that's updated. Well, it's, it's done the first one. I guess it'll do the others in time. So that's an important step. So when you add new host records, you should also add the corresponding PTR. So let's create a new host record. So in this case, we're going to say uh, web server. Well, I'll call it file server, actually. File server 1. And we'll give it an IP address. It'll be fictional, of course. 16.0.87. Create the associated PTR record. Add host. And then done. And we should find that that record is also here. There it is. That's the reverse uh, lookup. And we should find that the file save record is here. If I want to create an alias, I can do that. Now I can do that by right clicking the zone and saying um, new C name. So uh, I can create a, an alias for the domain controller, for example. So let's say DC and then point. I'm not saying this is a thing that you you typically want to do, but the fully qualified domain name is Contoso dc.contoso.com and then select OK and now dc is an alias to contoso.dc.contoso.com and we can verify that that's the case by performing an NSLOOKUP test but you know it's fine. Another way that you can add a CNAME or indeed any other record is by using PowerShell so uh, let's do that here. I'm going to add a, a record through PowerShell. It's going to be an alias record so I'm going to add a CNAME record f with the with the value of www2 for the host contoso-sbr2.contoso.com in the zone contoso.com. So I'm, I just want to check that I've got the records. I can do this by going to the zone, of course, but whilst I'm here in PowerShell, I can also use the get DNS resource record from the zone contoso.com that should re return all of my resource records and I can see that the one that I just added www2 at the bottom here exists. So the point I'm making here is that you can in fact use PowerShell to perform all of your management tasks. Just refresh this here I should see the record that I added. If that's your preference you can you can easily do everything through PowerShell. So it's also important to know how you can test DNS as a client to make sure that these things are working successfully. A good strategy is probably to use PowerShell and to use or rather to use a command line interface in fact but PowerShell works and to use the NS lookup tool. Now you can use this simply by running NS lookup and then specifying in this case the alias that I was interested in and then pressing enter and seeing if it's able to resolve that out and, and it is eventually it comes up with a DNS request timed out that doesn't matter about that. The important thing here is it's telling us that that record is actually the alias for Contoso SVR2 and what the IP address is. If you want a bit more detail, you can use debug mode, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. You can also perform queries that allow you to execute the commands interactively. So, for example, if I want to create an MX record, let's say other new records, and look for a mail exchanger, create record, and I'm going to specify that the fully qualified domain name of my mail server is smtp.contoso. Dot com and give it a preference value of 10 and say done. That's now created the record for me. If I refresh that, I should see it. There we go. So there's a mail exchange record. And if I wanted to, for example, check that out, I can go into NS Lookup to do that. Let's just clear the screen here. It's a good idea to purge the cache periodically. If I do an ipconfig slash display DNS, you can see the records that I've recently resolved. OK, so these are just uh, Active Directory records because they I can tell because they've got a, an MSDCS element to the suffix. Uh, but I want to purge all the records before I did any kind of tests. So having done that, open up and let's look up. Uh, 
set the type to the type of query I'm interested in, MX for example, and then in this case query the domain, and it comes back and tells me that for contos.com there is an MX record with the preference value of 10, mail exchanger being smtp.contos.com, and I might want to go on to do set type equals A for host records and so forth. So you can use NSLOOKUP interactively like that, uh, but you can also use it with debugging, which I think I showed you in an earlier sub-lesson. So for example, I don't know, www.contoso.com, always put the trailing dot and then file.txt, for example. When that's done, we should then open up file.txt and take a look at the query. So what it's asking us here, the relevant question is, what is www.contoso.com and it comes back and it tells us actually www.contoso.com is a type a C name record and actually points to contoso svr2.contoso.com that's a, got a TTL value of an hour remember we talked about caching earlier so we can cache this record once we resolve it for an hour but no longer so once again just to reiterate the, the, the TTL is defined by the authoritative server, not by some other value. It then goes on to helpfully resolve out contoso-svr2.contoso.com as a host record, type A, and gives us the IP address of 172.16.0.12, and it specifies the TTL for that as being 20 minutes. So that's a, a sort of a fairly typical output from NSLOOKUP using it in that way interactively. So finally, let's just quickly review the start of authority records up in the zone. So in contoso.com here, we've got a start of authority record. If you have a look at that, you can see that it defines the primary server, the person who's responsible for the zone, the refresh interval, the relay interval, sorry, the retry interval, the expires after, and the minimum TTL, which is set to be an hour. You can set some other value for that if you want to. In the demonstration, you learned how to add resource records and to review zone property records. In your on-premise deployment, you can configure a number of advanced DNS settings. These include DNSSEC, DNS socket pool, cache locking, DNS security, and finally, DNS policies. When you implement DNSSEC, your DNS servers return a digital signature along with a query response. This helps your clients understand that the response is from a legitimate DNS server. Clients use a trust anchor to verify this signature. To implement DNSSEC, you must create a trust anchor zone and then using group policy objects, create and distribute a name resolution policy table. You can do this by running the DNSSEC configuration wizard in the DNS console. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to implement DNSSEC. So before we set up DNSSEC, let's just perform a quick test to see how resolutions handle at the moment. I've opened up PowerShell here. I'm just going to run the resolve DNS commandlet to determine the IP address of Contoso SVR1. I'm querying the DNS server Contoso DC. On the last command switch, DNSSEC OK just indicates the client is capable of understanding information about DNSSEC, so return any that's valid. Now, it doesn't return anything to do with DNSSEC here because it hasn't yet been set up. So we'll return to this in a moment and perform that test again once DNSSEC is set up correctly. So now I'll choose the DNS console, DNS manager console from the tools menu and expand out forward lookup zones and select the zone that you're interested in signing, in this case contoso.com. Right click, choose DNSSEC and then choose sign the zone. Clicking next. And now I'm going to choose to customize zone signing parameters. And then on the key master page, I'm going to choose the DNS server Contoso DC is the key master. I'm going to skip past the prompt in future and go straight to the key signing key. I'm going to add a new key signing key. And then I'm just going to click OK and then select Next. On the Zone Signing Key page, I'm going to select 
add. Click OK and then select Next. On the next secure interface page, I'm going to select Next. And on the Trust Anchors page, I'm going to select the checkbox for Enable the distribution of trust anchors for this zone. And select Next. On the Signing and Polling Parameters page, just select Next. On the DNS Security Extensions or DNS Sec Summary page, select Next and then Finish. So now I just want to check the Trust Points node. Expand out Trust Points here and we can see that we have some DNSSEC records that are populated under Trust Points under the Contoso.com path. So the next thing to do is to configure the necessary group policy settings. So open up Group Policy Management. Right click and edit the default domain policy. And in the editor expand under Computer Configuration, expand the Policies node, Windows Settings node, and then select Name Resolution Policy. Then in the suffix box type Contoso dot com and then select the enable DNS sec in this rule checkbox and also the require DNS clients to check checkbox and then I select create and apply and that's now completed so if we go back to PowerShell and we run the command that we ran previously we should get a slightly different result now. So we can see the same information about resolving the IP address, uh, but we've got some information about the fact that it has been signed and the signer and details about the signature. So everything seems to be um, set up correctly. So in the demonstration, you saw how to implement DNSSEC. DNS socket pool. You can use DNS socket pool to force a DNS server to use a random source port when responding to DNS queries. This can help to ensure the DNS server is protected against a malicious person who must now guess both the source port of a DNS query and a random transaction ID before they can instigate some sort of attack against your DNS service. Use the DNS CMD XE command line tool to configure the DNS socket pool size. For example, DNS CMD slash config slash socket pool size and then a value, where the value is in a range from 0 to 10,000. When a DNS client queries a recursive DNS server, the server caches the result. The time to live or TTL value of the record determines how long the record stays in cache. During that TTL, a record can be overwritten if more recent data is available for the record. But this can expose a potential security issue. A malicious person might be able to overwrite the record in cache with bogus information. In Windows Server, you can use cache locking to control when information in the DNS resolver cache can be overwritten. When you enable cache locking, the DNS server doesn't allow updates to cached records until the TTL expires. Remember, the TTL is defined by the originator of the record, not by your server, usually. To enable cache locking, run the set DNS server cache commandlet. For example, set DNS server cache, and then use the locking percent command switch and the specifier value, where the value is a percentage of the time to live. In DNS, by default, the following groups have administrative capabilities on your organization's DNS servers. Domain Admins has full permissions to manage all aspects of the DNS server in the local domain. Enterprise Admins has full permissions to manage all aspects of all DNS servers in any domain in your forest. And DNS Admins can view and edit all DNS data, settings and configurations of all DNS servers in their local domain. So it's important that you only add a user to the appropriate group so that they have the necessary permissions, but no more than the necessary permissions. DNS policies is a feature in Windows Server that enables you to control how a DNS server behaves in a particular set of circumstances. You can create policies to manage application high availability, traffic management, split horizon, sometimes referred to as split brain DNS, filtering, and forensics. You can also use time of day based redirection. To implement DNS policies, you must be able to classify groups of records in a DNS zone. You can use the following DNS objects to characterize your DNS clients the client subnet, the recursion scope, zone scopes. Whichever of these you choose to use, you must implement DNS policies by using Windows PowerShell commands. To configure DNS zone scopes, 
Windows Server supports two types of DNS scope, recursion scopes and zone scopes. With multiple DNS zone scopes, each zone scope has its own DNS resource records. The same record can exist in multiple zone scopes, but with different values. So for example, a website with the address of www.contoso.com might have two different IP addresses returned based on the particular scope. You can use zone scopes to control zone transfers and to provide DNS clients with the resource records appropriate to their physical location. To create zone scopes, you must first of all create and configure client subnets. So for example, to create a subnet for a DNS clients in New York and another for clients in London, use the following Windows PowerShell commands. Add DNS server client subnet, name NYC subnet, and then IPv4 subnet, and then use the CIDR notation for the subnet address, in this instance 172.16.0.0 slash 24, which means that the first three octets represent the subnet and the last octet represents the hosts. Then run the same command again, only this time use the name LON subnet and use the IP4 subnet address of 172.16.1.0 slash 24. In step two, you'll need to create DNS zone scopes. So for example, to create the DNS zone scopes for New York and London, for the DNS clients located in each of those locations, use the following commands. Add DNS server zone scope and then zone name contosa.com and name NYC zone scope. And then run add DNS server zone scope zone name contosa.com and this time name lon zone scope. Next, you'll need to populate the zone scopes with records. So to populate the zone scopes with the appropriate records, use the add DNS server resource record commandlet. For example, add DNS server resource record, zone name contoso.com. And then the type of record we want here is a host record. So that's minus A and then the name, which is www. And then the IP4 address for that particular host is, in this instance, 172.16.0.41. And that's going to be in the zone scope, NYC zone scope. Then run the same command again, but this time the host record um, has a different IP address. In this instance, 172.16.1.22. And the zone scope is for LON zone scope. Finally, you need to configure the DNS policies. To do that, you'll need to, to configure the DNS servers to respond with the appropriate resource record from the New York zone scope or from the London zone scope as appropriate. So for New York, run the add DNS server query resolution policy command and specify the name of NYC policy, the action as allow, the client subnet as equal to NYC subnet, and the zone scope as being NYC zone scope, and the zone name as being contosa.com. To support the London clients, it's a similar command, obviously, that you're running here. So it's, again, add DNS server query resolution policy. This time, the name is LON policy. The action is also allow. Uh, and the client subnet this time is equal to LON subnet. And the zone scope is LON zone scope. Again, the zone name is contosa.com. In the demonstration, I'm going to show you how to create DNS policies. So I'm on my DNS server. I'm going to open up a Windows PowerShell command line interface. And the first thing I need to do is to create the client subnets. So I'm going to use the add DNS server client subnet commandlet. In this case, I'm creating NYC subnet. And then I need to create one for London. The next step is to create a zone scope. Again, this one's for NYC and the corresponding one for London. Then I need to add some specific records for each of these zones. So in this case, I'm going to add a, a record www with an IP of 172.16.0.41 to the NYC zone scope. And then I'm going to create something slightly different for the London location. In this case, the same record, www, will return a different IP address. And then finally, to create my DNS server query resolution policy, one for the New York location, 
and a corresponding but slightly different version for London. That's it, I've set up everything that I need. So I've switched to a Windows 11 client now. I'm going to open up Windows Terminal and I'm just going to do a quick test. Resolve DNS name www.contoso.com and press enter. And the record that we get is with an IP address of 172.16.0.41. And that's because uh, the IP address of this computer puts it into the subnet 172.16.0.24. And so that's the result that we get from that or for that subnet. So that all seems to be working as expected. In the demonstration, you learned how to create DNS policies. So far in this lesson, we've been looking at implementing DNS using Windows Server in your on-prem environment. But of course, you can also implement your name resolution strategy using Azure, either in addition to Windows Server on-prem or instead of. Azure DNS provides a highly available DNS service that runs in the Microsoft Cloud. It provides name resolution for your Azure resources and an authoritative DNS service for its zones. In order for DNS queries for resources in your organization's domain to reach Azure DNS, you must delegate that domain to Azure DNS from the parent domain. So if you're looking to integrate a subdomain, for example, sales.contosa.com within Azure DNS, that's fine. You'll need to create a delegation in your on-prem contosa.com zone for that to take effect. It's worth noting that Azure provides both public and private DNS services. Azure Public DNS provides name resolution for internet-facing DNS domains. You use Azure Public DNS to host your organization's DNS domains. So, for example, if you're in the organization Contoso and you have a public DNS name of contoso.com and you wanted to make that available through Azure, you'd set up an Azure Public DNS zone. Azure Private DNS provides name resolution for virtual machines within a virtual network and between virtual networks. This enables you to configure zone names with a split horizon display, which enables a private and a public DNS zone to share the same zone name. To implement Azure Private DNS, you need to remember that Azure Private DNS provides a, a platform as a service approach to DNS. So there's no need to deploy any infrastructure as a service virtual machines and to install or manage the DNS server role. During Azure DNS configuration, you're provided with the IP address of the DNS servers within Azure. Use these addresses when you're configuring DNS delegation from your chosen domain registrar or for forwarders and stub zones from your on-prem DNS servers. There are some limitations, however. Azure Private DNS doesn't support zone transfers from primary to secondary or from secondary to primary. So you can't directly integrate an AD integrated zone with an Azure DNS zone functioning as a secondary zone. The solution here is to use conditional forwarders or stub zones. In the demonstration, I'll show you how you can implement Azure DNS. So let's start by creating an, a public DNS zone in Azure. So I'm looking at the Azure portal here. So I'm going to search for DNS. and then select um, DNS zones and create a DNS zone. So select my subscription and resource group and now I'm going to choose the name and then review and create and then select create. So remember this is a public zone so this needs to be unique, you need to be responsible for managing the zone and then we can give that a test in a moment. You can see on the right hand side how in the details pane how we've got a list of the name servers so for example ns1-02.azuredns.com so the next thing I probably should do is consider adding a new record so let's take a look at that process. If I select record set and then specify the name as www Specify it as an A alias record to an IP4 address. Specify the alias record set details, if any. The TTL will default to one hour, and then I need to enter the IP address. Then dot zero dot zero dot two, for example, and then select OK. That's now created a record set. We can see the record is here. And then to give that a test from my client, which is 
a way off on the internet somewhere. Open up a command prompt. And then I'm going to use NSLOOKUP to verify the integrity of that record. And the name server I'm using, ns1-02.azuredns.com, is indicated behind that PowerShell window here. That's one of the name servers, ns1-02.azuredns.com, for that zone. And it comes back and it's able to resolve www.contosodemo.com. That's the zone we created with the record we created. And obviously that resource doesn't actually exist, but that's not relevant. So that's setting up a public facing DNS zone in Azure. So to set up a private DNS zone, go back to home and then search for private DNS, select private DNS zones, and then create a private DNS zone. Remember these are used within Azure to resolve names and uh, to IPs and so on for uh, resources within Azure, your, your resources. I'm gonna choose a resource group to place this private zone in. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it maybe priv.contosodemo.com and then select review and create and then select create. I'll take a moment to do that. Okay, that's complete. So I can go to that resource now. And one of the first thing I'm going to need to do is to create a virtual network link. So if I select virtual network links here and then add it, I can link it to my virtual network, which is Contoso VNet1, to which I have a VM established. So I'm just going to call this one, well, link, con, con, if I can type, Contoso VNet1, and then select OK. The Option here, enable auto registration, as you can see, enables automatic creation of DNS records in the private zone for VMs connected to the virtual network. So I'm gonna select that and then say, okay. So if I select the overview page here, I can add a record set. So pretty similar to what we did before, in fact, identical, www.priv.contosodemo.com this time, and give it the IP address of 10.0.0.0 five and then select OK. And now we've got some records as you can see here, www and we've got the start of authority record. There's no notion of real name servers because it's a managed service. So we don't need to consider that. But I now want to test that. I'm going to need to switch to a virtual machine which is connected to that virtual network. So if I go back to home here and look at my VMs, I've got a VM here, Contoso VM1 that's running at the moment. And if I select networking, we can see that it's connected to Contoso VNet1 and it's in subnet zero. So it has an IP address of 10.0.0.4. At some point or other, that record will be added to priv.contosodemo.com. So I'm just going to connect to the VM now. If I select the overview page and then select connect and RDP, I'll download the RDP file, open it up, connect to that VM and just enter the password for the account and then from here what we want to do is open up a PowerShell prompt and we want to perform a test and let's look up www.priv.contosodemo.com and press enter and it resolves that out for me. So that's all seems to be working. So slightly different testing process. In the demonstration, you learned how to implement Azure DNS. This is lesson seven, manage network infrastructure. In this lesson, you'll learn to manage on-premise IP addressing with DHCP and IPAM. Manage your address space with IPAM. Implement and manage the remote access role. Implement RADIUS. Manage network policies. Implement hybrid network connectivity. The hands-on sessions include creating and testing a VPN connection, creating network policies, and implementing Azure Network Adapter. It's very important that you understand how to configure IP4 addresses and understand IP4 subnet addressing. 
Although you won't be directly asked questions on the AZ800 exam about IP addressing, you will be expected to solve problems that relate to incorrect IP configuration. So we're going to start with the basics and work our way through a bit about IP4 subnetting. Take a glance at the way that Azure handles subnets and then move on to talk a bit about IP6. So when you configure a device, you'll need to assign an IP4 address. You'll also need to assign a subnet mask. This is usually configured by using a decimal notation, as you can see in the graphic here. But when you express IP addresses in a diagrammatic format, you'll use a CIDR notation. So CIDR notation uses the form 172.16.0.0 slash 16, 16 being the number of bits that represent the network and subnet network. The remaining 16 bits represent the host address within that particular network or subnetwork. It's important you're able to work with both the decimal notation and the CIDR notation. The next thing each host will need is a default gateway. The gateway is a router, so if a device needs to communicate with a host in a remote subnet, and it makes that determination by comparing its own IP with the remote IP and the subnet mask. If it needs to communicate remotely, then it needs to know how to get to that remote subnet, and it uses the default gateway to handle that routing. To resolve names into IP addresses, or the reverse when that's necessary, then you'll need to configure one or more DNS server addresses. On a Windows server, that means specifying a preferred DNS server and an alternative DNS server. When you're configuring IP addressing, you'll almost certainly be configuring private IP addresses. Public IP addresses are used on the internet. So all the IP4 devices that directly connect to the internet must have a valid and unique public IP4 address. Given the size of the address space, it supports about 4 billion addresses. That's not enough these days to support the number of connected devices. And so we need to use uh, private IP addresses on internal networks and connect those internal networks using some sort of network address translation device or NAT device that sits between the private network and the public network. IANA assigns the public IP addresses to ISPs and then a NAT, as I said, is used to convert from your internal or private IP address to a valid public IP address. These are the ranges of uh, private IP addresses that are available. 10.0.0.0 slash 8 gives you a huge range of potential IP addresses to work with internally. And that's the range of addresses that's used by Azure on Azure Virtual Networks by default. If you prefer to use a class B address, then 172.16.0.0 slash 12 is usually used um, in that circumstance. Alternatively, very commonly in home networks, 192.168.0.0 slash 16. So typically, you'll see private IPs in home networks in this range, class C range. But any of these are valid on an internal network. When you're working with simple networks, you use whole octets to describe networks, subnetworks, and hosts. So for example, 192.168.17.1 is the IP address. If we have a, a decimal mask of 255.255.255.0, that's very simple. And it's simple because we can immediately identify that the whole of the last octet is the host address, and the remaining three octets are either network or subnetwork elements. And we can figure out from this that the network ID in this case is 192.168.17.0. We should also be aware, by the way, that this is a private IP address. When you're using more complex environments, you might end up having to, to reconfigure the number of octets that are, are being used. Before you get into that, it's worth understanding what the defaults are. So for IP4, there are a number of different class of addresses or classes of address. These are used or initially were used to define large networks, medium-sized networks and small networks respectively, so A, B, C. This is not normally a consideration anymore, but it's, it's useful to understand the background. So in a class A network, up to 128 different networks from 1 to 127. So the first octet of an IP4 address will start 1 through 127 if it's a class A network. That will define the default subnet mask as being 255.000. Now the number of networks that are available is 126 in total because there are some reserved networks. So you can't use, for example, 127 because that's used for local loopback. 
However, each one of these networks can contain up to 16,777,214 hosts. Actually, there are 16,777,216 valid host addresses, but two of them are reserved, one for the network address and one for the broadcast address in the network. Class B, a Class B address will start with a, a decimal 128 through to 191, and that will default to using the first 16 bits or two octets for the subnet mask, 255.255.00, providing 16,384 networks, each containing 65,534 hosts. Of course, you can subnet these down if you want to, but that's not default. Class C networks start with a decimal 192 through to 223, Use three octets for the mask, providing just over 2 million networks, each containing 254 hosts. So you can see that when using class ABC, you're talking about bigger networks containing more hosts, through to class C, which is a far larger number of networks, each containing a smaller number of hosts. When you're working with complex networks, you're probably going to use a scheme of your own where you want to allocate however many bits you want to provide for the right number of subnets and the right number of hosts. By going with the defaults, it can be quite restrictive. So an IP address, it's the same one we looked at before, of 192.168.17.1, but this time using a mask of 255.255.2400. Now that's actually 20 bits. So you'd express this by saying whatever the subnet address was, slash 20, and we'll look at what the subnet address is in a minute. So that means part of the third octet is host address and part of the third octet is subnet address. And that can be confusing when you look at the number in decimal. So 17 indicates which subnet? Well, let's take a look. It's actually subnet 16, 192.168.16.0 slash 20. So you need to be familiar with understanding more complex arrangements where you're using a variable length subnet mask. VLSM, by the way, is the abbreviation that's also used to describe non-default configurations. I also used the term CIDR earlier, so those are similar terms. They mean the same thing. So let's take a look at an example. In this one, we have two hosts in different subnets. Host 1 has an IP address of 172.16.16.1 and 24 bits are used to express the um, subnet address. Host 2 has an IP address of 172.16.17.1 and again also 24 bits are used. So that means three whole octets. If you look at the octets 172.16.16 versus 172.16.17 you can see that they are different. So these two hosts are in different subnets. Whereas if you adjust the mask by sliding the mask to the left you uh, uh, create the ability to have more hosts in a subnet and to have fewer subnets. In this particular instance, we express that by using slash 20. That's the CIDR notation. And in this instance, then, 172.16.16.1 is in subnet 16, and 172.16.17.1 is also in subnet 16. It may not be quite so obvious when you're looking at that, but were you to write out the binary equivalent of those two IP addresses, that's what you'd see. So now we need to determine the subnet mask. So we can do that by starting off with a calculation or an estimate of the number of subnets that you need. So for example, if you needed 13, then you need to work out how many bits you need in binary to express that. Now, if you convert the number 13 to binary, in this case 1101, that uses four bits. So 1101, four bits. Now to make that meaningful as a mask, you need to convert it to high order contiguous bits. That's a complicated sounding phrase, but all it means is we shuffle it to the left and we make them all ones. So in a given octet, we use those four bits on the left hand side um, where they have a slightly higher value and they are all ones contiguously. If you look at a mask, they are always binary ones until they stop being binary ones and become binary zeros. And then there are all zeros. There's never one zero one zero. OK, so having converted to high order contiguous bits, we then convert that number to decimal. And 11110000 is 240 in decimal, and that is the decimal mask. Now, masks actually have a range of possible values. So they can be eight zeros, or they can be one followed by seven zeros, or one one and then six zeros, and one 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 and five zeros, and so on, through to eight ones. So there are only actually eight values you can have for, for a subnet mask. So it's usually quite easy. It's a question of 
finding out what those are. And if it was me taking the exam, I'd want to be familiar with this process because it's the kind of thing that you need to be able to do immediately in your head. I mean, you've got the subnet calculator feature that you can work with, but you don't have that in the exam. So you're going to have to figure it out in some sort of more manual way. Then you apply the mask to your chosen network ID. So in this case, maybe 172.16.0.0 provides for 255.255.2400 or more likely 172.16.0.0 slash and the number of bits, in this case, 20. This is a list of the possible subnet addresses using four bits in the mask. So the first is 0000. And I'm only saying the first four bits because only those are relevant. The rest of the bits in the this octet are host bits. Then the next bi binary value for, for the subnet would be 0001 and then 0010. If you converted each of those in turn, they would convert to 0, 16, 32, 48. And you'll notice there's a pattern here. In this particular example, every single subnet is 16 higher than the preceding subnet. Now, that varies based entirely on the number of bits that you're using. So, for example, if you're using five bits in the mask, that gives you a decimal mask of 248, in which case the interval is eight. If you're using three bits, that's a mask of 224 in decimal, which means that the interval is 32. So it does vary tremendously. But in this example, they are from zero through to 240 at 16 digit intervals. Then you need to figure out the host addresses. And the basic rule of this is that the start host range is one binary digit higher than the network address or subnetwork address through to two binary digits lower than the next subnet address. So let's look at the first example. So the decimal value of the subnet, the first subnet is zero. The first host then is in decimal zero one. I don't know what the first two octets are. It depends on what the network address is, but it's zero one, which is one binary digit higher. And it, it increases up to the maximum value of 15.254. 15.255 would be the broadcast address in that subnet. And you can't allocate that to a host. And then the next number after 15.254 is 16.0. And that, of course, is the next subnet. So it's the one digit lower than the broadcast address or two digits lower than the next subnet address. And on that basis, you can calculate all of the various values. I'm not saying you need to write all of this out, but you need to be familiar with the process. Supernetting is the ability to join subnets together, and it's working on the principle of changing the subnet mask from its default value. So it's, you consolidate perhaps a number of class C subnets rather than taking a class B network and subnetting it down. So a class C network uses three octets for the network address, a class B uses two, and with a class B subnet you might decide to use more than two, so maybe 20 bits instead of 16, and that gives you up to 16 subnets. Whereas with a class C network, you can have, you know, it's one subnet, and you can have 254 hosts. So instead, you change the mask by moving zeros to the left, reducing the number of bits in the mask from being three octets or 24 bits to, I don't know, 20 bits. And it does it effectively the same thing as subnetting a class B by four bits. You supernet a class C by four, four bits and you end up with the same sort of distribution of addresses. So by way of example, there are two hosts in different subnets, 192.168.16.1 slash 24 and 192.168.17.1 slash 24. And we can adjust the mask to place both um, hosts in the same subnet. So in this particular example, this is a class C network address. The default mask should be 24 bits or three octets. We're changing it to be 20 bits or two and a half octets. And that effectively joins the host into the same subnet. If you're looking at these addresses, you might be thinking, well, aren't those the same addresses we used before? Not quite. Before, we used the example 172.16.16.1 and 172.16.17.1. So they were class B addresses. So we subnetted down a class B address. And here we're supernetting up a class C address. So when you're planning an IP addressing scheme, you need to select an address class, calculate the required number of subnets, modify your mask, determine the subnets IDs, determine the host IDs for each subnet, and then implement your scheme. So in this example, you can see we're using a class B network address, 172.16. And we are subnetting with four bits, hence 172.16.0.0 slash 20. And subnet one 
is allocated the address range 172.16.16.0/20, which means it has a host range of 172.16.16.1 through to 172.16.31.254. In this example, the router has been allocated the last allocatable IP address in the subnet. And likewise in subnet 2, that's also the case. It's a different subnet. It starts at 32.1 through to 47.254. In other words, it's 172.16.32.0 slash 20. So the full range of IPs could be used. It's a good idea when you're implementing your IP addressing scheme to allocate router addresses at one end of the subnet range or the other, not somewhere randomly in the middle. Let's talk briefly about Azure subnets. When you create a virtual network, you'll need to configure the address space for that virtual network. When you've chosen the address space and you're prompted to use a 10 net address, and in fact it defaults to 10.0.0.0 slash 16, if you can remember, 10.0.0.0 slash 16 gives you 65,534 hosts in a range of 254 subnets. So that's plenty of address space to play with. Once you've configured your virtual network as part of that process, you will need to configure the subnet addresses. It will create a default subnet for you automatically and it will allocate the address 10.0.0.0 slash 24, giving you 254 hosts potentially in, in the subnet. You'll then go on to add as many subnets as you feel that you need. Subnets allow you to manage the flow of network traffic and all devices in all subnets can communicate with one another on the same virtual network. And we touched on virtual network peering earlier on in the course as a way of configuring connectivity between different virtual networks. But notice something interesting. When you actually add a subnet, there are a number of reserved addresses. So theoretically, there are 256 addresses available in the subnet. And I'm adding a subnet here called subnet2 with the address 10.0.2.0 slash 24. But as we know, one of the addresses is reserved for the subnet address itself. And one of them is for the broadcast address in the subnet. So those two are already reserved and can't be allocated. So although it expresses the range 10.0.2.0 to 10.0.2.255, it tells us in brackets that actually that's only 251 allocatable addresses. Five are reserved. So the two that I mentioned and three others. So depending on the subnet that you're talking about, the default subnet has an additional requirement. There, there is roughly 250 addresses in each subnet, but it does expressly tell you how many. You don't need to particularly allocate individual IP addresses or anything, but you need to be aware of the range of addresses that you are making available for allocation. Also notice that by default, it doesn't configure an IP6 address space, but that's something that you might want to configure based on the type of services that you're using and whether or not they need IP6. Now, I don't think you probably need to worry too much about IP6 on the exam, but it's worth being at least familiar. So I'm going to roll through a few slides about IP6. The thing about IP6 is it's giving us an increased address space. Instead of 32 bits, it's got 128 bits to play with. And that may sound like it's four times larger, but of course it's much larger than that. It's got, I think it's something like 38, something like three, it's 34 followed by something like 36 zeros. I mean, it's a huge number of addresses. So it's not four times bigger, it's twice as big as the address space for IP4 by 96 times. So it doubles up another 96 times. So it's a huge number. That's not to say that it's infinite. It's not. It will eventually be depleted, I suppose, but it will be a long time. It provides for improved routing because it has a, a more hierarchical structure. It's simpler to configure because you can rely on stateless auto configuration which is a process whereby devices obtain a configuration from a router rather than you having to allocate a configuration from, say, a DHCP server, or worse yet, having to manually configure a device. It provides for improved security, better real-time data delivery. It has a quite a different format. It's such a large address, it has to be expressed not in binary and not even in decimal, but in hexadecimal. So, for example, this is a, an IP6 address expressed in binary, that's only the first three parts of an eight-part address, so it would be an, an extremely long number, 128 bits long, in fact, and we're only looking at a small portion of it. If we convert that into hexadecimal, that becomes 2002 colon 0db5 colon 0000. So it starts to become a bit more manageable. And then to make it a bit easier, we can leave out the leading zeros and blocks of zeros. So you can see here the full address as an example, and you can see that there are some blocks of addresses 
that are all zeros and there are some addresses that start with a zero. We can remove the leading zero because we can imply that when we say db5, we mean 0db5 because we haven't expressed four digits. And therefore, the missing one is always at the front and it's always a zero. And then where we have a double colon, we can indicate that there is a missing block of all zeros. Now, in this particular instance, there's another block of all missing zeros, but we can't express that with a double colon because then we're not quite sure where they reside. We have to indicate that it's just one octet, one grouping rather, of the address space. So that collapse net IP format makes it a little bit easier to work with. As the, with IP4, there are a number of different ways you can communicate between hosts. There's unicasting, there's multicasting, and there's broadcasting. And in IP6, there's unicasting, and there are a number of different types of unicast address. Global, which is a bit like a public IP4 address, and unique local addresses, which is a bit like a private IP4 address, and linked local addresses, which is like um, an automatic private IP address, and a PEEPA address, 169.254, as an example in IP4 terms. It's an address that an IP6 host used by default until they've obtained either a unique local address or a global unicast address. There are special addresses available as well for certain circumstances, and there are also compatibility and transition addresses. You can also multicast between devices, just as you can with IP4. And instead of a broadcast, use the term anycast when you want to communicate with multiple hosts or with all hosts more accurately. Subnetting is handled slightly differently. A prefix is used to identify the subnet. So that's very similar to using CIDR notation in IP4. So you sort of 172.16.00 slash 20. So it's a similar sort of a process. So you can see here, for example, we specify the number of bits in the prefix by expressing them with a slash and then a numerical value. So 2002 colon DB5 colon colon slash 48 would be a typical IP6 subnet address. You can identify the type of unicast address by its prefix. So if it starts 2000 colon colon slash 3, it's a global unicast address. If it starts FD colon colon slash 8, it's a unique local address. And if it has a, a link local address assigned, it will start FE80 colon colon slash 64. To configure an IP6 host, you, same as with IP4, you must assign each device an IP6 address. It must be unique on the network. But you can assign it either manually, which is unlikely, or you'll use some sort of automatic system. So most IP6 hosts are assigned multiple addresses. So a link local address is assigned and then a unicast address is assigned. By using stateful auto configuration, you use DHCP to allocate these addresses. By using stateless auto configuration, you use router announcements for devices to automatically configure themselves appropriately with a relevant global or unique local address. Stateless addressing relies on router advertisements and during stateless, the following process occurs. The device creates a unique link local address, discovers routers on the network using that address, determines the prefix is configured on any discovered routers, and applies those locally. Optionally, the device will contact a DHCP server, if one is present, to obtain additional configuration information, and it will apply those DHCP version 6 settings. So this is an example of how that looks. So the IP6 host communicates with an IP6 router, and obtains its configurations through the prefixes that are advertised and applies those and then communicates with a DHCP server and looks for the presence of an IP6 scope and uses the scope to configure any IP6 options. As I said, it's unlikely you'll get any detailed questions about IP6 on the exam, but you should at least be aware of what an IP6 address looks like and how it's formatted and how devices typically configure. DHCP is ubiquitous. The Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol emerged as a, a Microsoft variation on the Boot P standard back in the 90s. It's now pretty much everywhere. We have that DHCP functionality built into routers at home to connect us to the internet and to printing devices even. It's important, therefore, you understand how to configure DHCP properly to provide for IP addresses to be allocated automatically to your devices to ensure that you've got the correct IP configuration because by using a service that has a stateful element to it, you can record the configurations that have been applied and ensure that they are not applied to other devices erroneously. 
It supports the notion of device reconfiguration, so you can change the configuration of your scope and that will result in the changed configuration of the configured devices or the devices leasing configurations. It means that you can use the available IP address space efficiently because you're, you're allocating on an as-needed basis. It centralizes your IP configuration. The architecture consists of a DHCP server per subnet, although that's something I'll talk more about later, with an IP4 and or an IP6 scope configured. You can think of the scope as being a collection of settings that are stored in a DHCP database. DHCP clients are any network device that supports the DHCP protocol for the leasing of an IP configuration. During the initial communication process between a DHCP client and a DHCP server, the following occurs. The DHCP client sends a DHCP discover packet over UDP port 67 using a broadcast. The DHCP server, or servers if there are several, respond with a DHCP offer, again over UDP, and this time port 68, again using a broadcast. The DHCP client will request the use of one of the offered configurations from a DHCP server, and again, because the client still doesn't have an IP configuration, it will need to use a broadcast, and it will use UDP 67 to communicate. The DHCP server will then respond with a DHCP acknowledgement over UDP 68, again using a broadcast. And at this point, the client will then use the configuration and therefore further communications is done over unicast rather than broadcast. Now, when a client obtains an IP configuration, it will continue using that configuration until the lease has expired. And typically, a lease lasts for eight days, although when you're configuring wired and wireless connections, you might set different values based on the fact that it's a wireless connection. Anyway, the default value is eight days. So a client will attempt to renew the configuration halfway through that lease period, so after four days. If that's unsuccessful, it continues using the configuration until it's able to renew or until it's instructed to discontinue use by a DHCP server. It will try again at seven eighths time to live. Sorry, at, at one eighth time to live at seven eighths time expired. So if that again is unsuccessful, it will continue using the address for the rest of the lease duration. However, if it's successful, then the clock starts again at, at eight days. So the renewal process works like this. The DHCP client sends a DHCP request packet to the configured DHCP server. That's unicast traffic as opposed to broadcast as in the initial discovery phase. The DHCP server responds to acknowledge and in indicates to the client they can continue using the configuration. It's very unlikely that the DHCP server rather would negatively acknowledge the renewal, but it does occasionally happen. So the client would then release the configuration for a new lease period, whatever that might be. Assuming it hasn't changed, it would then be a further eight days. As I said, communications is unicast based. Because clients tend to move around these days, it's also important that when they start up, they attempt to renew. So that's what happens. And it's important because if you're moving between subnets or you have the potential of moving between subnets, your IP configuration no longer is valid in the new subnet. So during startup renewal, the DHCP server will respond, and if it responds, then renewal occurs in the usual way, and you'll then lease the address for a further eight days or until you start up in the morning. But if you don't get a response from the DHCP server, the client will revert to the discover phase in the usual way, and that's because it assumes that it's in a different subnet. To install a DHCP server, you must meet the following prereqs. First of all, sign in with a local admin account or otherwise sign in as a member of the Domain Admin's Global Security Group, assuming you're installing in a domain environment. Configure the target server with a static, manually configured IP address. That's important because you can't allocate a dynamic address to a device which is allocating addresses to other devices. They must have a fixed static address. Ensure all volumes are configured for or formatted for NTFS. And then avoid combining the DHCP server role with other functions like SQL Server or Exchange Server. To install the DHCP server role, you can use Server Manager and select Add Roles and Features. Or you can use the Windows PowerShell Add Windows Feature commandlet and specify that you want to install the DHCP role. As a security precaution, you need to authorize your DHCP server role in Active Directory. To do this, you can select the option for Complete DHCP Configuration you'll see that listed under the notification window in Server Manager. This creates the required security groups for managing DHCP server and also, also authorizes the server in Active Directory. 
You can also use the Windows PowerShell Add DHCP Server in DC commandlet to perform the same authorization. In the demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can install the DHCP Server role and authorize the DHCP Server into Active Directory. So on this uh, additional server in the domain, I'm signed as a member of domain admins and I'm selecting admin features, scroll through the wizard and select DHCP server and the administrative tools that go along with that. And then when I'm ready, select install. As I said, you can also do this from the Windows PowerShell commandlet uh, with this feature if you wish. And then once installation is finished, we'll need to authorize the server because this is an Active Directory domain environment. OK, so that's fine. The notification appears up here in Server Manager to complete the DHCP configuration, which I'll now do. Select Next. Specify the credentials. I'm already signed in with necessary privilege, so I'm just going to select Commit and then select Closed. That's now done. If we went into the DHCP console, we could see the server, although there's nothing configured on it as yet, but it's ready to accept configuration. So in the demonstration, we learned how to install the DHCP server and how to authorize the role. Now, the first thing you'll want to do with your DHCP server is set up a DHCP scope. It's a scope that contains the configuration information and options and details about reservations. You can use standard scopes, which is probably what you'll do most of the time. And a standard scope maps a particular range of typically IP4, but also IP6 addresses and options. A super scope is a, a collection of standard scopes. So in the graphic you can see we have a, a standard scope 172.16.8.0 for London 1 and 172.16.16.0 for London 2, both of which are class B. Looks like we're using 248 or 21 bits in a subnet mask based on what I can see here. And those have been combined together to create a super scope from which a client can be allocated an address in either of the scopes, so long as they're in the appropriate physical location. So a super scope, as I said, combines multiple scopes. A multicast scope supports the notion of applications that require the allocation of a multicast address. Multicasting is used when you want to communicate with multiple hosts in an efficient manner. So, for example, distributing software or maybe video conferencing, something like that. And the configured app uses or, or wants to use a multicast address and we can allocate those addresses using DHCP. And you can configure both IP4 and IP6 DHCP scopes to suit your requirements. Remember that IP6 devices can automatically configure themselves using stateless auto configuration, but we often configure options for IP6 using DHCP. The properties of a scope are a start and end IP address, and my recommendation is that you allocate every single IP address in the entirety of a subnet, and then you go on to exclude any that you don't want to use. You'll also need to define a subnet mask or a prefix. So a subnet mask is a decimal notation, 255.255.00, whereas a prefix is expressed as a number of bits, so slash 16. Both are valid. Exclusions are the, ones, the IP addresses that you don't want to allocate within a configured range. So it's best practice, in my opinion, to specify the entire range of start and end addresses that are possible within a given subnet, every single IP address, and then exclude those that you want to allocate to router devices or to anything that needs a static configuration. You'll also need to configure the appropriate DNS and possibly the WINS servers. WINS is a, a NetBIOS name resolution service. It's not widely used now, but certainly DNS is extremely important. You can create scopes by using the DHCP console, or alternatively, you can use the following Windows PowerShell commandlets. Add DHCP Server v4 scope to create a standard scope. Add DHCP Server v4 super scope to create a super scope. And add DHCP Server v4 multicast scope to create a multicast scope. Reservations are interesting. Suppose you want to allocate a specific IP address to a specific device. Now, you might be tempted to manually configure that device, but the problem with that is if you need to change the configuration, you'll need to go to that device to change it. It's quite difficult sometimes to remotely change the network settings of a device manually because you're on a network configuring that device. As soon as you make a change, you lose connectivity to that device. So a better solution is to create a DHCP reservation. A reservation enables you to use a specific configuration for a specific client, but it's still centralized. It's still on the DHCP server. So to create a reservation, you need to know 
or we need to give it a name first of all and then you need to know what the mac address is of the client device that's the hardware network address and that allows you then to identify the specific computer you can give it a descriptive name as well if you want to the reservation name doesn't have to be the client computer name but it's helpful if, if it is it makes it easier for you and then you allocate an IP address from the current scope it can't be just any random address it must be one that, that's from the particular scope so you allocate it from a range that's already permitted so the, the device ends up having effectively a static configuration but you can configure that centrally if you need to make a change to it so a good approach if you need to work out what the MAC address is of a client device you can ping it and then you can use ARP the address resolution protocol to determine the hardware address that's just been resolved DHCP options allow us to configure additional IP configuration information beyond just a basic IP address and a subnet mask you can configure a range of options and each option has a, a numeric identifier so 003 is the router for example and 006 is DNS and 015 is the DNS suffix those are the three important ones and you probably need to remember what those are so in the case of a router you might want to allocate a particular router address for everybody in a particular subnet or for a DNS suffix you might want to allocate the same DNS suffix to everybody in your organization and you can do that because DHCP options are operating at several different levels at the server level even if your server has multiple scopes any IP address that's been allocated from any of the scopes would use a server option if one's configured so if you want the same DNS suffix for all devices you might allocate that at the server level if you allocate it at a subnet level then only computers that alloc are allocated a configuration for that subnet receive that particular option but you can be more specific and set a value at the scope if you set at the server and at the scope level then the more specific setting takes precedence so the scope setting overrides a server setting because it's more specific you can also configure options based on class so a class is a type of device that you can set up there are vendor classes that you can use for example or you can create your own classes so if you wanted to configure things differently based on a device being a laptop or a tablet or a, you know, a, a mobile phone device, a smartphone or something, you could create classes for each of those and then configure different options based on that class. A computer can figure out or a device can configure out what sort of class it is and then configure its options accordingly. And finally, for a reservation, you can configure options for a reserved client to be slightly different if you want them to be than for the rest of the devices in a particular scope. Use the DHCP console or the Windows PowerShell set DHCP server v4 option value commandlet. These are the available options or at least a subset of them and the key things for you to remember for the exam are 003 is the router, 006 is the IP address of DNS servers and 015 is the DNS suffix so contoso.com for example. The others are probably not that relevant and I wouldn't worry overly about them. The ones in the range, well, the ones 44, 46 and 47 are all related to NetBIOS. So if you still got NetBIOS devices on your network and that's unlikely, those might be relevant to you, but broadly speaking, they are not relevant anymore. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to create a scope and configure options for that scope. So here I am on my uh, new DHCP server. To create a DHCP scope, I select IP4, right click and choose new scope if I want to create a multicast scope there's an option for that as well once I've created multiple scopes I can then create a super scope for now I'm just going to choose a standard scope give it a name and we're going to call this one Contoso sales give it a start IP address range 172.16.0.0 well actually I'll t tell you what I'm going to change that to 16 and the end address 172.16.31.254 and I'm going to set the subnet mask to be 20 bits in this instance and then next if I want to define any exclusions I can do that the subnet delay in milliseconds that's a value for when you have multiple DHCP servers and in those circumstances because by default they don't communicate with one another you can delay one of the DHCP servers so that it responds more slowly than others effectively you're setting a priority for the one that has the lowest subnet delay in milliseconds value I'll talk more about where you, where you have multiple DHCP servers in a short while when we look at um, failover options but it is a possibility so that if you've got multiples you can control which one is the default 
So I'm going to leave the exclusions area blank and I can come back and change this later if I want to. The lease duration defaults to eight days, but you can change that if you want to, especially if you've got wireless clients, you might want to configure slightly different values. And then I can go on and configure the options now or later. I'm going to choose now and I'm going to specify the router address. I'm going to make that 131.254, add that, next. And in fact, thinking about it, I probably should exclude that address. So let's roll back a little bit and add an exclusion here of 172.16.31.254 because I've just allocated that as a router, but that is in my range. And then a parent suffix and one or more IP addresses for DNS servers that configures option number six and 15. And then if I'm using wins, I can specify some options here. And then I'm going to go ahead and um, activate the scope. I'm not going to do that right now. I'm going to choose to do that later and then finish. And if I want to reconfigure any of those values, depending on what they are, I can come back and revisit the address pool. I can change the exclusions if I want to. I can see if any clients are obtaining IP addresses and what those clients are. If I want to configure a reservation, I can do that from here. And I can revisit the scope options. If I want to configure server options, I can do that here. Remember, server options are overridden by scope options, but are convenient for applying settings across multiple scopes. So in the demonstration, you saw how to create and configure DHCP scopes and options. Now this shows us the configurable DNS options for a DHCP scope. So if you open up the IP4 properties and then select the DNS tab of your scope, you can then configure how DNS records are updated on behalf of clients that are not capable of doing that for themselves. So if you've got legacy clients, and I'm talking about really old clients running Windows NT4, so that's going back a long way, they will not be able to update DNS servers with changes to their IP addresses. So the DHCP server, since it's allocated those addresses, is in a fairly good place to be able to make that update on their behalf. And that's really what this is all about here. So um, generally speaking, you'll not need to use these settings or certainly you won't need to change them because the DHCP clients that we have now are fully capable, running Windows 10, Windows 11, of being able to configure their own DNS settings without requiring the DHCP server to do them on their behalf but it's important you know what those do. High availability. There are a number of different options for configuring high availability for DHCP. In the past, it was only possible to have one DHCP server per subnet, and it was necessary to have one in each subnet unless you were able to configure some sort of um, routing capability between the subnets that could handle the broadcast traffic. Generally, that meant installing something called a DHCP relay in each subnet. Once you create multiple DHCP servers, however, and you'll need to do that for reliability, then you run the risk of the DHCP server being able to allocate an address that another DHCP server has already allocated since they don't communicate. So there are a couple of workarounds. One way to do this is to not create multiple DHCP servers at all, but rather to install a server cluster and then install the DHCP role on that cluster so that you have the high availability built in through clustering rather than through something that the DHCP server role does. In that case, on your shared storage, you'd install a, the DHCP server role and you'd configure the full range of addresses for a particular scope. And if you get a hardware failure, one of the nodes in the cluster fails, for example, then the remaining node in the cluster can continue functioning as a server, performing the role, amongst other things, perhaps, of providing for DHCP. That's quite an inefficient option in the sense that you require quite high levels of hardware and some very specific hardware components. To configure this scenario, you start by deploying the DHCP server role to two servers. You then create a scope on one server, but don't activate it yet in case it starts allocating addresses to clients. Then you run the DHCP split scope configuration wizard and you're prompted for the name of the secondary server, the split of the IP addresses between the servers, and a DHCP re delay value for each server. That determines the, the primary server, so which one will normally allocate addresses. And as you can see here, it defaults to using 80 and 20 percentages. You can split that to any value you want, but that's why it's called often, or often referred to as the 80-20 rule. Finally, then activate the scopes. DHCP failover, however, provides probably the best high availability option. 
In this scenario, you don't require server failover. You require the DHCP server role to have been configured with a relationship with another instance of the DHCP server role on another server. In this scenario, if the DHCP server role or the server hosting that role fails, then the other server will take over after a period of time that you can define. There are two ways you can set up the failover relationship, so let's look at this a bit more closely. Load sharing, in which both DHCP servers are leasing addresses to clients, and hot standby, where one is designated as the primary and the other just sits waiting in case it needs to take over the role of the designated primary. To configure this, you start by defining a relationship name, a maximum client lead time, and a mode. You'll also need to specify load balance percentage and the role of the partner server. Then define the addresses reserved for the standby server and the state switchover interval. Finally, you'll need to enable message authentication so that the two servers can communicate securely. So the steps required to enable failover are first of all to create one or more scopes on a single DHCP server. Then in the DHCP console, run the configure failover wizard. Select all DHCP scopes that you want to configure as part of this failover relationship. Specify the partner server. Configure the options that we just discussed. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to configure DHCP failover. So on my DHCP server, open up the DHCP console. And then if I expand through the server IP4 and then select the scope that I have here, which is allocating addresses for Contoso HQ. If I right click that scope and choose configure failover and then select the available scopes I've already got selected all is default. Then specify a partner server. Now I've already got a server set up. It is Contoso SVR1. So I'm just going to browse and select that and then click OK. It will think about that for a moment. Check that the server's online. That's done. So I've got the partner server set up. Select next. And then here I can create a new failover relationship. It's given me a default name, which is descriptive of the name of the domain controller, uh, or rather the DHCP server happens to be a domain controller, and the IP address of the partner server. So I'm going to change that to something a bit more meaningful, Contoso DHCP failover. I can specify the load balancing as the mode, or I can choose hot standby as the mode. Choosing each of these different options results in a change in some of the re remaining options. So for example, in hot standby, I can choose the role of the partner server as standby. In load balancing, I have to configure the load balancing percentage to the local and the partner server. If I'm choosing hot standby, I need to specify a state switch over interval. And for all of these, I need to configure a shared secret for message authentication. I'm going to enter that right now and I'm going to go with a hot standby role and set the role of the partner to standby and then I'm going to allocate 5% of the addresses for use by the standby server in those circumstances where the primary is unavailable and select next and then finish. It has now configured that and were I to give that a test I would see that our client attempting to obtain an IP address would obtain one from the failover server if the primary is offline. When the primary comes back online then functionality will be reverted to that particular device. In the demonstration you saw how to configure DHCP failover. By using IPAM, you can allocate IP4 and IP6 addresses. You can optimize your IP address space. You can manage DHCP and DNS servers. You can monitor DHCP and DNS servers. And you can collect statistics from Active Directory domain controllers and network policy servers. IPAM consists of the following components. The IPAM client. The IPAM server which consists of an IPAM database, role-based access control to determine who can do what to which components of IPAM, and scheduled tasks. In addition, you have managed servers. This diagram helps describe each of these components. The IPAM client is used as a management workstation with the appropriate remote server administration tools enabled and reporting and tracking turned on. By using role-based access control, you can interact with the IPAM server and configure scheduled tasks and retrieve information from the IPAM database. 
and in turn the IPAM server performs monitoring of managed servers, those are running DNS, DHCP, NPS and domain controller roles. The requirements of IPAM are as follows. A Windows Server 2012 or newer. A database, it can be the Windows database or SQL Server database. Network connectivity. And Active Directory. The following are the supported topologies. Distributed. Centralised. And Hybrid. Let's examine each of these in turn. In a distributed environment, you have a system admin which is responsible for a particular IPAM server and its collection of managed servers. That might typically be in a, a branch office. Perhaps in the corporate data centre you have another systems admin who is responsible in turn for another IPAM server which is responsible for a collection of managed servers. In a centralised environment you have a single systems admin. This individual is responsible for managing an IPAM server which has managed servers in the corporate data centre and also in regional data centres and branch offices. In a hybrid topology, you have a number of systems admins, each of which is responsible for a separate area within the infrastructure. So perhaps one for a branch office, one for a regional data centre, one for the corporate data centre. In each of these locations, there's a separate IPAM server with its collection of managed servers. There may also be a forensics admin or network admin which is responsible for collecting specific types of information from a central IPAM server which represents information about the entire organisation. The deployment process for IPAM is as follows. Start by installing the IP address management feature. Then provision the server. Next you'll want to configure server discovery. After you've configured server discovery you can go on to discover the servers that you want to manage. You'll select which of those you do want to manage, and finally you'll retrieve data from Manage Servers. When you launch the Provision IPAM wizard, you can choose to use a Windows internal database or you can use a SQL Server database. If you implement IPAM on a server running Windows Server 2012 R2 or newer, you can deploy a Microsoft SQL Server database to support IPAM. If you choose to use SQL, you must define a server name, a database name, and the port number. That defaults to 1433. You must also define an authentication method, choosing between Windows Authentication, SQL Authentication. In the demonstration you'll learn how to install the IP address management feature. So on my server, selecting Add Roles and Features, and clicking through the wizard, and then on the Features page, selecting IP address management server. Adding the necessary tools and selecting next. That's it, install the server. Just wait for that to finish. Okay, that's successful. In the demonstration you learned how to install the IP address management feature. After you've deployed the IPAM server feature you must provision IPAM. Provisioning is the process of configuring managed servers so that your IPAM server can communicate with them. When you enable IPAM provisioning, the following things are configured. Permissions, access settings and shared folders. You can provision IPAM using either manual provisioning, which requires quite a lot of work, or group policy object based provisioning, which is much easier to achieve. To create the group policy objects that are required, run the invoke IPAM GPO provisioning commandlet, specifying your domain, the GPO prefix name, which I would recommend you use IPAM for, the IPAM server's FQDN, and then the delegated group policy object user. Once you run this command, you're prompted to confirm the action, as you can see in the graphic here. This will create the necessary group policy objects and link them to the domain object. Security filtering is used to determine which particular servers apply the group policy settings contained within each of these group policy objects. If you decide to manually provision IPAM, you'll need to perform a number of steps, first of all for DHCP servers, then for DNS servers, and then for network policy and Active Directory servers. Let's review the steps for provisioning DHCP servers. So for each DHCP server that you want to manage, you'll need to configure a number of predefined Windows firewall rules and settings. DHCP server, file and print sharing, remote event log management and remote service management. You'll also need to create a universal security group called IPAMUG, add the IPAM server to this group 
and add the IPAM UG group to the DHCP users local group. You'll also need to add the IPAM UG group to the event log readers group. And finally, you'll need to configure and share the DHCP audit folder and grant the IPAM UG group read permissions on the folder. In a similar way to DHCP, for DNS, you'll need to configure a number of, of uh, settings to provision those DNS servers for IPAM. So there'll be a number of firewall rules you'll need to change, RPC, DNS, RPC endpoint manager, remote event log management, and remote service management. You'll, if necessary, need to create that same universal security group. That's only necessary if you haven't already done it for, for DHCP. Again, if necessary, add the IPAM server to that group and grant that group permissions on the DNS server this time. And then add the IPAM UG group to the event log readers group. Again, only if necessary, because it may be that you're combining DNS and DHCP roles on the same server. And finally, again, enable event log monitoring on the DNS server. For the network policy server and Active Directory domain services roles, you'll need to perform the following high level steps. Again, firewall settings, in this case, the remote event log management firewall rule, and if necessary, creating that IPAM UG universal security group, and if necessary, again, adding the IPAM server to that group on each of the NPS and ADDS servers. And then finally, configuring the security settings in the same way that you do for the DHCP servers. Now, all of which is quite convoluted and complex. Therefore, unless you've got a very good reason to be doing otherwise, you should use the group policy method for provisioning IPAM. I'm going to demonstrate that now for you by provisioning IPAM using group policy objects. OK, so select the IPAM console within Server Manager. We're connected to the IPAM server. Next thing we need to do is to provision the IPAM server. We're going to do that by using group policy. And so I'm going to create the group policy objects first of all by running the invoke IPAM GPO provisioning commandlet, specifying the domain name as contosa.com, specifying the GPO prefix name as IPAM, and the FQDN of the server is contoso svr1.contosa.com, and I'm delegating GPO management to the administrator account. And select yes to confirm that. And it should create the necessary group policy objects. And just confirm the settings there. And if I now go to group policy, I should see that the necessary group policy objects have been created under the domain object. And there we have them. At the moment, if I select one of them, for example, this is for MPS, there's no object added under security filtering. So at the moment, although these group policies exist and have settings configured in them, they won't do anything until security filtering has been configured. And that's really a question of specifying what servers you want to provision. And you do that through discovery. So in the demonstration, you saw how to provision IPAM using group policy objects. Let's take a look now at IPAM discovery. Discovery enables you to add a managed server to IPAM. In Windows Server with Discovery, you can configure managed servers from multiple Active Directory forests. So you can see on the screen grab here that we can select the specific forest and add that forest and then go on to select additional forests should we want to. For each particular forest that you add, you can then identify domain controller, DHCP server and DNS server roles. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to configure server discovery and then how to start server discovery. So let's take a look at configuring discovery and starting server discovery. So provision the IPAM server. We're going to use the Windows internal database. We've already used group policy provisioning. So I've specified that here. And I'm going to apply the settings. That should now provision those settings for us. And we'll revisit it in a moment. So that's all done. Everything's been configured. Now we go on to configure server discovery. So having selected configure server discovery, we need to retrieve a list of forests. It'll take a moment for that to execute. If you take a look on server manager console, you can see there's a number of IPAM tasks running in the task scheduler. So if we now select from the list of forests, I'll try clicking OK there and coming back into configure. 
there we go it's populated now I've got the root domain here I can add that in and I ask it to look for domain controllers DHCP servers and DNS servers and then select OK so we've configured one domain if there are multiple domains we could add them so let's choose start server discovery we can see that another task is running so discovered servers are, are, are shown or the task is, is shown here and you can see here we're on another server discovery task right now so we've asked it to to locate servers in the demonstration you learned how to configure and to start server discovery once server discovery is complete you'll then need to add or edit specific servers by entering their fqdns verifying them and then specifying the server type this allows you to automatically change the security filtering on the respective group policy objects that were created earlier. That will then apply those group policies to the selected servers. For each server, you'll need to complete the add or edit server page. In the demonstration, I'll show you how you can configure manageability status and add managed servers. So the next step is to add some managed servers. So uh, we need to go to uh, so are we here? Server inventory, there we go. And for IP4, we need to add some managed servers. So the server FQDN is contoso dc.contoso.com. I know that's the domain controller. Verify that one. It's a DC, it's a DNS, it's DHCP as well. So we'll select OK to that. Okay, so that's already visible. So let's go on to contoso. SVR2. It's not a DC, but it has the other roles. Let's verify that. Click OK. And add Contoso SVR3.contoso.com. Verify that one. And it also is running DNS and DHCP. Select OK there. And I'm going to click the step five link here, select or add service. Here's a list of our status. We just need to go through each of these in turn and enable data retrieval. So let's do that. Just need to change the manageability status of each of these to managed. And then we need to wait a little while before it's able to check on the status of these and to apply the group policy settings that we configured earlier. Essentially, it's going to update the security filtering based on these settings and then the group policies will apply and then those devices will be configured. And then we should then be able to start retrieving data. So we need to check back here in a while to see what the status is. OK, that's looking good. All three servers have been discovered and added to the inventory. In the demonstration, you saw how to configure manageability status and add managed servers. In this lesson, we'll explore how you can use IPAM to manage your IP blocks and ranges of addresses. So a significant advantage of using IPAM is your ability to manage the IP address space from a single console. Using IPAM, you can manage the following. IP address blocks which consist of IP address subnets, IP address ranges, and IP addresses. You can also review the IP address inventory. And finally, IP address range groups. This graphic shows uh, an IP address block. So we have a network ID, a prefix length, automatically assigned address values, a start and end IP address, any regional internet registry settings, and a last assigned date. When you're managing IP address ranges, you can configure again a network ID and prefix length, a subnet mask, and start and end addresses, and whether or not the service is managed by IPAM. In the demonstration, you'll learn how to review IP address blocks, ranges, and inventory by using IPAM. So here we are on the IPAM server in the IPAM console on the overview tab. And um, we've been through the process of provisioning the server and configuring the necessary group policy objects. We've performed the server discovery process and we've added servers to the management scope of IPAM. And we can have a look at those servers by selecting the server inventory tab. And we can see if we look on the right hand side in the data retrieval status column, we can see that all of the managed servers have had data retrieved from them. So we should be able to review a fair bit of information. 
So there are a number of DNS servers installed and a number of DHCP servers installed across the organization. So we should be able to look at some of that information. Let's start here by looking at the server inventory. I'm, I'm looking at, or I have selected Contoso DC and in the lower half of the display, you've got some information about that selected server. So the server name is displayed, the domain name, the IP address of the server, the operating system installed, the server type and, and other information. If we select the IP address space tab, you can review IP address blocks. There's an explanation here about what these are. IP address subnets and IP address ranges and IP addresses. So let's select IP address blocks. And we can see that we've got two IP address blocks displayed here. One is in network 192.168.00/24. And the start IP address is 192.168.01. The end IP address is the last one in the subnet, 192.168.0.254. It's a global address scope, and it's being managed by MSDHCP on Contoso SVR2. The percentage of used addresses is zero, and that's not surprising. These were set up for, for a demonstration. Then here uh, on this server, we have on Contoso DC, Contoso.com, that's the domain controller, we have DHCP installed. And again, we have another range of addresses. 172.16.00 slash 16 is the network ID. The start address is dot 100 and the end address is dot 200. None are currently in use, so that's showing 0%. But you can see at a glance that this would be able to indicate to you the percent usage of the address space on a given DHCP server, which is a useful thing to, to know. So if we scroll down the page a little here, we can also see some configuration details for the specific selected block of addresses. We can also review the utilization trend and you can select a specific date or you can look at the last five, five years, two years, one year, the last day. Now there's no utilization here as we saw at 0%. But again, you would see that as being particularly beneficial if you had a large address space that was heavily used, you'd be able to identify when their peaks and troughs of utilization were, and that might indicate that corrective action needed to be take, taken to your to adjust your um, network configuration. The event catalog also will show you any useful events that relate to, in this case, the DHCP service on that domain controller. If we select the IP address inventory tab, we can have a look at uh, inventory information for IP address infrastructure. There's nothing displayed here. And then IP address ranges. And again, this is showing the same information as before. So it's showing us the range of addresses that are available on the DHCP servers. I can change the view from here to IP addresses. Again, nothing being used at the moment. And IP address range groups. So this is showing us that we have 355 assigned addresses. That's into the two DHCP scopes that we've identified on two different DHCP servers, of which zero are utilized and 0% are utilized. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna start up a couple of computers and consume some of these address addresses and then review the data again. So having allocated some addresses to some reservations and started up a Windows client, we should have some slight differences. So I'm just gonna refresh the display here. It may need a, a, a quick retrieval, so I'm going to right click a server and retrieve all server data, or I can go to the overview page and select retrieve data from managed servers. Because I've made the change recently, it may not necessarily have picked that up, so take a moment to complete that task. We'll check back in a second. Okay, that's done now. Um, select IP address blocks, and you can see immediately that there are a very small percentage, but there are some usage of the space in the um, scope on the domain controller, 2.97%. So we can see uh, in 172.16.00 slash 16, 2.97%, just about 3% of the addresses are being used. If we scroll down and look at utilization trend, we're not gonna have very much showing here, but if we select one day, yeah, it, it's, it's not showing any data yet. It will take a, a period of time before that's finished collecting, but this is where you might go to review additional details. If I have a look at the IP address ranges here, again, you can see that there are 0.85% utilized here. That's three addresses. And that's because that's being drawn from the collective pool of the two DHCP scopes on the two different servers. So it shows a slightly different uh, view of that information. 
So it's clear that it's a useful mechanism for being able to make a determination about what's going on in your address space across your organization without having to be specific about which particular server. In demonstration, you learned how to review the IP address blocks, ranges and inventory within your organization by using IPAM. You can perform DHCP server management by using IPAM. When you use the IPAM console, you can perform the following aspects of DHCP server management in your infrastructure. First, you can configure DHCP server properties and options. You can configure DHCP vendor and user classes. You can configure and or import DHCP policies, activate or deactivate those policies, add DHCP MAC address filters, replicate DHCP servers for failover DHCP configuration, view DHCP scope information across all servers. And finally, you can launch the DHCP management console. In the demonstration, you'll learn how to edit DHCP server properties and options. You'll also learn how to configure and activate a DHCP policy and how to launch the DHCP console. So in the IPAM console on the overview page, to manage your servers, you'll need to switch to DNS and DHCP servers. And here you'll see a list of servers separated by roles. So I have instances of DHCP on three servers in my organization and three instances of DNS. It's the same servers, but as I said, they're separated by role. So to manage a particular DHCP uh, server role, you right click the server in the console and then choose edit DHCP server properties. So from here, you can choose to enable DHCP audit logging. On the DNS update pages, on page rather, you can specify the DNS update settings. Now we looked at that before, when we were discussing DHCP in an, in an earlier lesson. But these are the settings that are used when a client is incapable of performing dynamic updates on DNS for itself. And that's what these settings uh, reflect. DNS credentials can be uh, entered here. So these are the credentials that the DHCP server uses when it's performing DNS dynamic updates for devices that are not capable. So once you've completed those changes, click OK. I'm going to select cancel here. You can also take a look at DHCP server options. We talked about options when we looked at the way that DHCP scopes work. You configure options at a number of different levels. You can configure options like a, a router and a DNS suffix and a DNS server. Those are the typical three that we use. And you can assign those at the server level, which means they will affect all clients that obtain an IP address from that server, irrespective of the scope. You can also configure scope options which configure only those clients that obtain an IP configuration from that scope. The more specific setting overrides the less specific setting. So in other words, the scope options override the server options. But nevertheless, you can configure the server options here for those things that you consider to be global. Typically, all your clients will probably have the same DNS suffix and may well use the same DNS servers. And so those are the sorts of options you might configure at the server level. So you can choose DHCP standard options or Microsoft options or Microsoft Windows 2000 options or Microsoft Windows 98 options. Those last two are unlikely to be relevant anymore. Then you can choose the particular option number. You'll remember, I think, that 003 is the router and the other two significant ones are 006 for DNS servers and 015 for DNS domain name. So I'm going to choose DNS domain name. First of all, I'm going to define the value of contoso.com and I'm going to add that one and then I'm going to create another one for the DNS server address again just choosing the number six DNS servers I can add several of course but I'm just going to add one 172.16.0.10 and resolve that so probably helpful if I actually entered the name rather than the IP address otherwise it's going to struggle a little bit to make that resolution Okay, it's, it's done it anyway, but let's do that properly. That was my mistake there. So contosodc.contoso.com is the name of the server. Let's resolve that much quicker that time. And when I'm happy with that, I can select Add Configuration. And then finally, if I could just rearrange the display here, I can select OK. So that will have configured or will configure the options on that DHCP server. So I can also use IPAM to configure DHCP policies. If I right click a DHCP server in the console and select configure DHCP policy, give it a name, 
And then, for example, I can choose a lease duration that varies from the standard eight days based on meeting the conditions of the policy. I can then specify what the policy conditions are and I can choose multiple conditions that all must be met or that one or other of, of the policies uh, conditions can be met depending on what I want to do. And I can choose the criteria as being things like a vendor class matching a certain value, a user class matching a certain value. Now user classes are interesting. You can define your own user classes like laptop or, or smartphone or whatever. And then if a device meets that particular categorization, then it would meet the, the conditions of the policy and therefore it might mean that it has a shorter lease duration in this particular instance, for example. Specify a MAC address, a client identifier, a fully qualified domain name, or the a relay agent information. That means that if a client is obtaining an IP address from a through a relay agent, which is connecting to a subnet where a DHCP server resides, then that might have an impact on how we want to configure that device. So I'm just going to choose user class and I can choose a default boot P class or default routing and row access class. So we'll choose that and add that. And then we can go on to add other conditions if we want to. So this is for devices that are connected remotely. It may be that I want to handle DNS dynamic updates differently based on meeting this, the requirements of this policy or the conditions of this policy. And I may also want to configure options differently. Let's just resize this dialog here. So if I scroll down to bottom, I can now add a DHCP policy option. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I didn't see it at the bottom of the screen there. So I can choose the standard DHCP options and then I can select amongst these well-known values now, 003 for a different router, 006 for a different DNS server. Or maybe what I might do is I might change the DNS domain name, for example, to remote.toso.com. Then when I'm happy with the changes, I can add that as a configuration. And then if there's anything else that I need to change, I can do that. Let's see. I think we're OK. And then click OK. That now goes off and makes that policy change or creates that policy. And then here for a particular server, I can deactivate any of the policies that I've configured or conversely, where necessary, to activate the DHCP policies. The final step is to open up the DHCP console, which is quite convenient because I'm sitting at a, the IPAM console on Contoso Serve 1 and I want to connect to Contoso DC. So if I right click Contoso DC and then select launch MMC, that will open up the DHCP console as if I were connected directly to that server. And so from here, then I can review any of the settings that I've configured or changed. So we change some things like server options. I can just review those if I want to. I can have a look at some of the scope settings and the policy settings. So here's the Contoso policy setting that I set up just a moment ago, for example. And I can choose to delete that or modify its properties from the console if, if that's what I prefer to do. But it saves me the hassle of having to open up the console manually and point it to a server. So it's a minor time saver, but useful nonetheless. In the demonstration, you learned how to edit the DHCP server properties, edit DHCP server options, configure and activate a policy, and to launch the DHCP console. So in addition to managing DHCP server properties, you could also manage DHCP scopes. So using the IPAM console, you can activate and deactivate scopes, configure scope properties, duplicate scopes, replicate scopes, add and remove a scope from a DHCP super scope, create DHCP reservations, configure and remove DHCP failover options, import a DHCP policy, and activate or deactivate DHCP scope policies. So in the demonstration, you'll learn how you can manage DHCP scopes from the IPAM console. So in the IPAM console, I can select the DHCP scopes tab, and there are two scopes configured in my environment, one on contosodccontoso.com, and the other on contososvr2.contoso.com. So I can right click the properties of one of these scopes and choose edit DHCP scope. And I can then make changes to the scope from here without needing to go to the DHCP console to perform that task. So for example, let's just add a description. I can modify the lease duration, for example. I can specify an exclusion range of addresses. So let's do that. 172.16.0.110 through to 
dot zero dot uh, one hundred and twelve. And then on the DNS updates page, I can configure those dynamic DNS settings. As I said a couple of times already, they're not really terribly useful anymore, but they are there. I can configure DHCP scope options from here. So at the moment, I've got the router being configured through the DHCP scope. I also have DHCP servers, but that's not necessary because I've already configured those at the server level, for example. So I might want to make a change there. But what I'll do is I'll just add something to do with NetBIOS. So we'll choose a DHCP standard option. Default user class is fine. And I'm going to choose option number 44. OK, here, which tells us or allows us to define the IP address of a Win server if you're still using NetBIOS. You probably won't be, but just as an example. So I can type in Contoso DC and resolve that. It's not actually running the Win service, but never mind. And then I could click OK. If there are any advanced settings here, uh, for example, assign IP addresses dynamically to clients of DHCP, I can choose also to support Boot P, which is a, a legacy type of client. Again, unlikely that you'll encounter that these days. And I can also update the subnet delay. If you remember that that's useful where you have multiple scopes on multiple DHCP servers and you want to define one as the more likely to be used. So you, you, you define the other as having a, a subnet delay of, of greater than zero. When I'm happy with those changes, I can click OK. I'm just going to abandon those right now. I can also manage reservations from this console. So I set up a number of test reservations earlier on, and I can modify the properties of those reservations if I want. OK, let's go back to the scope option here, and I can choose to deactivate the DHCP scope from here. And then I can activate the scope again. So you've got a fair range of, of different scope management options that you can configure through IPAM without, again, the need to switch to the DHCP console itself or go to the particular DHCP server in question. In the demonstration, you learned how to manage DHCP scopes using the IPAM console. In addition to managing DHCP, you can also manage DNS. By using the IPAM console, you can perform the following DNS management tasks. View DNS servers and zones. Create new zones create DNS records in those zones, manage conditional forwarders, and open the DNS management console for a selected server. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to add a new DNS zone, how to add records to that zone, and how to manage forwarding. So within the IPAM console, select the DNS zones tab, and then you can see that we have uh, three zones displayed, adatum.com, which is on Contoso SVR3, Contoso.com, which is on Contoso DC, and an additional one that relates to Active Directory, the underscore msdcs.contoso.com zone. So to add a record to a zone, for, for an alias, for example, let's right-click a zone, Contoso.com, and then I can add a DNS resource record to that zone. Let's give myself a bit more room here so I can see what I'm doing. So uh, in Contoso.com, on the server Contoso DC, Contoso.com, I'm going to add a new DNS resource record. I'm going to select the type CNAME or canonical name, which is an alias, and the alias is going to be www, and the FQDN is going to be a sync, contoso svr2.contoso.com, and then I can specify a TTL, which is pretty typical. It defaults to an hour, and I'm happy with that, so I'll select OK. That will create the record for me. OK, to create a new zone, go to the list of DNS and DHCP servers. Locate the DNS server that you want to create the zone on. Uh, so here I've got DNS on Contoso DC. So I'm going to right click that and create a new DNS zone. And from here, I can specify the properties of the zone. Let's have a bit of working space here. I can't see all the dialogues. So I'll just have to work around that. So it's a forward lookup zone, primary zone. The zone name is going to be Tailspin toys.com store it in active directory or in a zone file as indicated what type of replication do I want to set in this case if it's an active directory I can choose amongst domain forest legacy or custom I'll just leave it with a default value am I going to support dynamic updates 
So do not allow, allow both secure and non-secure or allow secure dynamic updates recommended for Active Directory, which would be the, the sensible solution. I cannot get to the OK page. So I'm just gonna have to tab down to it and just press it from here. So that's created the zone for me. OK, it hasn't got any data in it at the present time, but I can add a DNS resource record to it. So I'll do that now. And in Tailspin Toys, I'm going to add a new record. It's going to be a host record. And I'm going to specify the host as being www. And the IP address, it'll, 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 I'll, I'll use a private IP address here, but obviously um, it may well be other. So we'll choose um, 10.0.1. Dot one and then select OK. So that's now created the zone and created a record within the zone. To set up forwarding, you would switch to the DNS and DHCP servers tab and then select the appropriate DNS server. So, for example, selecting Contosa DC, right click it and then choose Create DNS Conditional Forwarder. And you'll have access to all the usual properties for defining which domain you want to. Uh, defined for conditional forwarding. So as we looked at earlier on in the lesson, you'd specify the domain name and then you'd specify the master server that would be used for forwarding. I won't go through the completion of the process here, but but that's because we've already looked at it, but that's how you'd set that up here. And uh, for those administrators that are still comfortable working in the standard DNS console, that's fine. Uh, from the DNS and DHCP service tab, you can right click the DNS server you want and select launch MMC and it will launch the standard DNS manager console, which you can then use to, to configure the settings that you want to, to work on. So uh, for example, we created a zone a moment ago called Tailspin Toys. Here it is and you can perform management on it. You can also configure your conditional forwarders or the standard properties of your server um, with forwarding configured here uh, on a sort of global basis rather than a conditional basis. In the demonstration, you learned how to add a new DNS zone, how to add records to that zone and how to manage forwarding. The ability to work from home or indeed to work from anywhere is increasingly important. So IT departments need to ensure that there are available solutions to support users that want to work remotely. There are a number of options. Virtual private networks or VPNs are very popular. Direct access is a Microsoft specific solution which is based on IP6 tunneling and provides a, an automatic method for users to connect and provides a persistent connection. Routing and the web application proxy, which is a Windows Server role that will sit in the perimeter network and enable access to resources which reside on the internal network for clients which are connected via the internet. To manage remote access in Windows Server, there are a number of available tools. The Remote Access Management Console, which allows you to set up and configure and manage direct access and VPN, either separately or together, depending on the specifics of your requirements. The Routing and Remote Access Console, which allows you to set up routing and VPN remote access. And Windows PowerShell commands, which can be used to retrieve information about or to configure details about your remote access elements. The Remote Access Server role consists of a number of role services. Direct Access and VPN provides the remote access connectivity for users sitting at home or in a hotel or some other remote location. Direct Access uses IP6 tunnels, as I mentioned already, whereas VPN uses specific virtual private networking tunnels. Both use some mechanism to provide for secure communications, that's authentication and encryption. The key difference is that Direct Access is focused on Windows 10 and Windows 11 clients that are, are Active Directory domain members, and the Direct Access solution is configured via group policy. VPNs is over the VPN solution is a much more accessible solution and is more widely supported by third party and non Microsoft vendors. Routing is a generic term to describe the process of, of taking packets and passing them from subnet to subnet. With routing, you can set up, if you've got multiple network adapters, you can set up some sort of routing solution between your various security zones within your network infrastructure. And as I mentioned already, the web application proxy allows for the publishing of resources that reside on the internal network 
using a specific URL name to clients on the internet. And most usually this is used to support things like access to email accounts that reside on Exchange Server on an internal network. Let's take a look now in the demonstration at installing the Remote Access Server role. So I'm going to use the Server Manager console to add the Remote Access role. Click through the wizard and then select Remote Access and then select Next click past features and then I'll be prompted on the role services page to choose which specific remote access technologies I, I want to enable. Uh, in, my inst or in my case I want to enable uh, VPN so I'm going to choose the direct access and VPN option and then add the additional features. I can choose to set up both or, or I can choose to set up either one of these solutions. As I said I'm, I'm going to be setting up a VPN later. Click through. I'm now being asked to set up some of the web services that are required to support these remote access roles. That's fine. I'm going to accept the defaults here and then click install. And that'll take a few moments to install and then we'll check back uh, during the next demonstration to see where it's got to. OK, so in the demonstration you learned how to install the remote access server role using Server Manager. Now Radius is an industry standard remote access security system. It's widely adopted as, a, as an, a key authentication protocol for remote access. So it's not a Microsoft standard, it's an international standard. It's used to support remote access solutions and it consists of a Radius server, a Radius proxy, although that's an optional component, and Radius clients. Let me talk a bit about what those might be. So a Radius server is um, the device which performs authentication on behalf of Radius clients. A Radius client is not a remote access client. That's not somebody sitting at a laptop somewhere trying to connect into the network. That's a remote access client. So a Radius client is something like a VPN server or uh, a wired hub or a wireless access point. Each of those accepts connections from remote clients remote wired clients, remote wireless clients or VPN clients. And it's the Radius client's job to authenticate with the Radius server. The advantage of using Radius is that you don't perform the authentication on the remote access device. In other words, not on the VPN server. You hand that off to a to another, another authority. The Radius proxy is used where you have a large number of Radius servers and Radius clients and you want to set up a collection of rules that determine which particular Radius server or servers in a Radius server group might be used to perform authentication for particular types of remote access, depending on your specific needs. The Network Policy and Access Services Server role is the component within Windows Server that provides Radius functionality. It includes the Network Policy Server and it is that component which will act as a Radius Server or a Radius Proxy depending on your particular situation. So it functions as either of those depending on how you set things up. It provides authentication, authorization and when configured accounting through a centralized point and it supports dial-up remote access, if that's still something that's relevant to you. VPN re remote access, which probably is. Wireless access, again, it's likely you'll be using that. 802.1x access, that's a, a wired hub that supports the 802.1x standard. So although you might not typically think of, of clients connecting through a wired connection as being remote, and I, I guess strictly speaking they're not, that's not the issue here. We can still provide for a degree of authentication at the point of access, which provides for a good level of, of security. Internet access and extranet access from partner organizations. So a typical NPS deployment might look something like this. Wireless access, access points, a VPN server or VPN servers, and an 802.1x switch, all of which are connected to the network access and policy server server role, that's the network policy server that we're looking at here, that is controlled through the use of network policy server policies, and we'll talk about those in a moment, and also you'll require access to Active Directory, that provides the authentication of, of user and computer accounts. So think of the MPS role as, as being something that interacts with all of those components to provide for authentication. In each of these circumstances, the wireless access point, VPN server, and 802.1x switch are radius clients, whereas the MPS server is acting as a radius server. So when you're operating or when you're configuring NPS as a radius server, this is the role that it performs. There it is, and it connects to Active Directory to provide for authentication of user and computer details. 
It connects to an accounting server to record information that you might want to look at or retrieve data from later. And then it handles requests from the various RADIUS clients, which in turn are servicing connections from remote access clients. When it's functioning as a RADIUS proxy, you have the RADIUS server in your intranet, which again is communicating with Active Directory and the accounting server that you've configured. And then based on the way that you set up the relationship between the various instances of NPS, you define some as being RADIUS proxies and the other as being a RADIUS server. So you point one to the other. And then in this scenario, you've also got your uh, RADIUS clients, which are the wireless access points, VPN servers and 802.1x switches. And those are supporting remote access clients. In the demonstration, I'm going to install the Network Policy and Access Services role. So this is the server Contoso SVR1, and I'm going to set this up as a Network Policy Server. I'm going to use Server Manager again, and select Next, click through the wizard. And then on the Roles page, I'm going to select Network Policy and Access Services, and then add the required management tools. And then it's just reminding me that what I'm installing here is the MPS as a potentially rem remote authentication dial-in user service, RADIUS server or proxy. So then I can go on to configure that behavior after I've installed the role. So I'll select install here, and then we can leave that running and check back on its status later. So in the demonstration, you learned how to install the Network Policy and Access Services role. And now let's talk a little bit about Network Policy Server policies. The Network Policy Server has been installed, and what you'll have to do next is to configure the network policies that control access to your infrastructure, your internal infrastructure. This enables you to determine which remote access clients can connect to your network, and which RADIUS server authenticates which client requests. So it's network policies that do the remote access client connectivity decision making, and it's connection request policies that deal with which RADIUS server authenticates the client requests. So those are the two types of policy that you will encounter. When you create a network policy, you, def you give it a name and you define that it's enabled or not, depending on whether you want to use the policy. And it consists then of that policy state, enabled or disabled, an access permission, grant or deny access. And that's very important because it may be that you set up a policy that will block access if certain connection attempts match the conditions defined in, in the policy, or if conditions are matched, then you might want to grant access. So grant and deny is the overriding functionality of the policy. Then you might define the type of network access. So it might be VPN or dial-up or whatever it might be. Then conditions. You can define multiple conditions or only one condition, depending on what you want to do. Conditions include things like group membership or day and time or tunneling type. There's a range of a large range, actually, of different conditions. For a policy to apply, a connection attempt must match all of the conditions defined. If it doesn't, then then we go on to examine other policies if other policies exist. And so the if you've got multiple policies, the policy order becomes very important because depending on which order you encounter the policies in and the conditions of those policies will determine whether or not you end up gaining access. Constraints define things like authentication methods and idle and session timeout values. They also allow you to define other characteristics that define the nature of the connection. So not only must a connection attempt match the conditions of a policy, but it must also meet the constraints. And then finally, the settings allow you to define things like encryption requirements and to filter IP traffic. So if you want, you can create a network policy that grants access, but a setting of that policy defines that you can only communicate to a specific web server using TCP port 443, for instance. So it can be very specific, or indeed it can be very general. This flow diagram tries to explain the process end to end. So there's a couple of things that are worth noting first of all. In addition to the policy setting and having a policy permission of allow or deny, we also have user accounts, and user accounts historically have a, an allow or deny dial-in permission. That's been expanded some years since to include the, the option to use the policy permission. So there are three options, allow, deny, or use policy. So a part of the process when we're policy processing, the MPS server will 
examine the user account details to see if there's an allow or deny permission for the user account. Generally speaking, that will never be the case. Neither will be set, in which case it's always the policy that determines access, but it is considered as part of the process. So the first thing that happens is we check to see if there are any policies, and if there are no policies, then the, reject, the connection attempt is rejected. If there are policies, we have to match the conditions of the policy. If there's one condition, we have to match one. If there are many, we have to, manage, we have to match all of them. If we don't match one or all of the, the permissions, the, the conditions rather, then we are moved on to the next policy in turn and we loop around until we find a policy for which conditions we match, for all conditions that we match. Then we check the user account to see if there is a deny permission set and if there is, the connection attempt is rejected. If there isn't, we then go on to see if the policy permission is set to deny. If that's the case, then we reject the connection attempt. If that's not the case, then we go on to see if the connection attempt matches the profile settings. That's the constraints, for example. And if that's acceptable, then the connection attempt is successful. We are connected. I'm going to show you how to create a network policy in the demonstration. So on the server where I installed the network policy and access services role, that's now complete. So the next step is to go to the tools menu in server manager and choose network policy server. I'll expand that out and we can have a look at the policies here. These are the connection request policies and those are used where you have radius servers and radius proxies so you can determine which particular radius server will handle a request in a given circumstance. So I'm going to leave that with its default values for now. Under network policies there are two policies both of which deny access. They have very high processing order numbers, so if you create any other policies, they will take precedence because, as always with Microsoft, the lowest numerical processing order value, in this case, processing order value, is the winner. So if we create an additional policy, it will have a lower numeric processing order value, so it will take precedence and will be processed first. It's important to remember that you must use the correct processing order for the logic to work with your policies. Remember, we check all policies in turn until we find one that we match the conditions for. After that, we don't check any other policies. So if there are five policies, for instance, and we don't match the conditions for the first two, number one processing order, number two processing order, but we match the conditions of number three, and that denies access, then we get no access. If number four and number five went on to grant access if we match the conditions, and if, in fact, we would have matched those conditions, it won't matter because we stop looking at other policies once we find the policy that we match the conditions for, even if that policy denies us access. That's it, processing stops. So it's critical to get the right order. So what I usually start out by doing is, is disabling these policies completely or even removing them and then creating my own. But it's a good idea to leave them as is for now because it stops anybody from being able to connect until you're properly ready. So I might go on to create a new policy and give it a name, Contoso VPN access, for example, specify the type of access server as being either remote access or remote desktop gateway. I'm choosing remote access here. And then I would add one or more conditions. And you've got simple conditions like belonging to a group. And that's a perfectly acceptable way of configuring things. Or you can do things like day and time restrictions. So you can prevent people from being able to access if it's a particular time of day. And if it's not that particular time of day, then we can move on to another policy. It's usually better actually to implement day and time restrictions as a configuration element rather than as a condition element. So you'll see that comes up again shortly. But I'll scroll through here. You can have a look at things like the authentication type. So if a user attempts to connect using a basic authentication type and you want something a bit more rigorous, then they would fail to meet the conditions and, the, and they would be then denied access. A tunneling type, if you're using a VPN, can be selected as being required and a range of other properties. I'm going to make this really simple and add a group. And I'm going to use domain admins because I'm going to use the admin account. And it's worth noting that if you use domain admins and domain users as dis determining conditions, often somebody that belongs to domain admins may also belong to domain users. And if you have the policies in the wrong order, that might have an unexpected uh, result. So you need to be cautious about that. So I'm just going to choose one group here. And then I can determine whether or not access is granted or denied. So if I want to block remote access for admin users, then by defining the condition as domain admins and then deny access, then they won't be able to check any other policies. They'll stop at that policy because they meet the conditions of that policy. So I'm just going to leave that as granted for now. 
Then I can specify the supported configure the authentication method methods that are, are available. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a bit of detail shortly. But I'm going to go for the defaults here of MS Chap. I'm actually going to turn off uh, MS Chat Basic and just go for MS Chat version two because it's a little bit more rigorous. And I'm also going to add support for smart card or other certificate for EAP. Then I can go on to define idle timeouts and session timeouts. And as I mentioned, day and time restrictions. So this policy might apply to domain admins and therefore no other policies will now be checked. But I might then stipulate here a day and time restriction. And then they, the connection might be dropped if they don't meet the configured allowed times. And you might be wondering, well, well, could you not have set the day and time restriction as a condition? Yes, I could. But if it wasn't that day or time, then the condition wouldn't apply. And I would go on to meet, look at another policy. Whereas if I specify this as a constraint, then only this policy applies if I belong to domain admins and I don't examine any others. So it works in a very different way. So I'm going to leave that for now. And then I can go on to define things like um, IP filtering to control what uh, resources I can connect to based on TCP and UDP ports, inbound and outbound. Uh, I'm not going to configure that, but I am going to configure that I want to have strongest encryption or strong encryption because these are admins that are connecting. And once I'm happy with that, I can review the settings and then select finish. So now I've got um, one which grants permissions that has a numerical processing value of one. So that's the highest that will be processed first. So in the demonstration, you learned how to create a network policy. In this lesson, we're going to examine connecting VPNs to the corporate network. VPNs have the following characteristics. Authentication. This helps to ensure that the communicating parties know who the other communicating parties are in a given conversation. Encryption helps to ensure that the information being sent across the network is not tampered with and not intercepted for a third party to view. Encapsulation is the process whereby local area network traffic is structured in such a way that it can pass through a remote communication protocol such as PPTP or SSTP through the internet and then be reassembled at the remote end encapsulation. There are a number of VPN protocols that you can use. The point-to-point -point tunneling protocol, or PPTP, has been around for quite a long time. It's a good choice for its simplicity, but there are better choices in terms of feature set and security capabilities. The Layer 2 tunneling protocol with IPsec, or L2TP IPsec, is quite complex to set up and involves the use probably of a PKI, or public key infrastructure, to generate and maintain and distribute certificates for authentication purposes. It's a, it's a great solution for, for, a v, for a VPN, but it can be challenging to set up. The Secure Tunneling Protocol, or SSTP, is convenient because it uses the same TCP port number as does secure web traffic, so HTTPS type of traffic, TCP uh, port 443, which is typically open on external firewalls and so doesn't require a lot of infrastructure configuration to support. But in a Windows environment, you'll probably want to use Internet Key Exchange version 2 or IKE version 2. It's the most recent protocol and provides for the most features, such as auto reconnect and persistent VPN. Then you'll need to choose an appropriate authentication option. When using Microsoft solutions, there are four choices. PAP, which is clear text authentication and is best avoided. CHAP, which uses a challenge handshake protocol. It's better than clear text, but it's well understood and, and probably also should be avoided because it, it's relatively easy to compromise. MS CHAP version 2 extends on this capability and, and adds some considerable improvements around security. So this should be your minimum starting point for selection of an authentication protocol. The extensible authentication protocol, however, is your best option. It provides the best capabilities in terms of uh, assuring you of a reliable and secure authentication process. You can use a VPN configuration to support remote access VPN connectivity. In this scenario, you've got a VPN client sitting across the other side of the internet who establishes a VPN to a VPN server, and that allows ongoing communication with elements and resources within the intranet. You can also set up site-to-site -site VPNs in your on-prem network, so effectively using the internet and two VPN servers at each end of it to create a secure tunnel between sites. So in this example, site A and site B are connected using two VPN servers. This is referred to, therefore, as a site-to-site -site VPN. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to create a VPN and how to test it.
Okay, so we're back on the uh, server that we're setting up the remote access roll on. We can see here that we need to complete the configuration process. We can open up the getting started wizard, which might be the standard way in which you want to configure the VPN server. You can choose here to deploy direct access and VPN, so you have both configured, or um, direct access only, or as I'm going to select, deploy VPN only. That will switch me to the routing remote access console. So here it's a slightly manual process that needs to be completed. First of all, I need to go and look at my network adapters and enable any that are required for internet connectivity. So I have two adapters. I've got one which is connected locally to the on-prem network. And here I'm going to enable the internet connection, which is a separate virtual network. This is a virtual machine. So that's fine. That's now configured. And now if I right click Contoso SVR3, in the routing and remote access console and choose configure and enable routing and remote access. I can set the machine up as a dial-up or VPN server, choose VPN from the list. And then I need to configure whichever interface connects to the internet. So I've cunningly called that internet to make it easy for me to identify. It obviously has a public IP and it will disable that security option for now. And then I'm going to specify how my clients will connect and obtain an IP address. I can use DHCP if it's running on my intranet, but I'm going to specify a separate range of addresses. 10.0.0.1 and 10.0.0.10. That ought to be enough for my demonstration purposes. Now I can use radius or, or not as a case may be. So I'm going to say, yes, I want to set it up to use radius. So I need to specify now the primary radius server and an alternate radius server. So I need to configure the radius server first of all. So let me go and do that. So here I need to configure on the NPS the radius clients. So we need to add a new radius client, which will be the VPN server. So we'll call that Contoso SVR3, which is what it's actually called. I'm also going to use that name, verify. Resolve that out, click OK to that. I can specify a shared secret. Note that you can actually use templates here. So if you've got lots of network policy servers that you need to set up and lots of radius clients and radius server groups, you can use templates to, to accelerate the process. So if there was a template, I could choose it here, but I'm just going to create a shared secret, which both parties will know. That's just to allow for internal communication. If there are any advanced settings, I can go on and configure those. I'm just going to choose radius standard here, but if there was something specific I could, I could, for example, choose Microsoft and that should work OK. Click OK. And then if there are any remote radius server groups, I can configure those. There aren't, so I'm going to switch back to my remote access server. So now I need to specify Contoso SVR1 as the radius server. I don't have an alternate and the shared secret. And then finish. OK, that's fine. I'll need to open up the appropriate ports and then finish. Now the routing road access is set up and I can expand through here and have a look at the configured network interfaces. I can have a look at any remote access clients. I can view the ports that have been set up for VPN connectivity. You can see there's SSTP, PPTP, IKE version 2 and so forth. There's nothing else really for me to do here. I, I could change some of the properties of the server if I needed to, to revisit. I can go up here and change the um, security method. I can see here the radius authentication is set up. I can choose authentication methods on, on this local server if I wish, but I, that's already done. I can also specify the accounting provider for radius. And if I need to change the configuration, I can select the particular server that I want to use and update it. But that's all looking okay at the moment. The next thing is to try setting up a VPN client and giving things a test. OK, so I switched to a Windows 11 computer, so I'm going to open up settings and I'm going to create a VPN connection. I can just search for that VPN and choose VPN settings and then add a VPN. The connection provider is the Windows built in provider. If you've got a third party provider, you can select that. I'm going to call this Contoso HQ. The server name. I've got the IP address, which I shouldn't really use, but I, that's without DNS on, on the real internet. That's going to be a bit of a problem. I can choose the VPN type, IKE, L2TP or whatever. I'm going to set it to automatic and it will rotate through those until it finds one that works successfully. And then I'm going to save that away. Now I also need to change my network settings. 
because I've got a network connection that I need to enable. So I'm going to enable the internet adapter here and I'm going to disable the intranet adapter and then I'm going to go back to VPN and I'm going to test the connection. So I'm going to select connect here. I need to sign in, so I'm going to sign in as Contoso administrator, remembering that I need to belong to domain admins and select OK. It's attempting to connect to the VPN server and negotiating security settings. Now, if this is unsuccessful and it looks like it's taking a bit of a while, then we'll need to switch over to the network settings and look at those in some more detail. So if I open up network and internet here and then go to advanced and then if I select more network adapter options, you can see that I've got my VPN connection here. If I change its properties, I can verify that everything is set up per the appropriate settings on the VPN um, policies, the network policies that we set up earlier. So on the security page, for example, I can specify the type of authentication. So I'm, I'm going to allow MS Chat version 2 and also use EAP or select a, possibly EAP using smart card or other certificate. Now, I don't have a certificate, so I'm going to go with MS Chat version 2. I also need to have maximum strength encryption because that's a requirement of my network policy. So that's looking a little bit better now. And I can now go back to VPN and give that another try. OK, so we try to connect. There we go. That was pretty instantaneous. So we're all good to go. We've got our connection. In demonstration, you learned how to create a VPN connection and how to test that connection. You also saw how to set up the routing and road access server and to configure additional authentication and encryption properties. You can use connection profiles to enable certain specific VPN features. For example, always on, app triggered and traffic filters. When you're looking to deploy your connection profiles, it's important to remember that although you can manually configure an individual machine, it's not easy to manually configure dozens or hundreds or even thousands of computers with the same settings. It's far better to use some sort of deployment methodology. You can use scripts to distribute your connection profiles. You can use removable media, which you can apply during the out-the-box experience setup process for a computer. Insert your memory stick and it will detect that there's a, a configuration profile or what we call a provisioning package on the removable media. You can build the settings into an operating system image and then capture that image having generalized it and then make it available as part of a deployment process to your desktop computers. Or you can use software distribution to configure and distribute the settings. You can use Endpoint Configuration Manager in an on-prem environment and you can use Intune if you're supporting devices that are primarily cloud connected. You can also use Windows Configuration Designer, which is part of the Windows Assessment and Deployment Kit. That's a downloadable add-on to the Windows client. It's got various features in it, one of which is this Configuration Designer. And with this, you can generate those provisioning packages that you can then distribute using removable media. You can also use group policy objects in an Active Directory environment for your AD joined devices. In the demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can distribute a VPN profile using Intune. I'll also show you how to use a or how to create a VPN profile using Windows Configuration Designer. So this is Microsoft Intune or Endpoint Manager Admin Center. To set up um, a profile that will distribute VPN settings, select Devices and then you've got a range of different devices here. I've got some iPhones and I've got um, an Android device and I've got Windows, but let's look at Windows. To distribute to Windows, I choose Windows and then Configuration Profiles and then I'll create a profile and I'll select Windows 10 and later and then choose right down the bottom here VPN and select create. I go on to give it a name and select next and then I can specify the type of connection so I might be using a third party provider or I might be using a built-in provider whatever I'm going to choose automatic and then I can go on to configure the base VPN settings so give it a connection name Contoso HQ Corp. VPN and then specify should use the computer name rather than an IP address that that protects you from changes in the underlying IP architecture. I'm going to make that the default server. I'm going to enable registering IP addresses with internal DNS. It's going to be configured for always on. I'm going to remember credentials at each logon and then I can choose an authentication method here based on certificates, 
perhaps, or a derived credential. And then I can go on to define apps and traffic rules to control what sort of traffic can use the link, conditional access to determine whether or not a link can initiate in a given circumstance, and a range of other settings. Now, I've not completed everything that I need for EAP here, but anyway, I can continue past this point for now. Then I need to assign the profile to a device or to a, well, it's, it's going to configure a device, but I can assign it by group memberships. If I choose a user group member, or if I choose a user group, it will assign it to all the relevant devices. So if a, if a user belongs to a group and I've assigned this VPN profile and they have a Windows 10 computer, then that will be configured. I, alternatively, I can create device groups and I can point directly at those. I can also use applicability rules to determine if a profile assigns based on characteristics of the computer's operating system. When I'm happy with that, I can select next and then I can create the settings. I've, I've not completed the process here, but it gives you an idea how that would work. And then basically devices will obtain the configuration and you can then monitor that process. So if you go to configuration status, you'd be able to see which devices were picking up the configuration. So if I choose these success ones here, for example, you can see that there's an email profile that's been configured that's been successfully applied, for instance. Windows Configuration Designer enables me to create provisioning packages that I can distribute. We mentioned in an earlier slide that you might use a removable media. That's a great location to store the PPKG file that's generated by Windows Configuration Designer. Start off by selecting the most appropriate of these options for the type of device you're configuring. So in my case, it's going to be desktop devices. I'll call this one VPN or maybe more accurately Contoso VPN. Select finish there and it will load up a wizard. Now there's lots of things you can do with the Windows Configuration Designer. You can generate a computer name, you can enter a product key, you can set up network settings, you can distribute software, none of which is relevant to the VPN um, configuration. So in this instance, I'm going to scroll down and switch to the Advanced Editor. Now the reason we use a wizard is because it addresses most of our needs in most of the situations that you'll encounter. But occasionally, if you're doing something very specific, then you might want to focus just on that specific thing. So if, if you take a look under connectivity profiles, you'll see that there's a node for VPN and it's here that you would configure the settings. I don't intend to go through how to, to set up the specific settings for a VPN, but merely to show you that this is where they live. And once you've configured these settings to be appropriate to your situation, you can then go on to export the provisioning package. You can choose to protect it when it's being distributed by encrypting it and providing a password to unlock it or, and to digitally sign the package. That's got nothing to do with what your what certificates you might need for using a connection with a VPN, but merely to sign this package so that the recipient of the package knows that it's not been tampered with. Otherwise, you select Next here, and then you go on to complete the process by selecting Build. And what you should find is if you go and have a look at the notes, uh, the folder here, you can see that the two files that are relevant are the CAT file and the PPKG file. It's the PPKG file that you'll distribute along with the CAT file to your memory stick. Your engineer might take the two files on a memory stick, insert them into a computer that they're setting up from out the box, and at some point through that process, you can direct the setup to the PPKG file, which is the one that contains the actual settings. The cat file is there for a security check. It's a security catalog file. Once you've done that, then the changes are incorporated onto the computer. It restarts if necessary or completes the out-of-the-box experience setup if that's when you're using it. And you are then able to launch the, in this case, VPN configuration to connect to the corporate network. In the demonstration, you learned how to distribute a VPN profile using Intune and using Windows Configuration Designer. You can use Azure Network Adapter to create a point-to-site VPN connection to an Azure virtual network. It supports multiple Azure virtual network adapters, each connected to a different Azure virtual network. The requirements are that you must be running Windows Server 2019 or Windows Server 2022 on your on-prem network. You don't need to use a public IP address, you just need for the network adapter to have internet connectivity. If you must connect your entire on-premises network to an Azure virtual network, instead of network adapter, you should instead use either a site-to-site -site VPN, an express route connection. To implement and manage an Azure extended network, this enables you to extend an on-premises subnet with a private IP address range into an Azure virtual network. 
It enables your existing on-premises host to retain their private IP addresses when migrating or configuring coexistence with Azure. It enables you to extend up to 250 addresses from an on-premises network to Azure and supports an aggregate throughput of around about 700 megabits. It's enabled through a two-way VXLAN tunnel between two Windows servers that are hosting virtual appliances. One appliance is deployed on the on-prem subnet you want to extend. The other appliance is deployed using nested virtualization in Azure on the network to which you wish to extend the IP address range. If a firewall exists between your on-prem network and Azure, and it probably will, you must configure it to allow asymmetric routing traffic. Requirements A virtual network in Azure that has a minimum of two subnets plus an additional subnet for the gateway connection. One of the subnets must have the same address range as the on-premises private address range that you want to extend into Azure. A Windows Server VM in Azure configured for nested virtualization. This server hosts the cloud instance of the virtual appliance. Windows Admin Center connected to your on-premises and Azure Virtual Server VM hosts. Extended network extension must also be installed. Configure each IP address that you want to extend from on-premises to Azure, avoiding conflicts. Azure Relay enables you to connect on-premises services to Azure securely. It supports the following scenarios. Unidirectional request response and peer-to-peer -peer communication. Unbuffered socket communication across network boundaries. Event distribution used in publish and subscribe scenarios. It has the following features, hybrid connections and WCF relays. A site-to-site -site VPN enables you to connect your on-premises network to Azure using a VPN tunnel. An Azure VPN gateway on an Azure virtual network functions as the Azure VPN endpoint. It supports multiple connections and is the only Azure VPN gateway permitted on that virtual network. Your on-premises VPN endpoint can be a Windows Server computer with routing and remote access installed. Azure ExpressRoute enables your organization to have a dedicated, private, high-speed connection from your on-premises network to Azure. It provides connections that have a higher service level agreement than VPN connections to Azure. It provides guaranteed bandwidth speed. It's private because traffic doesn't pass across the public internet. It can also be used for on-premises traffic to all of Microsoft Cloud apps, including Microsoft 365. Azure Virtual One enables you to use Azure as a hub and spoke architecture for site-to-site -site connections in your organization. It enables geographically distributed organizations that have multiple branch offices to remove existing cross-site VPN connections and route everything through Azure. Azure AD Application Proxy provides access to apps and workloads that use Active Directory authentication running on on-prem networks for your users on the internet. It supports the following app types. Web apps that use integrated Windows authentication. Web apps that use form-based authentication or header-based authentication. Apps hosted through Remote Desktop Gateway. Rich client apps that are integrated with Microsoft Authentication Library. Azure AD Application Proxy requires less administrative effort than Web Application Proxy because you only need to deploy the Application Proxy service in Azure and the Application Proxy connector in your on-prem network. The requirements are as follows. You can deploy the Application Proxy connector on a Windows Server computer running in a perimeter network, on an internal network. The computer hosting the Application Proxy connector must be able to direct connect to the back-end application. Azure App Service hybrid connections enable connections between an on-prem workload through a relay agent to workloads that you host in Azure. It provides access from an app running in Azure to a TCP endpoint. It supports connections to workloads running on multiple platforms, not just Windows Server. It uses a relay agent usually deployed on a perimeter network. It secures communications by using TLS 1.2 and shared access signature keys for authentication and authorization. The following limitations apply. It can't connect to UDP endpoints. It can't connect to TCP-based services that use dynamic ports. It doesn't support the lightweight directory access protocol. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to implement Azure Network Adapter. Okay, so I'm in Windows Admin Center. I have a connection to a VM running up, up in Azure. So I'm gonna select that. And then from the Azure Hybrid Center tab, I should be able to select Azure Network Adapter and choose to set that up. Choose the location as being UK South. Specify the VNet 
at the Azure end and the gateway subnet I want to use. And then when I'm ready, select create. That seems to be successful. Status is up and I can have a look at the details of this if I want to. So that's it. In the demonstration, you learned how to install the Azure Network Adapter feature. This is lesson eight, Managed Storage and File Services. In this lesson, you'll learn about Windows Server Storage, managing branch cache and the distributed file system, configuring and managing Windows Server file shares, and configuring and managing Azure File Sync. The hands-on sessions include create a storage pool and storage space, manage quotas and file screens, share folders, manage folder security, and verify access, configure branch cache, implement DFS, and implement Azure File Sync. When you introduce a new disk into Windows Server or indeed Windows Client, you'll need to make a basic decision about its initial structure. This is a choice between MBR and GPT. So these are partitioning schemes that are used on Windows and other operating systems. MBR stands for Master Boot Record and is an older format. GPT stands for Globally Unique Identity Partition Table and is the newer standard. When considering MBR, bear in mind that it contains the partition table for a disk and its master boot code. It's created during initial partitioning of a disk. It allows for four partition entries. Now that's not really much of a limitation because generally these days we tend to want to combine disks together to create one large volume rather than take one disk and split it down into four smaller volumes. For older BIOS based systems, Windows requires an MBR partition system disk to start up from. MBR is compatible with both BIOS systems and UFI based systems. MBR supports a two terabyte partition maximum size and offers no redundancy. GPT contains more robust partition entries, which means it's inherently more reliable. It's compatible with computers installed with BIOS and with UFI firmware. Windows Server, or in fact Windows Client, cannot start from a GPT disk if the computer only has a BIOS. But both Windows Server and Windows Client support startup from a GPT partition on a UFI based computer. GPT allows up to 128 partitions per disk and volume sizes up to 18 exabytes, although Windows has a limit of around about 256 terabytes. You can't use GPT on removable drives and GPT provides redundancy that MBR does not. After you've initialized your disk, you'll then need to create volumes in which you can store files. There are a number of different types of volume that you'll encounter. Simple, which is the most likely that you'll use. A simple volume encompasses space on a single disk. It might use all of the available space on a disk or be partitioned to use only a portion of the available space. A span disk is a way of combining physical disks together to create a logical volume that spans those disks. It doesn't provide for any fault tolerance or performance gain, but it does allow you to create a larger volume using the available disk architecture that you have. Mirrored enables you to create a mirror of one partition on one disk to another identical partition on another disk. The idea here is to provide fault tolerance, so if one of those disks fails, the other continues to operate, providing access to the volume. Striped enables you to improve throughput on your disks by sp spanning a volume across two, three, four, however many disks that you want, and distributing the load across all of those disks simultaneously, so you get an improvement in read-write performance. However, you are at higher risk of suffering a problem if you get a disk failure, because the whole volume will then be inaccessible. If you've got three disks in a disk stripe, then any one of those that fails, fails the whole stripe. RAID 5 is a stripe with parity. You'll need a minimum of three disks to configure this, and that will then give you a level of fault tolerance. You can afford to lose one of the three disks, or if you've got four or five disks, you can use, lose one of those. And that will then, con or the volume will then continue to, to be available within the operating system. So it's fault tolerance against drive failure. When you set up a volume, you need to choose a file system. The older file system, FAT, which comes in three variants, FAT or FAT16, FAT32 and XFAT, 
ubiquitous. They're available on virtually every operating system. And they're also available and supported by devices, media players and, and so forth. FAT32 is probably the choice that you should make for external storage such as SD cards and memory sticks, USB memory sticks, because you may want to use those on devices that aren't running Windows and it's FAT32 that's most widely supported. XFAT is becoming more popular but is not accepted by every single media player. Most computer operating systems support it but dedicated media player devices may not. NTFS is the default operating system uh, file system. You'll find that your startup volume, C drive, is formatted automatically for NTFS. It takes the standard structure of FAT and extends it to include additional attributes and higher levels of reliability. It's also less prone to suffer from fragmentation. Fragmentation can still occur on the hard disk when data is being written, but the file system is more efficient at handling that. The resilient file system is an enhancement on NTFS. It doesn't include all of the features that NTFS does, but those particular features aren't considered generally to be especially useful. I'm thinking of things like compression and encryption. So neither of those are supported by REFS. But REFS is the file system that you'll probably use for very large volumes when you're configuring something called storage spaces. Let's have a look at NTFS in a little more detail. It supports file level compression. I'm not sure that that's especially useful, and given that it's no longer supported in REFS, it suggests that Microsoft doesn't consider it to be especially useful either. Since most data files are very efficiently written to disk, using compression technologies built into the app, it's unlikely you'll get a great benefit from implementing file level compression. Per user volume quotas, so you can limit the amount of disk space that a user can consume. Well, first of all, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Limiting users is, is not something that users are going to be especially happy about. So um, better to manage your storage using other server-side technologies, all of which we'll discuss during this lesson. So per user volume quotas is also a feature that you can't implement in REFS. And again, therefore, I wonder how useful it really is. Symbolic links and junction points, that's just sort of architectural structure. Volume size is up to 256 terabytes. A maximum file size of 16 terabytes. File names and total path size is limited to 255 characters. That shouldn't be a particular problem, but it's worth remembering if you've got a very deep directory structure with long folder names, you might inadvertently hit that limit. And sometimes that can create file access errors that you're struggling to pinpoint the cause of. File and folder encryption. Don't forget that you can encrypt any file system volume using BitLocker, and that probably provides a more realistic solution to a realistic problem. File and folder encryption is all about privacy of content on a shared folder and there are other technologies that enable us to assure ourselves of that level of privacy without having to resort to encryption. So this is another feature that's not supported by REFS and again I wonder at its usefulness in NTFS. Metadata transactional logging means that um, when files are written the process is much more managed than on the FAT file system and therefore is inherently more reliable and recoverable. So there are some self-healing capabilities built into NTFS using those transactional logging capabilities. REFS uses a transactional write model. It has proactive repairing and self-healing. So it's, again, a step up in terms of reliability over NTFS. It provides for data integrity, improved availability. It's much more scalable and supports larger volumes. When you're working with disk, you'll want to use a number of the available disk management tools. These are Disk Management, which is a graphical tool, Windows PowerShell, which you can use to manage disks and volumes from the command line, and Disk Park, which is a command line tool. So Disk Management probably provides the easiest user interface for you. You can see at a glance the available volumes and the available disks and their configuration, and you can then make changes as you need. You can perform all disk tasks using Disk Management, except for setting up storage spaces. Windows PowerShell commandlets include Get disk to retrieve a list of disks. Clear disk to wipe a disk. Initialize disk to set up a disk for initial use. Set disk to change the properties of a disk. Get volume to retrieve a list of volumes. Format volume, obviously to format the volume. Get partition to retrieve a list of partitions. And some of the examples of these in use. Resize partition. Specify the disk number as zero. That's the first disk in the computer. And the partition number as one and then the size is 30 gig. So that will change the partition size of the designated partition to 30 gig. 
get disk number zero will retrieve information about the first disk in the computer. New partition and then specifying use maximum size uses all the available space on disk number zero and then using the pipe to, to pass the result to format volume and then specify the file system as NTFS and specify the file system label as simple. Get partition disk number zero will retrieve the list of partitions on disk zero. Set partition disk number zero, partition number and then whatever number you want to specify and then new drive letter H changes the drive letter of the, part, the, the specified partition to H. Disk part is a command line tool. You open up command prompt. You can run this of course from PowerShell because PowerShell will allow you to interpret command line tools. Uh, but strictly speaking it's a command line tool. Open up disk part and as you can see here I've selected or entered the command list disk and it's displaying the list of disks. Disk 0 being the primary disk for the computer, disk 1 being an additional disk that's been added. You can see that it indicates that both disks are online, the size of the disks and it tells us whether the partition is dynamic and it also tells us whether we're using MBR or GPT. So in this instance we can tell quite a lot from this output because the disk 0 which is the primary operating system disk is, is a GPT disk we know that this computer must have UFI firmware because otherwise it wouldn't be able to use a GPT disk as disk 0. Storage spaces is a feature of Windows Server and also Windows Client that allows you to efficiently combine multiple disks into a single volume. That volume then potentially being provided with fault tolerant capabilities depending on the number of disks that you have. This is probably the more efficient way of managing disks in your server than anything we've discussed so far in this in this lesson. It was introduced with Windows Server 2012 and is as I said used to combine multiple physical disks. It provides storage redundancy by pooling those disks, so you create a storage space from a storage pool of disks. You can use either NTFS or REFS file systems, and the recommendation would usually be to use REFS. The components of a storage space are a physical disk. You can use any size disk and any type of disk. At least one physical disk for a storage pool is needed, and you need more for mirroring purposes. When you're ready to set up a storage space, do not initialize or format the disks. A storage pool, you'll need one or more physical disks to create a virtual disk. You can add all unformatted disks to a storage pool. A storage space is a logical disk which you create from one or more physical disks. A storage space supports both thin provisioning, or what's called just-in-time disk allocations, so that you can configure more available space than you physically have. And then when you need to add additional space to accommodate growing space usage, you can do that. There is also, through the use of configuration, resiliency to physical disk failure. You can use mirroring of a number of different types depending on the number of disks that you have in your pool. When you allocate a drive letter, your storage pool is accessible through File Explorer. What's interesting is that if you open up Disk Management, it will show the whole storage space as a single drive with a specific individual drive number or disk number. These are the layout options you can use. Simple, two-way or three-way mirrors, and parity. The options you have are dependent on the number of disks that you have. With provisioning, you can use thin provisioning, whereby you can specify more available space than you physically have, as long as you are ready to add additional physical space when needed. And fixed provisioning, where you specify a standard amount which is addressed by that amount of space in the physical disks you have. Thin provisioning provides a very attractive option for administrators because it doesn't it allows you not to over-specify your storage. You can use Windows PowerShell to manage your storage spaces. New storage pool, add physical disk, get storage pool, set storage pool, set physical disk, get virtual disk, new virtual disk repair virtual disk, optimize storage pool, update storage pool, remove physical disk, remove storage pool. In the demonstration I'm going to show you how to create a storage pool and how to create a storage space. Okay, So I'm on a server which is a member of a domain and I have the file and storage services role installed so to set up a storage space I start with that and then select storage pools and down the bottom right hand side you can see that there are five physical disks that have been identified. So we're going to set those up in a in a storage pool and then from that we're going to create a storage space. 
So we'll start by selecting tasks. So it's a moment. Stars, tasks, new storage pool. Select next. Uh, I'm going to give it a name. And then select next. And then I'm going to select all of the disks that I want to use. I've got five of them, so I'm going to select all of those. I, I don't need to use all of them, but I'm going to show you the options that are available if you have five disks. And then select next. And then finally just click create to create the pool. And then I can create a virtual disk when the wizard closes. So that's the next step. Close. And I'm going to select the storage pool from which I want to create my virtual disk. So select next. Virtual disk name. I'm going to call this one Contoso Data. And then select next. And now I can choose the storage layout, simple, mirror, or parity. The options I have are entirely dependent on the number of disks that I have. I have five disks, so that gives me certain options. For the exam, it's well worth you prepping up on, on the options that are available here. So with mirroring, data strapped across physical disks, creating two or three copies of your data. So if you want to use two to protect against two disk failures, you'll need at least five disks. For parity, you can protect against a single disk failure for which you'll need three disks. Again, if you want to protect against two disk failures, in parity you'll need seven. We don't have seven disks, so I'm going to go for mirroring here. It then asks me, do I want two-way mirror or three-way mirror because I have enough disks to support either of those. So I'm just going to choose two-way mirror in this instance. Then I can choose my provisioning type, thin or fixed, which we discussed a moment ago. I'm going to go for thin and then select next. I can now specify whatever size I want. And at some point, obviously, I need to make the physical storage available to support that. But initially, I won't need to. I'm going to keep it very simple here, actually, and just go for fixed. I can then specify the size. I've got the total space of 312. So that's what I'll use in this instance. Then a quick summary of what I've asked it to do. And then I'm going to select create. OK. Close that. Now it launches the new volume wizard because I need to make the volume available by pointing it at the virtual disk that I just created from that storage pool. So select next here, then choose the disk. And you can see that it's identified it as disk six, which is interesting because the other disks were numbered one through five, the five that I added as new. But Windows doesn't see those anymore. It sees disk six, which is the virtual disk that I created. I'm going to use the available space. I'm going to assign it a drive letter of E. That's fine. The file system I want to choose is REFS in this case. I'm going to call this one Contoso Data. Confirms the settings. And then I select Create. Close. And then just to show you what's happened, if I go into File Explorer, I should see that new volume. There it is. And if I look at Disk Management, just to show you again that it sees it as a single disk, disk six, basic disk online. So from the computer's perspective, that's what it is. It's a single physical disk formatted as a single volume. But we know that actually it's five disks formatted to support two-way mirroring using all of the available space with fixed provisioning. In the demonstration, you saw how to create a storage pool and how to create a storage space. We refer to it as a virtual disk during the demonstration. Storage Spaces Direct enables you to use locally attached storage on Windows Server to create software-defined, highly available storage. It enables you to create volumes from a storage pool attached to multiple nodes in a Windows Server failover cluster. By using Storage Spaces Direct, you can replace expensive large-scale hardware storage arrays. Storage Space supports two deployment options, hyper-converged and converged. The requirements you must verify that each server has two volumes, one for data and the other for replication logs. Both data and log disks must be formatted for GPT. They must be identically sized, the data volume with the same sector sizes and the log volume with the same sector sizes. A log volume of at least 9 gig must be present. The system volume, page file and dump files on another volume other than the data volume. When you set up Storage Spaces Direct, you can choose between a number of resiliency types, two-way mirroring, three-way mirroring, dual parity, and mixed. Each of these provides a different failure tolerance level and storage efficiency. The following represent the supported configurations. Server to server, cluster to cluster, and stretch cluster.
Data deduplication is provided by the Data Deduplication Role Service. It's supported on both NTFS and RAFS volumes in Windows Server. It analyzes files and locates unique storage blocks or chunks of data for those files. It stores only a single copy of each chunk on a configured volume. This obviously means that you can be far more efficient of your disk space where you have multiple instances of the same chunk or that many chunks contain the same information. The data duplication role service is part of the file and storage services role. You can choose from one of the following usage types. General purpose file server, virtual desktop infrastructure server, virtualized backup server. Dedupe performs optimization, garbage collection, integrity scrubbing, and unoptimization. Once you've set up your storage, you'll want to configure certain features to control what users can do with that storage. One of those features is file screens. You can use file screens to block access to creating certain types of files based on the files extension. File screens are based on file groups and file templates. You implement file screens by using the file server resource manager role service on your server. So file groups define the file extensions for different types of files. So for example, audio files might have a .aac extension or a .aif extension. Um, it might be that uh, imaging files have a .jpg or .bmp or, or .eps type of file extension. So once you've created and configured your file groups, you can then go on to configure templates. Templates control access to certain types of files. There are some default file groups and there are also some default file screen templates, but you can create your own. A file screen template defines, well, the default ones define blocking audio and video files, for example, or blocking email files or blocking executable files. If the file screen template you want to configure isn't available, you can create your own, but otherwise you can go on to configure file screens. So a file screen can be created based on a template. You can configure active or passive file screening. In, in active, you, you block. In passive, you just warn and monitor the behavior. If you're implementing file screens for the first time, that's not a bad approach to take, to start with maybe passive file screening and then move on to active file screening after users have, a, have had a time to adjust to this new management um, approach to space on disks. So here we can see creating a file screen defining the file screen path as the root of drive E, and we're deriving the properties from a template, in this case, block image files. Another useful feature is quotas. These enable you to apply a per folder restriction on disk space consumption, and supports, again, hard quotas, which limits users, and soft quotas, which advises users and monitors their behavior. You implement quotas, again, using the file server resource manager role service. So you start by defining your quota templates. These can be configured as hard or soft, and there are some defaults, 10 gig, 100 meg, 2 gig, and so on. And each of those is available in hard and soft versions. Once you've configured your quotas, if you, oh, sorry, your quota templates, if you need to, you can then go on to configure a quota. So you specify a quota by specifying or choosing a particular template and then applying that to a particular path. So in this instance, we're applying a quota to the root of drive E, and we're specifying that we derive the properties for this quota based on the two gig limit template. And a summary of what that's going to do is indicated at the bottom of the screen. So you can see this is a hard limit for things like, well, any type of file really in that space, but we're going to get a warning at 85% and another email warning and an event log generated at 95% of the limit. And you can configure all those behaviors within the template. A very helpful thing to be able to do is to get an idea of what's happening with your storage. And one of the features that you have in FSRM is storage reports. So you can run storage reports to generate information about what's happening with files by file group, file screen audits, and duplicate files. So the following reports are by default available. Duplicate files, file screening audit, files by file group, files by owner, files by property, large files, least recently accessed files, most recently accessed files, quota usage. File classification is useful. It enables you to define the type of file that you're working with. So in this example, we're creating a, 
a classification called Contoso classification. And you can define classifications based on yes, no properties, date time properties, number properties, multiple choice list, and an ordered list. You can also choose single choice and strings. Strings can be either single string or multi strings. Classification rules enable you to assign classifications to files based on the file's properties. The following methods are available for classification. Content classifier, folder classifier, Windows PowerShell classifier. As a storage administrator, you'll probably want to perform file management tasks on occasion. FSRM file management tasks are automatically performed on a scheduled basis to save you the hassle of having to do them manually. There are three available tasks, file expiration, custom, which allows you to be flexible about what you want it to do, and RMS encryption. To implement file management tasks, use the file management tasks node under file server resource manager. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to manage quotas and how to create a file screen. So on my server, the first thing I want to do is to add the file server resource manager feature. I'm going to use server manager for that, but you can, of course, use PowerShell if you prefer. So this part of the file and storage services role, so if we expand that out, we can scroll down and select file server resource manager from the list and then add the required features and then click through the wizard to complete the process. Now that's complete, so click close there. So next thing to do is to go up to tools and choose file server resource manager. And here you can see a list of activities. We've got quota management, file screening management and storage reports classification management and file management tasks. So let's have a look at some of the quoted templates. We've got a, a, a template here, 10 gig limit. Let's examine that one. So we edit the properties of that if we want to. So as you can see here, it's going to create a 10 gig limit and it's a hard quota. So users are not allowed to exceed that limit. And then at various stages, it's going to send notifications. Now we can modify this if we want to, or we can copy it and modify it, um, or we can just accept it as it is. So let's have a look at creating a smaller limit that we might be able to, to generate some issues with. So we're going to create a new template. Choose Create Quota Template from the Actions list. And we call this one Contoso Test. So it's easy for me to find. A 100 megabyte limit, hard quota. And then I can specify some notifications. So send an email to whoever exceeded and to an admin. I don't have an email capability on this system, so I won't bother with that. I can generate an event log message, which you can see listed here. And I can run a particular script or a command or generate a particular report. So for now, I'm just going to specify 100 meg hard limit and set the limit, a warning limit at 85%. So that's fine. I've now created that. So the next thing to do is to create a quota based on that. Select Create Quota. I'm going to browse and select the path. You can see Drive C here. I'm going to create a new folder on Drive C called Data. Select that. And then I'm going to enforce that template or that limit using that template, which is the one we created here. Okay, so over on our Windows 11 workstation, I've signed in as a standard user and mapped a network drive to that data folder. I'm now going to open up a command prompt. And then I'm going to use a command in Drive Z to create the file. FSUtil is quite a useful utility, actually. You can create files to say you have to copy things around. Big file here, and um, we'll call it Big File 1, actually, and then specify its size. Do a directory listing, and we can see how much space we've consumed. So we've got a 87 million bytes, so getting to be a fairly large file. We're going to create another file and see what it does. It says there's not enough space on the disk, so it's limiting me. So that quota seems to be effective. If I wanted to make it a soft quota, then of course I could create it, but I'd be warned about it and the errors and, and email messages and so forth would be generated. Back on the server, let's just check the event viewer and look at the event log. Take a look at the application event log. And you can see that there is a warning here. User Contoso Abbey has reached the quota limit. And it tells you what that limit is. And the current usage is 82.98 megabytes. That's 82% of the limit. Then we've got a file server resource manager email action. Couldn't be run because we hadn't set up SMTP, but otherwise it would have fired off an email message. And again, a number of other messages that relate to us exceeding our quota. So that seems to work pretty well. 
So now let's take a look at creating file screens. You start by creating file groups. Now there are some already defined for you and for the most part they'll probably be perfectly sufficient. If you want to create additional ones you can create a file group. If you want to modify a file group you can select it and then add additional file extensions to the group. Once you've configured your file groups you'll need to define file screen templates. So here we've got some built-in templates blocking audio and video files, blocking email files, blocking image files and so on and the type of screening. So we've got active or passive. If you want to create a, a, a passive version of blocking image files then you'll need to create a new template that does it in that way. Having defined your file screen templates, and let's just have a look at one as you can see here. So you can choose the particular blocks or the types of files that you want to block, um, either active or passive. So in this case, it's just image files, but you, you could also include system files, backup files, audio and video files. So actually not an unusual one for multimedia would be to block audio and video files and image files, for instance. So it's not necessary to only block one type of file. You can block multiple types of file. So in this instance, I'm just going to block image files. So once you're happy with your templates, you then go on to file screens and create a new file screen. Call this one Contoso. Well, I won't call it anything. <laughs> I need to browse first of all and select it. And again, select the data folder and then block audio and video files. I'm going to choose image files. And then if I want, I can define custom properties. I'm quite happy with this configuration and then select create. So here I am signed in as Abby, connected to drive Z, which is the C slash data folder on the server. I'm going to get rid of my big file here so that I can actually create some new files. And again, from the command prompt, I can use the fsutil command to create the file. It doesn't have to be particularly big in this instance. And I can give it a file extension, jpg. And it says, I can't do that. Access is denied because I'm trying to create a not permitted file type. So just to test that that's the case, if I create it as a completely different type of a file, I'm able to do that, so it's not a space limitation, it's the file screen that's coming into force. Back on the server, it's maybe worth having a quick look in Event Viewer again, and again under the application log. And we can see here we've got a message that's just been generated. So Abby attempted to save a file. Um, this file matches the image files file group, which is not permitted. So that seems to be working successfully as well. In the demonstration, you learned how to manage quotas and how to create a file screen. So having created your storage and enabled file screens and quotas and so forth, you'll then want to actually make the content accessible to your users. You'll need to create a shared folder for that. A shared folder is one you've made available to other users on your network. Shared folder permissions control access to the content of your shared folder. Now underlying that is a volume which has its own file permissions configurable on it. So at some later stage in the lesson, we're going to talk about how those combine. Essentially, shared folder permissions are historical. They exist because earlier operating systems didn't support the notion of file permissions on the files themselves. You can share folders in a number of ways. You can share folders by using the computer management tool, from the command prompt by using the net share command, by using the new SMB share Windows PowerShell commandlet, or by using File Explorer. And it's probably the last of these that you'll use most. So to share with computer management, you open up the computer management tool, and you navigate to the shared folders area, and then select shares, and then right click and choose new share, and use the wizard to complete the process. From the command prompt, you'll use the net share command to review the available shares. You can use net share, and then the name of the shared folder, sales, and then the name of the file system folder that you're sharing, in this case e slash data slash sales, and then the permissions that you want to grant slash grant colon the group or user, comma, and the level of permissions, in this case change. When you're using NetShare, you can use the slash grant and then security principle and then permission, which is read, change, or full, that you can use to control access. You can use the slash users parameters, specify how many users can connect to the share concurrently, it's unlimited on the server potentially, but you might want to change that. You can use a remark to add some kind of description to the share. You can use the cache option to specify whether users can access the content when they're offline. And then if you want to get rid of a shared folder from the command prompt, you can use the slash delete switch in conjunction with the share. So net share and the name of the shared folder slash delete will remove it. 
For using Windows PowerShell, you'll use the new SMB share commandlet, specify the name and then the path. PowerShell commandlets that you can use with sharing are get SMB share, which lists existing shares on the computer, get SMB share access, which displays the permissions for a share, new SMB share creates a new share, set SMB share modifies the properties of an existing share, remove SMB share deletes a share, and grant SMB share access grants the permissions on a shared folder. Within File Explorer, you can use Give Access To to grant permissions and to share a folder simultaneously. Right click the folder you want to share, in this case data, then select Give Access To and then choose Specific People. You can then define the level of access that you want. But what's interesting about this method is it configures not only the shared folder permissions or share permissions, it also configures the permissions on the underlying file or folder, NTFS permissions in other words, and it does that simultaneously. But for most situations, you'll want to use what's known as advanced sharing. Advanced sharing isn't really advanced, it's just you have more control over the process. To share a folder in this way, right click the folder, choose properties and then choose the sharing tab. Then you can select the share button and then select share this folder, specify a name, it defaults to the name of the folder if that's not already in use. And then you can configure additional things like limiting the number of simultaneous users if you want to, configuring the caching options and configuring permissions. And these are the shared permissions rather than the underlying file permissions. The following shared folder permissions can be configured. Read, change and full. Now generally speaking, well first of all the default permissions when you use advanced sharing, everyone read. Now everyone means anyone really because if you've got guest accounts enabled then, then anybody can cap potentially uh, gain access to this folder. If you're concerned about that you might want to change the permissions to authenticated users which denies access to guests. So that's worth considering. However since we're going to configure the underlying file permissions then we don't necessarily need to worry too much about the shared folder permissions. I would recommend that you change the default value of everyone read to everyone full control. What that means is a user will be able to gain full access through the share but they won't be able to gain full access on the files and folders within the share because we'll use NTFS permissions or REFS depending on the volume type to configure the level of access. Okay so that would be my recommendation but for purists I know that they say that it's a good idea to change the shared folder permissions because otherwise you're leaving a potential loophole. I don't agree. There's no way to bypass those local file permissions and therefore I think it's largely irrelevant bothering to configure shared folder permissions. In the exam you may well get questions on trying to figure out the combination of, and the sort of joint effect of two levels of permissions for a user that's sitting across the network and going through a share with a particular set of permissions and a particular collection of group memberships on a file system object which has a different level of access configured. So we'll talk a bit more about that later. File and folder permissions enable you to control access to files and folders. They're sometimes referred to as file permissions, even though they're assigned generally to folders. And they're also sometimes referred to as NTFS permissions. But since you can configure both NTFS and REFS volumes with file and folder permissions, that's a bit of an inexact name, but it's commonly used. You can configure file and folder permissions using either File Explorer, Command Prompt, or indeed PowerShell. By using File Explorer, you right click the folder or file that you're interested in and choose its properties and then select the security tab. On the security tab you can then go on and configure the necessary permissions. Permissions include full control, modify, read, execute, list folder contents and read and I'll go through all of those in a moment. From the command prompt you can use a tool called ICACLS. Specify the name of the folder in quotes and then go on to specify the level of access that you want to grant. I actually find using ICACLS challenging. The syntax is not obvious to me and it's not something I use frequently enough to be able to remember the syntax. It's also very easy to overwrite permissions instead of adding to existing permissions. So exercise caution when you're using it but it's the sort of thing that might come up on the test. These are the ICACLS options. I'll include them for completeness but I'm not going to spend too long looking at them. So slash grant enables you to grant permissions to replace any existing explicit permissions. Deny denies permissions and remember that a deny permission will override any specifically granted permissions. Reset allows you to reset the permissions on a folder to go back to the default which is to inherit permissions from the parent folder. Using the switch F grants full access, M grants modify access, 
Rx grants read execute access. And it's those three that you'll mostly use. In certain circumstances, you might use, need to use some slightly unusual combinations of permissions. And that is possible. So R lets you grant read, W lets you grant write. I'm not sure how useful those are in most circumstances. OI specifies object inherit and NP means do not propagate the inherit. The available file and folder permissions when applied to a folder and when applied to a file slightly differ, but let's run through them. These are the most common that you'll use. Full control allows every activity to be performed on a particular folder. It also allows modification of permissions on those folders. When you apply it to a file, it allows you to read, write, change, delete the file and allows you to modify the permissions on files. Modify is essentially the same as full control, but doesn't allow changing to permissions. Actually, it, it doesn't allow one other thing. The difference between modify and full control is two specific permissions. One, take ownership, and two, change permissions. So when you've got modify permissions, you've got all the permissions that you need to be able to perform typical data file activities, but you don't have the ability to take ownership. If you take ownership of a file or folder, then you can change its permissions and block access for other people. So that's not the sort of level of permission that you'd normally want to grant to a shared data area. So modify is the typical level of access that you'll grant to data areas. Full control you'll probably use for individual personal folders and you'd grant permissions for the user themselves to have full control access. So full control for individual users in their own folders, modify uh, permissions for data areas that are shared at a de departmental level, for example. Read execute is ideal for executing programs. It doesn't allow you to make any modifications to the files or folders. It just allows you to access the content in the case of a folder and to run the file in the case of a file. Listing folder contents doesn't apply to files, but does apply to folders and it's pretty self-explanatory. You can see what's in the folder. Read allows the contents of a folder to be read or allows access to the contents of a file, but doesn't allow you to execute the file if it's an executable. And write allows the additions of files and folders into a given folder and allows a user to modify a file but not to delete it. So there may again be certain situations where read and write permissions are more appropriate than say modify or read execute in a given circumstance. There are also a number of advanced permissions. In fact when you set up one of those standard combinations of permissions like full control or modify you are in in essence, using these advanced permissions in, in particular combination. So traverse folder execute file, list folder read data, read attributes, read extended attributes, create files and write data, create folders and append data, write attributes, write extended attributes, delete subfolders and files, change permissions, take ownership. These together combine to create full control, modify, read execute, and so on. It's unusual for you to need to configure these individual permissions. So it would be very strange to have read attribute permissions and delete subfolders and files. That would not make a lot of sense in sort of typical file activities. But it's important to be aware of these specific permissions. From the advanced security settings page of a given folder, you can review the current permission entries and you can also set up and manage auditing and view effective access. You also have the ability to control inheritance. Inheritance enables you to, to, hermit, to determine whether or not you want to inherit permissions from the parent uh, folder, which is typical, or whether you want to grant explicit permissions over a particular file or folder within an existing subfolder. If you decide to disable inheritance, you've got the option to convert existing inherited permissions into explicit permissions, or to remove all permissions and start from a blank access control list. Be careful with that second option because it might be that you remove your own permissions from the folder and you then won't be able to proceed any further. I mean that's a problem you can relatively easily fix but it's a problem you, you can probably do without. So I would always go for the convert inherited option. Bear in mind that explicit permissions override in inherited permissions. So if you're ever comparing a level of access or trying to determine a level of access and a user is inheriting certain permissions through group memberships and has explicit permissions either as an individual or through other group memberships, then it's the explicit permissions that will take precedence in general terms. Effective access can be checked quite easily by using the effective access tab. And here you're able to specify the properties by selecting particular users, possibly adding group memberships for the user, and then maybe making a claim for the user using something called conditional access. 
Conditional access is a feature whereby you can use Active Directory attributes. In this case, the city where a user lives is defined in the user properties for that user and determining a level of access based on a user being in a particular city. So for example, if a user lives in London, and we're looking at a folder for sales managers in London, then we could use that property or that condition to define a level of access rather than simply relying on group memberships. When you combine shared folder and NTFS permissions together, you have to make a determination about what the effective permissions will be. Now, generally speaking, it's described as being the least permissions apply. So if, for example, you've got full control through the share, but you've got read execute permissions on the NTFS folder that's being shared, then NTFS permissions take precedence in that situation as the least level of access. So you have read execute permissions. Conversely, if you had read permissions through the share and full control over the shared folder itself on NTFS, then you'd still only have read permissions because the least permissions apply. Actually, what's happening is that the permissions must be agreed upon for you to have that permission. So the permission for you to enjoy a particular permission through a share, you must have the same permission at both levels. Now, this is slightly complicated in the sense that the permissions are called something completely different. In a shared folder scenario, we've got full control, change and read. And those are roughly equivalent to full control, modify and read execute, broadly speaking. So essentially, to have at least read permissions, you're going to need read permissions in one or other of the lists and more or less permissions in, in, in the other list. And then the agreed upon permissions will be the read execute permissions. If, for example, you had change permissions on a shared folder and you had read execute permissions, then again, the agreed upon permissions are read execute. But for simplicity's sake, if you remember the rule that the least permissions are applied, that will probably be sufficient for any exam questions that you might face. In the demonstration, I'm going to show you how to secure a folder and then verify effective access on the folder. So I'm on my server. I've created a sales folder on the Contoso data volume. I'm now going to look at the security settings for that by selecting security. And you can see here that we've got some permissions for the everyone group, for creator owner, for system, for administrators and for users. The fact that they are all allow permissions and slightly light gray in color, these little check marks, indicates that they are inherited permissions. You get dark gray checks if they are explicit permissions. And remember, explicit permissions override in most circumstances. If I want to look at some more detail, I can go to advanced. And then here I can see where the permissions are, are coming from. So the sales folder is inheriting its permissions from the root of drive E. If I were to create a subfolder under sales, reports, for example, and then look at the properties of that and check out its security settings and look at advanced. And you can see that it's inheriting the permissions from the root of drive E as well. If I want to disable inheritance, I can do that. And then I can change the permissions to be explicit permissions and explicit permissions will tend to override implicit or inherited permissions, generally speaking. So I'm going to change the permissions. I'm going to create a folder or configure the folder here for um, the sales department. So I'm going to edit the permissions here. I'm going to add sales and see if I've got a group called sales. I have sales users and I'm going to grant modify permissions here. Now you'll notice if I click apply that we've got a combination now of some explicit permissions and some inherited permissions. So that's interesting to be aware of. So Sales users have explicit permissions. If I go to the permissions list on advanced now, we can have a look at see sales users permissions are not inherited. They're explicit because I set them manually on that specific folder. OK, so sales users group has modified permissions on the sales folder. If I take a look under the sales folder and take a look at reports and look at its properties and select security, and look at sales users, same permissions, but these are now light gray. They're being inherited from the sales folder where they were set. And again, I can see that by selecting advanced and seeing that I'm inheriting those permissions from the parent. So that's the standard behavior. Now, it might be that I want to change the default permissions because currently we've got a bit more permissions maybe on the sales folder than we probably want. This is a, a folder for sales users and therefore everyone should be able to read the contents. OK, so I'm going to change the permissions and this is how you do that. Select advanced, disable inheritance. And as I recommended when I was talking earlier, I would choose convert permissions into explicit permissions. 
So all the same permissions are there, but they're explicit now. And then I can probably choose to get rid of users because I don't need those. Everyone, I don't need that either. Users, don't need that either. I probably ought to leave system and creator owner because they're likely to be needed. And I should probably also consider carefully whether or not I wanted to remove administrators. Apart from anything else, that includes me. And if I remove my own permissions, I'm going to have trouble moving on from this part of the demo. However, there's nothing that says you have to have administrators able to have full access to all files and folders on the file system. And in fact, in some respects, that's not a good idea. Anyway, I'm going to select OK here and OK again. And now we've configured these permissions to be appropriate to our particular needs. So we see that we've got sales users have modified permissions. Administrators have full control. Now, if I want to share this folder, I can do that by right clicking and I can say give access to or I can say properties, sharing, click the share button. And again, I can see the permissions here that have been assigned or I can say advanced sharing to share this folder. It defaults to the folder name unless that's already in use. This is a server, so there are 16 million potential users that can connect. I mean, it's effectively infinite because you're not going to have 16 million users connecting, so it's a non-issue. But if you wanted to limit that to a certain number that has meaning, 10, 20, you can do that, although there's no real reason to want to do it. Permissions, and as I said earlier, I think the recommended is to allow full control for everyone because the controlling factor here is the level of access that you have on the folder itself, not the permissions that you have on the share. So I'm going to click OK there, OK again and close. And then if I want to determine what level of access I have, I'm going to need to test it by going to properties and then security and advanced. And then on effective access, I can select a user. Now, I'm not actually sure who belongs to sales, so I'll have to go check that right now. So here we are on the domain controller, Active Directory Users and Computers, and a sales user like Abby. We'll use Abby. She belongs to the sales users group. Let's just check that. Yep, she does. So we'll test the access for her. So if I enter Abby here on my server, click OK. I can then view effective access. And we can see that she has modified permissions. And the limitation is being imposed by the file system. So she lacks the necessary file system permissions, NTFS permissions, to have full control. OK, so if we go back to permissions, we can see that that's true because we've granted sales users modify permissions. So now let's see the effect of changing these permissions. I'm going to click all the way out here and I'm going to go back to the shared folder properties and select sharing and choose advanced sharing and then select permissions. And I'm going to deselect those two checkboxes for full control and change. So now only everyone has only read permissions through the share. Everyone, of course, will include anybody in sales. If I now go back and look at the permissions on the security tab and then select advanced and then go to effective access and select Abby again because she's in the sales group and then view effective access, you can see that her permissions are limited. Some of them are being limited by the fact that she doesn't have sufficient permissions through the share. So in other words, that's telling me were I to change the share permissions that she would enjoy a higher level of access because she already has that access on the file system. OK, and whereas the, the um, file permissions and the shared folder permissions are both restricting full control and in this case, delete subfolders and files. Just to complete the picture, I'm just going to change this around a little bit more. So. On um, sales users here, on the file permissions tab, I'm going to change that. And I'm going to change it to read execute. Then I'm going to go back to sharing and I'm going to change the share permissions. So this time the shared folder grants full access. I have to come all the way out there. And then I'm going to look at how that changes things. So again, actually, I'm expecting users in the sales uh, department to have the same level of access. So if I go to advanced here and choose effective access and select Abby again and then check names and then view effective access, we can see that again, she now has read execute permissions, but the restriction is on the file system. So for a permission to exist through the share onto the file system and onto the files that are contained within a particular folder, the permission must be configured at both levels. And that's why I always suggest using 
full control on the share because it just, just stops it getting in the way then. You don't gain anything by making life complicated. So we leave this as full control and then we use the controlling or determining factor as being the, the system security on the file system. So in this case, sales users are going to need modify permissions. So I'm just going to modify that now and make that modify and click OK. OK again. And just to complete the process, we'll just have a look at the level of access by going to effective access and selecting Abby once more and making sure we've got everything set up as we should do. And view. And yes, there we go. She has modified permissions again. So now my final thing to say about this is, is probably to always focus on grouping your files together into subfolders that have meaning in relation to the way your users work. So at the departmental level, geographic level, and then use the fact that permissions are inherited to keep things nice and easy. So just as a reminder, I haven't changed anything about this reports folder. And if I take a look at that, because it's part of the same folder, it will inherit the permissions. If I go to advanced, you can see it's inheriting them from sales. And again, if I run it effective access on it, it will be exactly the same permissions for Abby because they are inherited. OK, and that makes it simpler. Otherwise, you've got a lot of work to do. In the demonstration, you learned how to secure a folder and how to verify access on that folder. Using Branch Cache, you can enable your client computers at branch offices to use cached copies of network files and folders. By using these cached copies, you don't have to be so reliant on the high speed connection to a head office. Instead, you can make do with a low bandwidth or unreliable connection between your head office and your branch offices. You can deploy branch cache in two modes. With distributed cache mode, you don't need a file server. Any client computer that retrieves a copy of a file can make it available to other users in a cached mode. In a hosted cache mode, you designate a file server at a branch office to perform this function. The caching function then is placed onto a particular file server and client computers obtain cached copies from that server. To enable branch cache for file services, complete the following high level tasks. On the host running Windows Server, install either the branch cache feature or the branch cache for network files role service. On client computers, configure branch cache by either using group policies, by running the netshish branch cache set service command at the command line, or by using Windows PowerShell to run the enable bc distributed or enable bc hosted server PowerShell commandlets. Branch cache supports caching for a variety of different content types. These are web server, file server, and application servers. To cache content on a file server using branch cache, perform the following tasks. Install the branch cache for the network files role service. Configure hash publication for branch cache. Create branch cache enabled file shares. And then on specific folders, select enable branch cache. To configure your client computers, modify the group policy settings. Select branch cache under the network node in administrative templates and then configure the settings in the details pane. Start by enabling turn on branch cache. Then you can configure settings like set branch cache distributed cache mode or set branch cache hosted cache mode. There are other ancillary settings that you can also configure. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to configure branch cache. So I'm on my file server here. I'm going to switch to server manager and choose add roles and features. Click through the wizard for a moment. If I expand out file and storage services and file and iSCSI services, I've got branch cache for network files listed as a role service. I'm going to select that and then click next and then click through to install the feature. OK, so that's completed. So over on my domain controller now, I need to configure some group policy settings. So open up group policy management. And I'm going to create a group policy and link it to the domain object. I'm going to call it branch cache hash publication and say OK to that. And then I'm going to want to only configure those computers that are going to be configured for branch cache. Now that happens to be the computers in this case, Contoso SVR1. It's a good idea to create a group to configure this. So I'm going to do that right now. 
tools, active directory users and computers, and I'm going to create a group under the computers node in this instance. I'll call this one branch cache servers, which seemingly I can't type today. That's better. Okay, and I'm going to add as members computer objects, in this case, Contoso SVR1, because that's the server I'm using. So now I've got branch cache servers configured correctly. And to go back to my group policy here, I need to modify the security filtering for this GPO. So I'm going to go to the delegation tab. I'm going to choose advanced. For authenticated users, I'm going to just remove the apply policy permission. And then I'm going to add the branch cache group that I just created. And I'm going to grant that apply policy permission. So now if I go back to the scope page, we can see that only branch cache servers will be configured. All I now need to do if I install the role on another server is add that server to that group and they'll pick up these hash publication settings. I now need to edit the group policy to configure the appropriate settings. So under policies, admin templates, network, under landman, server, I've got hash publication for branch cache. I need to select that and enable it. And then I can allow hash publication only for shared folders on which it's enabled, or I can disallow it, or I can allow it for all shared folders. So uh, I can choose whichever option I want. So I'm going to allow hash publication for all shared folders and then select OK. So everything seems to be set up now. Let's take a look at the file server. OK, so my file server, the final part of the puzzle is to create a shared folder. We'll call data here, choose properties, sharing, and choose advanced sharing, caching, and then enable branch cache. Click OK. And click OK again, and then close. Now on my Windows 11 client, I need to configure the settings. I can do this again through group policy on my domain controller, and then apply the settings, or I can do it locally. So I'm going to run this locally. I'm going to open up a command line here. And then I'm going to run gpedit.msc as administrator. So I'm just going to edit the local settings for speed here. Under admin templates, take a look under network, and then select uh, branch cache. And then over on the details pane, I need to turn on branch cache for the client. And then I can configure the set branch cache distributed cache mode to be enabled. Or if I was using hosted cache mode, I'd configure that and specify the hosted cache server. So in this case, I'm just going to enable branch cache distributed cache mode. There are a number of other settings that I can configure here, but essentially that's sufficient. Now, when a user accesses a file, if somebody else accesses that in the near future, then they'll be able to obtain it transparently from the client that obtained the file first. In the demonstration, you learned how to configure branch cache. The distributed file system, or DFS, enables you to replicate files and folders between file servers distributed across your organization, even if they're at different physical locations. You can implement DFS in a number of different ways. These will help support your specific needs. DFS consists of one or more namespaces, folders, and folder targets. A DFS namespace provides a virtual representation of your shared folder structure. In the example here, each server has a shared folder called data. If users in Contoso want to access all three data folders, they'll need to remember three UNC shared folder names. So for example, slash slash Contoso SVR1 slash data, slash slash Contoso dash SVR2 slash data, and so on. By implementing a DFS namespace, in this case, a domain-based DFS namespace, you can consolidate these different UNCs into a single shared folder. For example, slash slash contoso.com slash data. Each one of the subfolders, London, New York, and Sydney, is directed to a different UNC server name. This is more convenient for your users. 
DFS supports two types of DFS namespace, domain-based, which is what you'll typically use, and standalone. A DFS namespace is a component of the file and iSCSI services server role. To configure a namespace, use the following procedure. Add the DFS namespace's role service. Create a DFS namespace. Once you've created your namespace, you must define folders and folder targets. A DFS folder is the top-level UNC path to one or more DFS folder targets. A folder target is a link to a shared folder on a file server in your organization. To create folders and folder targets, use the following procedure. First, create a folder in the DFS namespace, then add one or more folder targets to the folder. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to install the DFS namespace's role, how to create a domain-based DFS namespace, how to add a folder, and how to add folder targets. OK, I'm on my domain controller, so I'm going to add the required DFS roles. I'll use Server Manager, but again, you can use PowerShell if you'd like. Under File and Storage Services, under File and iSCSI Services, we can choose DFS namespaces, and then select Add Features. Complete the wizard and leave the role to install. OK, select Close. And the next thing to do is to create the DFS namespace. OK, under Tools, select DFS Management. And then select the Namespaces node. Right click and select New Namespace. And then you need to specify the server on which you want to create the namespace. I'm going to choose the local server and then select next and then I need to give the namespace a name so I'm going to call it Contoso data and select next. That will now create a namespace which has a previewed name of contoso.com slash contoso data. In fact actually I'm going to change that just to data make it a little bit easier for me to type later on in the demo. That's better. And when I'm happy with that, I can click Next. Note that by default, it uses a domain-based namespace, which is typically what, what, what you want to use. There are some minor advantages of using a standalone namespace for, for particular scenarios, but essentially, you'll want to use a domain-based namespace in almost all circumstances. Select Next, review the settings, and then when happy, we'll click Create. So the namespace has now been created. It's worth mentioning, if you select the namespace and then select the namespace service tab, you can see one namespace server, the one that I just created. It may not be obvious, but if this server, the um, Contoso DC server, fails for any reason, then the whole namespace is inaccessible. And that means that although the folders and folder targets are all still out there on the network somewhere. If users are using the namespace name to connect to them, they can't. So this actually has become a single point of failure. So it's usually a pretty good idea to add additional namespace servers to provide resilience of the namespace name itself so that, so that users can connect even if one of the namespace services is offline. I'm not going to do that. I don't have sufficient servers here for that. But I thought I'd mention it as a fairly important thing to consider. Now, the next thing I need to do is to create some shared folders on some of my other servers. I'll do this on one server, and uh, you can assume that I've done it on the others. I've got three other servers. Once I've done one of these, I'll then come back here and create a new folder and some folder targets. I'm signing in on my member server here. There's the desktop. So I'm going to open up File Explorer and create a shared folder. I'm use drive C because it's the only drive I've got on this computer now. So new folder, data. I'm going to now share that using advanced sharing. And select that. Share the folder. Choose permissions. I'm going to set everyone has full control on the shared folder permissions and I'm going to change the security in a moment for the underlying folder. Click OK to that. So then on the security tab, I'm going to modify the permissions. At the moment, users have no permissions, so other than read execute. So I'm going to add, it's taking a moment to think that through there, I'm going to add authenticated users. Click OK. And 
I'm going to grant um, full control. Now, clearly, in a real world example, you wouldn't grant full control to authenticated users, but I'm not here to test permissions. I'm here right now just to set up some targets and I'll worry about permissions later on. So click OK for now. So I've set that up now and I'm going to repeat that, although you won't need to watch it, twice on two other servers. So I can now create a new folder back here on the domain controller. And uh, let's call this one London. And we're going to point that to so SVR1 slash data. Click OK to that. And then OK. Then add another folder. And we'll call this one New York. Well, actually, I'll truncate that to NYC to make it easier for users to remember. And then point that to Contoso SVR2 slash data and click OK and then create another folder for Sydney and add Contoso SVR3 data and OK again and OK. So now let's see what that looks like for a user. So if I were to open up File Explorer and type in contoso.com slash data and press enter, you see that I have three subfolders. London, which takes me to SVR1. I don't know that, but that's where it goes. NYC, which takes me to SVR2. And Sydney, which takes me to SVR3. So a common UNC name to access all of these three disparate shares on, on different servers. In the demonstration, you learned how to install the DFS namespace role and how to create a domain-based DFS namespace. You also learned how to add a folder and add folder targets. DFS namespace replication enables you to create replicas of the namespace itself. Given that the namespace is a single point of failure without an, a replica, it's important that you set this up. This enables you to provide namespace replication and helps ensure high availability of the namespace. DFS replication enables you to synchronize copies of folder content between instances of folder targets throughout your organization. This can help you to address a number of scenarios when supporting branch offices, collecting data from branches, distributing data to branches, sharing data throughout your branches. When you want to configure DFS replication targets, you start with your domain-based DFS namespace, in this case, contosa.com slash data. You create a folder, and then you define multiple targets for that folder, which are replicas of one another. This helps ensure that the content is accessible even if one instance of the folder is unavailable. It also allows you to consolidate data from branch offices or to distribute data to branch offices. To add a replication target, Install the DFS replication role on all servers that host replication targets. Add multiple folder targets to a folder. In the demonstration, I'll show you how you can add the DFS replication role. So on the Contoso SVR1 server, I'm going to add roles and features. I click through the wizard. And then I expand file and storage services in the list of roles expand file and iSCSI services, and then choose DFS replication and add the required additional features. Complete the wizard and install the component. Now I need to repeat this on any server that's going to participate in DFS replication or DFSR as it's sometimes referred to. I'll leave that running on this server and switch and complete the other one. In demonstration, you learned how to install the DFS replication role. Once you've installed the necessary role on the required servers, you can choose a replication group type. You can choose between two replication group types, a multi-purpose replication group and a replication group for data collection. That would be more appropriate when you're working with branch offices and you want to collect and collate the data to a central location. Other than that, it's probably best to choose a multi-purpose replication group. Next, you'll need to select your replication topology. You can choose between hub and spoke, which requires at least three members. Full mesh, where each member replicates with all the other members in the replication group. That works pretty well when there are 10 or fewer members in the group. Or no topology, where you can customize exactly what you want. 
you use the bandwidth and schedule page to configure the schedule, that means when replication will take place between the configured members, and the bandwidth, that's the capacity of the network link that will be used. Bear in mind, if you've got vast quantities of data moving across these links, that could have an adverse effect on other applications that want to use those links. You can use the referrals page to exclude targets outside of a particular client site and to define clients fail back to preferred targets. These are client settings and determine exactly which folder target or which replica a client will connect to. The advanced page allows you to define the use of permissions. So you can use inherited permissions from the local file system or set explicit view permissions on the DFS folder. In the demonstration, I'll show you how to create and configure a DFS replication group. So there's a number of ways in which you can set up replication. You can replicate a specific folder or you can simply go to the replication node and create a new replication group. You can then define the properties of the replication group, multi-purpose replication or replication group for data collection. So I'm going to choose multi-purpose. Then we're going to call or give the name or give a name to the replication group. We're going to call this Contoso. It's in the domain contoso.com. Then we need to select replication group members. So I'm going to specify SVR and then check names. And I can choose all three of those servers because I've installed the replication role on each three or each of them. And then it's just checking that they're all configured correctly. We can view the details of this process. Okay, seems that that was uh, quicker than I expected. It's all done. And then select next. And now we can choose the topology. So hub and spoke, full mesh, or no topology. And then we can individually define what we want. I'm going to choose full mesh and select next. Then I can specify replicate continuously using the specified bandwidth, or I can choose replicate during specified days and time. So the schedule is configured by selecting the second of these options, repl replicate during the specified days and times, and then editing the schedule. I'm going to leave that configured to replicate continuously, and then I can specify the bandwidth. With today's modern network connections, it's probably not necessary to worry too much about this, but if you've got concerns about the impact of replication traffic, in particularly large replication groups, then you might want to make some adjustments here. So I'm going to leave this configured at full for now. You can specify a primary member, which is one that's used for the initial seeding. So I'm going to choose Conto SVR, SVR1 here. Now I need to choose the folders that I want to replicate. Just checking the settings before it moves on. OK, so I'm now going to add a folder. So on contest so SVR1, the local path of the folder to replicate. So you can on slash data and click OK to that. And then select next. And then I need to edit each of these so the local path on the member servers. Now I've actually got the folder already, but so I just need to specify it. But if it didn't exist, I could ask it to be created for me. So I've already created these folders. And then this one. And select Next. And when I'm happy with that, I can select Create. It's telling me that it's done everything. So hopefully that's all successful. Click OK. And then we can review the settings here. So under Replicated Folders, I can see that I've got a folder called Data. I can have a look at the connections. We can see that there are they're all enabled between the respective servers in our full mesh. I can then take a look at the properties of my folder. So this is the replicated folder that I've configured. Here we go, properties. And I can reconfigure the schedule if I want to here. But other than that, everything seems to be working successfully. In the demonstration, you learned how to create and to configure a DFS replication group. Azure Files is an Azure service that provides functionality of the on-premise shared folder feature. 
Its key features are it's serverless. It provides for almost unlimited storage. It provides a selectable level of redundancy and provides inbuilt data encryption. It provides support for SMB, NFS and HTTP connections, which means that it supports most server type of environments. It gives you the ability to define granular permissions and supports previous versions and backups for recovery purposes. It also supports integration with your on-premise file servers. Common usage scenarios include replacing or supplementing on-premises file servers, lift and shift to replace your file servers, providing for backup and disaster recovery, supporting the Azure File Sync feature. Azure File Sync enables you to centralize your file shares in Azure Files. It provides support for caching Azure File Shares on on-premise servers. To enable Azure File Sync, you must first of all create a storage account. Then create a file share in this account. Next, you'll need to select Azure File Sync from the marketplace in Azure. You'll need to define Storage Sync service name and add a Storage Sync service instance. Finally, in the Storage Sync service, you'll create a sync group. Provide a name for this group and then select the storage account and the Azure File Share you, pre you created earlier on. The next step is to add server endpoints. First of all, select registered servers. Then download the Azure File Sync agent and install it on your on-premise servers. Select the sync group. Add a server endpoint for each registered server. Azure File Sync implements a feature called cloud tiering. Cloud tiering ensures there's always sufficient capacity on a volume hosting a share for the files that are stored on that share. From a user's perspective, a tiered file still appears as though it's on the file server that they're accessing. If users try to open the file, it syncs from Azure File Share to the Azure File Sync File Share endpoint. You don't have to worry about freeing up space for additional files in this way. You can configure Azure File Sync for each file share to tier files based on when the file was last accessed, how much free space there is on the volume that hosts the share, and both of these last access and free space. In the demonstration, I'm going to show you how you can configure and enable Azure File Sync. So in the Azure portal, First of all, you want to start by creating a storage account. So if I search for storage account, select that link, and then I'm going to create a new storage account. Choose the subscription and resource group, and then create a unique storage account name. So demo and Azure File Sync. I'm going to specify a region. I'm configured to use UK South through a policy. And then specify the performance tier, standard, which is recommended for, for most situations. Or if you need low latency, then you can go for premium. Obviously, there is a cost attached. You can also choose the level of redundancy. And again, for, for more redundant failover scenarios, you will have to uh, pay a higher cost. I'm going to choose locally redundant storage here because it's just a demonstration. Click through to advanced. There may be things that I want to configure here. For example, down here, I can select an access tier. Um, cool is for infrequently accessed data and backup scenarios, and hot is for frequently accessed data and day-to-day -day usage scenarios. If I've got particularly large um, files that I want to share, I can choose for this Azure file element down here to enable large file support. In fact, there's actually nothing really else that I need to configure here particularly, so I'm just going to choose review and create and then select Create. It'll take a moment to set that up and we'll then be able to move on. So I've done that now, select Go to Resource. And the next step is to create a file share. So here we are in our, our demo storage account, select File Shares, and then select Plus File Share, and then give it a name. And I'm gonna call this one Contoso FS1. And I can then go on to configure some of the other options here, like the tier here it can be transaction optimized or hot or cool. I'm just going to leave it as transaction optimized for now. There's nothing else to say here, so I'm going to select create. So that's great. It's created the file share for me. Now the next step is to search the marketplace for Azure File Sync. So I'm just going to type that up in search. And I don't see it rather. Oh, there we are under marketplace, Azure File Sync. 
And now I need to configure this. I'm going to specify a storage sync service name. Again, I choose my subscription resource group and then I choose the location. So let's give this a name of Contoso Sync Service 1. And then I need to choose UK South because that's per my policy. Then if I want to review any of the other settings, I can. Otherwise, I'll just select Review and Create. And then Create. So again, that'll take a moment to set up. OK, so that's fine. Now let's go to the resource. So now we need to create a sync group. We'll call this one sync group one. We choose Contoso as the demo as the, sub, the subscription in my case. Then we select the storage account that we created earlier. So that's Contoso demo. And then we specify or select the share, the Azure file share that we created earlier. That's Contoso FS1 and then create. So that's configured the sync group. The next step is to go to registered servers and to download the Azure file sync agent on each of the servers that I want to register. And then I'll run the agent on each of those servers in turn. So let's start that process. So I click the link Azure file sync agent, opens up a new tab. I select download and then I choose the agent that I need. In this case, it's storage sync agent WS 2022.msi. So I'm going to download that and then I'll copy it onto each of my on-prem servers. So I've copied the storage sync agent down onto two servers. I've set one of the servers up already. So I'm now going to run through the process of setting up the other. So you click through the wizard, it's fairly straightforward to use. So once files are copied, you'll be prompted to connect to the Azure environment and to uh, establish a connection with the storage account so that you can synchronize through Azure File Sync. And so that's finished. Select Finish. It checks for updates. And then you need to sign in and register the server. So I'm just going to complete that process and then we'll check back in. OK, so I've signed in now. If I choose my Azure subscription, my resource group, and then the storage sync service, I can now register the server. I'll take a moment. OK, we're done. It's now testing connectivity, but we can move on. Select Close. So back in the Azure portal, if I select Refresh under Registered Servers, I can now see that there are two servers registered both of which are online. So the next thing is to go back to my sync group and select the sync group that I created earlier. And then you can see that I've got a cloud endpoint set up already. I now need to configure server endpoints. So select add server endpoint and then I can choose from amongst the registered servers. I'm going to choose the first one, Contoso SVR1. Specify a path on that server and I can't set this up yet, but later on I can revisit and configure cloud tiering. But for now, I've got nothing else to configure, so I'm just going to select Create. And then I can go on and add the remaining registered server, Contoso SPR2, and Create. And then that will take a while to provision, during which time I'm going to switch to my on-prem servers and add some files into the configured folders, C slash data on each of those servers and watch the end-to-end -end process of synchronization. So I'm connected to my on-prem server Contoso SVR1. You can see that that's the case up here with a little tab. I'm connected using RDP locally, so it's in my data center. And I have a folder called data, which is the folder that's being used for sync with Azure File Sync. So I'm going to create a new file in here called created on SVR1 and then just enter some data. This was created on SVR1. Save that away. 
So now I've created that file and I'm going to switch over to SVR2 and see when that appears and then create the file over there as well. So I'm going to open up the file system on SVR2 by using File Explorer, of course. Navigate to the data folder. It's already there, it's beat me to it. So it's already created that file. I'm now going to create one at this end. Created on SVR2. This was created on SVR2. Save that away. And I would expect to see that synchronize up. So here we are on SVR1. And if I go into the data folder, there we go, we've got the two files. So the synchronization seems to be working pretty well. One final thing that's maybe worth having a look at is uh, back here in the Azure portal, select storage accounts, select the storage account that we're using for Azure files, and then select the file share. And here is our Contoso FS1 file share, which is being used for Azure File Sync. And you can see up here that these there are the two files. In the demonstration, you learned how to configure and enable Azure File Sync. You can use Azure Monitor to monitor Azure File Sync. If you do, you can monitor bytes synced, cloud tiering cache hit rate, recall size, recall size by application, recall success rate, and recall throughput. Files not syncing, files synced, server cache size, server online status, and sync session results. You can also monitor using the storage sync service. The storage sync service provides the following. Registered server health, server endpoint health in terms of files not syncing, sync activity, cloud tiering efficiency, files not tiering, and recall errors. Finally, you can also review metrics. If you're using DFSR and you want to use Azure File Sync as a replacement, consider migrating by using the following procedure. First, in Azure, create a new sync group for the DFS replication topology that you're replacing. Then install Azure File Sync on the server that has all data in your DFS replication topology. Register the server and create a server endpoint for it. Wait until all the data has synced to the Azure File Share in your storage account. Install the Azure File Sync agent on each of the remaining servers and then register them in Azure. Disable DFS replication in your on premise to topology. Create a server endpoint for each of the remaining servers. Wait for sync to occur on all servers. Finally, retire DFSR. That brings us to the end of the course. We covered all the exam objectives for the AZ800 Administering Windows Server Hybrid Core Infrastructure Exam. To recap, Lesson 1 through 3, manage on-premise identities, implement and manage hybrid identities, and manage Windows Server using domain-based group policies, align to the exam OD, deploy and manage ADDS in on-premises and cloud environments. This represents around 30 to 35% of the exam. Lesson 4, manage servers, covered all the content required for manage Windows servers and workloads in a hybrid environment. That accounts for around 10 to 15% of the exam. Lesson 5, Manage Virtual Machines and Containers, covered the content for the exam OD Manage Virtual Machines and Containers and represents around 15-20% to 20 of the exam. Lesson 6, Implement Name Resolution and Lesson 7, Manage Network Infrastructure, together covered the exam OD Implement and Manage an On-Premises and Hybrid Networking Infrastructure. This represents around 15-20% to 20 of the exam. The final lesson, 8, Manage Storage and File Services, covered the exam OD of the same name and represents around 15 to 20 percent of the exam. Well, what to do now? I'd recommend you put into practice what you've learned during the course and work with Windows Server, both in an on-premises context and in Azure. Maybe sign up for a trial Azure subscription, build a few virtual machines. You'll need maybe two running Windows Server 2022. You should ensure these have internet access so that you can access and manage them from Azure. You should probably create a couple of additional Windows Server VMs in Azure as well. That environment should enable you to perform the tasks you've seen during the course. Then, using this environment, run through the demos you've just reviewed. It only remains for me to thank you for your participation in this course and to wish you the very best of luck, either with the exam or in your application of this knowledge at your workplace. Best of luck.